W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight we meet a sort of an unusual girl. Her name is Muriel, and she's quite a personality. The name of the story is Murder with Muriel. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Are you looking for a smooth shave, men? Then try Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. It'll give you the kind of shave you want because 40 years of experience have gone into the making of this product. Fitch's No Brush contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that takes the work out of shaving. You won't have to struggle and scrape against stubborn whiskers because the skin conditioner prepares your face beforehand. It holds the whiskers up so your razor can zip them down closely and quickly. Even against the grain of a tough beard, your razor will glide swiftly, never nicking or scraping. Pitches No Brush is a boon to sensitive faces because it lubricates gently, keeping that tender skin from being irritated. After this quick, easy shave, your skin will feel cool and refreshed. Wonderfully smooth. And if you prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It forms a rich, abundant lather when applied with a brush. This lather stays moist all during the shave. Fitch's Brush Cream also contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream are available in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. For a shave you like, switch to Fitch. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was sitting at my junior executive type desk one day a few months ago, trying to get a studious gander at the racing form for the next day. I had planned to attend and contribute a quick 48 bucks outside to the improvement of the breed of thoroughbreds racing at the track. 48 bucks, that's uh, six across the board, eight races, six eights. That's right, uh, 48. Well, anyway, I was working on a case for an insurance company. And they had assigned a big company detective with his brains at his feet to help me. His real job was to watch me. And he did. His girl was mad at him, and he spent all his time writing torchy poetry to her. I didn't mind that. But the big goon read it to me. That made it personal. Hey, listen to this one, will you, Rogie? Oh, no, I'm busy. Can't you see, Joe? <laughs> this will put her in her place. Listen. Gee, Cupid stupid. His dart in my heart, I trusted. Now, my heart's busted. He sent me an Aphrodite, who's awful flighty. Don't trust Cupid. He's stupid. <laughs> That's a deli, ain't it? I- I'm going to send it to Rose special delivery. Mm. That ought to bring her right back to you with a club in her hand. Why don't you give the dame up, Joe? Oh, you don't understand, Rogie. I love her. Oh. I'm looking for Richard Rogue. Yeah? What do you want? I've got a message for you. I want to talk to you. uh, Privately. Okay, okay. Come on in here. Look, I'm a busy guy today. What do you want? What's your name? I'm Joe Layton. Have you had a letter from Duke Dickerson? No. You know him, don't you? Well enough to lend him money. That answer your question? Well, he needs some dough. Tough. He still owes me. He's got some stashed in a tin box out in the valley. He wants it. He wants us to get it for him. Go on. He's planted the dough out in the valley. Yeah? Get to the point. Well, uh, he's mailed half of a map to me and the other half to you. A map showing just where the dough is buried. We're to go get it together. I get the 2,500 he owes me, and you get the 100 he owes you, plus 1,000 for the job. And Duke gets the rest. Okay? Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. I'll take a drive out into the valley for 1,100 skins any time. But I haven't got the map yet. Well, he mailed it day before yesterday. It should be here. Well, it isn't. Drop around about noon tomorrow. Maybe it'll come in the morning mail. The Duke needs the dough pretty bad. 
He's got himself in a bit of a jam in Kansas City. We'll get that dough tomorrow, huh? There's something about money I like. I think maybe it's the feeling of power it gives me when the rent is paid. Anyway, this, uh, this spook shoved off, and I went back into the outer office where Joe Black was poisoned, pinning some more poetry. The phone rang, and I thought twice before I answered it. It was almost six o'clock, and I had plans for that evening. Then I finally gave in to its yammering. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I must see you right away. Hmm, sorry. It's a matter of life and death, Mr. Rogue. I'm afraid. What's the matter? What's your name? Muriel Scott. Please, come to the Rialto Theater. I can't be seen talking to you. I'm in the aisle seat, center aisle, three rows down from the rear of the theater. On the right-hand side of the center aisle. The seat next to mine is vacant. Please meet me there as soon as possible. Please, hurry. Okay, wait there. Who was that, Rogie? Oh, now, look, Blackie, it was private business. Why don't you run along home now and get some rest? Oh, no. The boss told me to stick with you. And that's what I'm going to do. You're tricky, you know. We don't trust you. Oh, look, I... Oh, hello. What are you doing here, Urban? Just dropped in to ask you a few questions, Rogue. Good evening, Lieutenant Urban. Hello, Blackie. Go wait in the hall. I want to talk with Rogue. Yes, sir. Oh, now, what's on your mind? You know a guy by the name of Layton? Joe Layton? Hmm. Huh? Name sounds familiar. Why? He just left here, didn't he? Well, he's been here. What's that to you? What do you want to see you about? Well, I don't see how that could possibly affect you, old man. He came to see me on private business. That's all the talking I'm going to do. How'd you know he was here, anyway? I just took a card off him. He had your name and address on it. What did he want to see you about, Rogue? Well, he didn't mention your name. How come you to be shaking Joe Layton down? Is he pinched? No, no, he isn't in any trouble with the police, Rogie. I picked him up about a block from here a while ago. He'd been robbed and murdered. Well, this was a fine time for Joe Layton to get dead. Just when he meant 1100 bucks to me. I went down to the morgue with Urban to look at the body. What I really went for was a quick look through his personal effects. There was no sign of half a map. That's all I wanted to know. Urban put me on the fire for a while, trying to get me to tell him all I knew about Layton, but I didn't crack, and I left about 10.30 to drive back to my office. My shadow Blackie was right behind me. When I walked into the office, the phone was ringing. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Mr. Rogue, you didn't come to the theater. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Muriel. Something else came up that demanded my immediate attention. But I, I... must see you right away. It's a matter of life or death. Uh, but I can't. There's, there's a $500 fee waiting here for you for just a few minutes' work. Please, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, where are you? I'm at the Shady Glade Motel out in the valley. You know where it is? Oh, sure, sure. I've passed it a thousand times. Will you come right out? Please. Cabin number four. Uh... You say there's $500 waiting there for me? You got it there? Yes. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death. Well, I just had 1,100 skin shot out from under me. And I decided I couldn't afford to be too temperamental about a sure 500. So I ran down the stairs to my car and took off for the Shady Glade Motel... And the lady with the seductive voice. It was a long drive from my office, and I spent my time trying to figure out how I was going to get in touch with Duke Dickinson and deal myself back in on that buried treasure deal. I couldn't tell whether Blackie had managed to tail me on this trip or not. There was so much traffic on the pass. Well, uh, anyway, I pulled up at the Shady Glade and knocked at the door of cabin number four. You're Mr. Rogue? Yeah. Come in. Well, uh, get it off your chest, lady. Please, sit down. Okay, but uh, I'm in a kind of a hurry. Let's make this as brief as possible. All right. Would you care for a drink? Well, I'd love one. But look, you were tearing your hair out a half hour ago. I got here as soon as I could by breaking a few speed laws. Now, before we get social, what's the deal? I'm in trouble, Mr. Rogue. I'll take it from here, Muriel. Huh? 
Oh, oh, a reception committee with artillery, huh? Well, how about giving me a quick rundown on what's the deal? What do you want from me? You know a man by the name of Joe Layton? Yeah, I knew him. And I know what happened to him. You wouldn't want it to happen to you, would you? I don't insist on it. Get out of here, Muriel. I'll stay. Get into the other room. Go on. All right, Chef. All right now, Rogue. Let's get down to business. You had company today, didn't you? Layton was up to see you. That's right. Everybody seems to know that. What do you mean? Well, the cops came to see me later. Took me down for a little questioning. You see, they knew Layton called on me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you shook him down for that map, you should have taken that card with my name and address off of him. And he can't think of everything. I want your half of that map, Rogue. I don't have it. Don't lie to me, Rogue. Just give me your half of the map. I don't have it. But even if I did, name me a reason why I should give it to you. Where is it? I don't have it. That's all I know. I'll give you $5,000 for it, Rogue. Huh? <laughs> why should I sell it to you? I had to kill a man for half that map. I don't want to have to kill you unless it's absolutely necessary, Rogue. Believe me, I hope it won't come to that. Now, look, pretty boy. I don't have the letter, and killing me or keeping me here won't make you much of a score. Where is the letter? Why should I tell you? Ah, let's face it, chum. There's is it no... in your office? I haven't received it yet. It'll probably be in the morning's mail tomorrow. This is not getting anybody someplace. I'll do the worrying about that. Yeah? Well, while you're worrying, take a look behind you. You got company. <laughs> oh, no, no. I'm surprised that you try to run that old bluff like that on me. <laughs> you think it's a bluff? Hey, Blackie. Drop that gun, mister. I couldn't miss you from here. You better drop it, pretty boy. My friend Joe Black is a very nervous type. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Now, well, that's a nice guy. Look, Blackie, I'll hold a gun on this citizen. There's a girl in the bedroom. Go get her. All right, Rogie. What are you going to do with me, Rogue? I haven't made any plans yet. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Why don't we keep this to ourselves, Rogue? There's plenty. Hey, Rogue, there's, there's no dame in here. What? The window's open and she's gone. I, I heard a car pull away just as I came in here. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Well, well, it isn't my fault, Rogie. I, I did what you told me to and... Muriel got away, huh? That's right. She got away. But we've still got the main attraction. That's you. Look, Rogue, there's no reason why we can't make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to cut you in for half the money. <laughs> How big of you. You have to watch those generous impulses, Shep. Next thing you know, you'll be giving away the sleeves out of your vest. Hey, Blackie. Uh, yeah? You just declared yourself in on five bills, okay? Sure. What do I do? Shake him down. I want half of a hand-drawn map. There's no point in us working against each other, Rogue. Shut up. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Keep your hands away from your pockets. Yeah, just keep them up in the air, and I won't have to break your thick skull. Uh, toss me his wallet, Blackie. Uh, quit squirming, you. Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, there you are, Rogie. And a nice wallet it is, too. Uh, uh, maybe you'll let me have it, huh, Rogie? Uh, after you've taken a map out, of course. <laughs> oh, that's what I love about you, Blackie. You have such big ideas. Ah, well, quite a bit of dough here. And the driver's license. Glad to see that you're a law-abiding citizen, Chef. Oh, now, here it is. A little piece of paper worth 25 grand. Now, look, Rogue. Suppose I work with you. Just cut me in for five grand. A little late for that, Chef. Blackie. Yeah? I'm afraid our friend Shep might be a burden. Uh, you better put him to sleep for a while. Uh, you mean like this? Oh. You're so enthusiastic, Blackie. Now, let's get him tied up and slip him under a bed until we need him again, shall we? Of course. Uh, hey, uh, hadn't we better call in the cops, Rogie? Well, I didn't want the cops in on this deal yet. They get so inquisitive about murderers. I knew the Chep was as safe as a royal flesh against three deuces. So I left him there, all tied up like a bow tie. I gave Blackie the slip and went to my apartment to get a little sleep. I opened the door and walked in, into a surprise party. Hello, Rogie. Where you been? What are you doing in my apartment, Urban? Waiting for you to get home. You got a warrant? Oh, now, Rogie, are we going to get technical? What do you want? You decided to tell me what you know about the killing of uh, Joe Layton? No. You might be making a mistake, Rogue. 
You know, sometimes you need a guy like me. What are you working on? I don't report to you, Urban. Go away. I've known you for a long time, Rogie. You're declaring yourself in on Leighton's murder. I don't think you did it, but uh, I think you know more than you're talking. Now, look, I've got a stake in this case. If I crack it, I'll let you know in time to get your picture in the papers. Will you settle for that? You're on the level, aren't you, Rogie? Well, you know I am. I've worked with you this way before, haven't I? Have I ever given you a bump pitch? No. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Richard. If you have any ideas of slipping me a double cross, Rogie, forget it. I've got a cell waiting for you, and I'm not above framing you. Remember that. I knew Urban wasn't kidding. And I had an impulse to call him back and tell him about the murder I had put away for him in that motel. But I thought better of it. As the door closed behind Urban, I heard another door open behind me. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Muriel. Why, honey, this is... Put up your ple- hands. Huh? I'm going to get that map if I have to kill you. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that glamorous women the country over are using Fitch's saponified shampoo for greater hair beauty. Here's what lovely Bess Meyerson, recently awarded the title of Miss America of 1945, told us in an interview. A long time ago, I discovered that part of being beautiful was being clean. So I keep my hair clean by shampooing it as often as I feel it needs it. I use Fitch's saponified shampoo because it does not dry my hair or make it difficult to manage, no matter how often I shampoo it. Yes, beautiful women everywhere use Fitch's saponified shampoo. It does not dry the hair because it's made from mild vegetable and coconut oils. Even in hard water, it gives lots of rich, fragrant lather. It cleanses efficiently and gently. And here's a feature all women will cheer. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to make your hair sparkling clean. No particles are left to dim the luster and highlights of the hair. Best of all, you won't need to bother with a special after rinse. Give your hair a treat. Use Fitch's saponified shampoo. You can get a professional application at your beauty or barber shop or ask for an economical bottle at your drug counter. Richard Rogue is involved in an affair concerning $25,000 in buried treasure. There's a girl in the affair named Muriel Scott. And right this minute, the lovely Muriel is an uninvited guest in Rogue's apartment, where she's holding Rogue at the end of a 45 automatic. I love girls, especially girls with Muriel's gifts. She had the kind of a figure that you'd like to add to your income tax. And a little baby face that made me want to hold her on my lap and tell her a story. But that gun changed everything. It ruined the intimate romantic atmosphere that I would have preferred. Take your revolver out of the holster and drop it. Come on, I know how to use this gun. Okay, okay. Now back away from it. You know, uh, I have a strange feeling that you've lived through this before. I have. Keep backing. Okay. Mm. Now what? Sit down. Thanks. How'd you get in here? Through the window, the one of the fire escape. <coughs> now, what time is the first mail delivery at your office in the morning? Oh, it's about 9.30. I heard you tell Shep that the map would be there in that mail. I'm expecting it. Good. I'll get it then. What did you do with Shep? Well, he's okay. Is he in jail? No, he isn't. I want my hands on that dough before I yell for the cops. Uh-huh. I want my hands on that dough, too, and I'm going to get them there. Are you, uh, comfortable? Yeah, don't worry about me. Look, baby, I I want some coffee. How about you? Just stay where you are. Oh, but look, beautiful, it's only 11.30. It's 10 hours before the mail arrives. I can stay awake 10 hours at $2,500 an hour. Easy. Mm -hmm. Ah, It's too bad you're so hard to get along with. You're a very beautiful dame, you know it? Yeah, I know it. Just keep your seat, Mr. Rogue. I don't know whether you're going to like coffee the way I make it or not, Muriel. It'll be all right. Are you sure you don't want me to hold the gun while you make the coffee? Go ahead, make the coffee and stop talking. Uh, okay, okay, beautiful. 
Yeah, but you'd let her, better listen to my proposition. Uh, we could do a lot together with 25 grand. Ever been to Rio? More toast? Thanks, Richie. You know, you make pretty good coffee. And you make pretty good toast, Angel. Lots of butter. And you know that costs points? We won't need them in Rio, will we? No. <laughs> ah, we're going to make beautiful music together, baby. You know it? How did you ever get mixed up in a deal like this, anyway? Oh, he came through Pittsburgh. Mm, I know the town well. He spent a lot of money on me, and I thought I was living. Ah, you're too nice a girl to go around pointing guns at people. What did you do with that cannon, anyway? I left it on the kitchen table. Oh. You comfortable? Uh-huh. A few more hours and I can go pick up that money, huh, baby? Yeah. Twenty-five grand. You know something, honey? What? I can just barely remember Shep. It's nine o'clock, honey. Let's get going, shall we? Oh, uh-huh. we just about make it, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Well, I hope that map's in the morning mail, don't you? Well, it will be. Don't worry. Come on, I'll help you with your coat. Mm-hmm. Hey, where'd you get it? It's a nice mink. Shep stole it for me. He was a petty larceny guy, wasn't he? Ah, let's not think about him, Angel. Come on. We we're on our way to the office in that letter. And Rio? Could be. here. Now, you stay in the car. I don't know whether there'll be any cops up there or not. And if I'm not back in five minutes, shove off. And I'll meet you in the lobby of the Hotel Bellevue in an hour. Oh? You're not going to take me to the office with you? No. Then leave me the half of the map you took from ship. I want to know you're coming back. Oh, sure. Sure, baby. Yeah, here you are. Now, are you happy? Yes. I'm happy. Hurry, though, will you? I'll be back in a minute, beautiful. If I'm not, remember what I told you to do, huh? I'll be in the lobby of the Bellevue if you aren't back in five minutes, right? If that letter was in my office, I had this case whipped like Simon Legree had Uncle Tom. Then my wishbone was in my throat as I rode up to my office. The elevator had always seemed slow, but this morning it seemed to be going backwards. With just a few more breaks now, I'd be back at home, home base like the third fleet. I walked into the office, and there sat my shot of Joe Black. I pitched him some fast double talk about ditching him last night, ran through the mail, found the letter from Duke Dickinson with a map. While I was jumping up and down and clapping my hands, I told Blackie what I wanted him to do. And then Muriel and I took off for the treasure hunt with a spade. Are you sure this is the right path? Sure. I got the map right here, haven't I? Look, uh, look up ahead. There's the big rock he's got on. See? Uh-huh. And uh, there's the tree. Look, Rogie. Oh, the gun. You put it back. Do you have any plans about taking this money yourself? Oh, will you cut it out? Put that I rock back in your bag. I just want you to know I've now? still got it and I can oh. use it. Oh, but look, baby. Remember me. Oh, I suppose I'm a chump. I'll put the gun away. Just for you. You big, handsome cutthroat. <laughs> Well, I paced off the location of that hidden treasure, just like it said on the map. Feeling a little like Captain John Silver as I did it. And then I exposed my poor, aching back to the unaccustomed labor of making a hole in the ground with a spade. I will never be a fan of digging. I like my spades five at a time. Preferably running from the ace down to the ten with a lot of dough in the middle of the table instead of in the middle of the pasture. But I dug. Richard, are you sure you're digging in the right place? Sure. We sighted in on that tree and that big rock. And if that petty larceny crook of a Duke Dickerson thinks this is funny, I'll personally hit... Hey. Huh? Hey, hey, pay dirt. Hear it? Yes. Hurry, Rogie. Dig it out. Well, do you want this shovel? I'm digging as fast as I can. There it is. See the top of it? Be there. Be there. 25,000. 
Well, baby, there it is. Twenty-five grand. You want to count it? Let me have it, Rogi. Here, baby, you, you take care of it for a while, huh? Put it in your bag and let's get back to town and celebrate, beautiful? All right. Just hold that close. <laughs> Both of you, hold it. Hey, hey, what is this? Shut up. Give me your bag, lady. Come on, lady. I don't want to have to shoot any holes in that pretty dress you're wearing. Come on, give me that bag. No, I won't. <laughs> Next time I slap you with this rod. Now, give me that bag. Get your hands away from that coat there, mister. Thanks. Ah, oh. March. You look familiar to me, tough stuff. Yeah? Maybe I'd better put you away, huh? Hmm. Duke Dickinson must have sent out a bullet into all his friends. Shut up. Lay down on your faces, both of you. Now. <laughs> Shut up, lady. I just shot a couple of holes in your tires, that's all. Now, just take it easy and don't move until I'm out of here. Thanks for the dough. Come on in the office, baby. Now, buck up and stop crying. I don't suppose you're going to pay any attention to me now that the money's gone? You'll probably forget me as soon as you can. Oh, baby. Oh, hi, Urban. Hello, Rogue. Who's this? A cop. What's he doing here? He's here after you, baby. Oh, oh Richard. He wouldn't turn me into the... Hate to interrupt, but uh, what's the score, Rogue? Uh, this little girl helped to kill Joe Layton. The guy who worked with her is under the bed at cabin number four at the Shady Glade Motel. How could you do this to me? After all the things you said and... and... It's... Well, it's... It's uh, not easy. But you see, baby, I don't approve of murder. Especially not in this neighborhood. Gives a block a bad name. Oh, no. No, Richard. Better take her away, Urban, no. before I take her away from you. She's a beautiful oh, girl, isn't she? Richard. Oh, Richard. Richard. Well, that's the story. Of course, you recognize my old friend Joe Black as a hold-up man. You see, I figured that when Muriel and Shep were on trial, I would have less explaining to do if they thought some stranger had finally come up with the 25 grand. I gave Joe his 500 like I said I would. He beefed a little, but he took it. And then I took the 100 Duke owed me and 1,000 for the job that was agreed on, and then I took the 2,500 that Joe Layton was supposed to get and sent it to Muriel's mother. Layton didn't have any use for it in the morgue. And I sent the rest to Duke in Kansas City. Made a nice score altogether, but... Oh, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I dream of Rio and Muriel and that trip we were going to take. The money's spent, but the dreams linger on. They're wonderful. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you noticed that I didn't get hit on the head in tonight's story. It was nice for a change, I... Hope you like the yarn. Ray Buffum wrote it. Lee Stevens composed and conducted the music. And D. Engelbach produced and directed. I want to remind you to make a date with us the next Thursday night. We're going to get mixed up in a strange affair about a photograph. We call it photo finish. Be on hand for the developing, will you? Thanks for listening and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you'll again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. (laughs) 
in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight you're going to meet some charming people. And you're going to run into a little bit of very fancy murder. The name of the story is Little Drops of Rain. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Did you know that there are over 50 million men in the United States who shave? Yes, that's a lot of men. It was in the interest of these 50 million shavers that Fitch Company chemists and technicians went to work in their laboratories and came up with Fitch's No Brush, a shaving cream especially designed to give a solid comfort shave. You see, Fitch's No Brush shaving cream contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients that work together to give you a smoother, faster shave. It also contains a special skin conditioner ingredient. Men appreciate this ingredient because it has a soothing effect on the skin the instant it's applied, and it keeps the skin feeling smooth and refreshed long after the shave is finished. Men also like the just-right consistency of Fitch's No Brush. It's neither too thick nor too thin. It's not greasy and won't clog the razor. If you're among those who prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives a rich, dense lather that wilts whiskers completely soft for a clean, fast shave. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in big 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try a jar. You'll find it easier on your razor and easier on you. Thank you, Jim. And now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. Still confined to my little cranked up downy couch in the hospital, but not as still as I was last week. I am now allowed to get up and totter around a little, and I use the word totter advisedly. My legs act like strangers who have different political beliefs, and my knees have suddenly developed sideway hinges. But my nurses, ah, my nurses, yes, they're beautiful and tender. And resistant. And speaking of nurses, nurses are girls, and girls are my favorite pastime. And that brings me up to the girl who has done the most to confuse my life. Liza. The girl I was so sincerely in love with a couple of months ago. Liza was in to see me. She just left, and we were talking about the time when I showed up at her apartment for a date. It was raining out, and... I was sitting at the piano, doodling around a little bit. I don't want to go to a nightclub tonight, Richard. I'm too tired. Let's just go to a show, shall we? Anything you say, baby. That's the kind of guy I am. I want to see two girls in a sailor. It's playing at the Rialto. June Allison's in that, isn't she? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's for me, then. You think so? Definitely. You think she's prettier than I am? Well, you're, you're not in pictures, Angel. Do you think she's prettier than I am? Well, well you're, a, you're a different type. Are you going to answer me? Oh, 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 oh if you're jealous. <laughs> How can you be jealous of a girl I don't even know? Give me a kiss. No. No, oh, but baby, I love you. I love you like anything. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Pop, then. I don't care. Mm, June is busting out all over, all over the meadow and the hill. Busts are busting out of bushes, and the robin river pushes every little wheel that wheels beside a mill. June is busting out all over. The feeling is getting so intense that the young Virginia creepers have been hugging the bejeepers 
Out of all the morning glories on the fence Because it's June June, June, June You're yeah. insufferable, Richard Rogue Oh, now quit potting Come on over here On the bench by me Are we going to a show or not? Sure Get your lipstick on again and we'll see what... Oh. I'll get it. No, I'll answer. It's probably George. Oh, George. Well, I'll tell him, that homewrecker. Hello. Is Mr. Rogue there? Mm, speaking. Uh, this is your call service, Mr. Rogue. We got a call for you. Oh, uh, oh. Who is it? Uh, uh, Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Says it's very important. Okay, put her on. Right. Oh, put her on. Who is... It? <laughs> Hello. Uh, Richard Rogue speaking. This is Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Yes? I must see you at once, Mr. Rogue. Oh, well, any time tomorrow, Mrs. I Burgess. I will see you tonight, immediately. It is most important. Well, can't you tell me about it over the phone? Oh, no. Could you come to my house at once? Uh, what's the address? 485 Hillcrest. You'll be well paid for your time. Please hurry. I'll be right out, Mrs. Burgess. Wait for me. I'll be right back, honey. Go on. Go on out to see Mrs. Burgess. Don't mind me, Dick Tracy. Well, what could I do? Mrs. Harvey Burgess was the wife of a tycoon with a dollar for every Democrat in Georgia. I tried to explain to Liza, but I was talking to myself and I left for the Burgess residence. <laughs> I left Liza burning like Mrs. O'Leary's barn. The Burgess Mansion was a huge colonial affair. George Washington could have slept there every night. He was at Valley Forge and never seen the same room twice. A butler who talked like he was choking to death on an olive pit conducted me into the library and uh, into the presence of Mrs. Harvey Burgess. Oh, my. What a presence. She was sitting in front of the open fire filling out a hostess gown that didn't straighten out any of the curves she featured. I pulled my eyes back into my head and tried not to look too interested. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I'm i in a bit of a hurry tonight, Mrs. Burgess. As a matter of fact, I... Mr. Rogue, I... my husband is making a fool of himself. Yes? He's lost his mind completely over his secretary in his office. His secretary. A girl by the name of Helen Stark. You, you mean that... Yes, I mean he prefers her company to mine. Well, that doesn't sound reasonable, if you'll pardon me for saying so. What do you want me to do? Somebody has to bring Harvey back to his senses, Mr. Rogue. Well, I'm afraid you've called on the wrong man. I'm not very good at long fatherly talks. Oh, and Mr. I... Rogue, please, I'm so alone. Hey, hey, now, wait a minute. Good grief. You mean to tell me that Harvey is neglecting you? What you need to straighten Harvey out is a psychiatrist, not a detective. Harvey is definitely off his trolley. Please help me, Mr. Rowe. No, 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 Mrs. Burgess. I, I... He's with her right this minute. How do you know? When he left the house tonight, I followed him. He went to the home of his best friend, Clarence Roman. I parked across the street. I was going in and faced them, but I saw Mr. Roman leave, and I lost my nerve. That's when I called you. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I want you to go out there and talk to Harvey. Tell him I know all about him and that Stark girl. And I'm suing him for divorce. Well, that's not my kind of work, Mrs. Burgess. I I'm Please. sorry, but that... I don't want a divorce, Harvey. But I do want him back. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if you will do as I say, he'll come back. You must do it for me, Mr. Rogue. Here, uh... oh, where is it? I have $500 here in an envelope. You did? Oh, wait a minute here. Let me see. Uh, oh, oh. Is this it? Yes. That's your fee. Hmm. For going out there with me, Mr. Rogan. Trying to bring Harvey back to his senses. You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Well, I, uh... You'll do it for me, won't you, Mr. Rogue? Okay. Come along. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems there's nobody home. There's my husband's convertible out in front, right where he left it tonight when I followed him out here. How did the girl arrive? In her car. Oh. 
Her car isn't here. It was right behind Harvey's. Looks like we got here too late, doesn't it? Try the door. I know Harvey's still here. All right. You're an old friend of Roman's, I suppose. Yes. Why? Uh, I just want to know before I try to open the door. You see, there are laws against that sort of thing. Hmm. Door's unlocked. Do we go in? Yes. Okay. After you. You know the house better than I do. Go ahead. All right. The living room is over here. Well, nobody home. Look, Mrs. Burgess, we better get out of here. No. I know Harvey's in this house someplace, and I'm going to find him. I can't... What are you sniffing for? Wait a minute. That smell in the air. You get it? What? Oh. I don't smell anything. You don't? I smell chloroform. Chloroform? Yeah. You take a look upstairs. I'm going to shake down the first floor. That smell of chloroform can mean trouble, you know. Mr. Roke, what do you mean? You're frightening me. Mrs. Burgess was very fetching when she was frightened. But I calmed her down a little bit. Now, this may sound fantastic, but I've got a little bell in my head that rings an alarm every time I really get around serious trouble. And it was playing a tune that sounded too much like a death march right that minute. I had to get her out of the way. She finally went upstairs, and I went to work. I took the living room first and looked behind all the couches and in all the dark corners. I was bending over, looking under a huge Italian carved table when I thought I heard a stealthy footstep behind me. Ah. Don't move. Oh! My ears were still full of that ringing scream Mrs. Burgess had let out as I caught that sock behind the ear and drifted gently through space toward cloud number eight and my alter ego, Hugo. I was hoping he wouldn't be there, but he was. Sitting there with that silly smirk on his face with his little short legs pulled up under his chin and his funny little arms around them and his long white beard waving the cosmic breeze. Oh, shut up. <laughs> That's a fine attitude. You go prowling around a strange house and get caught at it and knocked out. Then you come up here and take it out on me. <laughs> get out of here, you ingrate. Oh, stop acting like a landlord, Hugo. What happened to me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Tell me, why did Mrs. Burgess scream? Answer me, Hugo. Do you know why she screamed? You going to tell me? <laughs> no. Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're a detective. Oh, someday I'm going to get rid of you, you little pest. <laughs> Why don't you get back to work? You got a date with Liza, you know. She's still waiting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, here goes. <laughs> Come on, Rogue. Please, come on. You didn't have to hit him so hard, Clarence. <coughs> oh, who hit me? I'm Clarence Roman, Rogue. I came home. I found the front door unlocked. I walked in. I saw a strange man prowling around my parlor. A woman screamed, and I hit you with my cane. Oh, well, what do you carry for a cane? A ball bat? Why did you scream, Mrs. Burgess? I found my husband. Upstairs. He's dead. Murdered. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to say something to the ladies. Do you ever feel like hanging your head in shame because your hair isn't, uh, well, looking as nice as it should? Perhaps you get discouraged because every time you shampoo your hair, it seems dry and difficult to set. Then for your next shampoo, why not try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo? This clear golden liquid shampoo is made from mild coconut and vegetable oil. These pure natural oils keep your hair from becoming dry and brittle. When you use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo, you can have a shampoo as often as you like, and after each one, your hair will be soft and lustrous, 
easy to set into your favorite hairstyle. You'll love the glorious quantities of fragrant lather this shampoo makes. It cleanses thoroughly and then rinses out completely without a special after rinse. You see, Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. All you do is rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent contained in the shampoo ensures the removal of all particles from your hair, making it sparkle with cleanliness. Ask for Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. Well, I had accepted a case for Mrs. Harvey Burgess, a suspicious wife. Yes, that's the Mrs. Harvey Burgess of the Burgess Millions. She suspected her husband of having a rendezvous with Helen Stark, his secretary, at the home of Clarence Roman, Burgess's best friend, and we went out there together. Nobody answered the door, so we went in. My suspicions were aroused when I smelled the unmistakable odor of chloroform. Mrs. Burgess was looking around upstairs while I searched the downstairs. Suddenly, I heard Mrs. Burgess scream. Ah! My husband! Upstairs, he's dead! Murdered! Well, that snapped me out of it. I got to my feet and ran up the stairs. Mrs. Burgess and Roma were right behind me, and she directed me into the library, which was just off the main hall. And there he was. As dead as last summer's romance, with a neat little blue hole right below the part in his hair. He was a nice-looking old guy, about 50, which made him a good 25 years older than his wife. And his widow was really taking his death big, which was natural. A woman doesn't have a husband murdered every day. Poor Harvey, this is horrible. Has anything in this room been moved or touched? Well, I just arrived home, when I When I looked wouldn't... in here and saw Harvey, I knew he was dead. I screamed. Yes, yes, I heard you. Then you ran right downstairs. Yes, huh? uh, I saw Mr. Roman hit you, and I ran down to tell him who you were. And... That's a little late. Okay. Just don't touch anything. Stay right there in the door, both of you. Just who are you to be giving us orders? You'll find out. You ever see this gun before? Yes. Where? It was Harvey's. He kept it in his desk at the office. Oh, you recognize it mighty quickly. How? It has his initials on it. I can see them from here, inset in the butt of the gun. Oh, his gun, huh? Yeah. Well, it wasn't suicide. Not with the gun clear over here on the opposite side of the room. This is murder. <laughs> hey, what's the matter? Well, this ought to do it. What is it? What's well, a handkerchief. <laughs> a very nice linen handkerchief with initials in the corner. And blood on it. What initials? H.S. Helen Stark. That's her handkerchief. She killed Harvey. She killed my Harvey. Is there a phone upstairs here? Yes. You'll find an extension in the hall. Thanks. Come on out of this room. I don't want anything touched or moved. Now, now. Dear, please. You two wait for me downstairs. I'll be down just a minute. As soon as I call the police. Urban speaking. Hello, Urban. Richard Rogue. Yeah, who's dead? Harvey Burgess, wise guy. Hmm? You mean it? You mixed up in another murder, Rogie? Sure. You'd never find a body if it wasn't for me. Where are you? At the residence of Clarence Roman on Cypress Avenue, 2120. Better get the boys and get out here. Be right there. Got any leads on the killer? Uh, a couple of vague ideas. Stay there until I get there, Rogue. Oh, uh, hello, Liza, darling. This is Rogie. Oh, you know what time it is. Oh, sure, honey, I'll give you I... ten minutes to get back here and take me to that show. What? Oh. Uh, look, Roman. Roman, the cops will be here in a minute. Tell Urban, that's Lieutenant Urban, he'll be in charge for the police, that I'll be right back, will you? Tell him I went out to get a murderess for him. Of course. And I hope you manage to catch her, Rogue. Yes? 
Yes? Good evening. Is uh, Helen Stark at home? I, I I beg your pardon. I'm I'm a bit deaf. I I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, I said, is Helen Stark at home? Oh, oh, Helen? Uh, no, no, she isn't home this evening. Has she been home? I say, has she been home in the last hour? Uh, no, no, she hasn't. I, I don't know what time to expect her either. But I imagine she'll be home soon, though. You know where she is? Uh, well, she didn't come home from the office tonight. She's she's working late. Oh. She called you and told you she wouldn't be home? Uh, yes, yes. She said she was going to work with Mr. Burgess. That's her boss, you know, the, the millionaire. Yes, sir. Uh... Well, thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I tell her who called? No, no, no. That, uh, that won't be necessary. Thanks. Hmm? Thanks very much, Mr. Stark. I, uh, oh, uh, you and Helen live here all alone? Uh, yes, yes. Since her mother died several years ago. Uh, are you an old friend of Helen's? No. A very recent acquaintance. Oh. I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Stark. Good night. Good evening. Nice out after the rain, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Good night. Good night. Oh, that nice little old guy. It was going to be tough for him to realize that his daughter was a killer. I hated the world as I walked down the steps from that porch and started for my car. I, uh... Oh... I don't like murder. It upsets so many people who aren't involved in the act, or the reasons for it. Yeah, I guess I'm a chicken-hearted Patsy. But if I am, I'm glad. Anyway, I was walking down the walk when that little bell rang in my massive intellect again. I noticed something. Something peculiar. There were tire tracks running into the stock garage. It had only stopped raining about 45 minutes before, and if that car had been driven into the garage while it was still raining, there would be no tracks. They would have been washed away. Now, it's very peculiar. I ran up the driveway and opened the overhead garage door. Then I jumped back. The garage was full of carbon monoxide. I wet my handkerchief in a puddle of rainwater, held it over my nose, and ran into the garage. I wrestled the door of the small coupe open and saw a young girl, unconscious, slumped over the steering wheel. I pulled her out of there. She was dead weight and carried her into the house. Oh, Helen. Helen. I'm afraid it's a little late for that, Mr. Stark. Where's your telephone? In the hall. Right in the hall. Thanks. I'll get a pole motor squad out here right away. Get a pole motor squad to 640 Inglewood Drive. Attempted suicide. Bad shape. Rush it. Right. Uh, uh, uh. Raymond, Ramsey, Redding, Roman. Roman, Clarence. Hello? Hello. Lieutenant Urban, please. This is Richard Rogan. It's important. This is Urban speaking, Rogue. I thought I told you to stay here. Look, never mind the argument. Get out here to 640 Inglewood Drive. I've got Helen Stark for you. You have? Nice work. I want to talk to that young lady. Well, you missed the boat. I think she's dead. Suicide. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Step on it. Okay, Rogie, I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't go away. <laughs> I gave Helen Stark my own interpretation of artificial respiration until the pole motor squad got there. Urban arrived on the heels of the fire department, and we went out and looked around in the garage. Made some fascinating discoveries, too. The car had run out of gas and stopped turning over, for one thing. And one thing led to another, to coin a phrase. Anyway, Urban and I made a little deal. I went back to the Roman residence, and while he and his boys were being scientific, I sat in the parlor and talked with Mrs. Burgess and Clarence Roman. Mrs. Burgess had recovered her poise to some extent. 
They were both very anxious to know all about my daring capture of the Stark girl. I'm glad she's dead. I couldn't stand a trial. I'm glad she committed suicide. Yes, I, I guess it seemed like the only way out. She wasn't very smart about murder, leaving clues all over the place the way she did. <laughs> Even the cops would have had her in 24 hours. How well did you know the Stark girl, Roman? Rather well. I'd see her on the office a great deal. Harvey was, well, not very discreet about the fact that he was fond of her. Please, Clarence. Harvey's dead. We should forget those things. He was a good husband. I, I don't know what life's going to be like without him. I just have an idea that it's going to be pretty simple, Mrs. Burgess. And possibly rather short. What do you mean? I mean that the police suspected you and Mr. Roman murdered your husband and Miss Stark. That's a serious accusation, Rude. Your husband was suing you for divorce, wasn't he, Mrs. Burgess? He knew you were going to be there with Mr. Roman, his best friend tonight. So he came and surprised you with Helen Stark for a witness, didn't he? And you, Mr. Roman, you killed him and then you had to kill Helen Stark to shut her up. This is preposterous. Ah, uh, sit down, Roman. You were right, Rogie. We found Roman's fingerprints on the steering wheel of Helen Stark's car. One of the boys just got back with a report that Roman's shoe is a perfect fit in that shoe print outside Stark's garage. I had nothing to do with it. Clarence killed Harvey and then he chloroformed that Stark girl and then... You're in this as far as I am. Shut up! I've got more news for you, Roman. Helen Stark isn't dead. The car ran out of gas just in time. She'll be there to appear against you when you're tried for murder. <laughs> Liza, honey. I'm... I don't want to talk to you, Richard Rogue. I'm busy. Oh, now, honey. The lady says she's busy. Yeah? Who are you? His name is George. Good night, chump. <laughs> ah, little drops of rain. The stuff we're getting so much of out here in California right now saved Helen Stark's life. Because if I hadn't noticed those tire tracks, she would have stayed in the garage until it was too late for the pole motor squad to save her. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Little drops of rain put the curse on what was almost a perfect double murder. With the help of my massive intellect, there's only one thing I can't understand. How come a guy as smart as I am gets hit on the head so often? Answer me that, will you? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. How did you like our little story tonight? Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Oh, uh, don't forget to tune in next Thursday night. We're going to present a strange story of a house where everybody was scared. We call it the House of Fear. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, Barber, or Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Folks, when we see a wounded veteran, we can thank him with our eyes and with a smile. We can also thank him in more material ways, like helping make sure he gets all the benefits of the G.I. Bill of Rights. That takes money. The money we lend when we buy victory bonds. Buy victory bonds.
The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cup that got me through the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. The Swede would rather shoot you than not. Rogue speaking. That little scene takes me back to a night a couple of months ago. The night I met some scared people in a seaside mansion. In just a minute, I'm going to tell you the story of the House of Fear. But first, here's Jim Doyle. Just talking about a grand product like Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream isn't really enough. We can tell you what a cool, solid comfort shave it gives, but you won't really know what this comfort is until you use Fitch's No Brush. The very instant you spread this rich, smooth cream on your face, you can tell the difference. You see, it contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that immediately lubricates your skin. Even men with super-sensitive skin find that the skin conditioner ingredient keeps their faces from feeling irritated. Then, when you start to shave, you'll find how easily your razor glides along, even against the grain of a tough beard. After you've finished... Your face will feel cool and refreshed, and you'll know what we mean when we say Fitch's No Brush gives a solid comfort shave. You men who prefer a lather cream will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives an abundant, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. It doesn't become dry and make your face feel parched and uncomfortable. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try it for real shaving comfort. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to go on with my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. Remember that scene you just heard? Well, one day a couple of months ago, I was in my office playing a bit of gin rummy with Herb Heidi, the bookie from the cigar store in the lobby, when Mr. J. McDonald called from the Great Western Insurance Company. I knew what he wanted. I'd read the morning papers. I hated to leave the game because uh, I was winning for some reason, known only to Herb Heidi who plays cards with all the warm human abandon of an adding machine. But I have learned to love a cash case like a bookie loves a losing horse, and uh, Great Western Insurance is a good client. So I picked up my $2.35 winnings and made tracks for the plush offices of Mr. J. McDonald. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. I have a case I want to discuss with you. Well, thank you. Uh, what's on the fire, Mr. McDonald? I suppose you read of the theft of the Somaliland diamond from the home of James E. Lee? Oh, sure, sure. Last night during a party given by his granddaughter, Sandra Lee. That much I know. The Great Western had that diamond covered, Mr. Rogue. It was insured for $50,000. $50,000. No kidding. Mm, well, that's a lot of money. Must have been some diamond. We're offering $5,000 reward for the recovery of the stone. It's one of the largest in existence. Well, uh, bring me up to date a little, will you? It was a slip crane job, wasn't it? The papers used his name. That's right. Three members of the family identified him from Rogue's Gallery Pictures. There's no doubt that he was the man. He had an accomplice, but we have no line on him at all. And all you want me to do is pinch Crane and get the uh, Somaliland diamond back, right? Yes. Mm. Crane left the Lee mansion in a yellow convertible sedan, which the police found wrecked between the Lee estate and Los Angeles. There was blood on the seat, and it's thought that either Crane or his accomplice was wounded. They believe to be here in the Los Angeles area. Huh? They haven't made any attempt to run the police blockade. 
Okay, Mr. McDonald, if he's here in this town, I'll have him. And that's all the information I have for you, Rogue. I've had our auditor make you out a check for $1,000. Oh? That's your retainer. Oh. And, of course, if you do manage to recover the diamond, there will be another $4,000 due you. Oh, oh, uh-huh. Thanks. And here are your credentials, identifying you as our investigator. And now, Mr. Uh, Rogue... remember, I'm not promising anything. Oh, yes, there is one more thing. The Lee family has been extremely uncooperative today. Extremely so. They practically refuse to talk with either the newspapers or the police. Well, how do you figure that? I mean, uh, what do you suppose is their angle? That is what we are paying you to discover, Mr. Rogue. It was about five in the afternoon when I took off the Lee mansion which was a show place up the coast about 20 miles. Old Man Lee is, uh, is an eccentric millionaire. His picture is always in the Rodegavir section with his two granddaughters, Sandra and Virginia, who live with him. A heavy fog billowed in about 10 minutes before I reached the Lee house, and though I drove the rest of the way by ear. And by the time I pulled up at the house, my windshield was colored like the side of a battleship and was just about as easy to see through. So I parked in the circular driveway and ran up on the huge front porch. Yes? Richard Rogue, uh, I want to see Mr. Lee, please. I'm sorry, Monsieur Lee is not in. Hmm. Well, then I'd like to see Miss Sandra Lee, then. I'm sorry, Miss Sandra is not in. Oh? Huh? Well, I'll just take a look. Oh, no, no, you cannot come in. Oh, you could be wrong, dear. There. Mm-hmm. I'm in. Who is it, Marie? This man is trying to force his way in, Monsieur Lee. Oh, good evening, Mr. Lee. I hope you remember me. Richard Robe? Oh, the detective. Of course. Thank you very much, Marie. Come into the study, Mr. Rogue. I, uh, hope you don't think I'm a heathen walking in here like this, Mr. Lee. It's my business, you know. I, I had to see you. Oh, I suppose so. It's about that darn Somaliland diamond. I tell you, Mr. Rogue, we've just been pestered to death all day long about that robbery. I finally had to tell the police and the newspaper people to go away and let me alone. Well, I, I don't like to be a pest, but... Uh, oh, we have another guest, Sandra, my dear. The detective, Richard Rogue. Mr. Rogue, I'd like you to meet my granddaughter, Sandra Lee. We've met, Grant. And, Mr. Rogue, I'd like to introduce you to John Wood. He's a house guest. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Wood. Thank you. I suppose you're here to question us about the Somaliland and Diamond. Well, that's, uh, that's my job, Miss Lee. I suppose it is. Now, now, Sandra, please... Oh, my goodness. Oh, Graham, stop fidgeting. We're terribly tired of talking about the robbery, Mr. Rogue. We've talked to the police and reporters by the dozens, and, well, there's just not anything left to say. Now, you must understand, Rogue, that Mr. Lee has been driven to the verge of a breakdown by this affair. Can't you give your information from the police? No, no, I can't. You know, I can see why you're tired of explaining what happened, but I'm in a little different position than the newspaper boys. I represent the insurance company, and... They had that diamond covered for $50,000, and naturally, they're quite interested in knowing the facts of the case. I assure you, Mr. Rogue, that I have no intention of filing a claim against the insurance company. Oh? No intention at all. I just don't want to hear any more about the diamond or the robbery. But, Mr. Lee... Oh, please, it? Mr. Rogue. It's Graham's own business if he wants to take the loss, isn't it? Well, yes, yeah, I suppose it is, but it's a little unusual. And I don't think he should make any such decision under the present circumstances. It's easy to see that you're all upset and jittery, but... Uh, and with good I... reason, really, Mr. Rogue. Mr. Lee has not been well. Couldn't you talk with him tomorrow? No. I'm, uh... I'm sure you won't mind, Mr. Lee, if I have a chair here in front of the fireplace. It's... No. Well, that's a terrible night out. Had a tough drive the last few miles. Fog is awful. Yes, I have noticed that the fog is in a little heavier than usual tonight. It's depressing, isn't it? Fog on top of everything else. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I'm so upset. Maybe you'd better start back to town, Mr. Rogue. It'll be slow going in this fog. What's the matter with you, Miss Lee? You're not the hysterical type. Will you please leave, Mr. Rogue? No. I'm an investigator, and I've got a job to do. I'd be a lousy investigator if I didn't try to get to the bottom of this situation. Who are you protecting? What are you afraid of? Are you accusing us of complicity in the disappearance of that diamond? I don't even know you, Mr. Wood. I'm talking to the Lees. I'm not accusing them of anything. Look, Mr. Lee... Crime is my business. I know how to deal with crime and criminals. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind, Mr. Lee? I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. But as far as I and, and my family are concerned, the theft of the Somaliland diamond is a closed matter. I have my reasons now. Please go. Yes, you, 
You can't do any good staying here. Where's your other granddaughter, Mr. Lee? Where's Virginia? She's returned to her school in the city. Oh, I see. Oh, Grant, please, Mr. Lee. Now, now, dear. I'm sure Mr. Rogue will be going. Did you ring, monsieur? Yes, Marie. Will you please show Mr. Rogue to the door? Okay, okay, okay. But uh, if you ever feel like you need any help in whatever it is that's forcing you to act like this, Mr. Lee, call me, will you? I'll be waiting for your call. Yes. Yes, I will. I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. Good night. Good night. Good night, Miss Lee and Mr. Wood. Good night. Good night. This way, monsieur. Monsieur Rogue, you are the detective? Yes, that's right. There are strange things going on in this house, Monsieur Rogue. There is much trouble. Ah? Uh, can you tell me about it, Marie? Well, I... Marie! Uh, yes, Monsieur Wood? Mr. Lee wants to see you in the library. Good night, Mr. Rogue. As I got in my car and sneaked down the hill through the fog, I told myself I was wasting my time. That I was looking for a man named Slip Crane, the jewel thief. And that I had no business getting mixed up in the family affairs of the Lees. <clears throat> there was a filling station and general store at the spot where the highway joined the private road that led up to the Lee estate. Sam's filling station for you and your car. I stopped in there for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Great night to be driving around, mister. Yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, uh, give me a slice of that pumpkin pie, will you? Why, sure. Here you are. Just came down the hill from the Lee house, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, sir, there was plenty of excitement around here last night. Yep, cops all over the place. Newspaper men. Best business have done in years. The whole district is still full of cops. They've thrown up a roadblock in every direction. Hey, you policeman? After a fashion. You working on the case? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have been some diamond. Mm. You know, those Lees are nice people. The old man's a little fidgety, but the rest of them are swell people. Well, he's all right, too. Yes, sir, nice guy. You know them? Know them? Why, sure know them. Known them all for years. The kids, Sandra, Virginia, been eating my hamburgers ever since they was old enough to toddle down here. Yeah? You know what school Virginia goes to up in the city? Why, sure. Same one Sandra used to go to. Hmm. Uh, let me see, uh, Mrs. Whipple School. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, uh, what's the toll charge to call the city? Uh, two bits for the first three minutes. There's a phone booth right over there. Thank you. Yes, sir, those little Lee girls are the soul of the earth. I've known them for ten years, I guess. Knew their daddy well, too. Went to school with him. He's a colonel now, an eagle colonel in Washington. A big shot. Hello, operator. Please get me Briargate 63645 in the city. Mrs. Whipple, school for girls. Hattie Smith on duty. Oh, hello. I, uh, I would like to speak with Virginia Lee, please. Miss Lee? Why, I'm sure she isn't here. She's at her grandfather's home up the coast. Oh, she is? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Uh, just a minute. Miss Lee is home, isn't she? Yes, Miss Lee is not expected back until Monday morning. Thank you. Get your party? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, give me another cup of coffee, will you, Sam? Why, sure. Oh, uh, tell me, Sam, uh, I know the whole Lee family except Virginia. She's only about 14, isn't she? Jenny? Oh, no. No, she's 19 or 20. Mm. 20, I think. She's a wild one, that youngster. She's all for having fun. Nothing at all like her sister, Sandra. Oh, oh. Well, I guess I'll be on my way. Can't sit here all night. Now, don't envy your drive, none. Better take it easy in that fog. It was all as plain as the nose on an anteater's face now. They told me Virginia was back at her school. She wasn't. Sam told me Virginia was a wild one. I knew Slip Crane. He was a smoothie. So, one and one makes two, and these two were Virginia Lee and Slip Crane. She'd run away with him. That's why the old man didn't want the case followed any further. That's why he was willing to take the loss rather than have the police arrest his daughter with Slip Crane. 
when they caught him for the theft of the Somaliland diamond. I got in my jalopy and drove back to the Lee estate. I wanted to have a talk with that maid, Marie. I parked at the turn in the driveway and walked through the fog toward the servant's cottage at the rear of the main house. I could see a halo of light back there pointing its fingers through the haze. I headed for it across the lawn. I heard a movement behind me and then... Oh. Oh, I caught my dream train for Cloud 8. And who was waiting for me there? It was my alter enemy, Yugor. What happened, Midget? <laughs> you got hit on the head. <laughs> As usual. No, who hit me? I didn't see them. <laughs> it's a wonder you've lived so long, Rogie. Dumb as you are. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It was the Dane that hit me, wasn't it? <laughs> was it? I remember the perfume. I remember getting a sniff of it just as you let me have it. <laughs> That's you, Chief. When you should have been ducky. <laughs> oh, my head. Oh, you'd think I'd get used to this, but I, I don't, do I? <laughs> you know, Rogie, you haven't time to talk with me tonight. Get back downstairs. <laughs> oh, just let me rest a while, will you? Oh, can't. Over the side with you. <laughs> please, don't push me, please. I'm tired. Over you go. Come on. You got some trouble to straighten up down there. Over you go, over the side. Look out, look out. Oh, here I go again. <laughs> I began to come to. I could hear voices fading in and out. I couldn't focus my mind's eye on them, but I listened without quite knowing what it was all about. Oh, oh, Mr. Rogue. Please, please, wake up. Sandra, don't move. I see you and I have you covered. All right. I'm not moving, Mr. Wood. What are you doing? Who's that lying there? It's Richard Rogue, the detective. Oh? Rogue, huh? What happened to him? I... I knocked him out with this poker. I thought it was you. You followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Really? How interesting. Instead of that, you fixed it, so I'll have to kill Richard Rogue. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that one of Hollywood's foremost hairstylists remarked recently that most women do not shampoo their hair often enough. She pointed out that movie stars' hair is frequently shampooed every day because they know that beautiful hair must be kept sparkling clean at all times. Now, you're probably thinking, isn't it hard on hair to wash it so often? Doesn't it become dry and difficult to manage? The answer is no. Not if you use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Thousands of women in the United States and Canada have found they can wash their hair as often as they like with this shampoo, and their hair is always soft, lustrous, and easy to set. Fitch's saponified shampoo does not dry the hair because it's made from mild coconut and vegetable oils. These pure natural oils are kind to your hair. It makes swirls of rich, fragrant lather that rinses out completely, for Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. Just rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent goes to work to remove all remaining particles from your hair, leaving it soft and full of natural highlights. You can get a generous six-ounce bottle of Fitch's saponified shampoo for 50 cents, and the economical 16-ounce size for one dollar. Use it often to keep your hair shining and lovely. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. I was telling you about the time the Somaliland diamond was stolen from the home of wealthy old gem collector James E. Lee. The insurance company put me on the case, and I went out to Lee's secluded country mansion, but uh, got no place. He wouldn't even talk to me about the robbery. I left, uh, picked up a few more clues, and returned. I was walking across the lawn in a pea soup fog when I was knocked unconscious by Sandra Lee, the old man's granddaughter. And when I returned to consciousness, I... 
I played possum and listened to the conversation between Sandra and uh, John Wood, a mysterious house guest of the Lees. So you followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Instead of that, you fixed it so I have to kill Rogue. Do you think that would be smart? He doesn't know anything. No? Come on, help me carry him into the house. There's a certain permanence about being killed that made me act deader than a ghost town on Monday night. I was as limp as a wet sock when they picked me up and carried me into the house. Wood, uh, who was a very strange house guest, lifted the rod out of my shoulder holster before they laid me out on a divan in the study. Old Mr. Lee was very upset when he saw me. He, he immediately started patting my hands while Wood poured some very good brandy down my throat. I was in no hurry to face facts, but eventually I figured that one more sip of brandy would be overdoing it, so I snapped out of it. He's coming out of it. Oh, mm. oh what happened to me? Oh, my head. Oh, dear, I knew something like this would happen. Oh. I hit you. I didn't know who you were. You should know better than to be caught prowling around the lawn up here after what happened last night. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you're right. What did you hit me with? A poker. Oh, Sandra. I don't know what your father would say. What were you doing on the lawn at this time of night, Rogue? You're lucky you didn't get shot, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I am. Oh, well, I, I didn't think of that. Uh, could I have another drink of that brandy? It makes me forget my headache. Of course, Mr. Rogue. Uh. Here you are. Ah, uh, thanks, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's uh, strong. And You know, Mr. Lee, I, I came back to tell you... Uh, I've got the deal figured. What do you mean? I mean, well, Mr. Lee, you told me that your other granddaughter, Virginia, had gone gone back to her school. Yes. I called Mrs. Whipple's school and found out she wasn't due back until Monday. Yes? Oh, you called the school? She wasn't there? That's right. So right away, I knew why you were so anxious to get me to drop the case today. You've got it all figured out, haven't you, Rogue? Sure. I'm right, aren't I? Virginia, your granddaughter, eloped with a thief. That's right, isn't it, Mr. Lee? I, uh... Guess we might as well admit it to you, Rogue. Nothing else we can do. Is there, Mr. Lee? No, I, I guess not. Now, that's not for publication, you know, Rogue. We'll make it worth your while to forget it. Won't we, Mr. Lee? Why, of course. If you say so, Mr. Wood, I it, mean... It, uh, it'll cost you. Uh, I'm not in business for my health. For a thousand bucks, I forget what I know. That will be satisfactory. <laughs> You're something of a louse, aren't you, Rogue? <laughs> something. You can call me a louse if you'll give me that grand... You got that much in the house, Mr. Lee? I believe I have, in the safe. You want me to get it for you, Gramps? We might as well get Mr. Rogue paid off and out of here. Now, that's the kind of talk I like to hear. Yes, Sandra. Will you get it for me, dear? So that's what you came back for. The shakedown. <laughs> you private dicks are all alike. For the first time since I'd been carried into the house, Wood was loosening up. My attempt at a shakedown had sold him on the fact that I was just a chiseler. And I could see the hand he had on that gun in his coat pocket relax a little. That brandy had given me a transfusion and I was feeling all of my faculties falling back into place. I was tense as the east ring on a hyphet's fiddle. and just as ready to play when I saw Sandra sneak in the door and grab up that poker she'd used so effectively on me. I figured it was my move. So I started to get up. I wanted to get Wood concentrating on me. Oh, you know, uh, you know, I have, I think I've got a concussion. My, my head is spinning like a top. Look, uh, is his skin broken, Wood? I don't know and I don't care. Well, you can look, can't you? Come here. Better take it easy, Rogue. You're in no shape to make any sudden moves. No, I, I just want to see if I can sit up. That's all now. Look out! Take it, Sandra. I've got his gun arm. Let go of that. Ooh. Oh, nice work, Sandra. Get his gun? Sure. He's got one of mine, too, that I want back. Sandra, how could you dare with Virginia? I had to do it, Graham. Give me a belt, will you, Mr. Lee? I want to use it to tie up this character's legs. He's one of the men who stole my diamond. He was with that crane man. They worked together. Here, I, I'm, a, I'm still a little confused. Sandra. Yes? Give me a handkerchief, will you? I want to gag our friend. Incidentally... I was conscious when you explained to him that you knocked me silly by mistake. Please, we must get to Virginia. Poor Virginia. We will, Gramps, we will. Just leave it to us. Where is Virginia? She's upstairs with Crane holding five this morning. What? Well, here, here. 
Fill it in a little. What happened? These men came back here last I'll night, Mr. Uh, you mean Crane and Wood robbed you and then came back here and hid out after they wrecked their car and couldn't get through the police blockade? Yes. Crane was wounded. They waited until the police were gone about five this morning, then they came in. Hmm. They kidnapped Virginia and held her in a room. Crane stayed with her, and Wood made us introduce him to the police and newspaper men all morning. Okay. House guest. Okay, okay. Now, this guy's all taken care of. Let's go get Crane. Where is he? He's in one of the front suites, upstairs. In a room that has windows out onto the porch? Yes, um, the first window at this end of the porch. All right, now listen. In exactly five minutes, you knock on the door to that room, right? This sounds dangerous. I shinned up the pillar at the far end of the porch, looked my rod over to see that it was in good working order, and... Then I inched over to the window of the room where Crane was holding Virginia. Virginia was tied in a chair. Crane was babying a bloody shoulder. I could hear them talking. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cop that got me in the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. This thing would rather shoot you than not. Drop that gun, Crane. My next shot goes right through your back collar button. Well, he dropped it. And that's about the end of the story, except that I took the uh, Somaliland diamond from him and won the five grand reward, which I, uh, which I spent on Sandra Lee during the next few months. I thought some of asking her to marry me. And believe me, I, I think she was all in the mood to give me the nod. No, no, really, really. But I thought better of it and stayed single, making me one of those select eligible young men who has never made the same mistake once. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Did you uh, miss the murder in tonight's story, or do you think we can get along without one once in a while? Ray Buffum wrote tonight's yarn. Leith Stevens composed, composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed but don't forget to tune in again next Thursday night. We're going to present an exciting story about a horse, a jockey, and a murder. We call it Last Race. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Uh, oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station... When you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug and toilet goods counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery.
This chisel's got you all fouled up in a murder, baby. You'll fry for it. Senor Oak, I don't know anything about a murder. Tippy killed him. He killed Max. Conchita knows nothing about it. Stop being chumps, will you? You're both in this with me. You help me frame Rogue for it. With Max and Khan, I'm the biggest operator in town. All we have to do is kill Rogue and we got the world by the tail. You'll all go to the chair for it. You can't get away with killing me. I'm going to kill you, Rogue, right now. If you've got anything to say, say it, because here it comes, fall guy. <laughs> Rogue speaking. This afternoon, I found a little case in my crime gallery that brought back memories. You just heard a little of it. Enough to know that I was framed for murder. I call the story Little Old Lady, and I'll tell you all about it in just a minute. But first, here's Jim Doyle, who's going to tell you men how to get a fast, clean shave without having to scrape and slave. You bet I am, Dick. Men, the simple, sure way to a comfortable shave is Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. The instant you apply this grand cream to your face, the three important shaving ingredients contained in it go to work. They smooth down the flaky top layer of skin and soften up the beard. This makes it easy for your razor to cut whiskers close and clean without nicking or scraping. Among the important ingredients in Fitch's No Brush is a special skin conditioner. This conditioner gently lubricates your skin, protecting it from irritation and burning. After your shave... It gives your skin a cool, refreshed feeling that will linger for hours. For those who prefer a lather cream, there's Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives a swell, hurry-up lather that stays moist and washes off quickly and easily. It, too, contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive skin. Ask for either Fitch's Brush or No Brush Shaving Cream. But for a solid comfort shave, be sure it's Fitch, spelled F-I-T-C-H. Thank you, Jim. And now I'd like to go on with my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was looking at the world through azure-colored glasses that afternoon. I was as low as a centipede's hangnail and just about as irritated. A couple of lush cases I'd been working on had blown up without paying off, and the girl I was madly in love with that week was madly in love with some other guy. I needed some money, I needed a vacation, and I needed a new love interest. When the door to my office opened and then walked a Latin-type panic who made my heart beat in a rumba rhythm that would have made Cougat sound like Spike Jones? I just sat there trading my blue thoughts in on a lot of purple ones while she closed the door behind her and walked toward me. You are Richard Rogue, the detective? The celebrated detective, yes. What can I do for you? I need your help, Senor Rogue. Okay. What's your name? Conchita Morales. Oh, oh, the singer, huh? That's right. I'm in trouble, Senor Rogue. You know, I sort of suspected that was why you came to see me. What's your difficulty? Well, it's hard to explain, but there is a man in this town who is threatening me. Well, that's not hard to explain. You're the sort of girl who is liable to be threatened. What do you mean by that, Senor Roque? Well, that you, uh, you are beautiful and extremely desirable and, uh... Well, pardon me, Miss Morales. I shouldn't have said that. I'm just in a kind of an impolite mood today, I guess. Then you don't really think I am... Beautiful or desirable? Hmm. Don't let that glassy look in my eyes fool you, can see, huh? I can see, and what I see pleases me, if you go for understatements. Then you will help me. You know, beauty's a wonderful thing, Mexican type, but so is money. My time's for sale. I have money. I will give you $250 if you will help me. What do you want me to do? I want you to get some letters back for me. Oh, why? Because I write them when I'm very young and foolish to a man I think I love. I do not love him. I hate him. I want to marry someone else. That man I love, but I cannot because of this letter. Oh, here, here. Slow it down to a gallop, Conchita. I'm getting a little confused. Who has the letters? Frank Maxon is his name. He's no good. He is a... a what you call a poor loser. Uh-huh. And who is this man you love at the moment? Tippy Tyler. We will be married soon. Oh, 
You will be married, so... <clears throat> well, in that case, let's make this strictly business. What do you want me to do? I'm having dinner with Frank tonight at the Club Cooper. I want you to meet us there. I want you to tell him he must give me back my letters. If he knows that I have employed you to help me, he will give them up. He is without courage. I don't see how I ever think I was in love with him. Frank is considered quite a ladies' man, or was, before you went up on that income tax wrap a couple of years ago. I understand the boys in his mob are giving him a little trouble since he got out. Uh, where's that 250 you mentioned a while ago? He, it is here. Just a moment. Mm, that's a retainer. If the case gets tough, it's going to cost you plenty more, Conchita. You know that? I do not care. I must have these letters. Here is $250. Thank you. And now, what time do I meet you at the Club Cuba? Be there at nine. And I'm warning you, Mr. Rogue. Come prepared for trouble. Hello, Senor Og. You are late. Sorry, I was held up in traffic. Oh, hello, Frank. Well, what are you doing here, Rog? <laughs> Conchita invited me. Sit down, please. Thank you. What is this, a surprise party on me, Conchita? Mr. Rog is working for me, Frank. Yep. I came down to help Conchita recover some letters from you. How about it? Nice of you to be interested, Rogue, but Conchita and I can take care of our own affairs without any outside assistance. Goodbye, Rogue. No, I like it here. Where are the letters, Frank? You bore me, Mr. Rogue. I wish you'd leave. Make him give them to you, Richard Rogue. I want those letters, Frank. You ever hear of blackmail? I'm not blackmailing anybody. Those letters are mine. They came to me through the mail. If I want to keep them, I will. But you're threatening me with them. That is illegal, isn't it, Mr. Rogue? Sure. It's especially illegal for a guy who's out on parole. Who's going to call the cops in on this deal? You can cheat it? Mr. Rogue will handle it for me. Look, sweetheart, it's no go. See? You and I just have to work this out our own way. Hit him, Mr. Rogue. Kill him. No, 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 no. There are ways of handling petty larceny pasties or pasties like Frank that you never heard of, Conchita. Look, Frank, you know you've got two strikes against you. Are you going to play ball with me? Conchita's mine and she's going to stay that way, Rogue. She's not getting away from me with your help or any other way. Well, I've asked you two or three times to get out of here, Rogue. Are you leaving? No. I'm sorry about this. I always liked you, Rogue. Oh, Smitty. Yes, Mr. Maxon? Will you ask the boys to throw Mr. Rogue out, please? If thugs lay a hand on me, I'll break your neck, Maxon. We'll see. Throw him out, boys. It occurred to me, as I hit the sidewalk with the back of my head, among other things, that Frank owned a piece of the Club Cuba, and that it was a bad place to start a beef with him. I got up, piece by piece, counted my arms and legs, and waited a while for Conchita to come out. She didn't. So I felt in my pocket for that 250. It was there. I went home. The next morning, I went to the office and tried all forenoon to get in touch with my Latin-type client at her swank apartment hotel. The Mayflower couldn't locate her. I had a late lunch, and when I got back to the office about three, there was a little old lady waiting there for me. A lovely little old lady, with rosy cheeks and twinkling eyes, with a lot of laugh crinkles in the corners of them. Mr. Rogue? That's right. You waiting to see me? Oh, yes, I was. I've been waiting for quite a while, Mr. Rogue. I just had to see you. Oh, I'll have a chair. <laughs> Don't tell me you're in trouble. No. Oh, yes, Mr. Rogue, I am. I'm in trouble because my son is... Oh? Tell me about it. Well, there isn't really very much to tell, Mr. Rogue. I know so little about what Norman has been doing. He's always been a little wild, but... A few weeks ago, he quit his job. And he's had much more money than he ever had before. I know that he's been doing something wrong, Mr. Rogue. Well, now, Mrs... Uh... Mrs. Stam. Well, Mrs. Stam, have you tried talking with him? And, I uh... haven't told you the worst yet, Mr. Rogue. No? Last night he came home for the first time in ten days. 
Oh, I've just been worried to death about him, and, and when he came in last night, he was so pale, and I tried to talk with him, but he went right to his room. Yeah? He called me after a while, and I went in to see him, and, oh, Mr. Rogie had been shot through the shoulder. He was bleeding badly. Oh, oh, I see. I asked him to let me call a doctor, and he wouldn't. I know that he'd been shot while he was breaking some law. I took care of him as well as I could, and I think he's going to be all right. I want you to come and talk with Norman tonight, Mr. Rogue. Well, Mrs. Stam, I, I'm working on another case oh, right if now. you just come out and talk with him, you could advise him what to do. He won't pay any attention to me, and I have to get him straightened out, Mr. Rogue. I have a little money, and... Uh, where do you live? In the southwest part of town, at 2673 Spring Lane. Would you come out with me and, and talk with Norman? I'll pay you for your time, Mr. Rogue. Um, I'll go with you, Mrs. Stan. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's perfect, all right. But please don't plan on me performing any miracles. If your son was shot during a robbery, he's going to have to go to jail. You know that, don't you? Oh, yes, I know. I only want him to do what's right, Mr. Rogue. I don't want him to do anything foolish. No, of course you don't. You have a car? No, well, uh, I... Well, have... we'll take mine. Come on. Uh... Well, you certainly have plenty of privacy out here, Mrs. Sam. Yes, it's lonesome. But my husband bought it many years ago. He thought then that it would build up out here, but it hasn't. Did your son know you were coming in to see me? Oh, no. I didn't tell him. He's right here in the front bedroom, Mr. Rogue. Oh, please try to understand Norman, Mr. Rogue. He's a very sensitive boy. Oh, all right. I'll take it easy with him. the bed with blood on the sheets where a man's shoulder would have been lying. There was no note. No sign of the wounded boy I'd made the trip to see. The little old lady was almost hysterical. I finally got her calmed down. She made some tea, offered me a cup. I should never have gone away and left him. I should have known better. He was frightened, Mr. Rowe. Now, now, drink your tea, Mrs. Stam. Don't cry. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything for you. We'll find him. You will help me, won't you, Mr. Rowe? Oh, of course. Please drink your tea. Don't you like it? Mm. Uh, I love it, yes. It's, uh, well, it, it is a little, uh, a little bitter. I... It's a special kind my oldest boy sent me from China. Well, it, uh, uh mm. Oh, I'm f feeling a little woozy. You are? Well, that's right. That's the way it should be. I... You... You, you poison me, you... That's right, Mr. Rogue. I did. My body dissolved before it hit the floor... And a warm breeze wafted me upwards, gently, like a spark out of a chimney. I was drowsy and happy when I hit cloud number eight. I was at peace with the world until I heard that nail-file laugh of my alter Ugor. <laughs> well, Rogie, that little old lady kind of put you away, didn't she? Oh, shut up. Let me sleep, midget. Why? Oh, there must be some reason why Mrs. Stam, if that's her name, gave you those knockout drops. <laughs> Look at you, knocked out by lavender and old Mickey's. <laughs> Bright boy. Why do you suppose she did it, Pest? Oh, I don't know, but you'd better find out. You're in a jam, Rogie. Oh, I'll bet that Conchita dame fits in here someplace. <laughs> 
Bogey. Okay. Don't push you, Gore. You're my friend. Going down. Going down. Next stop, planet Earth. Last car just leaving. Cut it out. Well, look out. Oh. Oh, here I go again. <laughs> Goodbye, Rogie. <laughs> Two in my car. My gun was gone. I I looked for my money. It was still there. I looked at my watch. It was 9.30. I drove to my office, opened the door, and stopped dead in my tracks. There was a dead man lying there in the middle of the floor. He'd been shot at close range through the head. My gun was lying a foot from the body. The gun that had been stolen from me while I was knocked out. I closed the door and leaned up against the wall to think. I was still leaning there when the door opened. Hello, Rogue. Who's your friend? Oh, uh, hello. Hello, Lieutenant Urban. What are you doing here? I got a call telling me you just killed a man. Yeah? Well, that's Frank Maxson, that defunct character there. Your gun? Yeah. Uh, looks to me like we're going to have to hold you, Rogue. For murder. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, we'd like to remind you that in Marie Antoinette's time, hairdressers stood on ladders in order to dress towering hairstyles. Today, the trend in hair fashions is simplicity, a style that requires shining, immaculately clean hair. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is ideal to keep your hair looking its loveliest at all times. Made from pure vegetable and coconut oils, it protects the hair from drying and becoming harsh no matter how often you shampoo it. Just a little, Fitch's saponified shampoo makes swirls of cleansing, fragrant lather that whisk away every bit of dust and dirt. And the special patented rinsing agent contained in the shampoo ensures the removal of all lather and other particles from the hair so you won't have to bother with additional after-rinses. For a shampoo that assures praise-winning results every time, use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo. You can have a professional application at your beauty or barber shop, or ask for an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. Six full ounces, 50 cents. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Dick Powell, as Richard Rogue, is telling our story. What started out to be a very quiet day brought Conchita Morales, the Mexican singer, to my office. She wanted to get some letters back from, uh, from a Frank Maxson. I went with her to meet Maxson in a cafe, and we had a brawl in front of plenty of witnesses. And after I made a few threats, I got thrown out. Next morning, I tried to find Conchita and couldn't. That afternoon, a little old lady came to my office, told me her son Norman Stam had been wounded in a holdup, and I went with her to her home. When we got there, her son was gone. I drank a cup of tea, which was sweetened with knockout drops, and, oh, I woke up in my car, drove to my office, and walked in to find Maxson, the man I'd threatened, shot to death with my gun. While I was standing there wondering what to do next, Lieutenant Urban of Homicide walked in. Uh, looks like we're going to have to hold you, Rogue, for murder. Oh, I didn't kill him. You threatened him in a cafe last night. Plenty of people heard you. Uh, where do you get all your information? The little bird that told me he was dead, that you'd killed him. Oh, but I just got here. I I've been gone since about 3.30 this afternoon. Yeah? Maxon looks like he's been dead since about seven. Where were you at seven? Well, uh, an old lady came in here this afternoon to see me, and I went out to her home with her. You you mean you've got an alibi? Well, I, I don't know. What do you mean I... you don't know? You either got one or you haven't. Well, I, I went out to see this woman's son. He wasn't there when we got there. So you I... came back here and killed Maxon. Look, Rogue. Somebody phoned Maxon at six o'clock and told him to be here at your office at seven. How do you know so much? We've been on the case since 7.30, Rogie. Looks like he went a little too far this time. Look, Urban. Look, uh, Urban, I was doped. I've been out of the picture since about 5.30. 
And while I was out, somebody lifted my gun. Rogie, oh. just put yourself in my place. I find a guy you threatened to kill dead in your office, shot with your gun. Yeah. Then instead of an alibi, you give me a fairy story about wicked old witches and knockout drops. Where does this old lady live? This one that kidnapped you. Out southwest on Spring Lane. Let's go out there and talk to her, Urban. Okay? Okay, Rogie. We'll just ride in the squad car. Just in case, eh? Lights on. There's nobody home. I think we'll go in, Rogie. As long as you say there's a wounded man in here, I don't have to have a warrant. Try the door. Oh. Well, it's unlocked. Come on. Turn on the lights. Well, they don't go on. You got your flashlight? Yeah. Look, Rogie. The furniture's all covered. Hmm. There's nobody living in this house. Uh, Urban, come over this way. Let's look in this bedroom. Are you sure you're all right, Rogie? Sure. Come on, over here. Well? Well, there's not even any furniture in this room. That's right. But but there was a bed with, with blood-stained sheets. I'm what? sorry, Rogie. They seem to have disappeared with the old lady and your alibi. This house hasn't been lived in for months. Why'd you kill him, Rogie? Look, Urban, you know me better than to think I'd pull a dumb rub out like that in my office. Yeah, but there are no fingerprints on that gun but yours, Rogie. And he was killed in your office, and you don't have an alibi. What am I supposed to do? I'm a cop. I've got to believe the evidence. Oh, sure, I can see it that way. Well, I... I've been framed by an expert. Have any ideas? Some vague ones. Well... I'm going to pull up here and get some cigars in that cigar store. If you're not here when I get back, uh, I'll expect you at headquarters in an hour. Thanks, Urban. Good luck, Rogie. Well, hello, Murphy. How's my favorite house detective? Oh, hello, Rogue. What are you doing here at the Mayflower, huh? I want to talk with one of your guests, Flatfoot. <laughs> do you owe me any favors? Mm, maybe. What do you want me to do? Give me the pass key to Conchita Morales' apartment. <laughs> do you want me walking the streets? Ah, oh, now, just give me the pass key. And if you hear any shooting, come up. What's the deal, Rogue? Mm, a little murder. Is she in, do you know? Oh, Conchita isn't in. The, uh, the old lady's up there, though. The old lady? Look, Murphy, what old lady? I'm looking for an old lady. Huh? Oh, you mean Conchita's mother. Yeah, she's... Conchita's uh... mother? Hey, a little old lady about this high? Eyes with lots of laughs in them? Yeah. White hair, plump? That Conchita's mother? Sure it is. Her name's Shay. So is Conchita's. Huh? Her real name's Ellen Shay. Uh -huh. She's no Mexican dame. No kidding. Hey, give me your rod and a pass key. No, don't get up. Please, Mrs. Shea. Hmm. Just keep your seat. Oh, Mr. Rogue. Yeah, surprised to see me? Yes, I am. A little. I can understand that, Mrs. Shea. You figured me for a murder rap, didn't you? Please don't point that gun at me. For some reason or the other, Mrs. Shea, I, I don't trust you. No. Oh. Where's Conchita, or whatever your daughter's name is, that Latin from Manhattan, that phony Mexican... I won't have you talking that way about my daughter. What do you expect me to call her? After the tour, you framed me for murder. Murder? Who said that before? What do you mean? Are you going to drop that act? Murder, I said. And murder's what you frame me for. Now, sit down. Where's Conchita? I'm expecting her any moment. Drop that gun, Rogue. Oh, Tippy, where have you been? I've been waiting for you to come in. He keeps talking about a murder. I said drop that gun, Rogue. And why should I drop the gun? Because if you don't, I'm going to pull the trigger on this one. 
And it's resting at the back of your neck. Come on, drop it. Ah, now, where did you come from? I was in the kitchen mixing myself a drink, fortunately. Hmm. Tippy Tyler, huh? I suppose you're the man Conchita's in love with at the moment. That's right. They're going to be married, Mr. Rogue. In the death house, I hope. (laughs) It's wishful thinking, Rogue. The two of you killed Frank Maxson, didn't you? Killed him? Killed Mr. Maxson? (gasps) Oh. No, no, Rogue. You did, according to the cops and all the evidence. You were Frank's right-hand man before he went up, weren't you, Tippy? Mm-hmm. He kind of took over while he was gone. Go on, talk, Rogue. I'm just figuring out what I'm going to do with you. Oh, Conchita. Hello, Mama. What are you doing here, Senor Rogue? He's making things difficult, Angel. I just dropped in for a little chat about a house out on Spring Lane and a wounded man who wasn't there and a murdered man in my office. That's all. It's a very nice job of framing me, Conchita, Ella, and Shay. And you can drop that broken-down accent. Okay, Mr. Rogue, smart guy. What happened? Who was murdered? Well, you ought to know. You helped the plan it. I did not. I don't know what you're talking about. I've been arranging things for us, Conchita. Frank Maxson is dead. Your mother helped arrange it. I didn't know what I was doing, Conchita. Honest, I didn't know. That's a lie, and you know it. You and your daughter end this thing too far to get out now unless you smart up fast. There's too much talk going on in here. Maxson's dead. He was found dead in Rogue's office, shot with Rogue's gun. Rogue's as good as burned for it. Mama, did you kill him? No, no, I didn't, Conchita. Look, sweetheart, everybody heard Rogue threaten Maxson last night. It was our chance to get rid of him. Conchita, listen to me. This chiseler's got you all fouled up in a murder, baby. You'll fry for it. I don't know anything about a murder. If he killed him, he killed Maxson. My Conchita knows nothing about it. Stop being chumps, will you? You're both in this with me. You help me frame Rogue for it. Maxson gone, I'm the biggest operator in town. All we have to do is kill Rogue and we've got the world by the tail. You'll all go to the chair for it. You can't get away with killing me. I'm going to kill you, Rogue, right now. If you've got anything to say, say it. Because here it comes, fall guy. The little old lady picked up my gun and let Tippy have it right between the eyes. He never knew what hit him. The house dick came charging in and she told him the whole story. Tippy on that house she took me to... He framed it with the old lady to get me out of the way, giving her some cock and bull story about wanting to search my apartment. She pleaded guilty to giving me the knockout drops, but denied knowing that he was framing me for murder. And as long as she saved my life and gave me an alibi for the time of the murder, I, uh, I believed her. The judge let her off with a suspended sentence at my request. Conchita was... Conchita was very grateful to me. And when Conchita, she was grateful, oh, the angel, she sing. <laughs> oh, brother. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Don't I meet some lovely people in these stories? They love murder like Richard Rogue loves money, and it makes a very happy combination. Ray Buffum wrote the story, Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget, you've got a date with us all next Thursday night. We've got a story for you about blackmail, intrigue, and sudden death. We call it Eve and the Apple. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilets good counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery.
Fogg speaking. Well, I was suffering one of my regular attacks of rigor indolence last year when I decided to commune with nature in a gentle sort of a way. So I made a reservation at the L7 Dude Ranch out in the desert. The afternoon I arrived at the ranch, I was lolling around the swimming pool, exposing my epidermis to the sun and admiring the scenery, when part of the scenery walked up and took a poke at another part of the scenery over some of the most beautiful scenery I've ever seen in or out of a white satin bathing suit. The poker was a paunchy 45, the pokey a very slick 30. And the cause of it all was a lovely, lovely 25, blonde and definitely feminine. I stayed out of it. Come on, Marty. I've told you for the last time, Harding, I want you to stay away from my wife. Brian, please, you've been drinking. This is no place to settle your quarrel with Tom. I'm just as sick of you as you are of me, Mills, and so's Anne. You're no good to anybody. Tom, don't. Not here. Tom, if you don't stay away from my wife, I'll kill you, oh, Harding. please. Come on, Brian. Let's get out of here, please. Tom, I'll see you later. This is the last time I'm going to warn you, Harding. If you don't stay away from oh, me, I'll... shut up. You're drunk again. Talking, that's all. You're not going to kill anybody. I'll see you later, Anne. Come on, Brian. Let's go now. Would you mind talking to me? I'm a little embarrassed. Oh, hello. Why don't you just look the other way? That's what I'm doing. Maybe it's because I want to see Tom Hardy and get what's coming to him. You don't like Mr. Hardy? Well, no. He considers himself the world's most attractive man. Well, that's silly. I'm the world's most attractive man. Uh, how nice. I'm the world's most attractive woman. Well, how about a couple we'd make? You like to know my name? I know you. You're Richard Rogue. Been reading my mail. No, but you're a very famous person. I've seen your picture in the paper lots of times. Society page, of course. Mm, was it? I don't remember. Well, that's thoughtful of you. What's your name? Lucia Logan. Should I know it? Mm, not unless you're looking for a secretary. That's what I am. Like to ride? Love it. Some of my best friends are horses. You're lucky. Some of my best friends are skunks. Want to go for an early morning ride with me tomorrow? Mm, tomorrow we greet the dawn on horseback and, uh... Yeah? I'll wear a coat to keep me warm, Richard. You know, Lucia, darling, this scene uh, brings out the Gene Autry in me. Yes, sir. If I had my guitar, I'd sing for you. So help me. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie. <laughs> yeah, this is for me, baby. Yep, someday I'm going to save enough money to buy me a ranch out here, and then I'm through with the crowded city. Yep. Me for the wide open spaces. With my dogs and my horses and... And a pretty little partner to cook and sow. And, and milk uh... the cows and throw down the hay at the horses' stalls. Uh, and... I'm not listening anymore. Oh? What's ever happened to the pioneer woman? Richard, look. Hmm? Where? Over there, where I'm pointing. There's a man lying there. Huh? Yeah. Come on. He's hurt. Must have been thrown from his horse or something. Yeah. I can't hang on, Richard. Well, take it easy then. Oh, boy. Whoa, whoa. Settle down. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Oh, no. This couldn't happen to me. Who is it, Richard? It's Tom Harding, baby. Stay on your horse. Is he unconscious? No. He's been shot. He's dead. I'll be back in a moment to tell you the rest of the story of Blood on the Sand, but first here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company, who's going to give you men a shaving tip you can't afford to skip. That's right, Dick. I want to tip you men off to the grandest, smoothest shave you've had in a long time. It's the kind of shave you can have all the time when you use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. You see, Fitch's No Brush contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients. These three ingredients are blended together in a smooth, rich cream that lubricates your face instantly and prepares it for the shave. Your razor will fairly sail along over those whiskers, cutting them close and clean without nicking or scraping. It's easier on your face, easier on your razor blades, too. When you've finished, your face will have a cool, refreshed feeling that lingers for hours. No fooling, fellas, for a really solid comfort shave... Switch to Fitch. Men who say there's nothing like lather to give a smooth, swell shave will find Fitch's brush cream as tops. It gives a rich lather that stays moist longer, rinses off easier. Next time, make it Fitch's shave cream. Either brush or no brush type. Two handy economical sizes, 25 and 50 cents. 
And now here's Dick Powell again as Private Detective Richard Rogue. As I was saying, before Jim Doyle put in that pitch for Fitch, when the great outdoors called me down to the L7 Dude Ranch on the desert for a two-week vacation, I didn't expect to meet a dream girl like Lucia Logan. And I didn't expect to hear a writer, Brian Mills, threaten to kill his friend, Tom Harding, if he didn't stay away from his wife, Anne. And I didn't expect to make a discovery which Lucia and I made on a sunrise horseback ride the next morning. We were just riding along, enjoying the dawn, when we saw the body of a man lying on the floor of the desert. I reached the body first. Who is it, Richard? It's Tom Harding, baby. Stay on your horse. Is he unconscious? No, no. He's been shot. He's dead. Oh, Richard. He was murdered and there's no gun here. Oh, why do things like this always happen to me? Oh, Richard. Let's get back to the ranch. I'm scared. There's nothing to be scared of. The guy's dead. But whoever shot him might still be around here, Richard. Whoever shot him never was around here, baby. There's not a footprint in sight. And he was shot from long range, if I'm any good at my business. But it's just getting light. You remember last night, baby? Remember the moonlight? It didn't even take good shooting to kill this guy. Come in. Hello, Rogue. Oh, hi. Uh, You're Sheriff Kane, I take it, from the badge. That's right. I just got back from looking at that body you found for me this morning. Well, he was shot with a thirty-two twenty rifle. A deer gun. No kidding. Ah. Have you figured out where the killer was when he did the shooting? My boys are checking. You, uh, going to help me out on this case, Rogue? I'm on a vacation. I well, don't... I can use any help you want to give me. I'll swear you in as a deputy. No, no, no. No thanks, Kane. Believe me, I want no part of it. I'm up here for a rest, and I'm going to have it. Well, let me know if you change your mind. I sure will. Oh, by the way, any ideas on who would want to kill Hardy? I just got here yesterday afternoon. I don't know anything about the guy. But you heard his life threatened yesterday at the swimming pool, didn't you? Oh, you know about that, huh? Mm-hmm. I just wanted to know how much you weren't going to cooperate, Rogue. Well, I knew somebody would tell you. Now, just leave me out of it, Kane. I pass. Well, sorry. I'll see you later, Rogue. you mind if I sit here with you for dinner, Richard? Well, hello. I've been looking for you, Luscious Lucia. Have a chair. You've been avoiding me. I've been avoiding everybody. I'm on a vacation. I don't want to get mixed up in that murder. You know, everybody thinks Mr. Mills did it. What do you mean, everybody thinks so? Well, I think so. He threatened to kill Tom. You heard him. Well, how about Mrs. Mills? She was having trouble with Harding, too, wasn't she? Yes, but I still think it was that drunken husband of hers. Oh, well, you do, huh? Yeah. You want a tip from me, baby? What? Don't be going around having hunches about murders, and if you have them, shut up about them. Stay out of it. Well, the sheriff won't let anybody leave the ranch. You came here for a week, didn't you? How about a ride in the morning? We didn't get very far with that one this morning, did we? <laughs> Mr. Rogue? Yeah? Oh, hello, Mills. Could I see you for a moment, Mr. Rogue? Well, I'd like to eat my dinner if they ever serve it. Oh, perhaps later. Huh? Well, what do you want to see me about, Mills? In your professional capacity, Mr. Rogue. I'm not in my professional capacity. Could I drop by your cabin later this evening? Oh, sure, if you can walk that far, I'll be there. Thank you. My goodness, you're popular. Just like being with a movie star. Uh, yeah, yeah. So how about that horseback ride in the morning? Want to try it again? Hmm, I'd love to. Such exciting things happen when I go for rides with you. Come in. Oh, hello, Mills. Come in. My wife is with me, Rogue. Huh? Oh. How do you do, Mrs. Mills? Hello. Oh, well, wait a minute. Huh? I'll get these bottles off the chair and we can all sit down. These cabins weren't built for entertaining large parties, were they? No. No, they weren't. Oh. Well, now that we're uh, all comfortable, Mills, 
What do you want to see me about? And the answer is no. Please, Mr. Rogue, you don't even know what Brian was going to say. You want me to get mixed up with the murder of Tom Harding, right? Yes, I do, Rogue. And I'm willing to pay you well for your time. I'm not interested. You see, this is the first vacation I've taken for about... Rogue, I'm being persecuted. That hick sheriff, he's, he's been hounding me. Sheriff Kane seems to be a pretty astute officer. Did you kill Harding Mills? No, he didn't. He was with me all that evening, all that night. I told the sheriff that. Brian was never out of my sight. My wife can give me a perfect alibi, Rogue. I'm not the sort of man who kills people, and I'm not going to be hounded by a country sheriff. Look, Mills, I'm sorry if you're being hounded, but I'm on a vacation, so I don't... You must protect my husband, Mr. Rogue. He's not a murderer. The sheriff suspects him because he and Harding had words yesterday. I heard the words. One of them was kill. You threatened to kill Harding, didn't you, Mills? He was annoying my wife. Why, nobody would have ever heard of him if it hadn't been for me. A writer. <laughs> Couldn't even write home for money. Harding was a horrible pest, Mr. Rogue. He wouldn't let me alone. Yeah, so I've heard. So, uh, just what was the relationship between the two of you and Tom Harding? Uh, he and I have been collaborating on plays for years. He, uh, he was engaged to Anne when I married her a year ago. Since then, he's been giving us nothing but trouble. I never loved him, but I couldn't convince him of that. And I know one thing. My husband didn't kill him. I'll give you $500 to work on this case for me, Rogue. What do you expect me to do? Find the real murderer. Protect me. Convince that stupid sheriff I couldn't have killed Harding. All right, give me the 500 You got it with you? Yeah. Yeah, I got it with me. Okay, now here's what I'll do. I'll try to locate the real murderer. Whether it's you or whoever it is. And when I find him, I'll turn him over to the sheriff. Understand? Yes. A rogue. I didn't kill Tom Harding. I don't know what it is about money that frays my moral fiber, but when the man handed me those nice, crisp hundred dollar bills, all my bad intentions about enjoying my vacation disappeared like friends when I'm broke. After Brian Mills and his glamorous wife left, I smoked a cigarette and turned in. I was going riding at dawn. And when I got to the stables next morning, Lucia wasn't there yet, but Mrs. Mills was. She was wearing a riding habit to which no horse nor man would ever say nay, and of all things, a pair of pigskin play shoes. Oh, very fetching and very peculiar. Oh, hello, Mr. Rogue. You off for a morning ride? Yes, I mentioned it last night. Remember? Did you? Oh, I guess you did. I was so upset about Brian's trouble with the sheriff. You, you are going to help him, aren't you, Mr. Rogue? He's such a sweetheart, and scandal would ruin him. Sure. Well, I took his money. I'm going to do what I can for him. Oh, I hope it's taught him a lesson. He has a terrible temper when he's drinking. He should never have caused that scene at the pool. You were the cause of that scene. What did Tom Harding have on you? Nothing. We used to be good friends, that's all. Oh, I see. You're not telling all you know, are you, Mrs. Mills? Mr. Rogue, I want you to promise me something. I'll listen. You said last night that if you found incriminating evidence on my husband, you'd turn it over to the authorities. Yeah, sure I will. Please, Mr. Rogue, I have some money of my own. I want you to promise me that you'll... You'll tell me first if you find anything which makes you suspicious of Brian. Hey, I don't get it. I thought he had an ironclad alibi. He has. And besides, Brian couldn't kill anybody. I want to do everything I can to protect him from worry and persecution. Look, I know how you feel, Mrs. Mills. If your husband isn't guilty, don't worry. We'll keep him out of it. Hi, Richard. Uh, oh, hello there, beautiful. You know Mrs. Mills? Mm, we've met. Oh. Our horses are all ready. I've been out helping to saddle them. Okay, let's go. I don't like this, Richard. Climbing mountains on horseback. What do you think of Mrs. Mills? I don't. There's a method my madness, baby. I'm a working man today. You are? Who are you working for? Secret. You've decided to get mixed up in that murder, haven't you? Yep, something nice happened to me. That's what we're doing here at the spot where we located that body. I was siding in on this pile of rocks. Are you being mysterious? No, not especially. Today I'm being a detective. You see, Angel, Harding was shot with a deer gun. Everybody knows that. I'm no detective and I know that. 
Okay, but do you know enough to figure out where the shot came from? By the way the body fell? I don't even care. I came out for a horseback ride, and I want to enjoy it. This is no fun, walking a horse up the side of a mountain. Well, we have it far to go. Just stay with me a little longer. And to think I turned down a date with that nice-looking blonde boy from San Francisco this morning. Oh, look, are you going to stop beefing? Oh, boy. Why are you oh. stopping, Richard? Oh, I just want to look around here a little bit. Oh, boy. What are you looking for? I'm prospecting for lead. Maybe with a copper jacket. Come on, we're walking from here. Oh, no. Come on, I... I want to take a look behind that big rock up there. I'm going to be so stiff, I won't be able to dance tonight. Good. We'll set them all out someplace near the punch bowl. Oh, no. I'm going to be with that blonde boy from San Francisco. And if you so much as ask me for a dance, I'll... Oh. What's the matter? Look. Look there on the ground behind that bowler. Where? Oh, those little copper things. They're, they're shells, aren't they? They certainly are. Three empty shells. Hmm. 3220s. Look out. Don't touch them. I want them for fingerprints. Do you think they're the shells that killed Tom Harding? Well, I'm willing to bet they are, baby. I think we just put the finger on a murderer. Richard? Yeah? Look down there. Where? Way over there on that next peak. The sun's flashing on something. Hmm? Oh. Oh, yeah, I, I see it. Hmm. Somebody is looking us over with a pair of field glasses, I think. Probably the murderer. He wouldn't like to see us looking around up here. What are you putting in your pocket? Another little souvenir. See? Oh. Get on, baby. Get on. That was a rifle bullet. Get on here behind this rock. Our story will continue in just a moment. But first, I'd like to remind you that the holiday season coming up will be the gayest in years, with peace on earth at last to reality. You ladies will undoubtedly want to keep in the spirit of things by accentuating your costumes and hairstyles with gay, sparkling jewelry so popular now. But remember, dull, drab-looking hair is not the kind of background you want for your jeweled hair accessories. Try using Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo to give your hair luster and a jewel-like sparkle. Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils, so it won't dry your hair. Even immediately after washing, your hair will be soft and shiny, easy to set into your favorite holiday hairstyle. Using Fitch's saponified shampoo will take only a few minutes from your busy day, too. Just a little shampoo makes mountains of fluffy, fragrant lather. And since Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, you won't have to bother with a special after-rinse. To keep your hair looking radiantly lovely at its holiday best, Use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. And now we return to Rogue's Gallery with Dick Powell as private detective Richard Rogue. My thoughts were as bitter as a quinine sandwich as I ducked down behind that boulder and listened to the bullets sing. With the whole world to get killed in, why did Tom Harding have to pick out a dude ranch where I was sweating on a vacation? I reached into my pocket where I'd put the empty rifle bullets. The killer had fired at Harding, and they were there. I felt in my back pocket, and the other clue I had found was safe. I tried to pull Lucia down beside me just as I heard another bullet sing. Lucia screamed, and my heart did a handspring in my throat. Hmm? Oh, I'm shocked. Hmm? Richard... Oh, why did I ever come with you? Where did you get it? Where did you get it? Let me see. Right here. In the shoulder. Well, well get your hand away from there. Oh, oh, you're not shot, youngster. You're not even bleeding. I'm not? Well, no. You must have just been hit with a chip of a rock or something, that's all. Now, come on. Let's get out of here. Stay low now. I'll go first. Oh, if I ever get back to that ranch alive, Richard Rogue, and if you ever speak to me again... Oh, take it easy, baby. This will be something to tell our grandchildren about. Uh, our grandchildren? Richard Rogue, I never want to see you again. We 
We got back to our horses and got back to the ranch house all right. I made Lucia promise not to say a word to anybody until I had a chance to think this thing out. She promised. She would have promised anything to get rid of me. I went to my cabin to look over the stuff I'd found up there behind that boulder, and as I opened the door to my cabin... Oh! Oh! Oh, I got it. Right behind the ear, as usual. I watched the stars go by for a while, and... Finally, I grabbed on the tail of a comet and didn't let go until I was within dumping distance of cloud number eight. And there he was. My alter enemy, Yugor. <laughs> You're a little late tonight, Rogi. Yeah, oh, oh, what happened? <laughs> Somebody wanted to know what you found up there on that mountain. You should have stuck to your vacation, Rogi. Uh, well, whoever it was, I... I'm going to have them over a barrel in a few minutes. Oh, i got to get back there. Help me. <laughs> oh, you better rest a while. I can't. So long, Midget. See you next week. So long, Rogie. <laughs> oh, hmm. Uh, well, I... I came to and felt my head. It was... Oh, it was really caved in. Whoever hit me used a piece of firewood. I looked in my pants pocket. The, the handkerchief I'd wrapped the empty cartridge in was gone. I grabbed it in my back pocket, and it was there. That other little clue I'd picked up there behind that boulder. I staggered to my feet, and and I, I headed for the main ranch house. I, I saw the sheriff's car outside. I... I wanted to talk with him. Rogue! Hey, hey, what's the matter? What's happened to you, man? Oh, nothing, nothing much. I Somebody just battered my brains out, that's all. Oh. Yeah, I I want to talk with you, though. Come on. Uh, sure. Well, I, I, I've been working on that murder for you. Oh, swell. Yeah, I, I was hired by one of the suspects. Not Mills. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the guy. Oh, he is guilty as the devil, Rogue. Uh, how do you figure? Motive. He had a double-barreled one. First, Harding had been making up to his wife. Second, Harding and Mills had drawn up partnership papers, providing that if either one of them died, the other would be sole owner of anything they were working on. Yeah? Sure. I've been checking on them through the L.A. police. They've got a play that every picture company is bidding for and every Broadway producer is interested in, a gold mine. Well, now that Harding's dead, the play is the sole property of Mills. <laughs> Those two motives good enough for you? Well, how about his alibi? His wife said he was never out of her sight. If that's true, he couldn't possibly have killed Harding. Well, I got a call from his wife telling me to meet her at their cabin at noon. That's going to be the end of that alibi, I think. She sounded nervous and scared. Uh, I'm going over there now. Uh, going with me? Sure. Yeah, I'll go. Oh, uh, I found the place where the killer waited for Harding to keep his date to be killed. Oh, you, you did, huh? Yeah, and I also found the casings from the bullets that killed him. Well, where are they? A any fingerprints? Uh, somebody just knocked my brains out and took them from me. Oh, uh, how long ago? Oh, it must have been a half an hour. Uh, that's what you get for not cooperating with me, Rogue. You've cost me... Uh, uh, uh... Hey, that came from the mill's cabin. Come on. Right here. Mills. I killed him. I killed my husband. Yeah. Yeah, you sure have. Hey, what, what happened? He had that rifle. He was going to kill me. Why was he going to kill you? Lock the door, Kane. Huh? Oh, yeah. Now look, Mrs. Mills. You'll have to get a hold of yourself. Why was your husband going to kill you? Because I knew I was going to tell the sheriff he wasn't with me last night. He was drinking. He took that rifle and left before Tom Harding was killed. I told him I couldn't go on lying. Oh, that's why you sent for me. You were going to break his alibi. Yes. He killed Tom. He was boasting about it to me. Oh, poor Brian. I loved him, but I couldn't. Oh, is that, uh, is that rifle there, thirty-two twenty, Sheriff? Mm-hmm. It's the murder gun, all right. Well... Looks like this case is all wrapped up, Rogue. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mills. Now, look, Sheriff, this case is all wrapped up all right, but not the way you think. Hmm? Mills never killed anybody. Why, well, what do you mean? I mean, 
Mrs. Mills missed something when she beat my brains out and took me down for those cartridges a while ago. Me? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you'd better have something to back that up, Rogue. If I haven't, I'll take the wrap. Look, Kane. You see those fancy ladies' cowboy boots over there in the corner? Yeah. Get away from them. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I got her. Bring those boots over here, Kane. Let go of me. Okay, Rogue. How about letting me in on it? Well, half the heel's gone off the left boot, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Let go of me. If you don't stand still, Mrs. Mills, I'm going to slug you. I've got that broken boot heel right here in my pocket, Kane, and I had a witness when I found it this afternoon. Up there behind that boulder where Mrs. Mills here waited for Tom Harding to keep his date with her and a couple of slugs from a 35th wedding. Well, that's the end of the story. Mrs. Mills didn't want her husband, and she didn't want her old boyfriend. She just wanted to own that play everybody was fighting for. So when her husband threatened her boyfriend, she went into action. She invited Tom Harding to a rendezvous on the desert and shot him to death. And then when her husband was suspected of the crime, she gave him an alibi. So she could kill him later and swear it was self-defense. She would have gotten away with it, too, if it hadn't have been for that half of boot heel. The minute I saw it lying there behind that boulder, I thought of her western riding habit that morning and the pigskin play shoes. That started my massive intellect to work, and... Uh, <laughs> Of course, when uh, that happened, that was all. I also remembered the faint odor of her expensive perfume just before that log knocked my brains out. And, uh, well, after the excitement was over and I had combed the lump out of my hair, I went over to see Luscious Lucia. Oh, you. Oh, hello, dear. I just thought I'd drop I over. told you I never wanted to see you again. Oh, well, she was a little on the chubby side anyway. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Believe me, Richard Rogue is the only man who ever made money on a dude ranch vacation. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our story. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget now, we all have got a date next Thursday night. We're going to do a little story about murder, arson, and a lovely lady. We call it Fortune and Furs. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Oh, uh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, uh, things were a little slow at the office, which is my way of saying I didn't have a client or a dime. And I was indulging in my favorite form of athletics. A fast game of snooker pool with Herb Heidi, the bookie at the deluxe pool hall. Heidi was born with a pool cue in one hand and a cue ball in the other, and I was born with an eight ball birthmark. He was trimming me like a Christmas tree, and I was glad when the elevator boy from my building yelled into the door that I had a customer in my office. So I shoved off to talk to this volunteer victim. When I opened the door to my office, I saw him standing there, a dignified-looking, white-haired gent. 
with a strong nose, a weak mouth, and the, the nice middle-class air of substantial citizenry. You're Mr. Rogue? That's Ryan. Do you want to talk business with me, Mr. Uh... Uh, Grant? George Grant, yes. Oh, well, have a chair, Mr. Grant. No, thank you. I prefer to stand. Mr. Rogue, I understand that you have connections with the fire insurance companies, that you are sometimes retained by them to investigate losses which might have been caused by arson. That's right. Go on. Are you interested in the fire at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse a week ago? I could be. That, uh, that fire was arson, Mr. Rogue. Mm-hmm. I can tell you some very interesting facts about it. Well, good, good. That was a pretty important claim, wasn't it? The fire destroyed over $100,000 worth of furs. Huh? Well, start talking, then. I, uh, I'd like to have $1,000 before I talk with you, Mr. Rogue. Well, I don't usually pay out that kind of money until I know what I'm buying. I'm not saying a word, sir, until I get $1,000. I've been double-crossed once on this deal, and I don't intend to take a chance on getting the same treatment from you. Just how much did you have to do with this torching, Grant? I don't intend to answer that question. Do I get my $1,000, Mr. Rogue? Well, uh, come back in an hour. You have the money for me then? Yeah, yeah, come back in an hour. And your story had better be good, Grant. I'm a busy man. I haven't time to fool around with crackpots. I'll have the proof. Okay. So long now. Oh, it's 4 o'clock, Grant. I'll see you at 5. On the dot, right? I'll be here. Flynn, say, uh, your outfit had the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire covered, didn't they? Who is this? This is Richard Rogue. Yes, yes, we had it. $160,000 claim. Well, fine. Uh, say, uh, would you pay me 10% of what I saved you on that claim if I could prove the fire was arson? $16,000? <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Save $16,000 and lose one hundred and sixty. I can afford it if you can. Wait a minute. How can you prove arson? Well, I've got a man. He wants to talk. He says he can prove arson. I believe him. I'll give you 10000 for a conviction. I'll take it. Look, send the $1,000 retainer over here, special messenger, right away. It's important. Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Hello, Flynn. Yes, where have you been, Rogue? Well, my source of information has just been eliminated. But the deal's on. What do you mean? Well, he must have known too much. He's been murdered. Well, as I was saying, I, uh... I was as broke as a New Year's resolution when I ran across proof... But the Matthews Fur Company warehouse fire was arson. I called Louis Flynn, who headed up the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company, and made a deal with him for ten grand if I could prove that the fire was of incendiary origin. And while I was talking with him, George Grant, my witness, was killed leaving the building. Well, I couldn't afford to lose a ten thousand dollar fee right then, so I took a fast distance to the home of the late George Grant. I knocked at the door. What do you want? I want to talk with you. You're George Grant's daughter? Yes. You're the police? Uh, yes. Come in. Thank you. I suppose you want to question me about my father's affairs. Yes, that's right. Come in here, please. I can't believe that Dad is dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Believe me. And if you'll help me, I'm sure we can find the people who murdered him. Sit down, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, Miss Grant, uh, what was your father's business? Oh, don't you know? He was warehouse manager for the Matthews Fur Company. He had been for years. Oh? Did he have any enemies that you know of? No. Dad wasn't the kind of a man who made enemies. He was... Well, he was sweet. Oh, I don't know. There'd been something wrong with him for the last couple of weeks. 
He wasn't himself. He was worried. And it was all that blonde's fault. Blonde? Yes, Bernice Maxwell. Dad became involved with her. And he was spending too much money on her. Much too much money. Oh, uh, how long ago did he meet this, uh, uh, Miss Maxwell? Oh, about a month ago, I guess. She deliberately chased him. She must have had some reason for it. Dad was no great catch. He... He was just a little guy working for a salary, trying to get along. Oh, you say he's been acting strangely. In what way? Could you break that down a little bit for me? I'll try. You see, for a while he was talking about how he was going to have a lot of money. All of a sudden, he was happy and carefree then. He was gone from home quite a bit. One night he had a meeting here with some rough-looking men. He wouldn't tell me who they were. Yes, go on. Then after the warehouse fire, he was depressed. And he... he talked about... He talked about killing himself. I knew he was in some awful trouble, but he wouldn't talk with me about it. He just kept calling Bernice Maxwell. She wouldn't answer the phone, even. Uh Oh, uh, did your father talk with you much about the fire? No. Mm. But I'm sure that that fire had something to do with his... his murder. I know it did. That Maxwell woman has something to do with it, too. Who do you suppose that is? I think I know. Oh, please don't go away. I don't want to talk to anybody else. If you stay here, maybe they'll, maybe they'll leave. Is this the residence of George Grant? Yes. Who are you? Lieutenant Urban, Homicide Squad. Oh. Won't you come in? Uh, hello, Urban. Rogue. What are you doing here? Isn't he a policeman? No. What are you doing here, Rogue? I'm working on a case. Do you know anything about a murder that took place outside your office an hour ago? A little? I see. What are you doing out here? Well, I'm working for a client. I've got a license to do that. You want to see it? If he isn't a policeman, who is he? He's a private investigator, which is a Harvard version of a gumshoe. His name is Rogue. Richard Rogue. It is? Well, he told me he was a policeman. I I, I wouldn't have let him in. Well, that's not very gracious of you, Miss Grant. Shut up. Miss Grant, did you give this man any information which you should have withheld for the police? Well, I don't know. He he kept asking me questions about... about my fault. I answered them. What do you know about a murder? That murder, Rogue? Who did it? I don't know. How did you get out here so fast? How did you know who the murdered man was? I don't have to answer that. Well, he'd been up to your office to see you, hadn't he? Daddy? Miss Grant, do you know whether or not your father planned on seeing a private investigator today? Well, I don't know. He he didn't tell me if he did. I'm getting a little fed up with your ethics, Rogue. Aren't you getting a little out of line, Irvin? You're withholding information. Can you prove it? This man was shot on his way out of your office. What was he talking to you about? Answer me. Did you see him talking to me? Oh, now let's not get technical. Let's do, let's do. You're going to take me down to the station and sweat me? Not if you'll be reasonable. I'm not going to be reasonable. So either pull out your cuffs or shut up. Oh, please. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Miss Grant. Believe me, I, I really want to help you. I'm going to take care of the people who are responsible for this murder. Even the cops can't keep you from doing that. Now, wait a minute, Rogue. I'm walking out of here, Urban. I'll see you later. When I deliver the killers to you so you can take a bow for the newspapers. Oh, I was burned like a bride's biscuits and feeling just as tough when I walked out of that house and passed Urban's squad car to my coupe. It didn't do my atomic temper any good when a pasty-faced gunman got out of the front seat of my car and pointed a pistol at me. Hello, Rogue. Get in. We're going places. Huh? Oh. Oh, okay, Junior. But be careful of that thing. It might go off. Where to, Junior? Straight down the street. I'll tell you when to turn. You had a visitor at your office this morning. How much talking did he do? Oh, you mean George Grant? You know who I mean. Well, he doesn't talk much. Why? Who wants to know? The boss. Hey, hey, look out where you're going, Rogue. Well, I'm not worried. I've got the wheel. Let's get this thing out of low, shall we? What are you trying to do, Rogue? Kill yourself? No, it makes me feel safer going this fast. Because you pull the trigger on that heater and you're just as dead as I am. Slow down, Rogue. Hey... Hey, that guy almost crashed us. What's the matter, bully boy? You yellow? 
I've got a tank full of gas, and this car will make over a hundred. You're going to kill us both. That's possible. As a matter of fact, it's probable. But you were going to take me for a ride anyway, weren't you? I got nothing to lose. Give me that gun. Hey, keep your hands on the wheel, Rogue. Hey, hey, give, cut it off. Give me that gun, punk. Come on. Get your hands on the wheel, Rogue. You're going to crash. Give me that gun, or I'll rip right into that wall ahead of us. You know me, kid. I mean it. Now, give me that gun. Would you let me go? No. Give it here. I'll look. Come on, hey. Hey. Well, I'll be. He's passed out. Hey. Hey. In the struggle for the gun, I twisted this torpedo's hand around and, well, he pulled the trigger himself with me a contributing factor. He shot himself through the chest, but it didn't look fatal to me. So I drove him to a hospital and left him there told them to call Urban. I used the hospital phone to check up on Bernice Maxwell and found that she was a sort of a notorious babe, ran an escort service, which was legitimate enough, but she's had a few sidelines, such as uh, blackmail. I got her home address out of the book and went out there. She lived in a nice enough house out on the east side of town. I rang the doorbell. Yes? Hello, Miss Maxwell. I'd like to talk with you for a moment, please. Who are you? Uh, let's talk about that inside, shall we? Well, what do you mean, forcing your way in here? I mean business, Blondie. And that's what we're going to talk. Now, let's go in the other room and have a chat. You just lead the way. After all, you are the hostess. If you don't get out of here, I'm going to call the police. Don't bother, baby. I'm the police. And I want to talk to you about a fire and a murder. So just get moving. Come on. Uh... Murder? Yes, yes, a murder. Doesn't the fire surprise you, too? Sit down. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you, anyway? That's beside the point. I want to know what you had to do with the murder of George Grant. You can talk now or later. I've got nothing but time. George Grant? He's dead? Yes, very. He was murdered about five minutes after four downtown on Grand Avenue. And I think you know who did it. I don't. I don't know anything about it. You never heard of him, huh? I... Knew him slightly. Oh, now, please, Miss Maxwell. You knew him better than slightly. You've been running around with him or giving him the runaround for the last month. You deliberately set a trap for him, didn't you? You mixed him up in that arson job on the Matthews Fur Company's warehouse. I don't know anything about arson. You can't come in here and threaten Oh, me. look, lady, I'm not going to be polite about this. George Grant has been murdered. You had a hand in that murder, and I'm going to get the information out of you if I have to beat it out of you. And if you think I'm bluffing, just keep on dumbing up. Now, who was mixed up on that arson job that Grant was killed for knowing too much about? Look, I'm going to count three. Then I'm going to come over there and slap the information out of you. Look. L l look. If I tell you what you want to know, will you fix it with the district attorney to let me turn state's evidence? It depends on how good your information is. You have nothing on me. Now, don't start that again. You almost had your mind made up to be smart. Don't double-cross yourself. Now, come on. Talk. I have everything you need right here in this desk. Well, now you're talking smart. Now, wise guy, get your hands up. Huh? Oh, no kidding. Now, look, Maxwell. This is nothing you can shoot your way out of, especially with a toy gun like that. Sit down. No. If I'm going to be shot, I want to be standing up when I get it. This is a silly piece of grandstanding, Barney. I'm going to take that gun away from you before you nerve yourself into pulling the trigger. Don't. Don't come another step. I'm telling you, if you do, I'll shoot. Now, you don't think one bullet from that little twenty-five is going to stop me, do you? It won't, Maxwell. I'll just keep right on coming, and I'll take it away from you. And I'll put you in the pen for the rest of your life for attempted murder. I'll be there anyway. If I don't get rid of you, I'll... Don't I... be a sucker now. Think of those thirteen steps to the death house. I'm coming after that gun, Maxwell. You... Take one more step and... Oh, I hated to slap that gun out of your hand, Blondie, but you didn't want to shoot me anyway, did you? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Now talk. Who's behind that arson deal? Who's the touch-off man? Hold the brain. I can't tell you. I can't. If I don't, they'll kill me. Come on. Come on. I haven't much sympathy for dames like you. You killed George Grant just as much as if you pulled the trigger on him. Now talk, baby. Talk, do you hear? I 
Hey, hey, Blondie, come out of it. Come on. Well, well, I'm a son of a gun. She passed out on me. Hey, Maxwell, come out of it now, will you? Come on. All right, Rogue. Just stay right where you are. Huh? What did you do to Bernice? Well, nothing. I... Did she talk? No, no, she didn't. That's good. How did you get here, Rogue? Well, I, I trolled. I... Oh, I, uh, I got rid of that little pasty puss gunman you sent after me. Where is he? He's been taken care of. That's funny. That's exactly what's going to happen to you, Richard. Stand still while I get this gun out of that shoulder holster. Okay, okay. You're in the driver's seat. You just couldn't ever learn to stay out of trouble, could you? Trouble's my business, Bob. Get up and keep your hands in the air. Oh, sure, sure. Well, if you're going to let me have it, this is as good a time as any, isn't it? Time's all right. But I don't like the place, that's all. I'm going to take you out in the country. Well, that's nice to think about. I love the country. You know I'm going to have to kill you, don't you? You know too much. Sure, sure. You couldn't stand a police investigation, could you, Bob? No. You know, you, uh, you should have covered me yourself when I left the Grant house. <laughs> you should never send a boy to do a man's work. No. Now, you're yellow too, aren't you? You haven't got the guts to pull a trigger yourself. You've got a lot of nerve. Talking that way when you're looking down the barrel of this gun, Richard? Yeah, you're a two for a nickel penny at it, ten horn, Frenchie. And I'm going to take that gun away from you and make you eat it. Yes? Well, I have plans for you, Richard. I'm going to bend this gun over your head first, and then I'm going to get rid of you. For good. You haven't got the guts. No. Turn around, Rogue. <laughs> well, I... I wasn't as bad as I sounded there, believe me. I'm I'm no hero, and, and usually when a guy has the drop on me, I, I obey orders like a corporal bucking for sergeant. But I didn't have much to lose, and... And for once, I wanted to be hit over the head. Oh, I got my wish and rolled with a blow. Those old familiar stars started to circulate around my indestructible cranium, and, and I started to black out. But I pulled myself back and hung on to consciousness. I didn't move after I fell. I, I didn't have to. You see, I, I fell with my left shoulder in the shadows, covering the automatic I'd slapped out of Bernice Maxwell's hand a little earlier. When I heard this character walk away from me, I, I got my right hand on the gun. He went over to where Bernice was, just coming around to this world again. I could hear him talking to her. Bernice. Bernice. Get away from me. Oh, oh it's you, Marcel. Where is he? Hog. He's on ice over there in the corner. You kill him? No, but I'm going to. I didn't want to do it here on your house. Drop that gun, Marcel. I'm taking over from here. What? Drop it! Marcel is over there by the piano! I was a little worried about my future as I stood there behind the cover of that piano and pumped lead at Marcel. But if I could get in a lucky shot, I, I knew I could put him away for the murder of George Grant and the arson job at the Matthews Fur Company warehouse. I'd hit him a couple of times, and his girl, Bernice Maxwell, was screaming at me to stop. But Marcel kept on trying to luck a shot into my anatomy. Stop shooting! He's hurt! Stop shooting! Don't move! Don't move! Either one of you! I still got plenty of lead here to stop you if you do. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you both over to the cops, baby. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, this guy will live to hang. Now, here. Here, tie him up. Use his necktie. Come on. He needs a doctor. Well, I'll call one as soon as he's secured. Come on, tie him tight now. He's bleeding to death. Shut up. Here now. Take my tie. Here, tie his feet tight. You're really tough, aren't you, Ralph? Yeah, when I'm mad, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Here's my gun, and here's the gun that's going to send your boyfriend to the chair. No. Now, you want to go with him, or do you want to tell me all about it? You mean I can still turn state's evidence? Were you mixed up in the murder? No. I don't know anything about that. You do about the arson deal, though, huh? Yes. Okay, baby. Now, start talking. Maybe I can get you a deal with the DA. 
I'll talk. I'll tell. I'll tell you everything. Well, she sang. Yeah, she sang plenty. And the words were music to my ears. When she was through singing, I tied her up tight and called Homicide to tell Urban where he could pick up a murderer and an accessory before the fact. Then I told him where I'd be later. I called Flynn at the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company and told him to meet me at the home of Paul Matthews, owner of the Matthews Fur Company, in ten minutes. He did, and we went in together. The butler sort of unwittingly showed us into the study where Matthews was reading. I'm Richard Rogue, Mr. Matthews. The investigator? The celebrated investigator, Mr. Matthews. This gentleman with me here is Mr. Flynn of the Fidelity Fire Insurance Company. How do you do? Well, I'm puzzled as to the purpose of your visit, gentlemen. Well, I'll unpuzzle you, Matthews. The fire at your fur warehouse was deliberate arson. Oh? Why, well, that's preposterous. It's a nice act, but no go. We're not paying the claim, Matthews. We have absolute evidence well, that... Let me tell you, that... Flynn. You made a deal with Marcel Jarnac, one of the West's leading arsonists, to start that blaze, Matthews. But you needed the loyalty of an old employee of yours, the manager of your warehouse, George Grant. Grant was an honest guy. So you and Marcel sicked a dame on him, a dame named Ber- Bernice Maxwell. Ah, uh, you convinced now that I know what I'm talking about? No. I tell you what... Okay, then I'll give you some more dope. With Grant's help, you took all of the expensive furs out of the warehouse and filled it up with a lot of junk. And then Grant sopped it all down to the gasoline and touched it off. So you want the insurance on $160,000 worth of minks and sables for burning $1,000 worth of cat skin. It was a swindle, Matthews. We're not paying the claim. The cops have the Maxwell woman, Marcel Jarnack, and the pasty-faced gunman who worked with them. They've all talked. You're through. That's the police now, the homicide squad. Show the man, will you, Flynn? Sure. Looks like the end of the road for me, doesn't it, Mr. Rogue? Yeah, yeah, it sure does, Matthews. You know, amateurs like you shouldn't go around uh, mixing up with professional crooks. That's right. Hey, hey, cut it out. Drop that gun. Matthews, hey. Here. Uh, hey, hey, what's going on in here, Rogue? Oh, this guy, this, this Matthews tried to commit suicide. I had to take the gun away from him. That's all I've been doing all day long. Is that living... Well, it was Pasty Puss's gun that bumped George Grant. He and Marcel got the chair. Matthews and Bernice Maxwell got ten years apiece, and I got ten grand reward money for cracking the case. <laughs> yeah, I really had a time with that ten thousand dollars. Went to Mexico. Mexico City, incidentally. <laughs> ah, las señoritas. <laughs> Muy simpáticas. Yeah. Spent the month of January there. What a month, January. Well, as soon as I get time, I'm going to write a book. You know what the title's going to be? I'm going to call it Lost January. <laughs> oh, dear. Incidentally, I hope you noticed that I didn't get my brains knocked out and make my regular visit to my alter enemy, Hugo, tonight. And... Huh? Huh? What's the idea, Rogi? I missed you. Are you mad because I threw that Betty Dame off our cloud? No, Hugo. Oh, but look, Rogi, you made a reservation. On cloud number eight? I did not. Oh, yes, you did. You said it. I said what? You said, see you next week, Hugo. You said it. I heard you. Okay, okay, I've seen you. Good night, Midget. Goodbye, Rogie. Say, Rogie, aren't you going to wish me a Merry Christmas? Oh, sure, sure. Merry Christmas, Hugo. Merry Christmas, Richard. So long. (laughs) Merry Christmas. (laughs) Imagine that little dehydrated Santa Claus. Oh, well, I love everybody. And God blesses one and all. To coin a phrase. You know what I mean? F.W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Hello, 
Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. This is Stark McVeigh in Minden, California. Yeah? I want to talk to you, Rogue. Well, you're talking. I want you to come up here to Minden and do a little job for me. I don't want you to let anybody in this town know who you are. Uh, you can register at the hotel as a traveling man, a salesman or something. And I, uh, I... Hold it, hold it, McVeigh. I can't get away right now. I wired you $500 expense money. It should be at your office now. Mm-hmm. We'll talk over the rest of the deal when you get here. Oh, five bills, huh? Well, what kind of a case is it? A case that pays money. You can get out of there at 7 o'clock, and if you want to take a train... I'll think... drive. I'll leave as soon as the 500 arrive. Take me about two hours to get there, won't it? That's right. I'll contact you at the hotel tonight about nine. Okay. See you then. How are you, Banks, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to check in. Here. Thanks. Hey, clerk. Yes? You got a room? Well, I don't no, know. I didn't ask the price, did I? I'll take anything from a broom closet to the bridal suite. Here, buy yourself a box of cigars to smoke while you're thinking it over. Oh, thank you, sir. If you'll just register, I think we can take care of you. Hmm, thanks. Have my bag sent up, will you? I'll pick up my key in a minute. Hey, Sonny, got an evening paper? Yes, sir. But all the news isn't in that paper, mister. Believe me. What do you mean? There was a murder in town tonight. Just a little while ago, as a matter of fact, a man was shot, killed, dead. Hmm, all that? Well, Menden is an enterprising community. Who got the business? A fellow by the name of Stark McVeigh. We'll return to our story in just a moment, but first here's Jim Doyle to give you some smooth talk on a smooth subject. Yes, smooth is the word for it, Dick. That describes Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream to a T. For it has a rich, creamy consistency that spreads over your face like a cool April breeze. There's nothing heavy or greasy about Fitch's No Brush, yet it does a man-sized job when it comes to wilting a tough beard. You see, Fitch's No Brush is a blend of three important shaving ingredients. These are balanced in such a way that you get efficiency in softening whiskers, plus a skin conditioning action that protects your skin from irritation. Yes, they all add up to a shave that's really solid comfort. You men who say there's nothing like lather for a swell, smooth shave will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives lots of dense lather that stays moist all during the shave and rinses off easily. It, too, contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive skins. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in handy jars, big 25 and 50 cent sizes. Or smoother, happier shaves switch to fish. And now we return you to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, this case looked like it was officially over before it started. The man I was working for had just been killed. I found that out while I was registering in Menden's Menden's only hotel with running water. A bellboy gave me the news. And while I was just standing there with my mouth hanging open, a big, beefy guy eased up to me and said, You're Richard Rogue, aren't you? Oh, my name's Richard. Yeah, I know you're Rogue. I've seen your picture in the paper too often to be mistaken. I want to talk to you. Why? Because I'm chief of police in this town. Oh, oh, well, you just want to have a social talk, huh? Yeah, about a murder. Come on, Rogue, let's retire to the bar and play questions and answers. What about? About what you're doing in town, among other things. Come on, get moving, big shot. All right now, Rogue, suppose you start talking. What are you doing in Minden under the name of Richard? Hey, bartender, you put too much sugar in this old fashion. Oh, so you think I like to hear myself talk? I said, what are you doing here? I'm on a vacation. Does a man named Stark McVeigh always finance your vacations? Hmm, McVeigh. Hmm, yes. Well, the name sounds familiar. I'll bet it does. He had a call in for you all day down at the city. He reached you at the Hunt Bar Room a little before 5 o'clock, and he wired you $500 to your office this afternoon. Huh. <laughs> Maybe that's why his name sounds familiar. Well, could be that. Well, what was it that made McVeigh think he'd need you $500 worth of rogue? He didn't say. Uh, Who was McVeigh, anyway? I never met the guy. 
Never heard of him till he called me. You think I'll believe that? How do I know what you believe? I'm telling you the truth. That's all I can be sure of. And what's the idea of the pressure? You got ambitions to hang McVeigh's murder on me? Uh-huh. You know he's been murdered. How did you know that? Well, the bellboy told me. Who did it, Rogue? Who was McVeigh afraid of? I don't know anything about the guy. I didn't murder him. I hardly ever murder strangers. And now, uh, thanks for the drink and so long. Wait a minute. You leaving town, Rogue? I don't think so, no. I like the climate here. It's, uh, it's so peaceful. Well, don't you leave without seeing me. Or you'll come back with your hands cuffed behind you, lying down. <laughs> oh, well, if there's anything I love, it's a clever conversationalist. Huh? Huh? Now, I'll make a rule, egghead. Don't put any of your rural gumshoes on my tail if you like them personally. I don't like to be shattered. <laughs> Here's your ice water, Mr. Rogue. The name is Richard. Skip it, skip it. I heard you talking to Chief Reese. I know who you were anyway. Oh, well, you're a smart lad, huh? <laughs> Did you know Stark McVeigh? Sure. He used to be around here quite a bit. In the bar. What was his racket? What did he do for a living? Uh, how long had he been living here in Menden? Nobody knows where he made his money. He didn't work since he moved here about two years ago. Retired, I guess. That's what everybody thought. Always seemed to have plenty of money. Oh, he did, huh? Well, who were his friends? Was he married? Look, if I'm going to answer all of those questions, I want to work on the case with you. You need somebody who knows the town. Now, I'm an ex-GI. I work with intelligence. I can be a big help to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're working. Now, was McVeigh married? No. Didn't run around with women much either. I mean, here. Some blonde came down to see him once in a while. Drove a Cadillac convertible. Looked like a movie star. Hmm. Did McVeigh make many trips? Was he uh, out of town much? He traveled quite a bit. Hmm? Did he have any enemies in town? Nobody knew him well enough to hate him. He was a kind of a stranger, Mr. Rogue. Nobody got to know him very well. You live alone? Yeah. He had a woman come in a couple of times a week to clean up. That's all. Good. Well, who do you think killed him? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Any suspicious-looking characters been seen around town lately? Not that I know of. But they could have been here without me knowing it. Okay. Hey, uh, what's your name? Buzz Walters. What time are you off duty? About an hour, nine o'clock. Good. I'll see you then. In the lobby, right? Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do now? Oh, I'm going out to the house, McVeigh's house, and take a look around. You know where it is? I'll find it. See you at nine. Who is it? Turn on the lights. Who is it? Is, is that you, Hank? Yeah. Turn on the lights. Hey, hey, you're not Hank. Who are you? What are you doing here? Will you turn on the lights so we can talk this thing over, Junior? Oh. Oh, you're the guy who, who bumped McVeigh, huh? Okay, Junior. Stand right where you are. And let you shoot at me? That doesn't sound practical. I've got my gun out now. How about taking another shot so I can spot you? Who are you? The law? Oh, it... Okay, Junior. Throw that gun away. Oh, don't, don't, don't shoot anymore. You, you hit me. Let me hear that gun hit the wall. Throw it. <laughs> okay. Now, maybe we can talk. Keep your hands down to your sides. Look. I'm shot. I'm bleeding. You've got to do something for me. Later, later. First, Junior, you're going to answer some questions. I, hey. Did yeah. I startle you? Huh? Just hold that pause. Who is this guy, Shorty? I don't know. He, he came in here and I... I thought it was you. I, I took a shot at him and... But he... But he got me. Yeah. I see. Well? You better get somebody to take care of your friend here. He's got a bad chest. Don't let him. that worry you. You're gonna have worse before long. And we'll start you out... Like this. <coughs> oh, oh. How's everything on cloud eight? Oh, it's fine, fine. Say, Rogie, I missed you last week. Oh, oh, well, yeah. I had the flu. 
Now, didn't, uh, didn't Dennis O'Keefe come up to see you? Nah, not that Irishman. He doesn't use his head the way you do, Rogie. <laughs> Say, who did it this time? I don't know, I don't know. But I'm gonna get him. If it's the last thing I do. Oh, you better hurry back downstairs then. You're getting further away every minute. Huh? What do you mean? <laughs> You've got a surprise coming, Rogie. You're a side door tourist right now. Huh? Oh, well, that settles it. I'm going over the side. So long, you gore. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Come on, uh, fella. Come out of it. Huh? Oh. Oh. Hey. Uh, hey. Hey, this thing's moving. Sure, Fred. It's okay. You're in a freight car. Hmm? A freight car? Well, how well it seems somebody wrapped you over the skull and threw you in here. Who? Who? I don't know. You were here when I got here. Don't worry. You'll be okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the first aid. I... Where are we? Well, about uh, ten miles out of Minden, this red ball got a hot box and was held up. We're on the big grade going into the mountains. Ah, yeah. oh, thanks. <sighs> hey, why well, you got around my head? Yeah, you were bleeding. I tore up your shirt and made a bandage of it. Oh, thanks. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump out of this thing. Are you crazy? Yeah, uh, could be. Uh... Hey, look. Yeah, look, I, I've still got my wallet. You have? How come you didn't lift it? <laughs> I didn't think of it. Oh, you're an honest man. Here, here's a 20. Thanks. Okay. Well, here, here goes nothing. So long. Hey, driver. Driver. Ride. Driver. Driver. You going into Minden? Yeah. What happened to you? Well, I was... I was knocked out and robbed and left on the road. I I, I got to get back to Minden to uh, report it to the cops. Okay, buddy. I wouldn't leave anybody out. But I got a revolver here and don't try any funny stuff. Uh, well, me? Oh, I don't want to try anything. I... I just want to get back to Minden. I'll take you into Minden. Get in. Thanks. You can let me out here. Oh, no. Just stay right where you are. Hmm? Hey, what's the idea? Will you get that heater out of my face? I'll tell you where to get out. Oh? Well, when will that be? When we get to the police station. That's where you're going, mister. So I brought him in here to the police station, Chief. He looks suspicious to me. Yeah, nice work, Mr. Pollard. We'll take care of him, thanks. I hope I did the right thing. Yeah, you sure did. Thanks for the ride, Mr. Pollard. Goodbye. You just go right ahead, Pollard. I'll see you later. Oh, uh, Chief. Huh? There's no reward, is there? Uh, uh, no, no, no. So long. Oh. So long. Well? Well, I see you're back, Rogue. I told you you'd get in trouble nosing around in this town. Now, you gonna talk? Well, I haven't much to say, Reese. I went out to McVeigh's house. The door was open. I walked in. Some guy took a shot at me. I shot back. Mm. Got him, and while I was trying to find out what it was all about, another guy sneaked up behind me and bent a rod over my head. I woke up in a freight train ten miles out of town. This, uh, this, uh, Pollard, uh, gave me a ride in. And that's the end of the story. Mm. Well, how do you figure it? I don't know. But I want to get back out to that house... You coming with me? Well, what do you expect to find out there? We combed the house from one end to the other. Well, there's something going on in your charming little town that needs taken care of, Chief. 
And how come you don't have men at that house? There was a murder there a few hours ago. Now, don't you tell me my business, Rogue. Oh, I... Something smells. Come on. Let's get out to McVeigh's house. I want to do a little combing myself. Now, you'd better stay in line, Rogue. After all, I'm the chief here, and yeah, I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read your star. Do. I don't know whether you're a dumb chief or a smart operator. But we're going to McVeigh's house, and we're going to tear it to pieces until I get a lead. Now, come on. Try the door. Don't knock. It may be open. Okay. Mm. Well, close the door. All right, all right. Mm. Now, the lights don't work. The main switch must be pulled. We'll get by with this flashlight. Come on, let's take a look around. Hmm. Hey. Hmm? You see where that lamp is on the floor over there? Uh, Yeah. Well, the guy who was shooting at me was lying right by the side of it after I got him. Oh. Look, there's blood on the floor. You see it? What was that? Oh, it seemed to come from that closet. Somebody's in there. Well, come on out. Come on out or I'll shoot that door so full of holes we can pull you out through them. Okay. I'll come out. Well, hello, Buzz. Welcome to the party. What are you doing here? Well, Mr. Rogue told me he was coming out here, and he was supposed to be back to meet me in the lobby at 9 o'clock. He didn't come back, so I decided I'd run out here and look for him. You got here a little late, Buzz. Oh, no, I didn't. Well, I was a little late to do you any good, but I saw plenty. I saw them walking around here. Wait a minute. What do you mean, them? Two men and a girl. The blonde girl that used to come here to see Mr. McVeigh. Oh, oh, you mean she was here? Yep. I hid outside of the window and watched them. They were carrying stuff up from the basement. That is, the girl and this man were, and putting it in the car. Uh, Buzz, did you hear them talk? Did the girl mention his name? No, no, she just called him Sweetheart or Honey or something like that. There was something funny about the other guy. What? He never did come out. The other two came out, got into that Cadillac convertible, and drove away about ten minutes ago. Well, then there must still be a man in the house. Yep, he'd been shot. He had trouble getting around. Must have been the guy I shot. I've been looking for him. Well, why didn't you call me? I was working for Mr. Rogue. Uh, I know he'd be here. Oh, good boy, Buzz. Now, come on, let's shake this house down. If that thug is in here, we better find him before he finds us. Well, this is the best kept basement I ever saw in a bachelor's house, Buzz. How about it? It's sure clean. Hmm. Hey, look, there are a few muddy footsteps going this way. It- they're going both ways, Mr. Rogue. Oh, yeah, right over here and then back out. Hmm, that's funny. Huh. They walk right up to this blank wall and then back again. Maybe the stuff they were carrying out of the basement was stacked up against the wall. I doubt it. Hey, there's nobody up here. Shook down every room, every closet up here. There's nobody. Well, we're even. There's nobody down here either. I tell you, that guy they called Shorty never came out of the house. I was watching and I know he didn't. Hey, you're imagining things, kid. People don't just disappear. If he was here, we could see him now, couldn't we? If we could find him. Hmm. I've got an idea. Yeah? Well, there must be a hidden door of something in this wall here someplace. Oh, now, wait a minute, Rogie. Okay, okay. So I've been reading too many comic books, but I'm making my guess, and I'm going to see if I'm right. You see these footprints coming over here and going back again? Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's what it is. Maybe there's a loose tile in the wall or something. Yeah. Listen now. (laughs) There it is, Reese. You die hard. You hear that? It's hollow in there. Now, come on. Let's figure this thing out. Hey, there is a loose tile right here. Huh? Well, let me see. Yeah. Well, I'll be... Are you a... sure you're surprised, Sheriff? Why, I... There's a regular doorknob in there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Hmm. Well, it's locked, but I think I can take care of that. Look out. Now, that ought to do it. Flash your light in there, Reese. Okay. Hmm? Oh, brother, look at that. Huh? Hey, he's dead. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to ask the ladies a question. Have you ever had the shampoo blues? 
The shampoo blues, of course, is that dejected feeling you get when your hair becomes dry and unmanageable after a shampoo. If that's been your experience, then here's a way to beat those blues. Try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. Use this clear, golden liquid shampoo as often as you like. It will never leave your hair dry or difficult to manage. That's because Fitch's Saponified Shampoo is made from pure, natural oils. Just a little makes oceans of cleansing lather. Rinses out easily, too, for Fitch's Saponified Shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. It leaves your hair soft, lustrous, and easy to manage even right after you shampoo it. Yes, you can always use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo with complete confidence and freedom from the shampoo blues. So use it regularly. Buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter or ask for a professional application at your beauty shop. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, you could have knocked me down with an atom bomb when we opened that secret door in the basement of McVeigh's house and saw what was inside. It was an air-conditioned room with fluorescent lighting and strictly occupational furniture. And sitting at the table in the swivel chair was the body of the man named Shorty. Buzz, the bellboy, said, Hey, he's dead! Yeah, yeah, they let him have one right through the temple. Good Lord. Two murders in one day. In Mint. That'll put the place on the map, won't it? I wonder why they killed him. Well, it looks pretty simple to me. I got him through the chest when he shot at me. And a wounded man is kind of a handicap to a mob that's trying to make a getaway with a set of counterfeit plates. Counterfeit? Is that what they were doing? Yeah. This place is one of the best equipped engraving shops I've ever been in. <laughs> you knew that right away, didn't you, Reese? Mm. Oh, 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 sure. Right there. That's what McVeigh's racket was, huh? Yeah. Come on, let's take a look around. Here. Look here. Hmm? What did you find? Exhibit A. A whole stack of ten dollar bills. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> All with the same serial numbers. Oh, there's phonies, of course, girls' accent. Hmm. Well, Reese, let's get back to town and get some post mortem fingerprints off your late pal McVeigh. And some information on the license number Buzz got off that Cadillac. Do you think we'll get him, Mr. Rogue? Oh, we're a lead pipe cinch, Buzz. You know, if you hadn't been sharp enough to jot down that license number, (laughs) we'd have been out of luck. See, but Reese can trace that. You think it could use a guy like me regular, Mr. Rogue? Oh, well, I'm sorry, kid. I... I'm a, well, I'm a lone wolf. But you'll make some dough out of this case. You can bet your shirt there's a reward out for this mob, and we'll split it. Oh. You know, Junior, if you hadn't been around that house and seen those two drive away without Shorty, this crime may have never been solved. That's right, I guess. Nobody would ever have looked for the secret room. You know, I've always wanted to be a detective. Well, Rogie, the Department of Motor Vehicles says this is the address that car is registered to. Miss uh, Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue in Los Angeles. Well, that makes it my meat, Reese. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on, Buzz. You want to drive to L.A. with me? Sure, Mr. Rogue. I want to be in at the kill on this case. <laughs> This is the house. Miss Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue. What are we going to do? Well, first you go see if the car is in the garage while I take a look around. Okay. Hey, Buzz, Buzz. Come here. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hey, look in that window out there. Mm -hmm. That man. He's the one who knocked me out. Mm. Oh, is that the man and the blonde woman you saw leaving McVeigh's house? Yep. That's them. Mm, Looks like they're having a beef. Ah, that's good. Buzz? We're going to do a little listening. Oh, how are you going to get in? Back door. Come on. But it's probably locked. Yeah, could be. But if I haven't a skeleton key on my chain that'll open that door, I'm going to get a new locksmith. Now, quiet. Come on. You 
didn't have to kill them both, Hank. You're a trigger-happy fool. Will you stop harping on that dead dead? That's all there is to it. We're rid of them, and we got the counterfeit plates. We got no more troubles, baby. From now on, it's you and me. It is? What do you mean? Just that I don't have to put up with you anymore, either. One word out of me, and the cops will put you under the jail, Hank. That's what they do with killers, you know? I don't like you. I never did like you. But you're going to keep me in money and minks and everything I want as long as I live. Killer. It may not be long, you little double-crossing. Hank, put that gun away. Hank. Hank, no. So you were going to double-cross no. me. Hank, no, no. So all that sweet talk no. was just an act. No. Well, here's no. my act. Baby. No, no. Nixon, that's your eye, Hank. Drop the gun. Pick it up, Buzz. Yeah. Who are you? Well, now, that's not very flattering. I'm Richard Rogue. But we'll talk about that later, lovely. Right now, get up against that wall, both of you. Start singing and make the lyrics cover a couple of murders. Come on, sing! Well, that was the end of that story. It all happened over a woman, almost everything does. When I got through chatting with Sylvia, I, I had the whole story. McVeigh and Hank had a sweet little counterfeiting deal all set up and running smoothly. McVeigh, a master engraver, made the plates and hand-printed them in his shop in Minden. Hank wholesaled the stuff. Everything was just too, too divine. Until Hank moved in on McVeigh's girl, Sylvia, and got caught at it. McVeigh wanted to hire me to front for him and exposing Hank as a counterfeiter, and that's what started all of the excitement and the murders. We found the counterfeiting plate in Sylvia's Cadillac. And I collected five grand reward for cracking the case. (laughs) I split it with Buzz. He was a happy kid. Yes, well, as I've always said, Shoshi la femme, to coin a phrase. (laughs) It means find the woman. And by the way, if you have any luck, Shoshi one for me too, will you? I'm feeling much better and not doing a thing tonight. (laughs) You know what I mean. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Now don't forget now, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about a man with a million dollars, a beautiful wife, and an overpowering jealousy. We call it Best Laid Plans. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. And be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And remember, tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue... In Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Oh, uh, first off, today being Thursday and things being the way they are, 
I want to thank my Aunt Beulah for sending me those pork chops from Barlow, Kentucky. She doesn't know it, but she's made me the most sought-after man in town. Oh, well, next week, spinach. Anyway, to get back to business, I didn't know that my old friend, Judge Robert March, was having a cocktail party the afternoon I dropped by his place to say hello. But as I walked into the patio, <laughs> I was Richard the Glad Rogue. My old friend, the judge, introduced me to an amber-eyed blonde who answered to the name of Pamela Leeds. And I smartly opened the conversation by saying, Hello. Oh, Judge March. Do you mean to tell me that this is a famous Richard Rowe? The investigator? <laughs> I know it's disappointing, Pamela, dear, but nevertheless, <laughs> that's the rogue. Oh, really? You're not really disappointed, are you, Miss Leeds? You're just amazed that a man who has done so many brilliant things could be so young and uh, handsome. Of course. Well, I can see that you don't need me, Richard. I think I'll go and circulate among my other guests. I'm sure that the two of you will never miss me. See you later, Judge. Thanks. You can believe almost anything he says, Pamela, unless it's about himself or you. <laughs> Thanks for the tip, Judge. Oh, uh, would you like to take a walk around the garden? There's a bench under a weeping willow tree over there by the wall that always makes me feel very poetic. Oh, I hate to miss that, really, but I was just leaving. I have to leave, really. Oh, you do? Oh. Well, uh, how are you going to leave? Do you have a car here? No. No, the judge was going to send me home in his car. Well, that's silly. Oh, yes, especially when I'm going out that way, right past your house, as a matter of fact. I'll drive you home. <laughs> Were you really going out my way? Of course. Well, then, I'll go with you. <laughs> oh, that's swell. Oh, uh, incidentally, where do you live? Well, Pamela, this has been a kind of a short date, I... I hope I get a rain check on that bench under the tree. <laughs> I have a lot of fascinating statements I'd like to make to you. Oh, we'll see each other again, won't we, Richard? Mm, how about tomorrow night? It's Sunday, you know. <laughs> Great night, Sundays. Mm -hmm. The moon will be full. There's dining and dancing at the Macombo. And... Oh, Pamela. Dr. Stevens, uh, what's the matter? Is father... Pamela, we've been trying to reach you. Yes? You better come with me, Pamela. Your father is dead. Well, that's how it all began. We'll continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. I'd like to make a suggestion to the ladies. I'll bet you've often felt like singing the blues after you've shampooed your hair. The shampoo blues is a well-known theme. I've just washed my hair and can't do a thing with it. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is just the thing to dispel those blues. For when you use Fitch's saponified shampoo, your hair is so lustrous and easy to manage, you'll be singing praises rather than the blues. It's made from pure vegetable and mild coconut oils, so it never leaves your hair dry and difficult to manage. It makes oceans of lather, too, that cleanses completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo also contains a special patented rinsing agent. Even when you rinse with hard water, this rinsing agent ensures that no soapy film is left on your hair. It leaves your hair shimmering with natural highlights. You can use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo as often as you like, with absolutely no fear of the shampoo blues. Ask for it at your drug or toilet goods counter. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. And now we return to Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I'm fairly familiar with death and most of its forms. And maybe familiarity with a man with a scythe breeds contempt. But I felt awfully sorry for Pamela Leeds when her father, Anson Leeds, died. I was more than ordinarily interested when my friend Judge Robert March called me the evening after Leeds' death and asked me to come to his office. Uh, Richard, I am the executor of Anson Leeds' estate, and I think there's something strange about his will. Eh? Uh, this is, of course, uh, confidential. Mm -hmm. 
but he left the great bulk of his estate to a nephew, his sister's child, Peter Moore, with only a $50,000 legacy for Pamela, and the rest of the estate going to the servants and various charities. Oh, only 50000 to Pamela, huh? You think that's a little strange? I've been Anson Leeds' attorney, and I think his closest friend for 30 years. Rogue, I know how fond he was of Pamela, but... Uh-huh. Uh, 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 Pamela was not his daughter, you know. Uh, she was adopted by Anson just before his wife died 20 years ago. Oh, legal adoption, huh? Uh, yes, and I'm in a position to know that uh, Anson couldn't have loved Pamela any more if she had been his own daughter. Uh, as a matter of fact, I drew up a will for him about uh, six years ago in which he left almost all of his money to Pamela with other small legacies to relatives and servants and charities. Was the old gentle little flighty in his last years? No, oh, sound as a dollar. Extremely bright right up to the last. And, Rogue, uh, there was no change in the way he felt about Pamela. I know that. But I cannot understand this new will. When was it made? What's the date on it? Uh, just a year ago this month. Uh, here it is. Mm. Oh, I see. Uh, typed. Is this signature genuine? Oh, of course. There can be no doubt of that. I know that fancy Spencerian signature as well as I know my own. I realize, Rogue, that I'm giving you a problem here that is based on nothing more than a personal hunch. But I would never be at ease about administering the estate if I didn't have the will thoroughly checked. Uh-huh. Well, let's see. This, uh, this will mentions only Peter Moore. That's the nephew. Mm-hmm. Pamela Leeds. Uh, Kate Schumann, 5,000. Oh, uh, Anson's nurse. Uh, been with him for, oh, six or seven years. A fine woman. And Fred Kraft? Uh, Anson's gardener. Uh, been with him, oh, 15 years, I guess. They, uh, the nurse and the gardener, uh, witnessed the will, as you'll notice. I want to retain you to investigate that will for me, Rogue. Oh. Well, Judge, uh, ordinarily I hold my clients up for a fee. But for you, Judge, uh, oh, I guess I could toss you a couple of packing tickets. Richard, this is very important to me. Will you handle it for me? Well, of course, Judge. Now, first, uh, looks like my first move is to go out to the Leeds estate and talk with the witnesses. See under what circumstances this document was written and signed. I'll see you later, Judge. How do you do? I wonder if I could see Kate Schumann. I'm Kate Schumann. Oh, oh, I'm Richard Rogue. The uh, investigator? Uh, yes. What do you want to see me about? Well, Miss Schumann, I... Oh, uh, could we go someplace where we could talk privately? Mm, of course. My quarters are upstairs. Richard Rogue. Oh, hello, Pamela. What in the world are you doing here? Well, I just came by to uh, talk with Miss Schumann. Well, I didn't know you knew her. He doesn't. No, we uh, just met. I'll see you later, Pam. All right. Stop by the library on your way out, will you? Oh, sure. Right in here, Mr. Rogue. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rogue. I uh, came to talk with you about the will which you witnessed for Anson Leeds about a year ago. Oh, oh, cigarette? No, thank you. I don't smoke, but I don't mind if you do. Thank you. Uh, tell me, Miss Schumann, uh, who typed the will? I'll tell you the whole story. Mr. Leeds called me in one morning and asked me to do some typing for him. I often type letters and business things for him. Yes? I got my portable typewriter, and before he started dictating, he made me promise that I'd never mention the fact that he'd made a new will until after he'd passed on. Then he dictated the will to me. I see. Did he seem in good mental health at the time? He was perfectly normal. I was a little surprised at his terms. I mean, the way he left the money. And he could tell that I was. He just told me that he had good and sufficient reasons for doing it the way he did. And asked me to witness his signature. Uh-huh. Then he asked me to get the gardener, Fred Kraft, to come in and witness it. I did. He, uh, he signed the will in the presence of both you and Fred Kraft? Yes. Hmm. Do you know Peter Moore? seen him here a few times on visits. I don't know him. Will he be here for the funeral? Yes. He's on his way here now. On his way here? 
He lives in another town? He lives in Garden City, Iowa, with his mother. She was Mr. Leeds' older sister. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Schumann. Who, uh, asked you to investigate the will, Mr. Rogue? I can't tell you that, except that it was an interested party. Well, everything happened just the way I said it did. I'm sorry to see Miss Pamela left with so little money. I'm very fond of her. Well, it certainly looks like everything was according to Hoyle. Thanks for talking so frankly with me, Miss Schumann. You've been a great help. I'll just check with Fred Kraft and you can forget the whole thing. <laughs> I didn't expect to see you out here today, Mr. Rogue. Well, I didn't expect to be here, Pamela. Judge Varch asked me to drop by and do him a little favor, that's all. Uh... Oh, excuse me. It must be Peter. Certainly. Hello, Peter. Hello, Pamela. I guess there isn't much I can say, is there, Pamela? I know, Peter. Where's your mother? Didn't she come with you? No, you know, Mother. She was very upset. She just couldn't make it. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is my cousin, Peter Moore, Mr. Rogue. Hello. How do you do? Mm, I think I'd better run along, Pamela. I want to talk to your gardener. Name's Kraft, isn't it? Uh, Fred Kraft. He'll be in his cottage. It's out and back. It's a little white cottage. He's probably asleep by now. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Oh, good Lord. Homicide. Lieutenant Urban speaking. Hello, Urban. Richard Rogue. No kidding. Cook up some more business for me, Rogie? Oh, you know me, Urban. The Anson Leeds estate this time. The Leeds gardener was just chopped to death with a hand axe while he was asleep. Better get your boys and get out here. <laughs> Hello? Judge Marge, Richard Rogue. Yes? Uh, Judge... Get that will to a handwriting expert. I think it's a phony. Oh, well, uh, well have you any evidence that... No, uh, no, no, Judge, this isn't the court. This time, I've got a hunch, that's all. One of the witnesses, the gardener, has just been chopped to death. Now, get an expert on that will and tell him we'll call him for a report on the signature tonight. And you'd better come out here. One of the things I like about you, Rogie, the corpses you find are always so dead. Oh, I see what you mean, Urban. Say, from the looks of this room, the late Fred Kraft put up quite a row, didn't he, huh? Uh-huh. But not enough of a row to get out of that couch he was lying on when he got that first blow with the axe. Let's shake the joint down, shall we? Uh-huh. Why was he killed? Well, all I have is a theory. I don't want anybody in the house to know that. Uh, he was one of the witnesses on a will made by Anson Leeds. A uh, will is in question. Mm, I get it. You think he might have been put out of the way to keep him from testifying as to the validity of the will, eh? That's my theory. Oh. And there's something that might back it up a little. What? Look. There on the floor. Yeah? Stub of a plane ticket. Hmm. From Garden City, Iowa. You sound like Garden City means something to you. Come on, no tricks, Rogie. What's with Garden City? That's the town where Leeds was born and raised. That's the town Peter Moore just arrived from. Oh, I got here as soon as I could, Rogue. Oh, good heavens. Hello, Judge. Kind of a mess, isn't it? Oh, uh, Judge, are you having that well checked? Yes, I have Carl Friend, the handwriting expert, working on it. Oh, uh, what did you know about Fred Kraft, Judge? Oh, he was an old family retainer in the best sense of the word, Lieutenant. He and Anson Leeds were more friends than they were employer and employee. How come Anson only left him $5,000 then? I, I don't know. Fred was a thrifty man. He had quite a nest egg saved from his salary and from investments he had made on tips from Anson. His estate will be worth, oh, I should say conservatively, $60,000. Hmm. Who gets it now that he's dead? Well, Pamela Leeds. 
You know, she's been like a daughter to old Fred. I happen to know that she's the sole beneficiary in his will because I drew it up for the old man. Yeah, this case has more angles than a six-pointed star. Yeah, yeah. Here's a cute one I just picked up, Rogue. Look. Huh. A lady's wristwatch. Where'd you find it? On the floor, right over there. It's got a broken link, like it might have been torn off of somebody's arm. Ah. Well, whose is it? Uh, it's engraved on the back to Pamela from Dad. Pamela? Oh, uh, come on. Let's get in the house, Irvin. You'll want to question everybody, won't you? Yeah. I've got the boys holding Miss Leeds, Peter Moore, and the nurse Schumann in the library. Oh, uh, while you're talking to them, the judge and I are going to be busy upstairs. <laughs> I don't understand, Rogue. Uh, just what is it we're looking for in Kate Schumann's room? I don't know. I don't know. But she's mixed up in this thing someplace. Uh, take a look in the bathroom, will you, Judge? If you see anything the least bit out of line, call me. Okay, Rogue. Oh, uh, look. Look. Ah. Here's pay dirt. Yes? Kate Schumann's diploma from nursing school. Hmm. See where it was issued? School of Nursing, City Hospital, Garden City, Iowa. Yeah, the town keeps popping up, doesn't it, huh? Yes. Oh, well, look, uh, I want you to witness this, Judge. Here are two cigarette stubs. Lipstick on the tips. Fresh. No, no, don't touch them. Just leave them right where they are. All right, but, but Rogue, you said yourself that the nurse couldn't have killed Kraft. She was in the house at the time that he was murdered. Yeah, I know, I know. But I've got an idea that's beginning to make sense. You got a pencil? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Now, let me use it here. I want to copy this phone number from Kate Schumann's scratch pad. BL6791. Room 323. You know, Rogue, we have no now, right. Now, look, Judge. This is beginning to weigh on your conscience. You better get downstairs with Urban. He's a warrior, too. I've got a lot of work to do and a long distance phone call to make. You go downstairs and tell Urban I'll be down as soon as I have convicting evidence on a murderer. I'm going to have to impress on you that I mean business. There's been a murder committed. Now, one of you knows something about it, and we I... We don't, Lieutenant Urban. I tell you, we were all here in the house when Fred was killed. I wish you'd go away and leave us alone. What was your wristwatch doing lying in a pool of blood near the body of the murdered man, Miss Leeds? Why was a link torn wide open on the band? I don't know. It was on my dressing table this morning. I know it was. Yes? Well, three witnesses saw it lying at the scene of the crime. Look, Lieutenant, why don't you let the poor girl alone? I was with her when Fred Kraft was killed. So was I. We were all right here in this room. That's very interesting. All of you established your alibis for a very important time. Were you all working together? Now, one of you start talking. How about you, Peter Moore? How do you account for the fact that the stub of a plane ticket from Garden City, Iowa, was found at the scene of the crime? Plane ticket? I came out on a train. Yeah? When were you in Fred Kraft's cottage? I haven't been out there in four years. You may have to prove that statement more in court. This is outrageous. You can't keep us here pounding questions at us, making accusations. There's been a murder committed. It's my business to find out who did it. I'm going to find out. Judge, go get Rogue. Tell him I want him down here right now. All right, Lieutenant. Peter, please. Don't let him question me anymore. Look, Lieutenant. It must be perfectly obvious that no one of us could have had anything to do with the murder. It was probably some transient. I suggest, Lieutenant, that you use some Lieutenant other means. Like... Yes, yes, what's the matter? The upstairs looks like a cyclone hit it. And Richard Rogue is gone. Yes, I was gone. And I'll tell you more about it in just a moment. First, here's Jim Doyle, who wants to tell you some facts about shaving. Yes, men, it's a fact. Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream does give as smooth and comfortable a shave as you could hope for. Plenty of research and testing have gone into the making of this fine cream, and now it combines the qualities you want. Smoothness of texture, a clean, tangy odor, and a skin conditioning ingredient for sensitive skins. Fitch's No Brush softens up the toughest beards, so your razor will glide easily, giving you a close, clean shave without scraping or irritation. It leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. Leaves your disposition calm and cool, too, 
for Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream is designed for sensitive skins. For men who prefer a lather cream, it's Fitch's Brush Cream. Gives lots of creamy lather that stays moist all during the shave, giving a smooth, comfortable shave. Rinses off easily, too. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in economical 25 and 50 cent sizes. Ask for either type, but for solid comfort shaves, be sure it's Fitch. Spelled F I T C H. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. The more I looked around the upstairs room in the mansion of Anson Leeds, the more I suspected that what started out to be the investigation of a validity of a will had turned into the investigation of not one murder, but two. I made a long-distance call. Then I called a doctor friend of mine who admitted that a clever murderess could disguise the effect of morphine poisoning. Then I checked the telephone number I found on Kate Schumann's scratch pad, found that it was the number of the Hotel Splendide. I went there. In the lobby, I was stopped by my friend Todd Reeves, the bellboy. Hello, Mr. Rogue. What are you doing? Oh, uh, take a ride with me in the elevator, will you, Todd? I'm calling on a guest of yours in room 323. Yeah? What's the matter? They in trouble? Now, just don't ask any questions. You want to make 20 bucks? Oh, sure. Who do you want killed? Just take a ride with me and do me a favor. Give me your passkey, Todd. Oh, that's what the 20 bucks was for. You want me to get fired? Oh, I'll back you up if you get in trouble. Yeah, then I'll really get me the boot. You want me to stick around? No, I don't. I think the less you know about this case, the better off you're going to be. Who is it? Uh, shove off, Todd. I'm, I'm going in. Who is it? Hello. Stay right where you are, please. What do you want? I want to talk with you about a murder. Oh, this is a typical rogue trick. Telling us to wait here and disappearing. If I ever get... Oh, I'll get it. Hello. Hello, Urban. Hello, rogue. Where the devil... Have... Look, Anson Leeds was murdered. Don't say a word to the people you're holding there. One of them is the killer. Right. The will is a forgery, and I have the proof. Hold everybody until I can get there for the payoff. Be about ten minutes. All right, Urban. I'll take the party from here. Okay, Rogue. And this had better be good. It will be. And this concerns all of you. In the first place, I've talked to Carl Friend, the handwriting expert. That will, leaving everything to Peter, is a forgery. There are five copies of the will, and the signature on each of the copies is identical. It's impossible for anybody, even a man in the best of health, to write his name exactly the same way five times. That's not true. I tell you Shut I... up. The signatures were made by placing a sheet of carbon paper under one authentic signature of Anson Leeds and tracing it through to the fake wills with a sharp pencil, then inking the signature in over the tracing. Don't bother denying it, Kate. Carl Friend photographed the signature under a powerful light with an enlarging camera. The particles of graphite under the ink sparkle like diamonds. Ah, oh, that will was a fake. And Fred Kraft was killed to keep him from telling the fact that he was not present when Anson Leeds signed it. I didn't kill Fred Kraft. No, but you killed Anson Leeds with morphine poisoning. She murdered my dad? He was murdered? Yes, Pamela. I just came from the mortuary. There are obvious syringe punctures in his arm. But Dr. Stevens... Yes, Stevens. I know, Judge. He signed a death certificate for heart failure. But I found this vial of morphine tablets in your room, Kate, and this... This bottle of belladonna hidden in your desk. You kill Leeds with morphine and then drop belladonna in his eyes to dilate the pupils. Oh, that was very clever. Because the only outward sign of morphine poisoning is the fact that the pupils of the eyes contract to pinpoint size. I killed him. But I'll never go to jail for it. Grab her, Jeff. Grab her. Get that syringe away from her. Kate. I was too late, Rogue. Yeah, yeah, she was too fast for us with that shot of poison. Kate. Kate. Uh, Kate! Too late. She's dead, Rogie. I, 
I don't understand. Why did she do it, Mr. Roke? Oh, for game, for game. You were an innocent part of the plot to kill Anson Leeds, Peter. Peter? Oh, no. Stop being so mysterious, Rogue. If you know who killed Fred Kraft, say so. Was it Kate? No, 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 it wasn't. The murderer of Fred Kraft is in jail. I put her there a few minutes ago. She was a good friend of Kate's, who was resentful of you, Pamela, and ambitious for her son to be a wealthy man. Peter, she needs you, kid. Better get out of the jail, see your mother. She loved you so much that two people died so you could inherit a million dollars. Well, that was the end of that case. Peter Moore's mother was tremendously jealous when old Anson Leeds adopted a little girl, Pamela, and made her the heir to his fortune. And after her school day's friend Kate Schumann was installed as the old man's trusted nurse, they plotted his murder without Peter's knowledge. Mrs. Moore was in Kate's bedroom when I was questioning Kate. And when she learned that the will was being investigated and that I was going to talk with Fred or Kraft about it, she killed him. She made a complete confession and was executed for the crime. I felt sorry for Peter. Ah, he's a nice kid. Pamela felt sorry for him, too. She felt so sorry for him, she's going to marry him. So he'll get the Leeds fortune anyway. Ah, you know, that hardly seems fair. Getting a girl like Pamela and all that money, too. You know, I... Uh, I could have gone for that Pamela. Lovely girl. Oh, lovely girl. Ah, but after all, I need another girl like Frankenstein needed another monster... In exactly the same way. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Now don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about an alibi that is blown up by gunfire. There are some lovely people in it. We call it the murder habit. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station... When you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Fowl as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. <laughs> oh, don't look at me like that. Just because my shirt is half torn off and my face is scratched and my necktie is under my ear... I just walked into a store to buy a pair of socks right in the middle of a sale of nylons. <laughs> oh, women. Long red fingernails, staring eyes, pushing, clawing, tall elbows and high heels. Yeah, 
Anybody know where I can trade my pair of nylons for a white shirt? Oh, well. As I returned from this shopping expedition and was looking on the world at large with a jaundiced eye, I walked into my office and found this soup sitting there, overflowing with a large and robust gentleman with a toothy smile and the manner of a man who was just meeting an old school chum after 40 years of separation. I cringed a little as he rushed happily toward me with a hand like the business end of a claw machine clutching at mine. I'd never seen him before. Mr. Rogue, you are Mr. Rogue, are you not the celebrated investigator? Yes, that's right. Mr. Rogue, I'm very happy to make your acquaintance very happy. My name is Price, Pop Price. I'm called by those who know me. I'll have a chair, Mr. Price. Thank you, sir, thank you. I've called on you, Mr. Rogue, to retain your services. Uh, Mr. Price, how about starting at the beginning now? When you get through with your end of the story, I'll tell you mine. It'll be a quick yes or no. Man, a few words that I like. Well, I'll be brief. I realize that you're a busy man, Mr. Rogue. Yes, sure. Go on. I am business manager for the Farrington Brothers Circus, the world's greatest show. You've seen the circus, of course, been running here for three weeks at the Coliseum. Well, no, I haven't, but I... Then uh... you've missed something, sir. You've never seen Carlotta the Magnificent, the world's premier aerialist, the only woman in the world who ever attempted to swing through the air between two flying trapezes, turning four complete somersaults in midair, defying death without even the security of a net beneath her. It's a breathtaking sight, road, positively breathtaking. Now, look, mister, if you're selling tickets to the circus, I, I don't came think... here to employ you, Rogue, in your professional capacity to prevent a murder. Somebody is going to attempt to murder one of the circus leading luminaries during tonight's performance. Rogue, somebody has threatened to murder Carlotta the Magnificent. No kidding. It's a little unusual for murderers to issue invitations. Now, here it is, Rogue, the death threat. Mm. Oh... Can't get much out of that. Pasted on the back of a circus handbill. Letters cut from newspaper headlines. You'll die during tonight's performance. <laughs> now, Pop, isn't that a little dramatic? How was the note delivered? It was on her makeup table this morning. Huh? Hmm. Do you have any enemies in the show? Well, frankly, Rogue, Carlotta is, well, she's the kind of a personality that makes enemies. She's uh, very sure of herself, exceedingly conceited. As a matter of fact, she's what you would probably call an 18 carat dyed in the wool. Oh, oh, fine. She's as strong as an ox, as smart as a fox, as mean as a snake, and as brave as a lion. She's 38, but she still considers herself a fatal beauty. As a matter of fact, she's. Fine-looking woman. Wonderful figure. Big brown eyes. Sounds like a fascinating character. Who would want to kill her? In strict confidence, Rogue, almost anybody who's ever had anything to do with her. Mm. Well, that narrows it down a little. Have you told the police about this threatening note? Yes, I told them, and I've told the newspapers. Oh, I knew you wouldn't want to leave them out. You know what I think, Pop? I think this whole thing is a press agent's dream. Lots of free publicity. Believe me, Mr. Rogue, you are wrong. Tonight only. Tonight only a special added attraction. See the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent, along with the greatest show on earth. All at the regular price. <laughs> oh, Pop, thanks for coming in, but I... Just I, I... a minute, Mr. Rogue. I have here something which I think might change your mind by way of a retainer. Oh. Oh, that stuff. Well, that does help to convince me you're on the level. Shall we say five hundred dollars? That's a nice round figure. Here you are, and here are two passes to the circus tonight. I'll see you there. Rogue, you must prevent that murder. Well, that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment. But now here's Jim Doyle. I'd like to say something to the ladies. You know that one of the rules of modern life is perfect cleanliness. For instance, women years ago would be horrified at the thought of washing their hair every day, as many of our Hollywood stars do. But then they didn't have Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo in those days. If they had, I'll wager they would have used it frequently. For Fitch's saponified shampoo always leaves the hair lustrous and easy to set. Made from pure vegetable and mild coconut oils, it won't dry the hair or make it harsh feeling. It cleanses thoroughly, too, for it makes loads of fluffy lather even in hard water. This lather whisks away every bit of dust and dirt, leaves your hair fragrant and sparkling clean. Ask for a professional application of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo at your beauty or barber shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Oh, 
Ordinarily, I wouldn't go to the circus, even if the elephants carried water for me. But when Pop Price, the business manager of the Farrington Brothers Circus, paid me five bills to prevent the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent, I called Betty Callahan at her newspaper and asked her to attend the performance with me that evening. We went early. We wanted to interview the great Carlotta before the big show started. The circus press agent was in today with a story on that threatening note. Mr. Addison had him come out of the office. Don't walk so fast, Richard. Wait a minute. He said no circus press agent was going to chisel any free space from our people with a moth who can gag like that. Yeah. Well, he's probably right. Oh, excuse me, Johnny. I'll tell you, we'll take him some pink lemonade and some cotton candy when we go back. <laughs> That'll make him happy, huh? Oh, George. I'd better go back with a murder story if I have to commit it myself. <laughs> All right. Hey, buddy. Yeah? Where do I find Collada the Magnificent? What do you want with her? We're from a newspaper. We want to interview her. About that death threat she got today? Yeah. How did you know about it? Who doesn't? Everybody in the show is hoping. You mean they're hoping she'll be killed? We can dream, can't we? Carlotta's the worst nuisance that ever hit the circus business. I've been in this racket 20 years. I never knew a dame who could make so many pe- people hate her so much. She's a genius. Well, thank you. Thank you. You stutter a little bit there, don't you? Sorry. Where do we find this nobody, sweetheart? You're on the right track. Last dressing room in this row. Mm-hmm. Circus must think Colada is hot stuff. Look at the size of that star on her door. Yeah. Now, Betty, I'm going to tell her I'm a reporter. Might be able to get more out there. All right. What do you want? A word from the evening bulletin. Oh, oh, you're from the press. I love the press. Did you bring a photographer with you? Come in. Well, the photographer will be along later. Oh, please, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, this young man is my manager, Frank Davis. Uh, hello, Mr. Davis. How are you? Uh, here, take this chair, miss. Oh, thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, now, you want to ask me some questions, no? Why, yes, Carlotta, if it isn't too much trouble. Uh, tell me, what is your last name? I am Carlotta. Uh, do we have to have this young lady here? I would like to talk to you alone. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Miss Betty Callahan. She's also on the paper. My name is Richard Rowe. Oh, you are a very handsome man, Mr. Rowe. You are strong, no? Well, I managed to drag myself around. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, let's talk about you, Kalata. Huh? Uh, could we put this interview off until after the performance tonight, Mr. Rhodes? Perhaps we could have dinner, you and I. You're not very worried about the death threat, are you? Me? Oh, no. Why should I worry? It's professional jealousy, that is all. Somebody is jealous of Carlotta the Magnificent. Someone who is less beautiful, less talented. <laughs> That could be almost anybody. They're all jealous, aren't they, Frank? Why shouldn't they be? Believe me, Mr. Rogue, Carlotta's the queen of them all. I've seen all of them in the last five years, and Carlotta here's the payoff. There's never been anyone within a mile of her. Oh, Frank. Frank is such a sweet boy. He loves me. But I am tired. I am weary. Tonight I leave the circus. Well, when did you decide that? I decided two weeks ago. This is my last night as a performer. The circus world loses its greatest attraction after tonight's performance. Isn't that tragic? Uh, <clears throat> uh, Carlotta, does Pop Price know of your decision? Price? Oh, of course he knows. His heart is breaking. What will his show be without Carlotta Magnificent? What will it be? Answer me. I don't know. It will be nothing. Oh, yeah. Well, now, now look, uh, what did you do when you found that threatening note? I turned the note over to Price. He turned it over to the police. Have you seen my act, Mr. Rogue? No. No? We're going to see it tonight, Carlotta. I am sensational. Well, uh, Carlotta, that note you received was lying here on your makeup table when you came in today, right? Yes. Young man, have you ever tried to do four somersaults a hundred feet in the air? Me? Without a net? Oh, now look, Carlotta, I I want to know about that note. You don't want to get killed, do you? Look, I take a big swing, then four somersaults. Then I grab the trapeze on the other side. It is impossible. Unless you are me. This I have to say, Carlotta. Feel that muscle, Mr. Rock. Sure. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's something. Yes. You're strong as in... Well, you're very strong. Yeah, and I've got the scars to prove it, haven't I, Carla? <laughs> yes. Frank and I were scoffling this morning. Look, open your mouth, sweetheart. There. The front tooth, I knocked it out. 
He is scuffling with Carlotta, who could tear him to pieces. She didn't mean to do it, Mr. Rogue. We were just kidding around. But I'm very feminine. I have a lovely figure. I dress very quietly on the street. You'll be proud of me when we go to dinner tonight, Mr. Rogue. Oh, I'm sure I will. Uh, look, Carlotta, I hate to be practical, but aren't you a little worried about the note? I mean, Pop Price is worried. Of course he's worried. He's afraid I'm leaving his show. You're on in ten minutes. Think. Pig. Don't pay any attention to him, Carlotta. I'll take care of him for you. Well, we'll have to hurry to our seats. We don't want to miss your performance. We'll be watching you, Carlotta. You will hurry. There will be a tremendous crowd tonight. This is Carlotta the Magnificent's last performance. Oh, kind of hard on the public, isn't it? Of course. I will see you after the performance, Hanson. Uh, thanks for coming back to see us, Rogue, and you too, Miss Callahan. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we'll see you later tonight, Carlotta. Oh, if she should live so long. <laughs> you know, Betty, I sometimes wonder if she really wants to talk to me after the show. You know, Richard, I feel that if I knew Carlotta the Magnificent just a little better, I'd kill her myself. She was absolutely brazen the way she flirted with you. And Dad Davis, he's young enough to be a son. She's a... She's a brazen flirt. Well, you could take some lessons from her, Betty. What? That's a girl who knows what she wants. On second thought, the two of you should make a wonderful couple. You could just sit around and talk to each other about each other. And lead a life of great bliss. I'll say one thing for Pop Price. He figured us in for some good seats. We're practically part of the show. Oh, I love circuses. I think they're exciting. Don't you, Richard? Sure, sure. The first honest work I ever did was carrying hay for the horses when the circus came to town. <laughs> Come to think of it, I guess it was the last honest work I ever did, too. Oh, Richard. Well, you can be an animal fan if you want to. Personally, I like the clowns. Oh, I like clowns, too. <laughs> Look, Richard, look at that clown with a camera. Coming around here. See him, see him? Yeah. You mean the one dressed like a woman? <laughs> look at that hat. <laughs> Isn't it ridiculous? You've got one just like it, haven't you? Oh, it's just like a man. The hat that clown has on has real fruit on it. Apples and oranges and grapefruit. <laughs> oh, look. <wow. laughs> well, at least the hat's practical. Did you see Mario grab that apple off and take a bite on it? <laughs> Mario? Is that the famous Mario? Why don't you look at your program? I paid two bits for it. Oh. That clown in the red, white, and blue outfit with the putty nose and the big shoes is Mario. The highest paid clown in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Your Wonderful attention, one, please. To enter. The Hamilton Brothers Circus. Quiet. The greatest show on earth. Proudly presents the most sensational attraction ever to be seen on any stage, in any circus, or any theater. America's premier circus proudly presents the greatest aerialist of all time. Carlotta must have written that himself. I call your attention to the fact jealous. that the performance of a and death-defying feet, no neck protects this intrepid artist from certain death in case of a mishap. Good. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, the feature attraction of this great show, Carlotta the Magnificent. <laughs> Well, there comes your girlfriend. She's climbing up to a trapeze. Oh, beautiful figure, hasn't she? Lovely. For her age. Ah, oh, kitty, 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 kitty. Oh. Huh? Call out of the magnificent is ready to go. You'll soon find out whether you're covering a hoax or not. You don't think there's any doubt of it being a hoax, do you? Baby, I'm not sure of anything. Well, I wish this were over. So do I. Oh, there she goes, out on the trapeze. So she takes a big swing. Looks like a tough way to make a buck, doesn't it? Well, why doesn't she jump? She's gathering momentum. Here come the somersaults, Betty. Richard, she's falling. Get 
Nope, that does this, Betty. Come on. We've just witnessed a murder. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company, who wants to say something about one of his favorite subjects. That's right, Dick. Fitch's no-brush shaving cream is a favorite subject with me because men are always so pleased with it after they've tried it. Fitch's No Brush combines three different shaving ingredients into one easy-to-use cream. One of the ingredients, a special skin conditioner, helps prepare even a tender, sensitive face for a solid comfort shave. Fitch's No Brush also has a creamy, non-greasy texture. It helps the razor do the job in a hurry, even if your beard is tough. When you finished your shave, your face feels cool and refreshed and smooth as can be. For men who prefer lather, there's Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives lots of rich, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. Rinses off easily, too, leaving your face feeling smooth and pleasantly cool. Join the thousands who have found shaving pleasure through their switch to Fitch. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams contain the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. And both come in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. <laughs> Now, Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I get invited to a lot of things, but this was the first time I was ever invited to watch a murder. As I sat there in my box seat at the circus and watched my self elected dinner date fell out of the magnificent tumble to her death. I felt a great emptiness. I would probably have shown how I felt with much more gusto if Betty Callahan hadn't been practically tearing my arm off. The whole place was in a turmoil. And it took Betty and me quite a while to get down to where Lieutenant Urban was standing not far from the body. Please clear the arena. The upper exit's in leaving. Use the upper exits, please. I've got to call my city desk. Oh, go ahead, Betty. You can find a phone someplace down around the business offices. I'm going to talk to Urban. He looks a little upset. I'll be right back. Right. Take it easy now. Yes, I'll, I'll hurry. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, I'm working for the corpse. What do you mean, working for the corpse? It's simple. I was hired to keep this from happening. Who paid you? Hot Price, the head man of this outfit. How did it happen? Well, there are two 38 caliber bullets in the body. Somebody did some nice shooting. Oh. While the drums were rolling to cover up the noise, and the arena was darkened except for the spotlight on the victim. Wow. It's very nice planning. Now, stay right here, Rogue. We may want to talk with you later. Okay, I'm not going any place. Hello, Price. Mr. Rogue, may I speak with you a moment? Are you Price, business manager of this layout? Yes, this is horrible. Where were you when it happened? I was standing in the entry back there. I was worried. Oh, you were? Of course he was. He'd been warned that Carlotta was going to be killed at this performance. I can handle this, Rogue. You don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? She was leaving the show. This was to be her last performance, wasn't it? Yes, at least she intended to quit. She was always threatening to quit. And this time it looked like she meant it, eh? What would happen to your show if Carlotta left it? She was the star, wasn't she? Yes, she was the stellar attraction. Uh Uh-huh. So you'd have been in trouble. She was spotting you, wasn't she? And you took this way of getting even. That's a good theory, Urban. Thanks. Who was with you when it happened, Price? I was alone. Mm, careless of you. Somebody punched a hole in your meal feed. Now, don't leave the premises. I want to talk with you later. Where's the dead woman's manager? I want to talk with him. He's in her dressing room. His name is Davis. Oh, he is, eh? Well, we'll call on him there. Come on, Rogue. Rachel, wait for me. Well, hurry up, Betty. Urban marches on. Davis, we just want to ask some questions. You have been associated with Carlotta for five years. Who would have wanted to kill her? Believe me, Lieutenant Urban, if I knew I'd murder them. You don't know what Carlotta meant to me. I loved her. She had a lot of enemies, but... Just uh, name off a few of them, will you? Well, she had a run-in with the animal trainer, Cliff Stewart, the other day. And a big fight with Mario the Clown last week. And she and Pop Price weren't getting along very well. She threatened to choke him to death a few nights ago when she was threatening to quit and taunting him about it. Well, 
Must have been one of them. They didn't understand Carlotta. They didn't know how to handle her. One of them killed her. Davis, uh, did she leave a will? Who gets her money? She had no money, Mr. Rogue. She spent it as fast as she got it. Sometimes a little faster. I tried to get her to save some money for the future. But she was too big-hearted. If she didn't have any dough, how come she was quitting a thousand-dollar-a-week job? Her doctor ordered her to take it easy for a while. Her heart was acting up. I had it all fixed for a three-month rest in Mexico City. That's what she wanted. We found the gun, Lieutenant Urban. Where? Right by the third ring. The gun is a Smith and Weston, 38, and there were two ejected shells laying right by it. Well, it must have been dropped as soon as it was fired. That, that gun belongs to Mario, the clown. How do you know? I've seen it in his trunk a thousand times. So has everybody else in the circus. It's his, all right. It's got his initials on the butt. Mario, eh? That murdering skunk. I'm going to kill him for this. He did it. He shot Carlotta. Mario was standing in the ring, right about where the shot was fired, just a few minutes before the murder. That's right, Richard. We were watching him when the house lights dim for Carlotta's entrance. Yeah, that's his routine. I'm going to find him and... Davis, take it easy. I think the police can handle this. This is a personal thing. Give me that gun. Cut it off, Davis. Now, sit down. Take, take it easy, Davis. Now, where's Mario's dressing room? Right next door. Ah, uh, come on, Evan. Let's go see how funny this clown really is. Mario! Mario! Open up! This is the law! You know, he just may not be in there, Evan. Now, uh, we'll see. Oh! Richard! He's dead! Hmm? Ah. Uh. No, I don't think so. He's been chloroformed. Smell it? Look, here's the bottle. He's still got the saturated cloth in his hand. Well, don't stand there waving at my face. Well, why would he chloroform himself? Well, what makes you think he did? Murderers do funny things. Come on, let's get him out of here. Help me lift him, Rogue. Now, wait a minute, Evan. Why don't you wait until he comes out of it? The way you're going at it, he'll be in the electric chair before he wakes up. You saw him right there at the edge of ring number three just before Carlotta was shot, didn't you, Rogue? Yes. Anybody else around him? No. And Carlotta was shot with Mario's gun. That's all I need. I'm taking him down and booking him for murder. Bet if your paper prints that story the way you see it, you're going to live to regret the day the printing press was invented. Urban's jumping the gun. Nobody ever went to that much trouble to frame themselves with the chair. Look, Richard, I'm your greatest admirer and all that. You're just being bullheaded. Nobody but Mario was near the spot where the gun and the spent cartridges were found. Your logic proves that he's the guilty man. Well, uh, somebody might have been impersonating Mario. Oh, that's ridiculous. Hey... I'm going back to the circus. There's one piece of evidence that everybody forgot to check. Good night. No. Well, hang on to my hand. We'll be in the main arena in just a minute. Thank goodness there's some lights in the arena. Yeah. It's an awful looking place in here, isn't it? <sighs> I don't imagine we're improving it much. No. Okay. All right. Now, now here's the third ring. Mm -hmm. When we were watching Mario, he was right about here, wasn't he? Yeah. Over this way a little, I think. Well, it's, it's bound to be here someplace. Richard, what are you doing down on your hands and knees? I'm looking for a clue, baby. A clue that's going to send somebody up for murder. I'll show that urban guy how a really sharp investigator works. Oh, let's get out of here, Richard. Well, it's, it's got to be here someplace. Well, someplace. I've got it. I've got it, Betty. Drop it, Rogue. Huh? Drop it. Huh? Oh, okay. Okay, Davis. I always do as I'm told when I'm talking past a 45. You killed Carlotta, didn't you? Yes, but I'm not going to be arrested for it. Nobody I can prove I did it but you, Rogue. And you're not going to live to tell it. And neither is Miss Callahan here. All right, Miss Callahan, get over here. Over by Rogue. Oh. You think you can get away with killing us here? It's worth trying, isn't it? Well, 
Okay. Look out, Betty. Stop! I didn't have anything to lose, so I rushed him. I may not be as strong as Collada was, but I was stronger than Frank Davis. And I had the advantage of some judo I'd picked up during a date with a hat check girl. I got the gun away from him and turned him over to Irvin. He admitted killing Collada. She was quitting the business and demanding an accounting of her cash. Davis had gabbled most of it away. He knew Mario's routine, so he slipped him a Mickey, borrowed his costume and his gun, and took his place in the arena that evening. And you know, when he was impersonating Mario, and Betty and I watched him take a bite out of an apple, he got off another clown's hat, remember? Well, I found the apple, and that's what convicted him. That front tooth Carlotta knocked out of his mouth gave him a kind of an uh, individualistic bite. It showed up as plain as the nose on Durant's face in the part of the apple that was left. <laughs> Smart work, huh? Well, they executed Frank Davis for the murder of Carlotta the Magnificent. She was, uh, uh, she was quite a girl. Quite a girl. Betty didn't seem to like her, but, well, after all, women are all alike. Everyone you meet is different. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget, uh, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about, uh, oh, about a girl, a boy, and a gun. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, uh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember... Tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, there's something about me that is to trouble what molasses is to flies. I never go around looking for trouble. Trouble goes around looking for me. Now, take that afternoon a few months ago when I walked into the press room of the Hall of Justice and found, among others, Clark Ames, the young city hall reporter for the Chronicle, expounding on his favorite subject, a deep hatred for a man named Fred Curtis, nicknamed the Alibi Master. Ames and the other newspaper men had watched Curtis win acquittals for a dozen different clients and always by the same route, unbreakable alibis. This made the clients very happy and the district attorney very miserable. The Chronicle, a crusading newspaper, 
had, at the instigation of Clark Ames, been running an anti-Curtis campaign, bordering pretty close on libel. And Curtis, who was sharper than a razor's edge and harder to catch up with on the horizon, hated Ames with a wonderful passion. Curtis had won the last round, and Ames was telling me about it. So Curtis goes to Williams, my managing editor, and threatens a libel suit. Well, I had gone a little overboard, I guess. And Williams had to let me go. Temporary layoff until the heat died down. But now I'm back on the job, Brogue, and I'm solid. And you wait until that phony Curtis sees me sitting here. Wait till he finds out I'm back on the job. Huh. Look, Ames, uh, I've been around this town for a while, and if I'm picking out a guy to buck, it won't be Fred Curtis. Huh? How come you decided to make a career of locking horns with the smartest mouthpiece in the business? How do you expect to win? Oh, don't worry about it, Rogue. I got that phony right where I want him. You wait a couple of days, that's all. Mr. Alibi Master Curtis is going to be nailed to the Chronicle's masthead. Oh, uh, hello, Ames. Did I hear you taking my name in vain? Could be. How uninteresting. What are you doing sitting around in the press room? It's reserved for the working press. Hello, Rogue. How are you? How's your trial going, Curtis? Oh, my client will have dinner at home tonight. Jury just retired. Your client is guilty as the devil, Curtis. What's his alibi this time? Now, you know he couldn't have committed the crime. I've just proved to the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time the murder was committed. How are you getting along on your unemployment insurance, Ames? <laughs> it was a pleasure getting you fired. Too bad it didn't last. Well, I'm back on the job, which means I'm right back on your trail. That's bad news for you, Curtis. Uh, do me a favor, will you, Ames? When you call in the report of the not guilty verdict the jury's about to bring in for my client, tell your stupid managing editor I'm filing a libel action against him the first thing in the morning. Uh, look, uh... Curtis, let's go in the courtroom, will you? I'm going to be there when the jury comes in. Okay, Rogue. Oh, here, Ames, here's ten bucks. Go get a haircut, will you, kid? And have your suit pressed. And don't forget to spell my name correctly when you phone that story in. Here's your ten right in your face, Curtis. I'll see that your name is spelled right. In the biggest type in the shop, right at the top of the page, when you're tried for falsifying evidence. And that's going to happen to you awfully soon, wise guy. Here, here, here. Take it easy, Ames. Oh, let him talk. Let me give you something to kick around in that warped mind of yours, Curtis. You remember a guy named Don Thompson? Your alibi witness for Ed Harris a year ago. I'm sure you remember Thompson. What about him? Would it put a crimp in that famous poise of yours if you knew that Thompson had given the Chronicle a signed and witness statement admitting that he had perjured himself in that alibi statement for Harris? That is preposterous. Is it? Well, you'd be in quite a spot if the Chronicle happened to have a statement like that, wouldn't you, Curtis? A statement that swears that you paid Don Thompson $1,000 for the perjured testimony that kept Ed Harris out of the gas chamber? That'd sure stop your clock, wouldn't it? Have you been drinking, Ames? <laughs> you sound even a little more illogical than usual. Oh, that's right. You like logic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, figure this one out. I've been trying for some time to get convicting evidence on you. You got me fired for trying. The Chronicle was scared of a libel suit. But... All of a sudden, my managing editor, Williams, doesn't seem to be very afraid of your suing the paper. Now, what could be the reason for him giving me my job back? It could be that that statement from Thompson did it, couldn't it? All right, now, sweat it out, Curtis. You'll be seeing your picture in the Chronicle with bars in front of you and a number on your chest in about 48 hours. Not even one of your phony alibis can keep you out of this rap, big shot. I suppose I should be annoyed by such juvenile threats. But I just don't seem to be able to take you seriously, Ames. And the next time I give you my attention, you'll never work on a newspaper again. Coming with me, Rogue? Uh, no, not now, no. I think I'll stay here and use the telephone. You could see and feel the hate that hung in the air in that press room like a cloud of poison gas after Fred Curtis left. Clark Ames went all to pieces as soon as we were alone, paced the floor, said he'd talk too much. He was as worried as a man with a three-horse parlay and two winners. Pretty soon, though, he, he left, and I used the telephone to call a couple of girls I know. They, uh, <clears throat> they weren't home. I was about to give up and go to dinner by myself when I turned around and saw Betty Callahan standing there behind me, looking like a million dollars, which is a nice figure, which is what she has, if you know what I mean. Betty had a funny little quizzical smile on her face. Hello, Richard. What's the matter? Aren't you having any luck? Well, honey, honey, I was just going to call you. You mean that if Alice isn't home and Liza doesn't answer, I'm next in line. Oh, now, you know better than that. You're always first on my list. Remember, Richard, I was standing here when you were phoning. Sure, sure. I was just, uh, just trying to get a substitute, that's all. Uh-huh. Well, what do you want? 
The names of some girls and a few phone numbers. Now, don't look at me like that, Betty. The only reason I was calling those other girls was because I couldn't find you. Well, I'll forgive you if you'll take me to dinner and then to the theater to see Tallulah Banker. Oh, my goodness, you have such expensive taste. Oh, really, my dear man. I have something infinitely better. I have two passes for the shelf. Well, good. I've got two passes for a drive in. <laughs> Come on, I want to see if I can walk through that door without eating the jam off of it. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. That's the only reason you have a date with me tonight, Richard. Well, then come on. All through that hamburger, I kept dividing my thoughts between how such a little girl could eat so much food and that scene in the press room at the Hall of Justice. I knew Fred Curtis for what he really was. Cold-blooded and completely ruthless. I remember that look in his eyes as he left the press room. A little puzzlement, a little fear... And a great deal of malice. Even if nobody else believed the story Ames told, I was sure that Curtis more than half believed it. And that meant trouble for somebody. Betty and I finished our dinner at last, and in spite of everything she could eat, I still had money enough to pay for it and a cab to the theater. We were just back in our seats after the second act intermission when I heard my name being paged. If Richard Rogue is in the audience, will he please report to the lobby? Mr. Richard Rogue, please report to the lobby. Isn't that a sort of obvious piece of publicity, Richard? Well, how the devil did anybody know I was here? You better go see what's so important. Would you hurry back? I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> I had a bad hunch as I walked up that aisle. Those little chills that always race up and down my spine when I'm walking into trouble were acting up. I didn't know what to expect as I walked out into the lobby. Then I saw Clark Ames standing there. His face was as white as a dove's wing, and his eyes had the strained look that is the aftermath of seeing violent death. Rogue. Yeah, what's the matter, Ames? You look like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something worse, Rogue. You gotta come down to the Chronicle with me. Now get a hold of yourself. You're shaking like a dice cup. What's the matter? Williams, my managing editor, was just killed. Huh? Murdered in his office. Well, that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment, but first, here's Jim Doyle. Romance and soft feminine glamour are back in style. Women are taking off the bandanas they donned in war plants and are again letting their hair reflect moonbeams and stardust. That's why Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is in more demand now than ever, because Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the radiant beauty of your hair. Its fragrant, creamy lather cleanses so thoroughly and rinses out so completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, so no special after-rinse is needed. And best of all... You can wash your hair as often as you like with Fitch's saponified shampoo, and it will never become dry or harsh feeling. That's because this shampoo is made from pure, natural oils that keep your hair ever soft and lustrous. Ask for Fitch's saponified shampoo the next time you're at your beauty shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, I was working. The publisher of the Chronicle was paying me a grand for putting the long, cold finger on the murder of Williams, the managing editor. I was pretty sure I knew who the murderer was, so it looked like a soft buck. When Ames and I arrived at the Chronicle, homicide was already there. My friendly enemy, Lieutenant Urban, was in charge, as usual. He walked over from where he was ex examining the remains of the late Mr. Williams. Hey, Sam, help me with this. What are you doing here, Rogue? Now, Urban, you, you, you know whenever anything, anything comes along you boys can't handle, they always send for me. Who's paying you? The publisher of this paper. Now, shall we go on with the third degree, or shall we get the work of the murder? What do you know about it? More than you do. When was he killed? The medical examiner says he got it about two hours ago. Mm. Stabbed the death of his own copy shares, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the last edition had already gone in. No one else was in the city room when it happened. Found a motive? Well, look at the office. Every file's been emptied. The murderer was looking for something, Rogie. Yeah, I wonder if he found it. Uh, you wouldn't know what it was, would you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I might. I might at that. 
I heard the Chronicle had a signed confession from Don Thompson. I will go to run it tomorrow. Now, what was Thompson's confession? Come on, Rogue, you might as well give me all of it. Well, it seemed Thompson was confessing that he had been paid a, uh, quite a sum of money for a job of perjury by Fred Curtis, commonly known as the alibi master. In words of one syllable, so you can understand it, Irvin, Thompson, uh, sold the Chronicle information which would have put Curtis away for about ten years. Curtis, eh? Well, looks like this is going to be a simple case. Could be, yes. Hey, Ames, you know where Williams kept that Thompson confession? It was in the top drawer of this file. It's gone. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I guess that settles that, Urban. Ah, it's too easy. Curtis knows every trick in the book. Hello, Urban. May I come in? Yeah. We were just talking about you, Curtis. You're very welcome. I figured I would be. Why did you kill him, Curtis? You knew you'd be the number one on the suspect parade? Oh, that's not very smart, Rogue. If I had killed him, I would have been much more clever about it. I wasn't within a hundred miles of here when he was killed. Well, that sounds familiar. I, uh, I know I'm wasting my time asking this, Curtis, but, uh... You can prove that alibi, can't you? Of course. I was on my ranch in Antelope Valley when I heard over the radio that Williams had been killed. I suppose my friend Rogue has told you of the fantastic story a drunken reporter named Ames was shouting in the press room at the Hall of Justice today. Yeah, I told him. He knows all about it. Oh, incidentally, uh, Thompson's little composition is missing. The man who killed Williams lifted it. Very convenient for you, wasn't it, Curtis? Convenient? Oh, there never was such a confession. There couldn't have been. Because there wasn't the slightest background of truth for the wild tale Ames told today. Okay, Curtis. We'll let you know what we think of the story after we've checked your alibi. You were on your ranch in Antelope Valley when you heard the report of William's death. Yes. That's about a hundred miles from here, right? Approximately. As soon as I heard the report of the death, I knew I would be a suspect. So I started to town. I stopped in a bar in Palmdale for a drink on the way in and then came directly to the Chronicle office without stopping. My car's at the curb now in front of the building. Ryan... Check those alibis. Oh, they'll check, Lieutenant. I'm sure they will. The alibi master would never slip up on his own alibi. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Rogue. Uh Uh-huh, and uh, I'm sorry to be disappointed, Curtis. You sure you don't know anything about this murder? You you didn't hire someone to do it for you, did you? Of course not. I had nothing against the man. Why should I want to kill him? You can go, Curtis. We'll try to break that alibi or find the boy you hired. Until we do, take it easy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Oh, you can reach me at my office if I can be of any further use to you. Oh, uh, Curtis, are you going back toward the Biltmore Theater? Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to get back there. I left my car there. And, oh, brother, Betty. Ooh, she'll massacre me. <laughs> I'll give you a lift. Come on, Rogue. This Curtis guy was strictly the deluxe type. His car was a long, sleek, black job a few sizes smaller than the Queen Mary but with approximately the same amount of power. We got in, Curtis turned on the ignition, and the gas gauge swept clear across to full. Curtis had said he drove directly from the bar in Palmdale to the Chronicle office without stopping. Uh About 70 miles. Mr. Curtis's carefully planned alibi was not so carefully planned. I was enjoying a short ride with a murderer. He saw my eyes on the gasoline gauge, followed them with his own, and then put his hand in his coat pocket. I knew there was a gun in it. As we drove away from the curb, I picked up a copy of the Chronicle, which had been lying in the seat beside me. I thought perhaps if I could hide my thoughts a little better, if I pretended a great nonchalance with no part of which I felt. Curtis was not sure that I'd attach the proper importance to the story the gas gauge told. He, uh... He was being nonchalant, too. I uh, had a little dough riding on prevaricator at 7th today. When I came out. Ought to be in that paper. Final results. Where'd you get it? I bought it in Palmdale. Then? Huh. This is the Bulldog Edition. Oh. The Bulldog Edition is sold only on the streets in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake, huh, Rogue? Yes, I'm afraid you made two of them, Curtis. This paper and that full gas tank. You didn't drive 70 miles in this gas eater without stopping and arrive here with a full tank, did you? You're very observant. Looks like you're cracking my alibi, huh? You killed Williams, didn't you? Yes, I had to. I had to get that confession of Thompson's that would have ruined me. I owe that impetuous reporter a great debt for tipping me off to the Chronicle's plans for crucifying me. You, uh, have any plans for me? Yes. Yes, I 
think I have it worked out. I'm going to drive you out to the suburbs to a spot I know that's probably deserted by this time. Now, if you were found there, shot. Aren't you overlooking something? If I'm found there, shot, Urban is going to pick you up fast. <laughs> You're going to do better than that, Curtis. Well, if there were signs of a struggle and your wristwatch had been set an hour ahead and smashed to set the time of death, and I was at Lincoln Heights Jail talking to a client at the time the police would figure the murder took place, that might do it, don't you think, Rose? No. It's no good, Curtis. You're slipping. In the first place, there's always the possibility that a shot would be heard. The district I have in mind is deserted by now, or will be, before I consummate my plan. And Urban is no fool. He'll be awfully suspicious. Might give you the paraffin test on your gun hand. You know, I, I, I don't think you're going to handle the situation that way, Curtis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be kind of hard to handle, even for you. You know, Rogue, it's amazing how fascinating crime, I mean the actual act of committing a crime, can be. Have you ever killed anybody? No. Now look, Curtis, I suppose you know that you're going to get caught. I know nothing of the kind. Successful crime is nothing more than planning, careful planning. Oh, I'll grant you, Rogue, that I'm going to be suspected of your murder. I'll never be convicted for it. I won't take any chances. You're wrong, Curtis. You talk like a sick man. You can't beat the law. If you commit a crime, you're going to pay for it. Let's go down to police headquarters and talk this thing over with Urban. What do you have to win by adding another murder to your score? Mr. Rogue, I love life too much, and I love success too much to let anything stand in the way of my life as I live it. You, you just can't understand that, can you? You think that a man of my background and position must be horrified at the thought of taking the life of another human being. Well, you're wrong, Rogue. I have my own code, my own ethics. You know and I know hundreds of reputable businessmen in this town who spend their days and nights, their lives, grasping for money, for power over the lives of more and more people. <laughs> well, when one of them wrecks another man's life or his business, it amounts to a victory, which is celebrated by the wrecker at his club that evening. If the victim commits suicide, and he often does, they're sorry. That's all. It's just business. What are you trying to prove, Curtis? I'm explaining why I killed Williams. Why I have to make sure that you and the knowledge you have of my affairs are disposed of. It's a matter of business, Rogue. Now you're crazier than a coach. You know that, Curtis. You're not talking like a rational person. You're going to pay for this crime. Don't move. Put your hands back in your lap. I think you know that I won't hesitate to kill you here on the road if it becomes necessary. Set your watch up an hour. One hour, Mr. Rogue. Okay. You got a new plan? Yeah. We're on the outskirts of town. I'm going to stop the car when I come to an advantageous place. Then I'm going to knock you unconscious with a tire iron, smash your watch, throw you onto the road and run over you. To all appearances, your murder will be the result of a hit-and-run accident. I will have an alibi which will make it impossible for me to have been in the vicinity at the time of the accident. That, I think, is a perfect plan. Ah, uh, it's full of holes. In the first place, Urban will check the tread on your tires, and in the second, he'll never fall for that smash watch trick. You'll never get away with it, Curtis. You've been buying up juries and alibis and evidence for so long that you've forgotten that they're honest people. People who can't be bought. Urban's one of them. He'll stay with you until he gets you for killing me, Curtis. Now, you'll have to come up with a much cleverer scheme than what you've thought of so far. Maybe you're right, Rogue. What are you doing? What I'm going to do now, Mr. Rogue. Won't need any alibi. Look out, you fool. Curtis! Curtis! Give me that wheel! Sit back there, Rogue. Get your foot off that accelerator. You're going to hit... Turn that wheel! Give me that wheel, Curtis! Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. Let go of that wheel. Let go or I'll shoot! <laughs> We'll continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. Time is a valuable thing these days, and no man wants to spend any more of it than possible on shaving. So you busy men who want to cut down on your shaving time, use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. This swell cream gives you a close, comfortable shave in a hurry. It's an expert blend of three important shaving ingredients. These ingredients enable your razor to fairly sail along without nicking or scraping. The creamy, non-greasy texture of Fitch's No Brush saves you time, too, for it won't clog your razor or the drain. And with all your speed in shaving, you'll find that Fitch's No Brush leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. You men who prefer a lather cream will find Fitch's Brush Cream also gives quick, comfortable shaves. It makes lots of rich lather that stays moist all during the shave. 
then rinses off easily. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. For shaving speed and shaving ease, switch to Fitch. Now back to Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. When I saw what that madman Curtis was going to do, I knew I had nothing to lose. He had that big, powerful car wide open and heading straight for a stone wall. I tried to grab the wheel and turn it. He fired at me just as we crashed into the wall. I only remembered turning the wheel enough to deflect the shock a little. And then... Oh, then I was on cloud number eight. Hugo was there, waiting for me. <laughs> oh, Chief, you had a close call there. Hey, hey, Hugo, where have you been? Well, I had a little trouble with the OPA about Cloud 8, and I had to go and see them. Oh. Then I had a tough time getting a reservation back. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, Rogie, with your usual bump on the head. Oh, Am I dead? <laughs> Only the good die, young rogie. Hey, you got company. An old friend of yours is up here. Look, over on cloud nine. See him? Oh, Curtis. He isn't dead either, huh? Oh, no. But I sure thought I was out of a job when I saw you slamming into that wall, rogie. You ought to take better care of yourself. For me. Yeah. Look. I gotta get out of here, you gore. How badly am I hurt? Oh, you're okay. That car was built to take it. <laughs> you won't be playing any gin rummy for a while, and you can't collect on your insurance. Give me a little boost over the side, will you, you gore? I gotta get downstairs before Curtis does. Sure, Chief. Here you go. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Rogie. Rogie. Uh, hello. Hello, Irvin. Mm, chance of meeting you here. Receiving hospital? Yeah. What have you been up to? What were you trying to do? Kill yourself? No. No, no. Is, uh... Is Curtis here? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll ask the questions. What happened? How badly is, uh, Curtis hurt? Leg broken, that's all. He's still unconscious. Look, uh... Irvin... Here. He killed Williams. He... He, uh, tried to kill me. He admitted it, eh? Yeah, after I caught a couple of flaws in his alibi. You got enough dope on him to make it stick? I don't know. I don't know. It would, uh, be my word against his. But I got an idea. An idea that might sense the deal. Every once in a while, you do have a good one. Get the... Get the chief surgeon over here, will you? I'm going to need his help. Okay. Here, here, here. Lie down there. I, I don't want anything to happen to you, Rogie. I was worried about you. You're such a pest. I'd miss you like the devil. I'll get the doc. When I outlined my scheme to the chief surgeon, he looked for a minute like he might call in the head of the psychiatric ward. But with Urban's help, I finally got him to agree to play it my way. He bandaged Curtis from head to foot, put constricting straps across his chest, and cinched him down like a saddle on an outlaw horse. Then they put him in an oxygen tent and brought him out of shock. Urban pulled out all of the stops as he stood by the side of the hospital bed and talked to the murderer. Like a father... Curtis, can you hear me? Yes. Who is it? Lieutenant Urban. Did the doctor give you the bad news yet? Yeah. Crushed chest. Nothing they can do, I guess. No. You haven't got long to live. Anything you want to tell me? Might as well go with a clear conscience. Did you kill Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. I had to do it. I killed him. 
I killed him. Well, that was the end of the case. Brilliant piece of work on my part, I, uh, I thought. Going through that little tableau of making Curtis believe uh, he was on his deathbed and had nothing to lose by confessing the murder. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that urban. He's so proud of the fact that he confined his remarks to the truth when he was talking with Curtis. All he said was, you haven't long to live. Remember? Huh? That, uh, that was true enough. Curtis was executed a few months later. Which proves that the theory about perfect crimes is as foolish as a sure way to beat roulette. And, uh, Betty... Well, I, uh, I left her in a theater when I started out on this case. It cost me about, uh, oh, just about what I made, a thousand bucks, to get her over her peeve. So, I broke about even on the deal. Oh, well, you know the old saying. A fool and his money are some party. <laughs> You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about... Uh, the last time rogues saw prison. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Makers of Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo and Fitch's Shaving Creams presents Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. As I walked down the corridor of the death house, the butterflies in my stomach were doing a soft shoe dance to the beat of a dirge. In a half hour, Mike Royal, the man I was about to see, would die of sitting in a chair. An occupational disease common to the business of murdering. This was not my idea of a pleasant way to start an evening, but that's the way it was. I was there by special request of the condemned man and completely in the darkest of why. When the guard and I reached the cage, Mike Royal was standing there with his face squeezed into the bars. Already they had slit his trouser leg and shaved his head so 50,000 volts could enter quickly without knocking. Here we are, Rogue. Thanks, Hanson. Hello, Mike. Oh, thank God you're here, Rogue. I, I didn't know if they'd let you come. I got here as fast as I could. Go on in, Rogue. But you've only got five minutes. Orders. Okay. That's all we need. Well, Mike? Has he gone? Listen, Rogue. 
You've got to help me. Now, Mike, your lawyer's throwing the book at them. Every appeal's been turned down. What can I do for you? I'm not talking about something for me. I want you to help somebody else. Who? My kid. Didn't know you had a kid, Mike. Yeah, yeah, a girl. Florence. She's she's 14. In the parochial school at Arlington. Father Shea knows. You must help me get some money for her, Rogue. Well, sure, Mike, sure. The press boys will chip in. We'll get up a little benefit. Oh, you'll get up nothing. I, I don't want a handout. But, Mike, Listen, you... listen, listen. I, I only have a minute left. Now, I want you to get the reward money and split it with her. Ten grand for her and, and five for you. Huh? Oh, save your breath, Mike. The insurance company isn't paying 15000 for your piles, even if you do turn them in. They'll only pay for the return of the stones. I'm talking about the stones. I wouldn't sing on my pals. You know, you know that, and they know it. But what they don't know is where the stones are. And I do, and I'm going to tell you. Why not tell the cops? Because I want her to get the money, you hear? Now, I've never done anything for her all the time that I was alive. And now, now that I'm as good as dead, I can. You hear? Yes, Mike. I, I killed a man, and, and I'm ready to burn for it. Well, that, that's okay. But wherever I'm going and whoever I have to answer to, I, I can face it better if I check out doing something decent. You're the only one who can help me, Rogan. Well, you've just got to give me a break. Okay, Mike, okay, I'll do what I can. Not for you now, but for your kid. Where do I get the stones? An angel will hand them to you. Now come back to Earth, will you, Mike? Where do I get the stones? An angel will hand them to you. An angel, huh? I see. Yeah, I get it. That's all I can tell you, Rogue. That's all I can tell you. Okay, Mike, anything you say. Time's up, Rogue. Right, Hanson. Promise me you'll do it, Rogue. Sure I will, Mike, sure I will. Anything you say. Yeah, yeah. And then split it ten and five, huh? Sure, anything you say. Yeah. Rogue. Yeah? So long, fella. So long, Mike. That was very nice of you, Mr. Rogue. Oh, Father Shea, I I didn't see you. I just couldn't help hearing you promise to do something for Mike. I don't know what it is, but I can see your heart's in the right place. Father, you haven't been worrying about me. I confess I was beginning to. (laughs) You know, you've been pretty close to the line of the law. (laughs) Well, always just inside, Father. I think you can stop worrying. Perhaps I will. Granting a dying man's last wish is a good sign. A very good sign. Well, the least I could do was say I would. Say you would? You mean you're not going to? Well, I would if I could, Father, but I'm no crystal ball. I can't read his mind. Mike's got angels and his daughter and $15,000 all mixed up in his mind like farmer's salad. Perhaps I can find out what he means and tell you. No, Father. Mike told me to go see an angel. But I'm not quite ready to meet the angel. Yet. Father Shea turned and walked back to Mike's cell. Then Hanson, the guard, joined me, and we started down the corridor. Our Father, our Father, who art, who art heaven, in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed thy, name. be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. I could hear Father Shea and Mike praying together. Oh, I wished I could help Mike's kid. But I couldn't see myself getting mixed up in this thing, even if it did have a payoff. No, sir. I couldn't see it. The prison gates clanged behind me, and I grabbed a cab. Told the driver where to go and leaned back with my thoughts. I thought of four big shining diamonds. I thought of a $15,000 reward. And of a little girl in parochial school. And of her father made a death house will and testament naming me executor. And I thought of Father Shea's eyes when he thought I was backing out on my promise and that one screwy line of Mike's. An angel will hand them to you. But anyway, I looked at it. All it added up to was a headache. By the time I got home, I was 
I was plenty tired. Maybe in the morning it would make sense. What I needed now was sleep. I went up to my apartment, walked in, and speaking of angels, there in my favorite armchair sat what appeared to be at least a very reasonable facsimile. A dark-eyed, red-headed dame who smiled and said, Hello. The manager let me in. I said I was an old friend. You're not seeing things. Uh, uh, that's what you think. Who poured you into that gown? Won't you come in? I won't bite you. Oh, thanks. I'm a blackened dog myself. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Oh, uh, here's your purse. Thank you. I make it a point never to sit on ladies' purses. Especially when there's a gun in them. Might go off. All right, baby, what is this? We'll continue our story in just a moment. But first, here's something a woman told us the other day. I like Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo for a special reason. And that is that it, well, it always leaves my hair smelling so fragrant and clean. Yes, lady, that is important, more than most people realize. For it's a fact, your scalp perspires too. And the hair collects and holds odors, dust, and dirt. But there's no need to risk offending with scalp odor when regular use of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo will keep your hair fresh and clean. This clear, golden, liquid shampoo makes mountains of delicately fragrant lather that quickly washes away every bit of dust, dirt, and scalp odor. Your hair is left smelling fresh, sweet, and clean. And it will be radiantly lustrous, too. For Fitch's saponified shampoo contains a special patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent ensures that no dull, soapy film will be left to mar the luster of your sparkling, clean hair. Ask for a bottle of Fitch's saponified shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, or have a professional application at your beauty shop. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> I'm not the type who expects handouts from angels. So when Mike Royal told me, just before he was executed, that an angel would hand me the Maris diamonds, I was as groggy as a New Year's morning. But when I reached my apartment, there sat something that looked very much like an angel. Until I found a gun in her purse. You're very clever, aren't you? Well, the uh, doctors at Yale and Harvard are both bidding for my head when I die. I might give one to each. Anything else you'd like to know? Yes. What did Mike Royal tell you? Mike Royal? I didn't come here to play games. Oh. What a pity. What did he tell you? Now listen, baby. I don't know who you are or what you want, but I haven't got it. You're poison, and I don't want any part of you. Now beat it before my fists get out of control. And take your water gun with you. As soon as I empty the water. There you are. Now crawl back under your rock. Now, listen. Mike Royal told you something. And you're in this whether you like it or not. I don't work alone and my friends play rough. Baby, I don't care how rough your friends play. We knew Mike would talk before he died. We tailed every visitor and tapped his lawyer's phone. We knew when he sent for you. You were the last guy to see Mike alive and we also knew you wouldn't tell the cops. Because you love a greenback more than anything in the world. That's right. I love greenbacks. 15,000 of them. 15,000? For the arrest of the Maris vault breakers and killers of the guard, and for the return of aforementioned jewelry. It wouldn't be easy to find those persons. For 15 grand, I'll work hard. So that's it. Little Boy Scout catches the gang, turns in the stones, and collects the merit badge. And 15,000. The stones worth half a million that you can turn in now for 100,000 cash? Is that smart? Play along and we'll be rich. We? Who's we? You and me. Don't you think we could get along? Well, uh... I, uh, I shouldn't be surprised. But what about the rest? Your, uh, your friends? They're on their own. I said you and me. We could go away somewhere together. Think of it, Rogue. A hundred thousand dollars. Hmm. Well, that's, uh... That's a lot of move. You can have anything you want, Rogue. Anything you want. Just you and me all the way. 
Well, what do you say? I, uh, I'm hanging on the ropes, baby. Uh, keep punching. Look outside. It's snowing. It's cold. But in Florida, it's warm. In Bermuda, all year round. It's getting warmer right here. What did Mike tell you? How do I know you're on the level? Here's a down payment. Baby. Then it hit me. Oh. The guy must have flown out of the closet like a moth. A two-legged moth. Swinging a sap that caught me over the right ear. Every steeple in the world began chiming nine o'clock. The hands of one big clock kept whirling around like a propeller. With me, stuck like a hunk of gum on the end of the minute hand. Then the clock fell over on its back. I was still whirling. But now the hands of the clock were a merry-go-round. Faster and faster and faster. And there I was, on cloud eight. My home away from home, where my old friend, my alter ego, Yugor, was waiting for me. <laughs> Hello, Rogi. Say, where have you been for the last couple of weeks? Oh, oh, hello. Hello, Yugor. Say, Yugor, do you know any angels? <laughs> What's the matter, Rogi? Don't you like the company you've been keeping? An angel with a... with a handful of diamonds? Hey, Rogi, you'd better get back downstairs. You're in trouble. But what did Mike mean? I... I can't figure it out. Oh, use your head, Rogi. No, oh, I did, I did. For a baseball. Somebody batted it for the circuit. That's why I'm here. Go on back, Rogi. All they want is what you know. Tell them, Rogi. It won't mean any more to them than it does to you. But you, Gora. Over the side you go, Rogi. The song, you go. So long, Rogi. <laughs> Come on, Rogue. What'd he tell you? Come on, or I'll beat it out of you. Did you see Mike Royal tonight? Yes. Yes, I I saw him. Did he say anything about the jewels? Did he say they were in a vault? Did he say they were in a safety deposit box? Did he say he gave them to a fence? Who did he say you'd get them from? Uh, from an angel. What? Uh, an angel. Ah, uh, nuts. All he gives us is double talk. I'll slap it out of him if I have to slap his head off. Well, maybe he really doesn't know. He knows plenty. He's seen us, hasn't he? Wait a minute. Listen, Rogue. I'm going to give you one chance more. Who did Mike say would give you the jewels? Uh, an angel. Oh, Joe, take care of him. Almost ten. I've got to dance at the club in 20 minutes. I don't want them to think there's anything wrong. Keep him here. I'll be back. Okay, leave him to me. Just be careful, Joe. <clears throat> And now, brother, I don't want to hear no more talk about angels. Well, then stop asking. I'll keep asking till I get a straight answer. No more funny talk. What did Mike tell you? Here we go again. Sure we do. Until you talk. I'm going to ask you just ten questions. One with each knuckle. What did Mike tell you? What did Mike tell you? Come on, talk! <laughs> He hit me with everything he had. I went sailing across the room, three sheets in the wind. I hit the wall and fell to my knees, grabbing at the telephone table for support. And then the phone fell off the cradle. Hang up that phone. And I did. Hung it right on his head. No! He went down like the 29 stock market. And now something besides Joe's fists was connecting in my head. Madge said she had to dance at the club. Mike Royal used to hang around the Cherub Club. The Cherub Club. It was a shot in the dark, but I couldn't stop now. I looked at Joe sleeping on the floor. 
His return train from the land of dreams wouldn't leave for at least an hour. So I went out to the Cherub Club. Mike Royal had tagged me, and I guess I was it. Whether I wanted to play or not. Throw him again, Mr. Rogue. Yeah, uh, throw him again. Pause your point again. You're kind of fun to that number, ain't you? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know why. Six. Take him up, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Say, why don't you keep your mind on this game? Gonna watch the floor show? Watch the floor show. Gonna play dice? Play dice. I'm sorry, Sam. I... Just looking the club over. Looking it over? Thinking of buying in or something? No, it's just that I see a lot of changes since I was here last. All for the worse, too. Yeah. Nobody to look after the place since Mike Royal got in trouble and left. Poor Mike. Hey, Mike did hang around here a lot, didn't he, huh? Sure. He was general handyman. Dolled the place up. Fixed props for the gals on the line. Mike was always puttering around. Busy little man. Yeah, too busy. Come on, Mr. Rogue. Throw the dice. Your point's four. Seven out. Want to go again? No, uh, just a minute, Sam. Say, uh... You got a dancing doll here who answers to the name of Madge? Madge? Sure. She's out on the floor now. Uh, in that line? Hmm. Second from the end. Oh. In the devil costume, you mean, with the uh, pitchfork? No, that's Lil. Madge is on the other side. The angel with the wings and the crown. Angel? Oh. Yeah. They hadn't changed that hungry number for three months. Since before Mike left. I can't look at it anymore. Angel, huh? Hey, Sam. Sam, I got ten bucks that says you can't tell me how to get backstage. I'll take that bet. Huh? Oh. Hello, Joe. I thought I left you in dreamland. I'm a light sleeper. What are you doing here? Playing tiddlywinks. What are you doing here? What does it look like? Playing dice, stupid. Don't get funny. Joe, for Pete's sake, don't start anything here. You know the boss don't like it. Stay out of this, Sam. Okay, Rogue, you don't want to talk? You can walk. Where to? You wanted to go backstage. Okay, this gun will show you the way. We'll return to Rogue's Gallery in a moment. But now, a word to the men. Your face is something that accompanies you wherever you go. So every man wants a face that's smooth shaven, without nicks and scars. If you're the type whose super-sensitive skin makes shaving a chore, try Fitch's Noble Brush Shaving Cream next time. It has a special skin conditioning action. When it turned out Madge really was one, with wings and crown and all and all, a gun poked me in the stomach. I looked up and saw Joe on the other end of it. Seems my phone call to his skull must have been a bum connection. Because there he was, walking around again, friendly as a toothache. He took me to a back office and shoved me in a chair. No use looking around, Rogue. There ain't no phone in this place. No for no double cross between you two. I'm staying here. If you're going to talk, talk. I don't talk with a gun crowding my tonsils. Tell this bug to put it away. Put it away, Joe. Now put a slug into him. Put it away, I said. All right, Rogue. Where are we going to get the diamonds? From an angel. Angels again. You know what I mean, don't you, Angel? No. I'm telling you, that's all I know. All right, Joe, do it your way, but not with a gun slug him. We'll drag him out to the car like we were walking a drunk. Then we'll finish him. Wait. Can't we, uh... Go ahead, I got him covered. Look, I'm telling you the truth. All right, George Washington. Here's a little phone bill I owe you. No, no, wait. Joe. Joe, there are the diamonds. What? There they are. Madge is wearing them. What are you talking about? Mike told me an angel would hand them to me. Madge is the angel, Joe. Look at the way she's dressed. Those are the jewels in her crown. Four of them, see? You're crazy. These jewels are paste. No, they're not. Listen, Joe. Mike worked here, didn't he? Gave the girls their props. They've been doing this number at the club since before Mike was put away. There were four stones, weren't there? There are four in that crown. Look at those stones, Joe. They're real. Madge. 
Give me that crown. Don't fall for that, Joe. Finish them off. Didn't I tell you before an angel had them? Yeah, you said it before. You dim bulb, can't you see? Stalling. She knows it's true, Joe. She's going to try to pull a double cross. Give me that crown. Wait a minute, Joe. Don't let her get out of this room with those stones, Joe. She'll double cross his boat. Cut it out, Rogue. You're getting Joe excited. He doesn't know what he's doing half the time anyway. Give me that crown. Listen to me. I'm still running the show, and you're going to take my orders. You'd have burned with Mike tonight if it weren't for me. Shut up. You just watch this monkey until I get back. Keep your gun on him. You ain't leaving this room with that crown. Don't be nuts. Edge. Let go of me. Look out, Joe! Too late, baby. I've got him. Hey! You're breaking my arm. I will if you don't drop that gun. Madge, get this guy off me. Okay, let go of him, Rogue. Oh, no, you don't, baby. Oh, claws, huh? Okay, break it up. Break it up. I've got you covered, all of you. Hey, cops. Urban. <sighs> Urban. Where did you come from? Well, uh, the switchboard girl at your hotel called me when you didn't answer after your phone fell off the hook. I got to your room in time to see this lug stagger out, and I tailed him here. But I didn't know where you were until I heard the scuffle. Now, what the devil is going on anyway? Well, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, Urban. I... First, there's a little unfinished business to attend. To. Yeah, what's that? Just this. Ooh. Yeah. Ah, little Joy Boy's been asking for that all night. I... I'm sorry I can't oblige you too, Madge, but uh, I'm a gentleman. Darn it. Hey, Rogue, what gives? Well, Urban... You'll probably be pleased to know that my little playmates here are the Marist Jewel Thieves. Yeah? Yeah. Now, Madge, if you'll just give the nice man the crown you're wearing... No, no, you don't. Listen, baby. I could forget about being a gentleman very easily. Give it to him. Here you That's move. better. Okay, O'Brien, take these two down and book them on suspicion. Come on, you two. Now, Rogie, what's this crown business? That, my friend, is a death house legacy. A ten grand windfall to a skinny little kid. Huh? Mike Royal knew where the Mars jewels were. He wanted to tell me so I could turn them in and split the reward with his kid. But he knew his pals would be laying for me. And he knew they'd try to beat out of me whatever he told me. But what I didn't know, I couldn't tell. Under fists or bullets. So? So, all he told me was that an angel would hand them to me. He hoped they wouldn't be able to figure it out, and I would. And uh, you did? I certainly did. As usual, I might say. And there are the jewels. And that crown. In this crown? Rogue, are you kidding? These are paste. Ten cent store stuff. <laughs> I know diamonds when I see them. Oh, let's not go through that again. Those are diamonds. Yeah? Suppose I pound them a little with my gun. If they're diamonds, it won't hurt them. Go ahead. Look. That's one. There's a second one, Rogie. Oh. oh, brother. Well, shall I go on, Rogie, or do we just go home? You win, Urban. Let's, uh, let's get out of here. Ah, uh, the Cherub Club. Well, I'm glad to see the outside of this place. <laughs> the Maris Jewels. Oh, brother, telling me about diamonds. Thanks for the lumps, lady. Hey, Rogie, who are you talking to? The angel on that sign up there. That sign... Hey, uh, hey, Urban. You say you know costume jewelry when you see it? A mile away. Ah, uh, well, take a look at that sign up there. See the stars in that angel's hand? See how bright they are? Now, what would you say they were? Four glitter stones. From, from the five and ten? From the five and ten. Ah, get yourself a ladder, Urban. Climb it and take the Maris jewels out of that angel's hand. Well, I, uh, I knew it all the time. I, I was kidding about the crown. You see, Mike didn't tell me an angel would give them to me. He said an angel would hand them to me. Smart, wasn't that I? <laughs> yes, I found the jewels all right. Mike Royal, the club handy man, had put, put them in the angel's hand when he knew the police were closing in. And Mike's daughter in the parochial school got the, the ten grand all right. And Joe and Mads got theirs too, life. And me? Well, I took my five grand and had a wonderful time went right back to the galloping dominoes at the Cherub Club. Tried all night long, but I never did make my point. 
You know, that four is hard to make. Even the easy way. You know what I mean? This is Dick Dick Paul again, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you liked our story tonight. Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be, be with us again at the same time next week. And be sure to see Dick, Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Why, after a while, let a song be your style, you stitch. Jam it up and sing it to the beat. Jam it up and sing it to the beat. Jam it up and sing it to the beat. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, Presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Do you ever long for the bracing feel of the freezing wind on your face? Hard packed snow under your skis? And the beauty of the stately pine laboring to support the dust dry snow on its limbs? Does your heart cry out for the tingle of the air as it swishes by your herping frame on a toboggan course? It doesn't? Well, neither does mine. I can't imagine what throwback impulse to a pioneering ancestor may be decided to take that vacation at a winter lodge in the mountains, but uh, nevertheless, I, uh, I did. I laughed with snow down my neck, cheered and clapped my frozen hands when some idiot risked his neck. Did all of the things required of a guest. But I didn't like it. No, I didn't. Until I saw this lovely, lovely view. She was a slow-eyed Latin. She was voluptuous, and she was uh, at the snack bar. I just happened to sit down on the stool next to her. Give me a cup of coffee, will you, Harry, and not too much sugar? Yes, sir. I'd like another coffee, please, Harry. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Helps to thaw you out, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> I saw you on the ski course this afternoon. Oh? Is that why you're laughing? <laughs> you came flying through the air very gracefully. Landed right by me. <laughs> threw snow all over me. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't do it on purpose, you know. I, I guess I'd better take some more lessons. <laughs> yes, I know it's impolite of me to laugh. Oh, but... that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> if I'm going to be laughed at, I certainly want it to be you who does the laughing. You may come out and laugh at me in the morning. I'm going to take my first ski jump. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'll be there. One with sugar, one without. Uh, thanks, Harry. Oh, uh, Harry. Yes, sir? Would you mind introducing me to this lovely lady? Mr. Rogue, this lovely lady is Juanita Mansky. Oh. Oh, Mr. Rogue, are you Richard Rogue, the investigator? That's right, the uh, celebrated investigator. I, I'm very happy to know you. Thank I, you. Anybody ever tell you that... Uh, your eyes are as beautiful as dark pools of fire. <laughs> Left with the god of love for men to scorch in. Oh, my dear, my dear, you have the cutest nose in the world. Mm, my husband. He tells me those things every day. Your husband? Mm -hmm. You'll have to meet him. I'd love to. No, I'm mad about him. Oh, good. Now, Harry, there's too much sugar in this coffee. Sorry. I'll give you another cup. <laughs> Thank you. 
There was too much sugar in my coffee and too much sweetness in the marital situation of the lovely Juanita. There I was, all puckered up for one of those highly romantic resort friendships I'm always reading about. And there wasn't a girl in the place that abandoned would dance with, except Juanita. When I got up to leave, I noticed that Juanita had left her compact there on the bar. I picked it up, decided to return it to her in the dining room. I spotted her the minute I walked in. She was lovely in a white evening dress, which signaled all of the curves and soft shoulders. And her husband was a a very big guy, ruggedly handsome, black wavy hair and Viking blue eyes. He was as British as St. George of the Dragon, neither of which would have impressed him. He looked uh, vaguely familiar. I walked over to the table. Oh, hello, Mr. Rose. Hello, Mrs. Mansfield. I've been looking for you. You have? This is my husband, Mr. Rogue. Good evening, Mr. Rogue. Well, how do you do, Mr. Mansfield? Uh, oh, Juanita, here's your compact. You left it on the bar this afternoon. Oh, thank you. I've been looking all over for it. Well, I come in very handy sometimes. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, haven't we met before, Mr. Mansfield? I'm sure we haven't. Hmm. <laughs> Funny, I think we have. You know, I never forget a face. You from Los Angeles? Pasadena. I am, anyway. David's from England. Well, I want to thank you for returning Juanita's compact, Mr. Rogue. It was a present from me. I was so worried. And now we must finish our dinner, darling. We're playing bridge in half an hour. Oh. All right, David. Well, uh, good night. And good night, Mr. Mansfield. You know, I, I, uh, I wish I could remember where it was we met before. I'm sure you're mistaken, Mr. Rogue. We've never met. Massive intellect was grinding exceeding fine as I returned to my table. My subconscious was flashing a message about David Mansfield. There'd been a fear in his pretty blue eyes when he saw me approaching him. I'd known him before, someplace. And his name wasn't David Mansfield. The knowledge that the guy was a phony chased itself around in my mind without ever catching up with the answer. All through dinner and through a few fast rounds with the slot machines. I have a good memory for faces, and he had a good face to remember, but I I, uh, couldn't make connections. After losing a bum decision favoring the one-armed bandits, I went to my cabin, opened the door. Oh. Oh, I was trumped in clubs. Right on the back of my ear. I took an on-the-spot lesson in astronomy. Through the pink haze, I noticed that one of the stars in my orbit was beckoning to me. I looked closely. It was Juanita. I followed her timelessly until I was so tired I couldn't keep up the speed. Then I fell a million lifetimes into peaceful oblivion. When I opened my eyes, I was on cloud eight, my home away from home. There was an economy-sized female bending over me. Gosh, Mr. Rogue, I didn't think you were going to stop here. Where's Ugor? Who are you? I'm Ugor's girlfriend, and Ugor's going to see about a marriage license. A marriage license? What's that midget up to? He can't get married without my consent. True love? What does that spook know about love? Oh, Mr. Rogue. You'll give your consent, won't you, Mr. Rogue? No. If you don't, I'll push you over the side. Oh, no, no. Let me rest up here. Give your consent. Never. Hey, hey, stop pushing, you condensed minx. Cut it out. Cut it out. Over the side you go, Rogie. Goodbye! Goodbye! Oh. Mm. <coughs> oh. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I'm happy to see your eyes open. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, well, hey. Hey. Who are you, anyway? Where am I? One question at a time. You're in my cabin, and you can call me Doc. That's as good a name as any. No, 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 no. Try to sit up. You, you've been pretty close to death, you know. What's the matter with my shoulder? You have a nice clean wound through it. Mm. Yeah. Look like a thirty-two or thirty-eight revolver wound from a distance of maybe twenty-five feet. Who shot me? I can't tell you that. No. Just lie still. You have plenty of time to recover and ask questions. Well, uh, how long have I been here? Mm-hmm. Quite a spell. Let's see. Today is when... No. No, today is Thursday. I picked you up at the bottom of that canyon on Tuesday. You'd been lying there unconscious, at least overnight. Bottom of a canyon? Yeah. How'd I get there? You're asking me a lot of questions I can't answer, Mr. Rogue. From the looks of your head, my opinion is that somebody knocked you out, threw you over inspiration point, and when your fall was broken by the underbrush, shot you. You don't know who it was? Oh, I've, uh, I've got a good idea. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm beginning to remember now. Uh... Tell me, where's, uh, where's Inspiration Point from uh, Red Feather Lodge? It's about ten miles back into the mountains. Oh, I, I guess I was supposed to be killed, huh? That's just what you would have been if, if you hadn't managed to fall near one of my trap lines. You know, Doc, you, uh, you don't talk much like a trapper. That's possible. However, I am a trapper. I like being a trapper. I'm also a prospector because I like being a prospector. No, I'll probably never find any gold, and I'll probably never be a very good trapper. But I'm living the way I want to live, and uh, I'll bet that's more than you can say, Mr. Rose. I like the way I live. Mm -hmm. You're a private investigator, and I've been through your credentials. You live on violence and terror, and fear, and crime. Yes, and sudden death. You like that? Well, it's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, that's to cover up the fact that you're bored to death with your life, Rogue. No, there's only one way to live. That's my way. Yes, alone. Oh, uh, yeah. You saved my life then, didn't you, Doc? Yes. If I hadn't found you and brought you here and treated you, you would have frozen to death out there if you hadn't died of your wounds. Yes, I saved your life, but you don't owe me anything for that. You'd probably be better off dead. Most people would. Well, that's, uh, that's a great philosophy. How did you arrive at that? I lived like you do once. As a matter of fact, I lived like you do for many years. I was a physician, which is a very fortunate thing for you. Oh, I couldn't stand the people. All of them striving to be smarter, more successful, more ruthless than their immediate friends. All of them scheming and plotting and lying and cheating to pile up money which they never live to enjoy because they're burned out by the time they're 50. You know, uh, you know, you sound a little antisocial, Doc. But uh, if you don't mind, I'm, uh, I'm hungry. Huh? Oh. Yes, I'm, of course, I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. It, it, it's been so long since I've had anybody to talk with. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been chattering like a magpie, huh? Oh, no, no, no. It's been very interesting, but uh, I'm... Uh... Broth. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I have some broth for you. Strengthening. We'll have you built up to fine shape <laughs> by the time you're able to leave here, Mr. Hmm. Rowe. Oh, but look, Doc, I've got to get out of here right away. No, 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 no. I'm afraid not, Rogue. It's been snowing for five days. We're snowed in here. Snowed in? It'll be weeks before I can get you out of here, Mr. Rowe. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. 
First, men, these warm spring days are probably finding you out on the golf course, the ball diamond, or the tennis court. Remember, these active sports often cause perspiration and unpleasant scalp odors to cling to the hair, odors that a hasty shower in the clubhouse won't remove. To do a quick yet thorough job, try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. It forms lots of lather instantly to cleanse away dust, dirt, perspiration, and unpleasant scalp odors from your hair. The lather rinses out quickly and easily, too, so your shampoo is done in a jiffy. And men, Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo is made from pure natural oils. You can use it as often as you like, and it won't leave your hair dry or unruly, but always well-groomed, fresh, and clean. Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo is available at drug and toilet goods counters, or you can have a professional application at your barber shop. Now back to Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I couldn't figure out whether my benefactor Doc was as daffy as a red hearse or as wise as a barn full of owls, but he was a talker, and he was a good doctor. In two weeks, I was as full of health as a Boy Scout camp and as full of conversation as a book of plays. Doc shoveled his way out of his shack, mounted me on snowshoes, and helped me over the 20 miles that was as glistening white as the top of a wedding cake. When we came inside of the Red Feather Lodge, Doc said goodbye. I managed to swagger into the lobby of the hotel. I was... I was freshly shaved. And Doc had cleaned the blood from my shirt and jacket and mended them. In fact, I... I, uh, I looked quite presentable. The clerk uncovered his teeth in professional welcome as I walked up to the desk. Well, well, Mr. Rowe. Glad to have you back. Oh, I should think you would be. Wasn't anybody worried about me? Worried? Yes. I left rather suddenly, didn't I? Well, yes, but we know people in your business get called away. Called away? Yes, I took the call myself. Uh-huh. What's the matter, Mr. Rowe? Why are you looking at me that way? Surely you received your baggage at your office. Look, uh, there seems to be something the matter with my memory. Uh, just what happened? Why, you... You called... You told us uh, you'd send a check to cover your bill and ask us to please send your luggage to your office in Los Angeles as soon as the check arrived. We did just that. Only it wasn't a check you sent. It was a money order. Oh, 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 I see. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I remember it all now. Oh, by the way, is uh, David Mansfield uh, still here? Oh, no, no. Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield checked out. Must have been about three weeks ago. Any forwarding address? Oh, yes, sir. I'll get it for you in just a moment, Mr. Rogue. <laughs> He gave me the forwarding address. It was in South Pasadena. I copied it in my little black book and took the hotel bus into town where I caught a train for Los Angeles. The wheels in my head clicked it out with the wheels on the train in a rhythm that soon lulled me to sleep in spite of my determination to stay awake and figure my next move. The porter awakened me when we pulled into Los Angeles and I gathered myself for a taxi trip to my apartment. I grabbed the newspaper on my way to the cab to, uh check up on what the world had been doing without me. And the first headline to catch my eye was a story about the murder of, uh, of a Dorothy Grandy, a, uh, uh, model I, uh, I, uh, knew slightly. She'd been stabbed to death in her apartment. The phone was ringing when I got to my apartment. Rogue speaking. Hello, Richard. This is Eve Fulton. Oh, well. Oh, Eve, what goes? Dottie. Dottie Granby, you remember her? Yeah, sure. I, She's I... been murdered. Well, I, I know that. I just saw it in the paper. Well, she and I were living together at the Magnolia Arms. The police are here. Please come over. Well, look, Eve, I just got into town. Please, I've Richard, got... I'll pay you. Oh, yeah, sure. No, all right. I'll be right over. I went over because I'd always liked Eve and because I don't approve of beautiful girls being murdered. And because I knew Detective Lieutenant Urban of Homicide would be there. I wanted to see Urban. I did. When I opened the door, he was waiting for me. Well, Rogie, this time we found the body. Where have you been? I was out of town. Hello, Eve. Hello, Richard. You know the murdered girl? Hmm? No, well, yes, yes, slightly. Who would have wanted to kill her? How do I know? If you'll just give me a few minutes, I might be able to tell you. How well did you know her? Why, Inspector, you don't think that I... Ask him to go away, Richard. 
I want to talk with you alone. If you have anything to say, young lady, you'd better say it to the police. I'm representing this girl, Urban. What does she need representation for? She wasn't under suspicion. You mean she is now? Well, if she didn't do it, why would she want you to represent her? Well, maybe she wants the guilty man caught. You ever think of that? You'd better come down to headquarters and see me after a while, Rogie. Well, I intended to do that anyway. I got a little something I want to talk to you about. Good. I'll be seeing you then. Hmm. And uh, you, young lady, don't be making any plans for leaving town, understand? All right. I'm not going anyplace. In about an hour, Rogie. Yeah, it's your office, huh? Oh, I'm so glad he's gone. Oh, Richard, hold me. No, 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 Eve. Who did it? I don't know, Richard. Honestly, I don't. Oh, I'm so glad you came right over. I needed you. What's uh, Dorothy been up to lately that might get her killed? I don't know. But she's been up to something. You know how she was. Closed mouth and kind of uh, mercenary. Yeah, I, uh, I remember. Uh, go away, will you? If not, go away. We, we, we got a murder on our hands. Look, uh, uh, tell me, uh, what's Dorothy been mixed up in? Well, she's been spending a lot of money lately. I mean, things like mink coats. <laughs> she's always wanted one. She got one about three weeks ago. and Oh, all kinds of expensive things. Well, you uh, think she's been putting the bite on somebody? I don't know what to think, Richard. She and I had an awful fight a couple of nights ago. The police found out about her from the neighbors, and I, I'm afraid they're going to think I killed her. I couldn't kill anybody. Okay, okay. If you didn't do it, I'm going to have to find out who did. Uh, got any money? Well, yes, I can pay you, Richard. But... Give me $200 and I'll let you know when you owe me more. Oh, all right. I'll take the 200 now. In the meantime, I'd like to take a look around the joint. Well, I'll get it for you if you really want it. I do. Who has, uh, who's Dottie been romancing lately? Oh, she's been playing the field. There was one Argentine fellow that she was with a lot and... More than any of the others, I guess, but he hasn't been with her much lately. He decided he liked me better. Oh, is that what you and Dottie fought about? Well, yes. Hmm. What was this uh, Latin type's name? Eduardo Lopez. He's a millionaire. Oh, well. Hey. Hey, come here. What's this? Oh. Oh, the, those wedding pictures. Yeah. Who's the big blonde groom? Well, that's Dottie's husband. They hadn't lived together for years. Oh? They were still married? Yeah. She was always talking about getting a divorce, but she never did. You met him, Richard. Remember a couple of years ago? <laughs> Before you got mad at me. He was with Dottie one night when you came up after me. We played hearts. Remember? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, you got the 200 bucks? Yeah, yeah, here it is. I can't afford any more, Richard. You'll represent me for the 200, won't you? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'm a very big-hearted guy. I won't be needing any more money from you, honey. On account of I'm just about to solve a murder. We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. You know how spring winds stir up dust and dirt and can cause perspiration to cling to the hair. This combination can imperil the daintiness and freshness of your hair. However, regular use of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo will always keep your hair sweet-smelling and clean. Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils. It makes mountains of fluffy, fragrant lather. Lather that floats away the dust, oily film, and perspiration from your hair. Then, when you rinse, a patented rinsing agent contained right in the shampoo comes to your aid. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to ensure sparkling clean hair undimmed by a dull, soapy film. Your hair is left radiantly lustrous and delicately fragrant. Guard the charm and beauty of your hair by using Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo regularly. Fitch is spelled F I T C H. <laughs> Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I left Eve Fulton's apartment, dropped by Homicide Headquarters for a chat with Urban, but he wasn't there. So I left him a note and went out to the Mansfield address in South Pasadena. It was a beautiful home, set back in a kind of park. 
There was a circular driveway up to the front door, but I parked out on the street. I wanted time to work up plenty of hate before I hit that front door. Mrs. Mansfield answered the door herself. What? Why, Mr. Kuroga. Oh, surprised to see me, huh? I want to talk with you and your husband. You can't come in here. Oh, you're a punk fortune teller, Juanita. Look out, here I come. Where is that pretty husband of yours? He, he isn't home. Please, don't point that gun at me. Where is he? I don't know. He, he's out. I don't know when he'll come back. Uh, no kidding. Well, I'll just wait, if you don't mind, or if you do. I want to have a talk with him. Just walk right in here, Mr. Rogue. Hmm? Come on. I won't botch the job this time. Drop your gun. You know, you're a difficult man to get rid of, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, I, I, I suppose you know, Juanita, your husband tried to kill me back of Red Feather Lodge. Yes, he told me just a few days ago. He told me you were dead. He was afraid you'd come between us. You knew something. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'm quite a disappointment to him. As a matter of fact, to you both. Really, Mr. Rogue, I'm quite surprised to see you. How on earth did you ever get back here? I was certain that you were done in before I left you up there. Well, it's a long story, Mansfield. It wouldn't interest you. I want to talk to you about something else. Yes? Yes. You know, I, uh... I finally remembered where it was I met you, David. Indeed? Yes. You were married at the time to a girl named Dorothy Granby, but not working at it. I was dating a roommate, Eve Fulton. We played hearts together, and you gave me the queen of spades three times, and I've hated you ever since. I know of that early foolish marriage of David's, Mr. Rogue. Which one of you killed her? What makes you think either of us did? She was blackmailing you, wasn't she? Your marriage to Juanita wasn't legal. You'd never been divorced from Dorothy Granby. Dorothy found out about your uh, fortune marriage, and she was putting a bite on you for money, blackmailing you. She milked you for plenty, and finally you had to kill her, didn't you? I didn't kill her. Oh, you know, I can get an indictment against you in 20 minutes with your record and the facts in the case. You're going to die of cyanide poisoning, Mansfield. Mm -hmm. I'm going to arrange it. I didn't kill her. I didn't. I killed her, David. Juanita, you don't know what you're saying. I know very well what I'm saying, darling. I followed her home to her apartment, and I killed her. We promised each other nothing could ever come between us. I killed her for us. Now we're free. You're not quite free of me, though, Juanita. That's a matter of our convenience, however, Mr. Rogue. Yeah, I suppose that's right. You've got the gun. You tried to kill him once, David, to save our happiness. Now... Yes, dear. But first, I'm interested, Mr. Rogue, in just how you learned all you know about us. I wouldn't want you to die uninformed, David. I found a wedding picture of you and Dorothy in her desk at the scene of the murder. You were a blonde then. That was before you dyed your hair. You were without mustache, and you were a lot fatter. But I never forget a face, Mansfield. The minute I saw that picture, I knew why you'd been so frightened when I met you at the Red Feather Lodge. That's unfortunate. Let's go for a little ride in your car, shall we, Mr. Oak? Uh-huh. Of course. Oh, well, uh, you love each other very much, you two, don't you? Very much, Mr. Rogue. I think it would be awfully nice if you could have a double execution. It's going to be a pleasure to finish you, Rogue. Come on. Oh, don't be a patsy, Mansfield. This dame's a murderer. She, she's going to pay for Shut it. Shut up. And if you take a shot at me, you're going to pay with her. You're inside the law now. Don't listen to him, David. Don't come any closer, Rogue. You want to take that walk with her? So that little green door... Into that glassed-in room with the green chair and the gas that makes you choke and die. I haven't killed anybody. Give me the gun, Mansfield. I haven't killed anybody, Rose. No, give it to me. I'll kill him. <laughs> Davis. I, I shot her. Juanita. Yeah. Come here, pretty boy. Hmm. Broke my hand. Well, that was the end of the case. David Mansfield tried to kill me in the mountains because he thought I might remember him and ruin his marriage with Juanita's bankroll. Instead of staying dead, I came back and killed two birds with one stone, in a matter of speaking. I, uh, I caught a murderess. Juanita lived for her execution, and David won't be out of the pen in time to vote for the 40th president. And, oh, uh, <laughs> oh by the way, I, uh, I saw my hermit friend, Doc, a couple of weeks ago... He's living at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Yeah. In a suite of five rooms. Found gold up in them thar hills and gave up hermiting. He's getting married next week to a lovely widow with five children. (laughs) 
Oh, there's nothing like living alone and liking it. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music. And Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next week, will you? We have a story for you about, uh, about a birthday party, a locked penthouse, and a homicide. We call it the impossible murder. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be sure to tune in next week, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your star news, Rich After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you stitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you stitch shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. I guess it wouldn't be polite for me to make the statement that Judge Colin Baker was a snake. I'll just say I think there was some truth of the rumor that he did shed his skin three times a year. The judge, who isn't a judge anymore, was a big barrel-chested guy with a dramatic mop of wavy white hair worn in a sort of a modified wind-blown bob, the better to impress the juries with. He'd made himself a reputation back east as a fire-eating DA, and then later as a hanging judge. He'd been out here about five years and had built a statewide reputation as a brilliant criminal lawyer on a -a set-a-thief-to-catch-a-thief basis. He had just won a big case and he was having a cocktail party at his penthouse apartment on top of the building which housed his plush officers. Betty, uh, Betty Callahan had covered the trial. And now she and the photographer from her paper were covering the party. I tagged along. Oh, there was a dandy crowd there. Pasty-faced politicians, tired-faced women, and the old two-faced judge in all of his glory. I think it's a lovely party. Oh, Richard, isn't this a lovely place? Clear up here on top of this building. Just like living on a mountain. Yeah, only you can't lock the bottom entrance of a mountain. (laughs) You see anybody here you would really like to know? Now, don't be bitter. You know I had to come here tonight. I don't like these people any better than you do. Well, get it over with as soon as you can. Let's go someplace where I can take my hand off my pocket. Well, well, my dear Miss Callahan, I'm oh. sorry I couldn't get over to you before. Indeed I am. I saw you come in, but Richard Rogue, I'm so glad you could come, sir. Thanks. And now, my dear, I suppose you like some pictures. I see you have a photographer with you. How thoughtful of you. Yes. Uh, could I get a group around the fireplace? Just you and the people connected with the trial, the, uh, the defendant and the witnesses. Of and, uh... course. I'll round them up for you immediately. Oh, thank you, Judge. Yes. Yeah. Mike. Yeah? You ready to go? Hey, they're sure serving good look here. Real scotch. None of that near scotch I get at the bar. Good. Now, here's what I want, Mike. Mm-hmm. Get me some shots of the group that's forming over by the fireplace. Right. We'll put the judge in the middle. Mm-hmm. And um, have everybody congratulating him and the man he saved from the gas chamber. I can think of a few captions for that picture. Richard. Yeah, uh, we couldn't quit him. Mm. 
You can't call a prominent guy like the judge a crook. And you can't call a murderer a murderer after a bought jury says he's not. You get the idea, Mike. Come on, Mike. You stay right here, Richard. I'll be back as soon as we've covered the art angle on the story. And then we leave, right? Yeah. Just as soon as I can, dear. I uh, wandered around in the crowd and listened in to scraps of conversations. Jim Dorset, an oily politician on the judge's payroll, was talking with uh, with a Mary Miller. Mary is a self-made wealthy widow whom the judge had defended uh, after she'd poisoned her husband. She was glaring hate at the judge like a death ray, and I moved within earshot of them. <laughs> Well, Mary, you enjoying yourself at this testimonial to our friend's genius? I'd rather be at his wake. I'd enjoy my cocktails more. Yeah, you can count me in on that, too. I'm surprised at you, though, Mary. He got you out of a pretty bad spot, didn't he? Yes, for exactly half the money Fred left me. I didn't kill Fred, you know. I was innocent. Oh, sure, sure. Well, here's to meeting you again soon at his wake. <laughs> Happy little gathering. The laughter, which was bouncing off a high ceiling, had all the gay spontaneity of an open grave. But everybody was getting along with the judge. He was a big man. He had lots of money, lots of power. In a way, I couldn't help admiring the old boy, posing over by the immense fireplace, tossing that snowy mane of his about, and filling the rooms with his deep-throated laughter. Betty finally got all of the pictures she wanted, and came glaring over to me. I got a little lump in my throat like I always do when I see Betty. Oh, if Mark Anthony could have seen her, Cleopatra would have been in the second barge, rowing. We'll leave in just a moment, Richard. We have to stay and drink one toast to the judge. He's going to be hurt if we don't. Well, I wouldn't want to cause him pain. Oh, he's getting our cocktails now. He's going to bring them over. Okay. Did you get some pretty pictures of the old windbag? He's charming. I like him. Hmm. Shh. Here he comes. How can you like a guy like that? Well, here we are. Hope they're not too strong. <laughs> Miss uh, Callahan, I wonder if you would forgive me if I borrowed Miss Tarot for just a moment. Uh, I have something I wish to ask his advice on privately. Why? Uh, couldn't we make it tomorrow, Judge Betty and uh, I? Are tomorrow co- will be too late, I'm afraid, Mr. Rogue. This will only take a few minutes. You won't mind, will you, Miss Callahan? No, of course not. Okay, all right, Judge. Uh, where do we go? My study, right through here. <laughs> Now, I received a rather alarming note tonight, Mr. Rogue. Yes? When? It was under my glass when I returned to the serving table after those pictures were taken. Here it is. Hmm. Paper and envelope from the dime store, huh? Well, can't trace them. Hmm. Well, let's have a see here. Hmm. Have a good time, you murderer. You won't be alive at this time tomorrow night. You're going to celebrate an anniversary. You can't run so far that I won't find you and kill you. Hmm. Unsigned, of course. Printed in block letters with no skill. Anybody could have written that. And anybody could have left it there on the serving table. That's right. There have been a hundred people drifting in and out of here. You, uh, take the note seriously? Rogue, I've had threatening letters before, of course. But this one, well, I have a hunch about it. A premonition. We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, when it comes to good grooming, your mirror can't tell you everything. It can't tell you how much clean, fragrant hair adds to that indefinable something called charm. Don't take chances on detracting from your loveliness. Keep your hair fresh and clean-smelling at all times by using Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo regularly. This clear, golden liquid shampoo lathers magnificently and washes away dust, dirt, perspiration, and unpleasant odors from your hair. Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils. It never leaves the hair dry or harsh feeling. Thus, you can use it as often as you like, 
and be sure that your hair is shining clean and free from offending odors. Have a professional application of Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo the next time you're at your barber or beauty shop, or buy a bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Ask for the economical large size, 16 ounces for $1. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I didn't want to go to the party in the first place, but I wanted to be with Betty Callahan, and she had to be there. It was a victory cocktail party which Judge Colin Baker was throwing to celebrate the fact that he'd cleared another guilty murderer. I wasn't particularly happy when the judge took me in his study and showed me a note threatening him with death within the next 24 hours. In fact, I didn't pay much attention until I looked at the judge's face. He was scared. Rogue, I've had threatening letters before, but this one... Well, I have a hunch about it, a premonition. Well, what are you going to do about it? The safest place in the world for me to stay is right here in this penthouse, and I want you to stay with me, Rogue. Me? I'll pay you well for your time, and... What's uh, well? I'll give you $500 if you'll stay with me for the next 24 hours, Mr. Rogue. Oh, oh 500 clams, huh? Well, Judge, that, uh, that makes it very interesting. You'll accept the assignment, then? Like a flash. Just let me explain it to Betty Callahan. I, I was supposed to take her out tonight. Very well. I'm sure Miss Callahan will understand when you tell her about the fee. I need you, Mr. Rogue. so busy, you have to break your date with me. That's a habit of yours, isn't it, Richard? Oh, I... Well, you won't ever have to do it again. You'll never have another chance. To. Oh, but, Betty, baby, listen, the judge figures someone is going to try to kill him tonight. You don't want to be a party to a murder, do you? You're not worried a bit about the judge, and you know it, Richard. You're thinking of that $500. Well, is that bad? Five bills will buy a lot of entertainment. You can have a lot of joy on $500. Don't knock it. Don't sneer at it. Well, I suppose I might just as well get Mike to take me home. I should have known that you'd get a better offer. You always do. Mike! Yes, Miss Callahan? Uh, well, uh, Miss Callahan, uh, I'm afraid I owe you an apology. Oh, no, Judge. I can't very well blame you if my friend Richard is so crazy about that money. Judge, I, uh, I got word for you. I can't take the assignment. But I have your word, Mr. Rogue. Well, I wouldn't want you to break your word with anybody else, Richard. Oh, no. Are you ready, Mike? You can shove off, Mike. I'm taking Miss Callahan home. Well, okay by me. I'm, uh, I'm really sorry, Judge, but... Now, look, you two youngsters, there's no point in having a disagreement over this. Why don't you just stay here until the rest of the guests leave? They're beginning to leave now. Then, Mr. Rogue... You can take Miss Callahan home and come back. Ah, uh, that would leave you alone for about an hour. There's only one entrance to this place. That's my private elevator. I'll give you the key. You can lock it as you leave. No one can possibly get up here. Oh, I don't want to cause all that trouble. Oh, it'll only be a little while, baby. I hope you'll do this favor for me, Miss Callahan. I need Mr. Rogue's moral support tonight. Even at my age, I feel that I'm too young to die. Betty and I hung around for another hour until all the guests either walked or were helped from the cocktail party. Then the judge and I went through the penthouse like acid goes through cotton. We looked under everything that was raised from the floor and behind everything that stood a foot high. Then we turned on the floodlights and searched the area surrounding the penthouse. Then the roof. There was nobody there. The judge was alone when Betty and I rode his private elevator and locked it with a foolproof lock before we got into my car and headed for her place. Betty was annoyed and, uh... That ride home was as romantic as a tub full of wet wash. But uh, she'd been annoyed before, and I wasn't worried. I left her at her apartment and fiddle-footed out to my car. I opened the car door, bent to get in. <coughs> oh! Lightning struck behind my ear. 
I heard the thunderbolts rocketing past and latched onto one for a wild ride through the firmament. Stars kept exploding in my face, but I, I hung on until I saw my home away from home. Oh, good old Cloud 8. I let go, dropped an eon or two, and landed as softly as a smoke ring. I didn't open my eyes for a moment. <laughs> Chippy! Chippy, wake up! You're home! Oh, hello, you guard. I didn't think you were ever going to get here, Rogi. I was worried. Huh? Oh. Mm. Where, uh, where have I been? I saw you go by here a couple of centuries ago. You went right past. I saw you way upstairs knocking at the pearly gates. <laughs> You go, Art. This isn't... Oh, tell me that this isn't... Oh, no, Chiefy. You're way north of there, oh. and you're alive. Oh, I'm glad to know that. What happened? Somebody knocked you out of the park, Rogi, and then you went for an automobile ride, and then... Oh, they... I gotta get out of here. Oh, yes, you do. You've been gone a long time. An old friend of yours is trying to get through to you. No. It's 9.30, Ack Emmon. Over you go, Chiefy. All right, Hugo. Give me a shove. So long, Chiefy. See you next week. No, <laughs> <laughs> hey. mm. oh, oh, oh. Oh. Hello, hello, Urban. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm trying to get these handcuffs off you. Oh, where are we? We're in the hills above Mulholland Drive. Somebody brought you up here, chloroformed you, and handcuffed you to this tree with your own handcuffs. You need a bodyguard, Rogie. How did uh, you find me? Oh, I got a phone call telling me where you were to bring a file. Stand still or I'll leave you here. Oh, okay. Mm. Who did it? Uh, I'm why? waiting for you to tell me that. Oh, I don't get it. Somebody wanted you out of the way for a while, Rogie. Now, do you want to tell me what you're mixed up in? I wasn't on a case, and I... Ooh, careful. Oh! There. Now, you have to get a new chain for your bracelets, but anyway, you're unharnessed from that tree. Look, Urban, I, uh... I was supposed to be bodyguarding Judge Colin Baker last night. Bodyguarding that crook? Why? Well, he, uh... He got a death threat, and... A note found on the serving table during a cocktail party. Go on. Yeah, somebody promised to kill him within 24 hours. Well, what'd you leave him for? Well, I took, uh, took Betty Callahan home. Somebody must have followed me when I left the judge's penthouse. They knocked me out as I left Betty. Oh, maybe we'd better check on the judge's health. Maybe that note wasn't kidding. How do you feel? Uh, woozy. Uh, you can hang your head out the window on the way back. We'd better see whether your client needs a bodyguard or an undertaker. My head was full of feathers and my hands felt heavy on my arms. My mouth was lined with brown blotting paper and my shoes were full of lead. I wasn't feeling very well as, as I got in Urban's official sedan and headed for the penthouse where I'd left Judge Colin Baker. My head ached like a broken heart until I took a couple of pills from Urban's first aid kit. And by the time we pulled up in front of the office building, I felt like I had a chance at living if I wanted to, and I decided I wanted to. The private penthouse elevator was still locked just as I'd left it, and that made me glad. We entered it. Maybe we should have called before we took this trip. No, I, I want to see the old boy. I owe him an apology. If he's still alive. How could he be dead unless somebody else had a key to this elevator? Well, they didn't. The only other key is on the judge's key ring. He told me that. And what are you worried about? I'm not worried. I, uh, oh, I just hate to give him back those nice, crisp C notes. That's all. I hope he's out. Well, uh, this is it. Oh, good Lord. Hmm. 
Well, the judge will never be any debtor. Mm. Blue in the face. He's been strangled, Rogi. We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. It's long been acknowledged that fragrance and charm go hand in hand. But unpleasant hair and scalp odors can banish charm in a hurry. By using Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo regularly, you can keep your hair flower fresh and fragrant. That's because Fitch's saponified shampoo makes billows of fragrant lather. Lather that floats away dirt, oily film, and displeasing odors from the hair. Then the lather rinses away easily and completely. You see, Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo contains its own special patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works right with the plain rinse water to assure you that your hair will be sparkling, radiant with all its natural color highlights. And there's no danger that your hair can offend others with unpleasant scalp odors, for Fitch's saponified shampoo leaves it dewy fresh and fragrant. Next time, ask for Fitch. F-I-T-C-H. Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. Now, back to Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Maybe I was surprised when I saw Judge Colin Baker looking up at me from the floor of his living room. I'm not sure. I had a hunch. Don't ask me why. I just had a hunch that he was dead when Urban brought me out of that stupor up there above Mulholland Drive. Judge Baker's face was as blue as a policeman's coat as he lay there, and his eyes were staring wide open. Urban and I walked over to him. He's been strangled, Rogie. Yeah, yeah, looks like it. Uh, any marks on his throat? No, no marks. Looks like there was a struggle, though. Table kicked over. Mm, how could anybody get in here? That elevator was locked. There's no other entrance. What are you trying to do? Tell me this guy's not dead? No, he's dead, all right. But how could he be strangled? I don't... Hmm. Cigarette, Urban. No, thanks, Rogie. So, he was murdered, wasn't he? Yeah, no. That calls for the medical examiner. Well, I don't get it. There was nobody here when I left. There's been nobody here since. There's... Hey, there's a peculiar odor in here. Smell it? No, no, no. Sit down, Rogie, while I look around. There's been a murder. You're mixed up in it, and I want to talk with you. Oh, you think I killed him? I didn't know him that well. I wasn't even mad at him. Hey, what's that? A check. A check for $2,500 made out to the victim and signed by Mary Miller... Was she here last night? Yeah, she was here. And she didn't like the judge. But I'd never heard of a dame her age doing a human fly act. Maybe she had a key to the joint. But she didn't believe me she didn't. Where's the phone? Oh, it's in the bedroom. I'm going to use it. Wait here, Rogue. There was a peculiar order in that room. A faintly familiar order, but I couldn't place it. My poor old beat-up mind was whirling a million revolutions a minute and getting no place. And then I I remembered the note the judge received. It had uh, mentioned an anniversary. So I decided not to wait. Instead, I took that long elevator ride and grabbed a cab for the library. May I help you? Oh, yes. I, uh, I want to see the files on the Gotham City newspapers for the last ten years. All right, sir. It's going to take me some time to get them out of the storeroom. Any specific dates? Yes, I, uh, I would like to see copies of the editions 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 years ago today. All right, sir, if you'll just have a chair. You sure you'll feel all right? You look ill. Oh, I, uh, I always look like this, thank you. Just get me the papers, please. They're mighty important. Confidentially, I think they're going to solve a murder. The librarian got me the papers. I went to work on them. Gotham City was the city where Judge Colin Baker had made his reputation as a hanging judge. My hunch was as strong as a bride's coffee and it paid off. In the issue for seven years ago that day, I found the name of Judge Colin Baker on the front page. A man he had sentenced to the chair for murder had been executed, screaming his innocence. 
Within an hour after the electricity had torn through the body of this man, Harold Michaels, the real killer had confessed. And this was the anniversary of that legal murder. I called Betty Callahan at her paper. She wasn't there. She was covering the police investigation of Judge Baker's murder. I took a cab back to the judge's penthouse. Oh, isn't this terrible, Richard? If it hadn't been for me insisting on you taking me home, the judge would have been alive. Or I would have been dead. Where have you been, Rogie? I told you to stay here. I'm not doing your work for you, Urban. I got demoted for this murder. You have, Richard? No. What did the medical examiner have to say, Urban? Oh, you know the doc. He just did a little muttering about cyanide. Won't give any official opinion until he's had a chance to analyze the contents of the body. What's your theory on the motive? Well, I... Hey, Betty, where are you going? I'm with the working press. Mike and I are going to get some pictures. All oh, right. I can hear that massive intellect of yours ticking, Rogie. And I recognize that far away look in your eyes. Now, what goes? Don't stand there like a dummy. If you've got any theories, let me in on them. Mm, cyanide, huh? Look, Urban, uh, this place is air-conditioned, isn't it? The penthouse is. The building isn't. Yeah? I'll be back in a minute. Hey, where are you going? I'll be back in a minute. I want to check that theory of mine. Cyanide. That word brought back that dainty smell I'd noticed in the apartment when Urban and I had discovered the judge's body. Cyanide. The odor of cyanide is brought out by cigarette smoke. I had been smoking when I detected it. Ah, the pieces of this murder were falling in place like a well-trained chorus. I found the ladder that led to the top of the penthouse, where the air conditioning machinery was located, ran up the ladder, gun in hand, and there he was, the murderer. Just lifting an earthenware crock from inside the housing of the intake fan on the air conditioning system. Put it down, Mike. Make another move toward me, Rogue. I'll let you have this crock full of acid right in your face. What good let do you, Mike? You can't get away. Another five minutes and I would have been home. Free. How'd you figure me, Rogue? Why'd you have to horn in? I looked up the Gotham newspapers for seven years ago today, the day Judge Baker executed a man named Har Harold Michaels, an innocent man. Was he your brother? Your name's Michaels, isn't it? He was my father. And I executed the man who executed him. In his own private gas chamber. Just like they do it at Quentin. I waited a long time for the chance. Look, Mike, I'm not arguing right or wrong with you, but now you're a killer. And I'm going to take you in. Put that crock down. No, I don't think so, Rogue. I'll just stand here. I have to think. Just for my information, Mike, how did you delay the action of the gas until you knew the judge would be alone? I thought of everything. I didn't want to hurt anybody but Baker. I hung the cyanide pellet over the acid on a piece of cotton cord. I tested it half a dozen times. You know... It took a drop of acid three hours to eat through the cord. I'm glad I killed him, Rogue. I'm coming after you, Mike. I'm not waiting, Rogue. I don't like the gas chamber. Mike. Mike. Don't. Come back here. I'm not sorry for anything. Tell him that was my payoff line, will you, Rogue? So long. No. Don't, Mike. Don't jump. <laughs> Mike's plan for murdering the man who had caused his father's execution was as near perfect as any murder will ever be. While the guests were having whoopee at the cocktail party, he put that jar of acid in the air conditioning intake, hung the cyanide pellet over it, and was back at the party leaving that note before anybody missed him. When he found that I was going to return to spend the night with the judge, he uh, had to knock me out and get me out of the way for at least five hours three hours before the cyanide fell into its acid bath, and two more hours which it took for the air conditioning system to completely change the air in the penthouse. <laughs> oh, it's clever, I thought. It, uh, yes, it, uh, looks like I did it again. Had a narrow escape, though, but, uh, that didn't bother me. I drive every day in the Los Angeles traffic. You know what I mean?
This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next week, will you? We have a story for you about a black-eyed senorita from Argentina, a Latin-type corpse, and a mysterious gold piece. We call it Latin-type. After and between Fitz shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few... Hello, creeps. This is a very tired T4Y on the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight's story will be told by Dick Powell, who plays Richard Rogue now, in another graphic adventure from Rogue's Gallery. When I got on this Rattler for my trip to Central City, I was not exactly a joy boy. I hate riding on trains. But a couple of hours later, I'm a happy chappy. Because who do I run across in the lounge car is a little ambition of mine by the name of Betty Callahan, a newspaper woman who is cheating the movies. She's a pocket-sized brunette with cornflower blue eyes and a complexion which wouldn't come off on the shoulder of my blue gabardine suit. I rescued her from the wolves in Uncle Sam's clothing, who were making life too interesting for her in the club car, and we retired to my compartment for the talk about, uh, old times. Nice little place you have here, Richard. A guy can get pretty lonesome in a place like this, you know, Betty. Get that gleam out of your eye, Richard. I'm perfectly comfortable right where I am. Oh, all right, all right. I just thought maybe you'd like to sit here with me and look out of the window. You're so thoughtful. You haven't even told me where you're going. Did things finally get too hot for you at home? Please. I'm going to Central City, baby, for the same reason you are. The Charlie Miller trial. Don't tell me you've learned to write. (laughs) Very funny. I'm an expert witness, and I've got a briefcase full of research here. That's going to make the DA very happy. Uh, come a little closer. Oh, all right. What do you think? Is Charlie going to get the works? Oh, let's not talk about Charlie. Let's talk about me. Don't you ever get tired of that subject? No, it fascinates me. Come on, what are you sitting clear over there for? You like it here. Why? Did your mother ever tell you anything? About fellows like you? <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> Why don't you drop that front page character, Angel? We've known each other for a long time. Stop pulling. Well, I was just trying to... Well, stop trying. How can you be so mean to me? Ever since the first time I, I saw you, Betty, I've, I've been stuck on you. No kidding. Oh, Richard. <laughs> Did anybody ever believe that line? Once in a while. You know something's going to happen to you in just a minute, baby. Will I like you? Let's find out. Oh, brother. What's the idea, lady? This is a private compartment. Please. I'm sorry to intrude. Who is this girl, Richard? I never saw her before. Who are you? I had to come in here. My life is in danger. Well, offhand, lady, I don't think you improved your situation any breaking in here when you did. Oh, why does everything have to happen to me? Why don't you buy a ticket, Latin type, and then you wouldn't have to play hide-and-seek with the conductor. I had to come in here. I'm hiding. There's a man on this train who has designs on my life. Yes. What Bernhardt could have done with that line? You don't believe me? That's right. Now scram. Don't answer it. Please. It's 
Tim. The guy with the design? I want to take a gander, Tim. Oh, no, no, no. I'll answer it myself. I want to talk to you a minute, Diane. It's impossible, Fritz. There's nothing more to say. I think maybe you'd better. I know where you're going, Diane, and I know what you've got. How do you want to come out here? All right. I'll be with you in a minute. I'll be waiting. Want me to take care of that punk for you? You stay out of this, Richard. Please. Will you keep this briefcase for me? Don't let anyone touch it. Please. Why don't you get a drawing room with a revolving door, Richard? Oh, shut up. You know, I'm kind of worried about that girl. I'm going to feel pretty silly if she comes up dead. For the next two minutes, I worried about Diane and the man who had designs on her life. But I'm a romanticist at heart. So I spent the next 58 minutes trying to spellbind Betty into seeing things my way. But she wasn't looking. At the end of an hour, my chances were still about on the ratio of Little Rock Junior High against Notre Dame. So I gave up. Well, it's been an hour since our visitor checked out. What do you think, Richard? The dame's either as goofy as a cub outfielder or she's really in a jam. If you're pulling me, I'll put my ex on the first stanza. Let's take a look in that briefcase she left behind. Hey, wait a minute, honey. That's my briefcase. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't get huffy, Richard. Those two briefcases are practically identical. Yeah, I guess they aren't that. Well, give me mine. I'm going to put it up here on the rack. Hey, what is this? Pipe down, pretty boy. Turn the lights back on, Richard. Shut up, lady. All right, give me that briefcase, pretty boy. Get that flashlight out of my eyes. Keep your hands where they are. Give me that flashlight. Sorry, lady, but you asked for it. <laughs> now, pretty boy, give me that bag. Hey, what's the gimmick? What are you pulling that emergency cord for? I don't want to have to shoot you. Keep your hands out of your coat. So long, pretty boy. As he pulled the cord, I could see the gleam of a gun in this character's fist, and I didn't want any samples of his marksmanship. But I could hear Betty groaning on the floor at my feet, and all of a sudden I felt that I had to get him before he jumped out of that window. He'd knocked out with the butt of his pistol. I made a dive for him, expecting to stop a little lead. When I got where he'd been, he wasn't there. He was behind me. I knew that when I heard the flashlight whizzing through the air. It connected expertly right behind my ear. And there I went again into the land of Nod, which is practically my home away from home. Everything was very quiet for a while, and I slept peacefully. Come on, Rogie. Come on. Get up, Rogue. Get up. Huh? Snap out of it. Betty's been hurt. Betty? The man got away. You've got to get up. Oh, I can't. Oh, my head. Get up. Get up. Wake up. Get up. What's that noise? It's at the door. Someone wants in. Oh, they'll go away. Snap out of it, Rogie. Let him in. Betty's been hurt. What happened? I can't remember. Remember the man? Remember the girl? He came back in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cut it out. Stop that pounding. Ooh, my head. You're in a jam, Rogie. Betty's been hurt. Wake up. Get up. I can't. I can't. What's that pounding? Pounding, pounding. Cut it out. Cut it out. Stop it, do you hear? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Okay, okay. Betty. Oh, Betty, you poor kid. Hello in there. Hello. I'm coming, I'm coming. Just keep your shirt on. Hey, 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 hey
I demand an explanation of what's been going on in here. Come on, come on. Help me bring this girl out of it. The window broken. Do you know what that does to the air conditioning in this car? Well, a man got out of that window while the train was stopped. Who pulled the emergency cord? This guy. He came in here waving a gun around, took a briefcase that some dame had left here, stopped the train, and knocked our brains out. I just came to, and he's gone. So let's face it, Conductor, he must have jumped out the window. Yes. And what happened to the young lady who left the briefcase here in your compartment? I don't know. Who was she? I never saw her before. Oh, Oh, are you okay, baby? Oh, sure. Takes a bump like that. Clear up my mind. Who was that fellow? I don't know. I'm holding you responsible for the damage that's been done to this compartment. What's your name? The name's Richard Rogue. Now get out of here. I'll give you some more things to hold me responsible for. Personal things. I'm the conductor on this train okay, and I'm... Okay, the... okay. We'll still be on your train when you pull into Central City. Goodbye now. Now, everything's all right, folks. Just get back to your seat, please. We're going ahead immediately. Please return to your seat. I've heard you were dynamic when you got started, Richard. Yeah, look. That Daffy Dame that came charging in here wasn't kidding. That briefcase of hers is full of dynamite. Was, you mean. It's gone. Out the window. Oh, no, it isn't. That window jumper took mine, remember? I had it in my hand, ready to put it up on the luggage rack when he came in. Uh, give me hers. It's right over there behind you. Oh, sure. It's locked. I want to know what's in it, don't you? I love life. I just wish I'd never seen it. Well, comb the hair over that lump on your head, baby. We're going to find and confer with the young lady who spark plugged this carnival of mayhem. Okay, I'm in. I owe that brunette a little something. Go talk to her. My head had that familiar old feeling of having been washed in a washing machine, and I was feeling anything but cute as we wandered down the aisle, asking porters if they'd seen a big brunette wearing a blue pinstripe suit and a hat with cherries on it. That was Diane, you know. Finally, in car 73, the porter recognized the description and told us that the lady was in drawing room A. Naturally, the conductor came along about this time. His glares bounced off that haze of pain that surrounded me like ricocheting bullets. He went with us, under protest, to drawing room A. Oh, no answer. She isn't in. Why don't you look in the club car? I did. Knock again. Why don't you try the door, Richard? Okay. Oh, it's open. Conductor, mind if we go and look around? What right have you to enter the stateroom of a strange woman? She entered his. You sue me if you want to, but I'm going in there and take a look around. Huh. Nobody at home, I guess. Well, I hope you're satisfied tearing up the train, walking into other people's drawing rooms. Look, mister, I'm trying to help you. I've been all over this train. This dame has to be someplace. All right, all right. She's not here. And I can't stand around all night. Look, over there, under the berth. I don't see anything. You don't? Come here, Doctor. What do you think that is? Red ink? Why? That's blood. Oh, well, I'll pull these blankets back. Oh, I'm getting out of here. Are you convinced now that something's happened to that girl? Yes, I suppose so. Well, she must be in here someplace. Open the door to that wardrobe. <gasps> oh, Richard. Steady, Betty. Here. Help me move her up on the berth. No. Leave her right where she is. The cops won't want her move. Oh, that knife in her throat. She's dead. Yes, she was dead. And all we knew about her was that her name was Diane. And that I had the briefcase which must contain the reason for her murder. A pleasant thought. I took one more look at the dead girl, shuddered, and pulled Betty out of that room. I wondered what was going to happen next. And who was going to be the main attraction. I must have been born under a police star. No matter what I start out to do, I end up in more trouble than a jitterbug at a square dance. Me? I start out to be an expert witness, and I wind up in the sheriff's office in Central City trying to explain a murder. Betty was enjoying every minute of this comedy of terrors, being a news hawk. She was jumping with enthusiasm and theories. The sheriff was jumping with importance, and I was just jumping. I don't like murder unless there's a profit in it for me. Sit down, Rogue. You shouldn't be so nervous. Well, we should be getting a report of that murdered woman, shouldn't we, Sheriff? 
We're not going to get any place until we find out who she was. Oh, my men are working on it, Rogue. Now, just take it easy. We know our business here in Central City. Uh-huh. Well, it's your business. It isn't mine. So if you don't mind, I think I'll shove off. I've got a little business to take care of myself. Uh, just a moment. I'll, uh... Hey, where have you been fixed up? We got a positive identification on that lady who was stabbed on the train, Sheriff. And who do you think she was? Well, who was she? Get to it, Hennessy. She was Diane Miller, wife of Charlie Miller, who's on trial for murdering Big Joe Lamberti. No kidding. Yeah. You can go, Hennessy. Sheriff Mills. Yeah? All over the place, huh? Hmm, great work, Sergeant. Okay, I'll have a pick out on him in ten minutes. Thanks. Well, what's the good news? Have anything to do with the case? Well, Rogue, the man who stabbed Mrs. Charlie Miller was Flip Stone, Miller's best friend, and his first lieutenant in the slot machine racket. His fingerprints were all over the knife. <laughs> How do you like that? Hmm, I don't like it. Doesn't make sense yet. Richard, I'm going to go call this into my city desk. Will you meet me at the hotel and bring me up to date on what has happened? Sure, I'll take care of it, baby. You run along, keep your readers informed. You might as well go along with her, Rogue. We don't need your help to solve this case. We're perfectly capable of taking care of it ourselves. Well, swell. Lots of luck. I've heard all about you, Rogue. Just keep your hands in your pockets while you're in Central City. We don't like smart private detectives very well. Remember that. I was all set to try and help the guy until he said that. I don't approve of people going around sticking knives through other people, and I'm willing to throw in my nickels the rest to see that they're discouraged. Then this politician with muscles running up to the part in his hair gets tough with me. Oh, well, he probably had run across some wrong guys in his time. Anyway, Betty and I lamb back to the Hotel Splendide. We went up to my room because we wanted to talk. She called in her story to her paper, and I sat in the window and talked the deal over with myself. She finished her phone call. I really walked into a scoop this time. The city editor's having hallucinations. He even promised me a raise. Throw the bolt in that door, will you? Why? Oh, don't be so conceited. I want to take a look in this briefcase all the excitement is about. Of course, you know you can get put away in the pokey for a long time for withholding evidence. Hmm. You're the worrying type, aren't you? Why do you suppose Lipstone rubbed out his boss's better hat? Maybe she asked idiotic questions while he was trying to open a briefcase. You know it's locked. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ruin the lock with my knife. Too bad. That's breaking and entering or something, isn't it? Illegal entry. Oh, that'll add 20 years to your sentence. I'll still be a young man I get out. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on, I'm not going to be browbeaten by a lock. Hey, hundred dollar bills. Millions of them. Take a gander at that, Betty. Money! Oh, you catch on quick. No wonder Flip Stone was so anxious to get his hot little pink fist on this letter. You count them, will you? I'd love to. There's some letters in here I want to be impolite about. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two. Richard, there must be fifty thousand dollars here. Maybe this is the works. These letters explain a lot of things. I'm counting. Wait a minute. Eighty-one, eighty-two, eighty-three, eighty-four. Don't bother me. I never saw this much money before. No. Well, I know now why Flips don't put the kiss of death on the lovely Diane. He had to keep these letters and that money from being delivered. He didn't want Charlie Miller to beat that rap. Four, five, six, seven. I'm through six thousands already, and I haven't even made a hole in the pile. Oh, the guy who wrote these letters was a character. Seven, 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 uh, give me the sheriff's office, please. One, two, three, four, five, Thank you. Eight thousand. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine thousand. Mm. Oh, I wonder what a nice yacht would cost me. Chicken, if that door was yours, you'd be Mrs. Richard Rogue tonight. Oh, would I? Six, seven, eight, nine. Hello, nine hello. Thousand. Sheriff's office. Uh, let me talk to Sheriff Mills. Richard Rogue calling. My Thanks. Gracious. Seven, eight, nine, eleven thousand, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, hello, 10, 8, 9, Sheriff. This is Richard Rogue. Yeah. Come down to seven thirty at Hotel Splendid right away, will you? Well, don't ask so many questions. I'm going to make you a big man. I want you to help me plan a surprise party. All right. Now hurry. Hey, that's a lot of letters you got there, Betty, darling. <laughs> Flipstone really grabbed a handful of disappointment when he bailed out with that my satchel by mistake. There wasn't nearly that much money in mine. Who could that be? I don't know. Look, I'll get over behind the door. You open it, and we'll look our company over before we put this artillery away. All right. I don't like guns. Ah, they come in handy sometimes. Okay. Put them up, lady. I'm coming in. You can't come in here. Shut up. Just keep backing up. I want that dough. You switched bags on me. I didn't. I didn't do it. Where's Rogue? I've checked every hotel register in town looking for him. Where is he? 
I want to slap them around a little bit for... Oh, Richard, why did you wait so long? I administered that pistol anesthesia with masterful precision. Flip was going to have a long ride on the dream train. Betty and I took a sheet off the bed, tore it into strips, and tied Flip up like traffic at Hollywood and Vine. Then we looked around for some place to hide him. We finally picked out a spot that any old maid would have thought of immediately. We slipped him under one of the twin beds. Then we finished counting the money. $25,000. Oh, it looked beautiful there. But I had things to do. I called the sheriff. He hadn't left the jail yet. So I went down there to talk with him. And while I was there, I had a chat with Charlie Miller. A very satisfactory chat. Then the sheriff and I went back to the hotel. Betty made a phone call. And we waited for company. The sheriff and I squeezed into a closet when a knock came at the door. Who is it? You just called and invited me down. Okay. Come in. Thanks. Now, let's get this over with, Mrs. Miller. I want to get out of here. Don't be in such a hurry. How do I know you're on the level? You have the money with you? Yes. I'll give it to you after you sign this little document. Uh, What is it? I'll read it to you. All right. I, Louis Tobin, a member of the jury in the trial of Charles Miller for the murder of Big Joe Lamberti, do hereby acknowledge the receipt of $25,000 from the hand of Mrs. Charles Miller, for which I agree to hold out against the conviction of Charles Miller and to find him not guilty. I also agree to use my best influence to make the other jurors agree to a not guilty verdict. And that's where you sign, Mr. Tobin. Oh, you, you know I can't sign a thing like that. And look, I've got 25 grand in hundreds ready for you. You get it when you sign your name. Right there. No, I... If you keep your word and my husband gets a hung jury or an acquittal, this receipt will be torn up. If you don't, I'll give it to the newspapers. Sign it. Uh, Okay. Okay, I'll sign it. Here's a pen, Mr. Tobin. I... 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 I, uh, Okay. There, I'll, I'll just hang on to this until you give me the money. Here you are. $250, $100 bill. There we are. You want to count it? Uh, no, no, I just want to get out of here, that's all. Hey, hey. Don't oh. move, Tobin. The sheriff and I have both have you covered. You double-crossed me. I was just Skip trying it, to... Tobin. I'll shake him down, Sheriff. He's got $25,000 on him that you marked yourself. You haven't got a thing on me. I was just Take trying... Take your hands out here. Well, hi, I... Miss Callahan, could I have I... that confession? Oh, sure, if you'll let me have it back for a photostat later. Okay, it'll be yours, exclusive. And now I'm going to take this man down and lock him up where he belongs. Yeah, that's a good idea. Very practical. Oh, here, Sheriff, you better take this money with you. I just spend everything I get my hands on. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Rogue. You better count it. Later. No, Sheriff, you better count it now. I can't take the time now, Rogue. If there's any money missing, I'll be back. And there had better not be any money missing. I had news for the Sheriff, but he was so impressed with this pinch that he couldn't see me. Oh, well, I, I knew he'd be back. You see... I'm a practical guy. I had palmed and pocketed $5,000 out of that wad of dough I took off Tobin. I showed it to Betty and she was horrified, but I knew what I was doing. So I just sat there and waited for the door to take a beating. And it did. Who is it? It's the sheriff. Let me in, Rogue. Why, Sheriff, you're all red in the face. It's your age. I knew you were a crook the first time I set eyes on you, Rogue. <laughs> you probably studied psychology at Barry College. That's what makes you so smart. There was only $20,000 in that briefcase when I counted the money at the jail. And I had four honest men as witnesses. Well, bless your heart. Where's that other $5,000, Rogue? In my pocket, Sheriff. And that's where it's going to stay. Uh, that's larceny. And you, you're under arrest. Now, is that silly? Look, Sheriff. Oh, please, Richard, tell him. Don't needle him anymore. Well, Sheriff... You remember when I went in the cell to see Charlie Miller? What's that got to do with the missing funds? Well, he posted a $5,000 reward for the killer of his wife with you, didn't he? Oh, uh, yes, I suppose he did. You suppose? You know he did. Well, if you look under the bed there in the bedroom, you'll find Flip Stone, the guy who murdered Diane Miller. It was very simple. I just collected my reward in advance, that's all. My friend, the sheriff, was a little upset for a while, but he calmed down when Betty brought in a photographer to take his picture for the papers. (laughs) Isn't it funny what some people will do to get their pictures in the papers? I had to practically wrestle him to keep him out profiling me, the big ham. Well, I split the reward with Betty, of course. 
Well, I didn't just exactly split it with her. I gave her 2,000 bucks. But she didn't want to take anything. Isn't that just like a woman, though? Or is it? We're a little late, folks. This is T4Y. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Call me a silly, impressionable boy if you want to. But when I first laid eyes on Patricia Flynn at that party, I was over the side like a Jacob's Ladder. Her hair was as black as a lover's despair... Her eyes were the blue of the washed sky around a rainbow. And she was the feminine architecture what the atom bomb is to science. Ah, there's never been anything like it. I, uh, I liked her, and she liked me. In fact, she seemed to be spending most of the evening trying to be alone with me. But, uh, another lovely, bless her, outmaneuvered her. The next day, I went to my office a little late... I was just sitting there at my desk trying to make my checkbook agree with the bank's theories when the door opened. And who walked in was Patricia. I restrained the foolish impulse to grab her and shout, I love you, by looking bored and saying, hello. Hello, Mr. Old. I guess I should have called for an appointment. Oh, now, now, look, uh, first off, you must call me Richard, because I'm going to call you Pat. I'm so glad you came in to see me, Pat. Let's go down to the hunt room and talk things over, shall we? After a while, if you want to. It sounds charming, but... I want to talk to you here alone first. Oh? Oh, uh, okay. What shall we talk about? Mr. Rowe. Uh, Richard. Thank you. I know this sounds dramatic, but... There have been two attempts made on my life in the past three weeks. Hmm. Well, why would anybody want to harm you? I don't know. I really don't. There's no reason that I can think of. Well... Why, you poor kid. Where did these attempts on your life take place? At our summer place, up on Lake Country. Oh, and there's nobody up there with any motive for wanting you out of the way? Nobody. Hmm. I don't know whether you've ever been to Lake Tecumseh or not. It's a small resort, just a few families have cabins there. Uh, maybe you'd better start from the beginning. You know, I, I don't really know much about you. Give me the whole story, will you? All right. You already know my name. It's Pat Flynn. My father was Michael Flynn, the attorney. Yes, I uh, I knew of him, of course. Mother was much younger than Dad. And about a year after he died, she married Herbert Lewis, the British artist. He was a widower. He had a daughter, Diane, just my age. She's a lovely girl. Very British, English, finishing school. And a wonderful musical education with the best of friends. She got married about three months ago to John Anderson. A boy I've known since he was about ten. They're very happy and... We were all up the lake together. All staying in the same cottage? Yes. Well, it isn't exactly a cottage. We all call it that, but it's really rather a large house. Okay. Now, tell me about the attempts on your life. How'd they happen? Well, about three weeks ago, I got up earlier than the rest of the family. I often do. I went down to the lake for a dip. I'm a pretty good swimmer, and I headed right out to the island in the middle of the lake. 
I heard a bullet whistle past my head. I dove underwater and swam back to the shore as long as I could hold my breath. Then I came up. I heard another bullet hit the water not a foot from me. I was frightened to death. I stayed underwater as much as I could until I saw Mother and John coming down for their morning dip. And I swam in and joined them. Did you tell them about it? No. I was afraid they'd laugh at me. Mm -hmm. There was another attempt later? Yes. I always have a glass of milk in my room at night. And one night, for no reason at all, I gave it to my cat, Cynthia. And Cynthia died. She had convulsions and died. The veterinary said she'd been poisoned. Somebody tried to poison me. Look, baby, I think it's about time you're telling somebody about this. There's no future in being murdered, you know. That poisoned milk makes it look like an inside job, doesn't it? I don't see how it could be anyone in the house, Mr. Rogue. There's only the family and... No servants? Only Mary, the cook, and... Oh, well, she's like a mother. She wouldn't want to hurt me. Oh, Richard, I'm scared. I'm supposed to go back up to the lake tomorrow. And I know that the next time... They're going to succeed in killing me. What do you want me to do? I want you to come up with me as a house guest. No one will know you're an investigator. And Mr. Rowe... Yes, Pat? You can protect me. We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, the three essentials of attractive, healthy-looking hair are one, cleanliness, two, manageability, and three, a fresh, clean fragrance. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo does all three for your hair. It's mild yet efficient shampoo. It cleanses the hair thoroughly of dust, dirt, perspiration, and other unpleasant scalp odors. Leaves the hair smelling fresh and clean. Then Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils. You can use it as often as you like, and it will never leave your hair dry or harsh feeling, but always soft and manageable. It makes your hair easier to comb and easier to keep combed. For clean, fragrant hair that's easy to manage, use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo regularly. Next time at your barber or beauty shop, ask for a professional application of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Six full ounces, 50 cents. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I couldn't understand why anybody would want to deprive this ugly old world of Patricia Flynn's beauty. But she was convinced that somebody was trying to promote her to a better land than this, so... I accepted her invitation to be a house guest at her family's 18-room cabin on Lake Tecumseh. <laughs> I'd like to be Uncle Tom in a cabin like that. The living room was a little smaller than the Los Angeles Union Station, but it was much more comfortable. There was a fireplace at each end of it about the size of the entrance to the Hudson Tube. And the room was done in rustic furniture with down cushions. Every place you looked at the walls, you either got an inquisitive look from a defunct moose or a cold stare from a mounted fish. Ah, if this was roughing it, I gave up my scouting too early. The first evening, I sat around and talked with Pat's mother, who looked 30, and her stepsister, Diane, who looked dandy, and John Anderson, who looked like John Anderson. John was Diane's husband. We're so happy that you could come up with Patricia, Mr. Rogue. She hasn't been enjoying herself this summer for some reason. She seems so depressed. Well, girls with her looks should never be depressed. If I weren't Patricia's mother, I'd think she was in love. She has all the symptoms. Are you the cause of all this, Rogue? <laughs> well, I, I, I hope so, but I doubt it. It's an interesting thought. Where is Pat? She went out for a walk. Down around the lake, I suppose. Oh, well, perhaps we're keeping you, Mr. Rogue. The moon's shining, you know. Very romantic out by the lake. Oh, I think if she had wanted me to go with her, she would have asked me. You don't know women, Mr. Rogue. They're very subtle. <laughs> it's really a lovely night. Come on, Diane. Let's take a walk and show Mr. Rogue around the place a little bit, huh? No, you and Mr. Rogue go ahead, John. I'm going to stay in tonight. I, I've had the sniffles all day. I don't think I should be out in the night air. 
You'd better slip a coat on over your sweater if you go out, Mr. Rogue. It gets pretty chilly up here nights. Well, how about it, Rogue? Shall we take a look around? Oh, yes. Certainly, I'd like to take a look around this place. You sure I'm not putting you out? Oh, not at all. I usually take a stroll before turning in. Come on. Okay. If you ladies will excuse us. Of course. I'll see you at breakfast, Mr. Rogue. I'll probably retire before you return. It's so nice having you here. Thank you. Good night. Good night. We live very quietly here on the lake, Rogue. I'm afraid you might find it a little dull. Oh, I could use a little quiet. Have you known Pat long? Hmm? Mm, Well, uh, quite a while. She's a grand girl, isn't she? Oh, one of the best. Strange kid, though. I think she's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. She has something on her mind lately, though. Doesn't seem to be quite her old carefree self. You've noticed it, too, huh? Well, she was very close to her father, you know. Hasn't been too sharp since his death. I'm kind of worried about her. You think that's what she's brooding about? Her father's death? I can't figure her lately. She's changed completely. Yeah, look at her down there by the side of the lake. All alone, as usual. Hmm. Suppose she would resent it if we joined her? Well, we can try and see. Hey, Pat, you receiving callers this evening? I'm waiting for them. Come on over. Well, you look mighty beautiful sitting out there in the moonlight. That remark has my enthusiastic approval. Aren't you cold out here with no wrap, Patty? No, it's nice out here. I like the breeze. Have a seat on the sand, Mr. Rose. Well, thanks. <sighs> oh, brother, this is the life. <laughs> Brings out the Davy Crockett in there. <laughs> Tell me, does the place come equipped with a canoe? Canoe, speedboat, rowboat, take your choice. Personally, I prefer the speedboat. Mm, These both hands free. Yo, you and your elephant's memory. (laughs) John used to make mad love to me out there on that lake, Mr. Rogue. Uh, Before he was married, of course. Yeah, well, that was puppy love. Pat soon tired of me. Mm. (laughs) What's the program for tomorrow, Pat? Want to go riding? Sure. Six o'clock then at the stables. Six o'clock in the morning? Will the horses be awake? No, they go to bed early. (laughs) Uh, what are you looking for, Rogue? Oh, oh, my cigarettes. I uh, guess I left them in my coat. Can you spare one? Uh, I didn't bring any with me. Did you, Pat? You know I don't smoke. Don't well, you? I'm uh, I'm an awful slave. Looks like I'm going to have to go get them. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, we'll be here. I didn't know handsome John well enough to call him a liar. But I did know he had cigarettes in his pocket. It was hard for me to believe that a guy living in all that luxury would begrudge a house guest a cigarette for financial reasons. So I had to assume that he wanted to be alone with Pat. I felt as unnecessary as a laugh at a funeral as I walked back up to the house. The French doors into the living room were open and I headed for them. I wasn't making any noise, walking in the sand. And I stopped in embarrassment when I heard the conversation which was in progress in the room between Diane and Patricia's mother. I tell you, I'm not going to put up with this much longer. The way Pat throws herself at John is sickening. John's old enough to take care of himself, I believe, Diane. She's doing everything she can to cause trouble between John and me. Everything. She hates me for marrying John. Yes, I believe she's still in love with John. She always has been. And if she hadn't been away at school when you met John and married him... Please! Don't you dare say that again. Ever! It's the truth. If it hadn't been for you, John and Pat would be married, as they always planned to be. If she doesn't leave John alone, something terrible is going to happen to her. I love John. He's mine. You hate me. You hate me for marrying John. No, I don't hate you, Diane. But I'm her mother. I want my daughter to be happy again. And I'll do anything, anything to bring her happiness back to her. You can't take John away from me. I'm going to have a talk with him now. We're leaving here in the morning. When Diane left that room, you could feel the hate radiating from her like heat from a depot stove. She walked directly toward the spot where I was standing, and I ducked back into the shrubbery. I followed her as she headed for the couple on the beach. And I was only a few feet behind her when she stopped. Pat and John were knee-deep in a conversation that was a tone lower than the last note of a sleep in the deep. Diane listened. So did I. 
We have to do something about this, John. We can't go on this way. If you don't tell her you want a divorce, I'll... I don't want a divorce, Pat. Now, that's final. I'm not going to let the fact that you fancy yourself in love with me ruin my whole life. Make it over tonight, darling. Meet me on the island at 6 tomorrow morning. You'd better go in. All right. I'll meet you in the morning, Pat, but you better... Go in, John. I love you. <laughs> This group of lovely people was as full of potential drama as a little theater on opening night. I followed Diane back into the house, walked noisily in the front door, and said good night. I thought I heard somebody enter and leave my room while I was under the shower, but there was nothing much I could do about it. The room was empty when I re-entered it, and I helped myself to a drink of water from the thermos on the night table. The water tasted funny. As I hit the pillow, I knew what it was. I went out like a match in a bucket of water. And when I opened my eyes, I was on cloud eight. Hugor was looking me over, and that little dame was there. He's opening his eyes, Hugor. <laughs> hey, Chiefy, what happened? No bump on your head. Oh, never mind. What's that girl doing here? Tell him, Hugo. Ask him now. If you're going to ask me for permission to get married, the answer is no. Yeah, but Chiefy, don't you think it's about time you and I settle down? Don't you get tired of getting hit on the head? Look, Hugo. You've got all you can do to take care of your job as my alter ego without taking on any more responsibilities. But, Mr. Roke, I won't be in any trouble. I can... Honey, now look, Rokey. I ask you man to man. Man to man? Anything you ask me is spook to man, Yogor. You're nothing but a figment of my imagination. What does that mean, Yogor? Oh, he's a little off his trolley right now. Now look, Chiefy. This is no time to be making a decision which will affect the entire lives of three people. You're not clear in the head. Did it ever occur to you that if I was clear in my head, I wouldn't be here on cloud eight, talking to you and that uh, Lilliputian Lana Turner? This cloud eight is strictly non-coeducational. Now you throw her out of here. Push him over the side, you good. Come on, I'll help you. Oh, no. No. No, I have to rest a while. Go away. Come on, you good. Help me. He's me. All right. Over you go, Chiefy. No. No. Cut it out. Ooh, I'll strangle you with your own beard, you gore. Stop pushing. He's a bad man, you good. Yes, he is. So long, Froggy. <laughs> woke up, the sun was high in the heavens. My head felt like a busy blacksmith's anvil and my tongue was made of mink. I leaped out of bed like a startled fawn and oh, oh, I sat back down fast. I dressed without lowering my head and made a belated appearance at the breakfast table. Pat and her mother were having breakfast. John came in a few minutes after me. He didn't look well either. Good morning, John. Where's Diane? I don't know. We had a bit of a disagreement last night. She slept in the guest room and I just looked in. She wasn't there. She probably went for a morning dip. Oh. Have you been in yet this morning, Pat? Not me. I slept. I couldn't wake up this morning. Whatever happened to our horseback ride, Pat? Oh, did you get up for it? Oh, me? Oh, no. no I slept right straight through. As a matter of fact, I I never slept so well in my life. Yeah, that goes for me, too. And I feel terrible this morning. Well, so do I. I feel dopey. How about a canoe ride after breakfast, Pat? It'll do us both good. Maybe that's what I need. Do I look as stupid as I feel? I don't know what you mean. You look kind of sleepy. You look like I feel. 
Somebody doped me last night, Pam. They did. Are you sure? Honey, I know when I'd been slipped a tricky Mickey. Last night was one of those times. Who would have wanted me out of the way last night? I don't know. I'm sure somebody doped me last night, too, Richard. It's almost as if some crazy person were hiding there. Maybe we should call the police. Look, chicken, that uh, that stepsister of yours is kind of burned for you. Diane? Now, don't look so surprised. You know it. I happened to overhear a little conversation between Diane and your mother last night. Diane lifted your boyfriend, didn't she? Yes. You're asking for trouble, Pat, fighting back like that. I, I really... Hey. What's the matter? What's that over there? Oh. Oh, Richard. Don't look. It's Diane, isn't it? Yes. That's my white bathing suit. She's wearing my bathing suit. She's dead, Pat. Somebody shot her. Oh, no. Richard. Whoever shot her thought they were shooting me. We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. You know how often your hair is caught in the spotlight of the summer sun. Be sure your hair meets the test. By shampooing regularly with Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo, you can be sure the sun will not reveal your hair as dry or harsh-looking. That's because Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils. It makes your hair ever so soft and manageable, even right after you shampoo it. And ladies, here's a special feature you'll appreciate. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo contains its own special patented rinsing agent. No special after-rinse is required, for the rinsing agent works right with the plain rinse water to get your hair sparkling clean. Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out all the gleaming natural highlights of your hair and leaves it with a satiny texture that's beautiful to look at, easy to arrange. Remember always to ask for Fitch. F-I-T-C-H. Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. <laughs> Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, Pat Flynn had proved her point. Her half-sister Diane was lying there on the beach, dead. Shot while swimming in Lake Tecumseh, wearing Pat's white satin swimsuit. I stood over Diane's body while Pat ran screaming hysterically up to the house to get John. They were back in a few minutes, and the three of us stood looking down at the dead girl. Oh, darling. Here, John, take it easy, old man. Let go of me, Rogue. Let go of me. I know how you feel, John. Oh, you know how I feel. Have you ever loved anybody so much you couldn't get your breath? (laughs) Then had to murder? (laughs) You know how I feel. How could you know? John, John, please. Get away from me, Pat. Do you hear? This is all your fault. If you hadn't been such a stupid little fool, she wouldn't be dead. Now, take it easy, John. You don't know what you're saying. How could you blame me, John? Whoever killed her thought they weren't shooting me. I wish they had. You were the cause of all the trouble. You've hated her ever since we were married. You think she stole me from you? How could you think that? You were never anything to me. Now, look, look. We'd better get up to the house. The police have to be called. This is murder, you know. You take care of that, will you, Rogue? Of course. Uh, You better come with me, John. No. I'll stay here with Diane. But take Pat with you. Don't leave her out here with me. With us. I'll go, John. I wish you wouldn't hate me, John. Get back to the house. Come on, Pat. And when the police get here, Rogue, I have something to tell them. Bring them right out here to me. All right. All right, John. Oh, this is a horrible thing, Pat. Tell me, how did your mother react to the news of her stepdaughter's murder? She didn't say anything. She just said, Oh, Richard, you don't think mother... I don't know. It looks like everybody in the house was doped last night but your mother. Oh, couldn't have been mother. She wouldn't want to hurt me. You're overlooking the fact that whoever shot Diane might have known just who was wearing that white bathing suit, aren't you? Oh, no. It couldn't have been Mother. 
It, it was someone trying to kill me. That's it... just a theory. Go call the police. Tell them to come up here. I'm going to have a talk with your mother. As soon as Pat was out of the way, I ran up the stairs to my room. I took the stopper out of the thermos and sniffed the water in it. There had been chloral in that water. I knew the pungent smell of it. I visited Pat's bedroom and John's and sampled the odor of the water at their bedsides. It was a very interesting experiment. I headed for the bedroom occupied by Pat's mother and hesitated outside the door. There was the odor of burning cloth. I opened the door and walked in. She was on her knees in front of the fireplace trying to burn a scanty red swimsuit, a damp one. What do you mean, coming into my bedroom, Mr. Rogue? Your stepdaughter, Diane, has been murdered, and I'm investigating the circumstances. Give me that, uh, baby suit. Give it here. No, I won't. I... I'm sorry. I'll have to take it, then. You know, destroying evidence is bad business. Give it here. I killed her. I killed Diane, Mr. Rogue. You did? Why? She was ruining my daughter's life. I killed her this morning. Where does the bathing suit enter into it? Why were you trying to destroy it? I didn't want the police to know that I'd been in the lake this morning. Oh, oh I see. Well... The police are... Mother, what are you doing with that swimsuit? Pat, I... Whose is it? it? It was Diane's. You might as well face it, Pat. Your mother killed Diane. She just confessed to me. He was burning that suit to keep the police from finding out that she'd been in swimming this morning. That's ridiculous. Look at that suit. Look at the size of it. Mother could no more get into that, Pat. No. No, she couldn't, could she? But you could, Pat. And if I'm I did it. I killed her. Pat, don't say anything. The water on my nightstand was drugged last night, Pat. Chloral. So was John's. But yours wasn't. And you shot Diane, didn't you? No. Pat, don't answer him. I shot her. I hated her. It she was no good, Mother. I did it. I killed her. I saw her sneaking around listening to what John and I were saying last night. Spying on us. I gave her something to listen to. I made a date to meet John on the island at six o'clock this morning. I knew what she'd do. I knew. Oh, Pat. Pat, how could you do it? I'm glad I did it. If I can't have John, I'd just as soon be dead. I- I'm only sorry I wasn't a little more clever. Pat, dear, we'll, we'll get the best attorney. No, not for me. Oh, bless your heart. That was a wonderful you try he made for me. Mommy, I love you. <laughs> the police arrived a few minutes later, and Pat told them everything. Her diary was admitted as evidence at her trial. Every day since the marriage of John and Diane, Pat had planned Diane's death. The phony attempts on her life that she told me about were part of the buildup. There could be no doubt about the fact that Pat's mind had given away under the deadly poison of jealousy and hate. She was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was committed to an institution. All on account of jealousy. Oh, well, jealousy is a very strange thing. You drive yourself daffy trying to prove something that you hope isn't true. Because if it is, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to convince yourself that it wasn't important anyway. You know what I mean. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music. And Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Next week, we have a story for you about a red-headed stranger, a young wife, and... Ah, something different. A murder. Be with us then, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be sure to tune in again next week, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue 
in Rogue's Gallery. Half a while and a song be your style, you stitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you stitch shampoo. After and between Fit Shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you Fitch. Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, use Fitch. Shampoo. The F.W. Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, Presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rose in Rose's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, I'm a man who loves sunshine in or out of orange juice. And the only place that has more sunshine per square inch than the Sahara Desert is the San Fernando Valley. San Fernando seems to be the place where everybody, including some of the healthiest gophers in the world, makes his home but me. I've withstood the blandishments of hundreds of brick-red real estate men who have offered me membership in that clan of plaid-shirted, tight blue jeans, high heel booted fraternity known as the San Fernando Valley Ranchers. <laughs> Ranchers. Yes, sir. The San Fernando Valley... As ranches that are thicker than any place in the world. There are at least two on every acre. Well, anyway, I was driving around out there this Sunday evening. It was swimming weather. And I happened to remember that my friend Joe Dale had a half acre spread in the neighborhood with a quarter acre swimming pool. So I stopped at the antlers on the gate, rang the ship's bell hanging there, but nobody answered. I thought maybe Joe was in the pool in the rear, so I opened the door and walked in. Then I felt like walking out again, because I saw Joe Dale lying there, making a red stain on the white living room rug, very defunct. I walked over to him and gazed down at him. Then I heard the footsteps behind me and did a half turn in time to see oblivion whistling down on my head. Oh... Everything went red, white, and blue. And I was whirling like a top. Oh, it made me dizzy whirling like that. I couldn't stand the shrieking of the wind as it whistled past my ears. I concentrated on stopping so hard that I could hear my teeth gritting. But no go. Then I thought of you, Gore. And suddenly I heard his pleasant voice. <laughs> Hello, Cheapy. Welcome home to Cloudy. Oh, oh, my head. Funny looking, Danny. <laughs> Wait till he sees you. You, Gore. Who is this ancient feather merchant with you? Well, Rogie, I warned you. This is her father. You mean the little dame's father? Is he talking about my daughter? Yes. What's he doing with that gun? He couldn't pull the trigger with a tractor. Well, you see, Chiefy, you're the young whippersnapper who's advising you go here not to marry my daughter. Well, let me tell you something. Oh, shut up. I don't feel good. Rocky, you're making things tough for me. Her father has a gun. I'm not going to stand for much more bullying around you, God. Oh, make him stop talking. His voice sounds like a grindstone on a grindstone. Now, look here, young fella. I'm a gentleman of the old school. And if my daughter is half-witted enough to want to marry this good-for-nothing, you God. Oh, 
Oh, no, no. I'm not going to let my alter ego get married. You, Gord, can't get married. Oh, that's a mighty selfish way of looking at things, Rogie. Oh, look. Look, my head. I don't feel good. I came up here for a rest. Shut up, shut up, shut up. I can't stand that silly voice of yours. But he's right, Rogie. You can't stand in the way of our happiness. It's not fair. It's only normal to want to get married. Now, uh, look at it from our point of view, Mr. Elk. Here's a couple of... I can't stand it. I'm getting out of here. Grab him. Come back here. Come back here. Come back I came to, I was looking right in Joe Dale's face, which was inches from mine. But the inside of my head was still whirling and clanking like a washing machine. But it didn't take me long to get back up to date. I remembered I had dropped in at Joe Dale's house for a quick swim and found Joe stretched out on the living room floor shot. Then I remembered that swishing sound, which always means another bump on my head. And now my my feet felt like they were in diver's shoes as I got up and looked the situation over. The murder gun was lying there by the side of Joe's body, and there was a billfold on the floor by the door. Being the kind of a guy I am, I picked up the billfold first. It was Joe Dale's, and I put it in my pocket. Then I took my handkerchief and carefully picked up the gun. I was bending over Joe, gun in hand, when I heard a voice behind me. Joe! Joe! A beautiful dame had walked in on me and caught me bending over the corpse, gun in hand. She fainted. I ran over to her. Hey. Hey, come out of it, lady. Lady, hey, c- come on, come on. Oh, oh, come on. Oh, Lord, everything happens to me. Come on, come out of it. Open your eyes. But she didn't. And while I was working on her... A man showed up in the open door. He took one look at the tableau and dived for the murder gun which I dropped. He pointed the gun at my third vest button and said, Just stay right where you are. I know how to shoot this thing and I'm holding you for the police. Your partner got away, but I'll... Look, mister, look, I, I, I am the police. I, I know who you are. You're Richard Rowe, the private investigator. You've been mixed up in plenty of shady deals before. What did you do to my wife? Is this your wife? Yes. What's the matter with her? Well, she came in... Saw Joe Dale's body and fainted. Barry. Barry, is that you? Yes, dear. Now, don't worry. Uh-oh. I'm here and I'll take care of you. This, this man, he, he was standing over Joe's body with a gun in his hand when I came in. He's a killer, Barry. Be careful. Don't worry, dear. I have him covered. Stay right there, Rogue. I'm a nervous man. And I advise you not to move while I'm phoning the police. <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, time was when heavy perfumed oils were considered the thing for pleasant-smelling hair. Now, of course, we know that the clean, delicate fragrance imparted to the hair by Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is much more the modern idea of good grooming. This clear, golden liquid shampoo makes an abundance of creamy lather that does an efficient job of cleansing the hair. It removes dust, perspiration, oily film, and all unpleasant scalp odors. Leaves the hair with a gloriously fresh, clean feeling. And Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils. Thus, you can use it as often as you like, because Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo does not rob your hair of its natural oils. Always leaves it soft, lustrous, and manageable. Next time you're at your barber or beauty shop... Ask for a professional application of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Look for the bottle with the bright yellow label. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. I couldn't very well blame Perry Stevens or his wife for thinking I just put the kiss of death on Joe Dale. 
Mrs. Stevens came in and saw me bending over the body with a murder gun in my hand, promptly fainted. And so when Perry arrived, the floor was cluttered, cluttered with bodies, and I was the only stranger. He picked up the killer's gun and held me at the point of it until the cops arrived. Lieutenant Urban of Homicide was in charge, as usual. He, uh, <laughs> he seemed a little bit discouraged with me. Well, Rogie, what's your story? Urban, it's a simple one. I just dropped in here to take a swim and I found Joe Dale dead. Why didn't you report the murder to Homicide? I didn't have a chance. The killer was hiding here in the room. He slapped me silly and escaped while I was out. How do you think I got this cut on my head, shaving? I never know about you. There were two of them, Lieutenant. I saw one of them run out from behind this house. A big man, red hair, rough. This man here, this Richard Rogue, had an accomplice. When I came in, Mr. Rogue was bending over the body with a gun. That gun in his hand. I almost caught him in the act. How about it, Rogie? Well, I was bending over the body all right. I'd, I'd just come to. I was checking up. Why didn't you call homicide when you came to? I was going to, Urban. But this dame here walked in on me, screamed, fainted. I demand that you arrest this man. Oh, wait a minute. What were you doing here? I came over Joe to... Joe was an old friend. We just came over to take him to dinner. Don't try to implicate a couple of law-abiding people in your crime. You and your wife came together? Of course. Then how come she came in ahead of you? I hesitated when I saw that man run out from behind the house. Lieutenant, do I have to stand here and let this murderer cross-question me? Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Stevens, uh, you and your husband uh, came here together? Yes. We had a dinner date with Joe. Did you see this man run away from the house? No, I came right straight inside. Okay. Look, Rogie, you'd better come down to headquarters with me right now. We've got some talking to do. Urban, Urban, I'll be down in an hour. I, uh, I want to go to the emergency hospital and have my head put back on. I gotta go home and get a suit without these red polka dots. Then I'll be down. I demand that you put Rogue under arrest, Lieutenant. Now, take it easy, Mr. Stevens. I've had a little more experience with this sort of thing than you have. See you in an hour, Rogie. Be there. That gash on my head had cost me a lot of blood, and I was a little woozy as I left the ex-residence of the late Joe Dale. I drove turtle speed to the emergency hospital, where the doc made a few insulting remarks about me getting scars on the scars on my forehead. And then I, I went home. I walked in the door, and an arm went around my throat. A crooked elbow squeezed my Adam's apple until I choked. I felt a hand sneak into my inside breast pocket and lift that wallet I'd picked up on the floor beside Joe Dale's body. The elbow squeezed a little tighter... Tighter, tighter, and I had a horrifying sensation of bursting lungs. And then the elbow released me, and I fell to the floor. To the accompaniment of departing footsteps. I was still lying there when Urban walked in through the open door. I got worried about you when you didn't show up, Rogie. What happened? I, uh, I don't know. I, uh... Oh, I guess I just got faint and flopped over here. I lost a lot of blood, you know. Better take care of yourself, Rogie. I don't want to lose you. Do you like talking? Oh, sure, sure, but I don't know anything to talk about. Maybe you'd like to talk about a murder. Well, uh, and tell me, uh, did you, uh, get a line on that red-headed guy that was seen leaving Joe's house? I've got a description out on him. Nothing's happened yet. How about Mr. and Mrs. Stevens? Check up on them? Yeah, Stevens is the personnel director for an airplane company. Pays his bills promptly, has money in the bank, lives within his income. And he's been a friend of Joe Dale's since college days. They're clean. That leaves you and a big red-headed guy in the finals. One of you killed Joe Dale. I don't think you did it, but uh, I could get an indictment against you in 20 minutes for the evidence I have. Oh, but I didn't kill him. I didn't like him well enough. Well, I guess it's up to me to find the big red-headed guy, huh? You uh, checked the gun? No soap. The number was filed off, and the only fingerprints on it were Stevens. And they got on it when he was holding you. Yeah, I was there when it happened, remember? Oh, brother... Brother, do I feel weary. Well, there's uh, one thing I'll swear to. Mrs. Stevens was not expecting to find Dale murdered. She really went out like a butler on Thursday night. You know, Rogie, I'm a cop. And the fact that you and I understand each other doesn't make any difference to the commissioner. Yeah, I know. Joe Dale was a pretty prominent character. Lots of connections. Now, the commissioner expects a quick pinch. And with our friends, the Stevens, down there at City Hall, swearing that they saw you standing over the body with a practically smoking gun in your hand, well, it looks like it's going to be you I put the arm on. Oh, but you know I didn't kill him, Urban. 
Why would I want to kill a guy like that? Yes, I know you didn't kill him, but the newspapers are on the old man. He's on the chief, and the chief's on me. I'm going to have to pinch you, Rogie. Ah, you're a... You're a great pal, Irvin. But look, if you pinch me, they'll never get a conviction. You know that you can't get a conviction without a motive. I know that, but you've made a lot of enemies around headquarters, Rogie. They see a chance to give you a bad time, and they don't want to miss it. You can see the spot I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Now look, look, Irvin. Give me 24 hours to get the guy that pulled the boom on, Joe Dale. Just 24 hours, and I'll have him for you. Oh, that's whistling in the dark, Rogie. Yeah, with a ten whistle. But just give me a chance at it anyway. Maybe I'll be lucky. Okay. It'll probably put me back on a beat, but I'll play along with you. You've got 24 hours, Rogue. Then, don't make me come after you. Come in and give yourself up. The deal? Yeah, the deal. Uh, oh, you're a good copper, but I, I know you're sticking your neck out like a turtle at feeding time, and believe me, I won't let you down. Okay, Rogue, I'll get out. Better get some sleep. You look awful. Oh, I can't afford the luxury of sleeping. i got work to do. Okay, Rogue, call me if you need me. I'll be around. Lots of luck. You'll need it. Hello? Hello, hello. Is Lieutenant Urban there? Just a minute. Hey, Urban. Yeah? For me? Yeah. Uh, he'll be right here. Hang on. Oh, mighty excited little man on the other end of this. Yeah? Hello. Urban speaking. Lieutenant Urban, this is Perry Stevens. Yeah? Uh, and what do you want? That man, that red-headed man that I saw running away from Joe's house this afternoon. Yes, I... yes. He came here tonight to my house. I Well, what did you do? He came here to kill me, but I... I shot him. He's dead. Please come out at once. I'll be right there. Now, don't move a thing till I get there. Come on, Rogie. Well, this puts that eight ball I was behind to over the corner pocket, doesn't it, Urban? Yeah, looks like Stevens wrapped his case up for us. And that makes me very happy. Well, oh, I wasn't looking forward to sweating it out in a jail of yours. No, oh, I didn't have anything against that red-headed guy, but I'm never going to miss him. Well, it takes me off the spot, too, you know. Yeah, well, you don't have to be a hero in my corner. Oh, well, all's well that ends well, coin a phrase. It's uh, right down this next block here. Huh? Ah, uh, Stevens must have a lot of cabbage, big houses in this neighborhood. Yeah, I checked that. The wife's got money. Oh, there it is, that uh, two-story white shop. There's the precinct prowl car in front. The boys are on the job. Well, let's, let's get with it. Good evening, Lieutenant. Hello, Bauer. Medical examiner here yet? No, not yet. Precinct boys just got here. Thanks. Come on, Rogie. Well, this is quite a layout. Wife's got dough, huh? Yeah. And Uncle left her plenty about a year ago. Hmm. Makes it nice for Perry. Oh, what a mind. Yeah, you know, someday Betty Callahan and I are going to have a chicken ranch out here in this valley. Look, we're investigating a murder. That's serious business. Hello, boys. Where is he? Right in there, Lieutenant. Thanks. Well, Lieutenant, it's about time you were getting here. We I... came as fast as we could, Stevens. Now, suppose you tell me what happened. I'll be glad to. Uh, my, uh, my wife and I got home tonight. We Where just... is your wife? I see any right to question me in that tone of voice, Lieutenant. Where is your wife? Why, the, the shock was too much for her. She's upstairs. Ah, uh, don't blame her. She's had enough for today. Come on, what happened? You got him with that shotgun, eh? Yes. I was frightened, terribly frightened, and as soon as I came home, I got my shotgun. I, I hunted a little, you know, and I put it here beside my chair. It was just a hunch. Yeah. The, uh, the doorbell rang. My wife answered the door. We thought it was a neighbor. This red-headed man walked in. I recognized him at once. He was the man I'd seen run away from Joe's house. He had a gun. He was going to kill me. I suppose because I was the only eyewitness of the crime. Well, that makes sense. It certainly does. It's the truth. He turned to talk to my wife. I saw my chance. I shot him. There he is. Your murderer. I, I've never seen anybody killed before. Well, he's sure dead. Yeah? Ever seen him before? No, not that I know of. Hey, what are you doing, Rogie? Oh, I'm just trying to get some identification on the guy, that's all. So take down. I thought... Uh-oh. What's the matter? Oh, oh an alligator billfold. I didn't expect to see one on this guy. And hey, hey, Urban, this is Joe Dale's billfold. And it's full of dough. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, several hundred bucks in it. Yeah, that's the final piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. I'll take care of it. 
Well, there's the medical examiner, and the newspapers are about due to arrive. You've done a good night's work, Mr. Stevens. I want to thank you. Uh, I'm not a man of violence. I'll never be able to forget this night. There was something about that wallet that was as strange as a bride in black. Other identification on the body pegged the redhead as one Tom Church, recently of the Navy, now a resident of the Crane Hotel. I watched for my chance to give Urban and his minions the slip and faded away. I went to police headquarters and charged into the identification bureau on a dead run. I handed the sergeant in charge the wallet and asked him to dust it for fingerprints. Then I waited. When the sergeant came back, his jaw was stuck out like the business end of a snowplow, and there were icicles in his voice. What's the deal, Rogie? Well, what's the matter with you? All I ask you to do is to give me the identification on the fingerprints you found on the billfold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know whose prints I found, your wise private creep, do you? Yours. Only yours. <laughs> We'll return to our story in a moment. First, a word to the ladies. Did you ever make the remark that your hair never was manageable after a shampoo until it was time to wash it again? That's been the experience of many a woman. Well, you can have your hair immaculately clean, lustrous, and manageable, too. Try using Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo for your hair care. This shampoo is made from pure, natural oils and leaves your hair soft and manageable even immediately after shampooing. Its creamy, fragrant lather never dries the hair, but cleanses gently, removing dirt, perspiration, and every trace of unpleasant scalp odors. Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the gleaming natural color highlights in your hair, too, and leaves it clean and fragrant. A special patented rinsing agent contained right in the shampoo leaves your hair sparkling clean and free from any dull, soapy film. Try Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo the next time you want an extra special beauty treat for your hair. Then use it regularly to keep your hair soft, fragrant, and lovely. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. The news that the only fingerprints on that billfold were mine turned on the floodlights. And one of my hunches picked up a hammer and started pounding against my skull. I left the billfold there for Urban and took off for the Crane Hotel to check up on the red-headed guy named Tom Church. The hotel was a fourth-class flea bag on Main Street. The clerk took a look at my buzzer and answered my questions. That's right, that's right, Shorty, I'm the law. And I want some answers. Now tell me, how long has Tom Church been registered here? Tom Church, uh, three days. He came in three days ago. All right. Now let me see his phone calls. Oh, we don't give out phone calls. Now don't lip me. Give them to me before I jump over that counter and stand on you while I pick them up. Oh, okay, okay. You you look like just the kind of guy that could do it. I'll get them for you. I checked the phone calls and found one of them had a message that was going to ring somebody's number for the surprise party. I thanked the clerk and drove to the valley. The pre-dawn gray made way for the sunshine just as I walked up the front walk at Dale's house. An elderly man walked around the next ranch, pushing a lawnmower. Hey, uh, are you a policeman? That's right, yes. A horrible thing, that murder yesterday. Did you get the killer yet? Well, I, uh, I think so. Hmm? Uh... Were you home yesterday afternoon at the time of the killing? Yeah, I wasn't paying much attention, you know. I heard the shot, but I thought it was a backfire, uh, look, you know. Uh, uh, look, old-timer, I I want you to tell me everything you saw and heard after that shot, will you? Well, you see, I was sitting in my living room reading the evening paper, you know, and I saw you drive up. You sure you're a policeman, mister? Why, yes, of course. Yes, well, I'd like to see your credentials. You know, you were the first man I saw enter there. All right, uh, here's the dope on me. Here, mm. the sheriff's office loves me. Mm. There it is. Satisfying? It is, uh... Oh, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I've heard of you, Mr. Rogue. Well, after you drove up, the lady arrived and...
What do you want, Mr. Rogue? Mrs. Stevens, I'm coming in. I want to talk with you. No, come back later. I'm sorry. Go on in and sit down. What do you want? Some answers. Sit down. Now, where's your husband? Asleep. Nothing ever wakens him. All right, let's uh, get right to it, huh? What were you to Joe Dale? I don't know what you mean. Mrs. Stevens, you've been seeing Joe a lot, haven't you? I don't bother lying. I've got witnesses. You and Joe Dale were better friends than your husband knew, weren't you? Oh, no. I, I used to meet Joe once in a while to talk over investments he was making for me. Uh-huh. At his house? In the afternoons, usually, huh? Yes. Mrs. Stevens, your husband killed Joe Dale. <gasps> you lied when you said that the two of you had a dinner date with Joe last night. I just talked to your husband's secretary. He was supposed to be in San Francisco yesterday. No. Yes. But instead, he went out in the valley and killed Dale. I practically surprised him in the act. He got panicky, knocked me out, and ran. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. I can prove what I'm saying, Mrs. Stevens. You came up in your car alone. Your husband came up in a cab a few minutes later. He had to get back in to get that wallet and the gun to make the murder look like a robbery. And he picked the gun up so there'd be a reason for his fingerprints on it. Then he went to my apartment and collected the wallet after choking me half to death. Are you with him, then? You're just making this up. You can't prove it. Mark! Mark! Don't say any more. It's a little late for that, Stevens. You've bungled the job all the way through. And you won't be needing that gun. Harry, don't. Don't shoot. Give me that gun, Stevens. You'd be crazy to get in a shooting contest with me. You stay right where you are, Rogue. I'm not afraid to shoot. Marge, they can't make you appear against me. That's the law. If you stay with me... I'm coming after that gun, Stevens. You stay where you are, Rogue. Marge. Marge, stop looking at me like that. Nobody knows anything about what I did but Rogue and... No. No, Perry. You killed them. And I'm glad to get rid of you. You. Marge, you can't. Don't sell me out. I've been frightened to death ever since I've married to you. Take that gun away from him, Rogue. Take it away from him. Give me the gun, Stephen. Get away from me, Rogue. Marge, you're going back on me. You can't do that, Marge. We're in this thing together. Let me have that gun, Stephen. I should have shot you uh, instead of him. Uh, Give me that gun or I'll break uh, your arm off. Uh, Give it to me. Uh, okay, Stephen. Uh, this is the end of Easy Street for you. <laughs> well, that finished that case. Stevens went to the gas chamber on Marge's testimony, and Marge is still in prison on an accessory wrap. The red-headed kid, Tom Church, was in... Oh, he was an innocent victim. He'd been interviewed by Stevens for a job the day before. Stevens knew he had no relatives, no connections, so he decided to frame him for the murder of Joe Dale. He described Church to the police, then called him at his hotel and asked him to come to Stevens' home for an interview about a job. If Church had been in when the call came... I, uh, well, I, uh, I might have muffed the case. But he was out. And Stevens left his number for a callback. That, uh, well, I... Oh, that was luck, I guess. But, uh, I don't know. I I think I would have solved the case anyway. Yeah, of course, I, uh, I didn't make a dime out of it. Oh, well, money can't buy happiness. But it can buy a lot of things that make unhappiness pleasant, can't it? Oh, you know what I mean. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Next week, we have a story for you about a missing witness, a worried rogue, and an ambush that failed. Be with us then, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Be sure to tune in again next week, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. After in between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. The 
F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's Tapanified Coconut Oil Shampoo and Fitch's Shaving Creams, presents Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. For the benefit of those who tuned in hoping to hear Cass Daly, may I introduce myself? My name is Richard Rogue. I'm a private investigator. <laughs> I said it and I'm glad. Private investigator. That's the Harvard way of saying I'm a guy who has parlayed a hard head and a great curiosity about other people's affairs into a career. At least that's the way the homicide squad's Lieutenant Urban, who shares my interest in unalive bodies, feels about me. And I'd also better tell you now that I have a certain personal idiosyncrasy. I hold audible consultations with my alter ego once in a while when I'm confused and in need of advice. His name is Ugor, which is rogue spell backwards, and he's a very fresh little spook. Of course, I wouldn't have known I had an alter ego if Betty Callahan, the girl I would rather be marooned on a desert island with than not, hadn't browbeaten me into reading Sigmund Freud. Betty, who is the sharpest newspaper woman in town, extends upward about five feet from the floor, has hair the color of cordovan leather and firelight, and a tip-tilted Irish nose shying away from the most kissable mouth in the world. She's... well, she's wonderful. And on this day I'm going to tell you about, she and I had had lunch together. She had an hour to kill, so she walked back to my office with me. You know, Richard, this is much too nice a day to work. Look, Betty, if you can get rid of that assignment you have for this afternoon, we'll go to the races, huh? Oh, I haven't been out this year. I got some information from Herb Hyde at the cigar store in the lobby. He gave me two horses who gave him their word they were ready today. Talking horses? Only to Herb. They don't speak English, but fortunately he speaks horse. <laughs> now get on the phone and ask that slave driver at your city desk for the afternoon off. Tell him you have to go to your grandmother's wedding or something. Well, I'll try it, but it's not going to work, and I know it. Just sit right down there and pay no attention to that sign asking you to leave a nickel in the cigar box for every call. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. I'll do anything for the girl I love. Better think of something better than my grandmother's wedding. I know. I'll tell him I want to go to the race. Okay, but... You're, you're, you're Richard Rogue. Yeah? A detective in New York named Clement Cohan referred me to you. My name is Charles McDonald. Yeah, I got his letter. I got to see you right away. Uh, go on in that office there. I'll, I'll be in in a minute. All right. Please, hurry. What was the matter with him? He looked sick. Oh, probably been drinking. I, I noticed that from the... Oh, wait a minute. Hello, give me the city desk, please. Now, make it a good story. Tell him that your grandmother... Hello, Walter. This is Betty Callahan. Look, um, can you put somebody else on that Strubel story this afternoon? I want to go to the races. And... But Walter... Yes, but... Uh... Okay. What did he say? No. Oh. He told me to get right back to the paper, and I like my job, so here I oh. go. Oh, well, then wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll go in and talk with this guy, give him the quick brush and go over with you. Maybe I can talk Walter into letting you take the afternoon off for the betterment of racing. Huh? Well, you'll have to hurry. Walter's mad. Well, just take it easy. I'll be right back. Hey... Hey, what's the matter? Oh, good Lord, Betty. Richard, what happened? Oh, he fell out of his chair. Yeah. Get Urban on the phone and call it for an ambulance. Oh, Rich. He's dead. Yeah. Yeah, very dead. <laughs> we'll continue our story in just a moment. First, impressions often count a lot. And remember, the appearance of your hair is an important factor in impressing people favorably the first time you meet them. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo can be a real help to you in attaining the well-groomed hair that people admire. For Fitch Shampoo removes every trace of that enemy of good grooming, dandruff. 
It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. There's nothing magical in the way Fitch shampoo removes dandruff. It's simply that it has a special solvent action that penetrates the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp, cleansing them thoroughly and dissolving every trace of dandruff. That means not only the loose flakes of dandruff, but the kind that clings to the scalp as well. Then Fitch forms an abundance of fluffy lather that carries away the dissolved dandruff flakes. It rinses out easily and leaves the hair sparkling clean, completely free from dandruff. Try Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo yourself for the appearance that impresses. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> I should be inured to the sight and smell of sudden death by this time, but it always does something to me. It freezes my stomach and gives me a dull ache at the base of my brain. When I left Betty Callahan on the phone in my reception room and walked into my private office, I found my mysterious visitor falling forward out of his chair in death. I knelt by his side and loosened the long top coat he was wearing. The front of his suit and his shirt were red and there were two bullet holes. One to the right of his heart, and one a little below it. I tried to blame myself for not talking to him at once, for not understanding that his staggering, shuffling gait was not caused by drinking, but by loss of blood. I looked in his billfold for identification. His name was Charles McDonald, and he was assistant manager of a Park Avenue jewelry store in New York. There was a piece of paper in his hand. I looked at it. It carried an address... 1392 Squirrel Hill. I put the paper in my pocket. Then I heard the outer office door open and the feminine voice said, Is this Mr. Rogue's office? I jumped to my feet and ran out there, closing the door behind me. There was a girl standing by the desk talking to Betty, a dark girl. She had a, she had a figure with enough O's in it to put it in the million dollar column. And a face to match. Betty said, This is Mr. Rogue. Where's my husband? Well, I'm sure I don't know. What's his name? Charles McDonald. He's here. I saw him come in. Oh, that's very interesting. Excuse me a moment. Betty, are they on their way? Yes, both of them. Thanks. Now, uh, Mrs. McDonald, what makes you think your husband is here? I saw him come in here. You were on the elevator with him? No. I just happened to be passing on the street. I saw Charles and spoke to him. He didn't even look at me. He walked right by. I couldn't understand it. He looked sick. I saw him come into this building. I followed him in. Oh, where have you been all this time? I missed his elevator. Why are you questioning me like this? I know he's here. I want to see him. Well, if you missed his elevator, what makes you think he's here? This is a big building, you know. I waited for his elevator to come back to the ground floor. I talked with the operator. He remembered my husband and told me that Charles had asked for your office. Where is he, Mr. Rogue? Where is he? Uh, Mrs. McDonald, would you uh, just please have a chair? He's, uh, he's here all right, but he's busy. You'll have to wait. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Urban. Come in. Well, Rob, what goes on? Where's the... Urban, uh, I want to see you in the next office. Follow me, will you? Well, he sure did. How did it happen, Rogie? I'll tell you all I know. He came in here looking pretty sick. I, I thought he'd been drinking. That long top coat he had on covered the fact that he was bleeding to death. I told him to come in here and wait. I came in about two minutes later just as he pitched forward out of his chair and died. That's when I called you, or uh, had Betty call you. She was here when he came in and saw the whole thing. Mm, looks like a thirty-eight caliber job. Two around the heart. His name is Charles McDonald, and he's from New York City. Well, that's interesting. Who's the girl outside with Callahan? Uh, his wife. Well, where does she fit in here? Well, she... Oh, well, Donald, you can't go in there. I want to see Mr. Rose. Sit down. I'm going in there. No, Mr. McDonald, no, you can't go in there. I know he's in there. I'm going in. Oh, Charles! Charles! Well, when that girl saw Charles McDonald lying there, as dead as yesterday's beer, she folded up right over him like a dropped piece of string. Urban and Betty and I were still working over when the medical examiner and the technical squad from Homicide showed up. We picked her up, carried her into the outer office. As soon as she came to, Betty gave her a glass of water, which she sipped nervously when Urban started throwing questions at her like baseballs. Mrs. McDonald, 
I'm sorry to have to question you at this time. Uh, will you please put that glass down and listen to me? Now, your husband was obviously murdered. I have to have the information. I don't know who could have done it. My husband was a businessman. He wasn't mixed up in anything that could have caused his murder. Now, what kind of business was your husband in? He was in the jewelry business. Manager of a big store in New York. Mm-hmm. Richard, what was I your have address to get back to the paper. Let me get the story in. Okay, wait a minute. I'll walk out of the hall with you. All right, come Where on. are you going, Rogie? Uh, I'm taking Betty to a cab. I'll be back. See that you are. Come on. What are you doing pulling me along like this? I have high heels on. I'm in a hurry, baby. But you told Lieutenant Urban you'd be right back. I told him I'd be back and I will. My rent's paid for another month. Well, where are you going? To do a little investigating. That's what it says in my card, investigator. Now, look, honey... When we get downstairs, I'm going to have to leave you. I'll see you tonight here at the office at 7 o'clock. Going down. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Hi, Shorty. Drop this thing, will you? I'm in a hurry. I shot out of that building like a bat out of a belfry and jumped into a cab. I slipped the cab jockey a bill that made his eyes pop open like dropped eggs and told him he could keep it. If he could get me to 1392 Squirrel Hill in five minutes... That's the address I found in Charles McDonald's hand. We broke every law but the 18th Amendment in the next four minutes and 50 seconds. And I jumped out of the cab, hit the front steps of that big, deserted-looking old house in the dead run. The door was ajar, so I took my gun out of its shoulder holster, put it in my side coat pocket, and walked right in. Into a blackjack. Oh! My glazed eyes told my brain there was a dead man lying there. And then my head hit one of the stars which were surrounding me. And the star exploded with a blinding flash. I felt myself flying upward at a speed that made me dizzy. I was grabbing at the tails of comets, trying to break my speed, but nothing could stop me. I looked down at the earth and it seemed I seemed to be looking through the wrong end of a telescope. It was a little round ball... That's all. I couldn't get my breath. I fought for it. Fought for it. And then my lungs seemed to explode and everything was peaceful. I opened my eyes and I was on cloud eight. My home, away from home. Ugor was sitting there, dangling his little short legs over eternity. And combing his long, white beard with his stubby fingers. <laughs> Hello, Rogie. Been using your head for a blackjack back stuff again, huh? Oh, never mind the cracks. I feel awful. Who did it? <laughs> Some big guy I never saw before. Uh, but why would he want to hit me? Well, you must have been interfering in his business, Chiefy. There was a dead man in that room, you know. Yeah, I know it. What was I doing there? I'm a little foggy. Well, you went there because it was the address that was printed on that piece of paper you found in Charles McDonald's hand. Remember? Oh. Oh, yeah. Hey, I, I, uh, I better get downstairs. I, I got a work to do. Help me over the side, will you, Hugo? Oh, look, Rogie. There's no dough in this case for you. Why don't you get out of it? You want to get yourself killed for free? I'll get out of it if I ever get back downstairs. Give me a shove, will you? I'm going down there. Okay, Chiefy. But take care of yourself now. So long, Rogie. <laughs> I open one eye. Carefully. Then I closed it again so fast that I was afraid the guy who was watching me would hear it snap. He was a big man, and his eyes were the blue of ice cubes. Ice cubes with floodlights behind them. Hot ice. One of his hands was holding a gun, and the gun was pointed right where my heart would have been if it hadn't been in my throat. No use playing possum now, Mr. Rose. Mm. No, indeed. Mm. I am aware that you have returned to consciousness. Oh, 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 who are you? My name is Moore. 
Now come, Mr. Rogue. I realize that you undoubtedly have a headache, probably a splitting headache, and I'm regretful. But we can finish our business in just a moment if you'll sit up and talk with me. Okay, uh, I'll try. Excellent, excellent. Now, Mr. Rogue, where is it? Where is what? Now, now, time is of the essence. Let us not waste it. You know what I'm speaking of. The Star of Savoy. Where is it? You, uh, you have to believe me. I, I don't know whether you're talking about a burlesque dancer, a passenger liner, or a military decoration. What is the Star of Savoy, and why am I supposed to know something about it? You're jesting, of course. Oh, believe me, I never jest with a head like this. Look, uh, Messi, you got the wrong number. Do you think I killed this man here? Oh, indeed I don't. He was killed by a man named Charles MacDonald. Uh, you know Mr. MacDonald, of course. Oh, vaguely, vaguely, yes. He, he was dead when I met him. Uh, delightful sense of humor. I always admire a man with a sense of humor. Good. Well, then, look, I am going to get out of here. That's possible. Entirely possible. After you tell me where I may find the Star of Savoy, Mr. Rogue. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Don't even know what it is. It's a large diamond, Mr. Rowe. One of the largest in the world. Formerly owned by the Hohenzollern family. Recently the property of a New York collector of famous jewels. It's a magnificent jewel, Rowe. Magnificent. Where is it? I don't know. I suppose you think I came here after it. Oh, I wouldn't know about that, Mr. Rogue. But you say you met my friend Charles MacDonald after he was dead. Very cleverly put. But when MacDonald left here, he went from here directly to your office. He was carrying the Star of Savoy in his coat. I know that to be true. I was following him. Well, we, we searched him, the police and I. He didn't have the Star of Savoy or any other diamond or a carrot any place on him. That's the truth. Only thing I found on him was this address. That's why I came here. That's very strange. Yes, quite baffling. Have you met a strikingly beautiful girl? Tall, dark black hair, brown eyes, uh, very appealing. You, uh, you mean MacDonald's wife? Uh, well, yes, MacDonald's wife. Uh, you've met her? Uh, yes, she, uh, she was at my office when he died. Uh, who is this stiff here? Oh, uh, a former partner of mine. He was attempting to double-cross me, poor fellow. You see, Rogue, he and I had a market for the Star of Savoy, a very fine market. That's why we hope to get it from Mr. MacDonald today. MacDonald was most unreasonable, most unreasonable. Of course, I intend to continue in my efforts to acquire the Star of Savoy. Uh, this dark young lady, Mrs. Uh, MacDonald, was she alone with him at any time? Either while he was alive or after his death? Well, no. I, well, she came into my office and saw that he was dead and fainted. Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Rogue, I'm inclined to believe your story about knowing nothing about my diamond. I think I'll be running along. But just to make sure that you don't use your meager talents to pursue me, I'll have to... Oh! <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, one often hears that a woman's eyes, the window to the soul, are her most expressive features. But did you ever consider that a woman's hair can be very expressive, too? It can tell the world whether the woman is fastidious or careless. That's why so many millions of smart women depend on Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo to make their hair express good care and exquisite grooming. For Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is a thorough cleansing agent. And while it cleanses, it also reconditions the hair. This reconditioning action perks up drab and tired hair strands, gives them more elasticity and a bright, gleaming texture. Then, since Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is completely soluble in water, it leaves no dull, soapy film on your hair. It rinses out quickly and leaves the hair shining and lustrous. Let your hair be an expression of loveliness. Ask your beauty operator to give you a professional application of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, what had started out to be a lovely, lucid day had certainly turned out to be as ugly and mad as a giraffe with a sore throat. The date I had with Betty Callahan had been interrupted by a stranger walking into my office and dropping dead of pre-digested murder. 
I got knocked silly and came to to find a guy named Moore politely annoyed with me about a diamond I'd never seen. So annoyed with me, in fact, that he was determined to kick my teeth out. I saw that big shoe swing from my jaw and I ducked right into it. Oh, it would have been so easy for me to pass out again. But I fought it. I couldn't. I needed the time. I vaguely heard the fading footsteps of Mr. Moore through the aura of pain which was surrounding me like a fog. And after he'd faded out, I I sat there for a while. Then I got to my hands and knees and crawled until my head cleared a little. When I got to my feet, I ran out of the house, grabbed a cab for the Park Crest Hotel. I thought I'd find Moore there looking for Mrs. McDonald. Oh, I must have looked like a hit-and-run victim as I approached the very proper clerk. He backed away, but I reached across the counter and grabbed him. Let go of me! I want some information. I want it fast. What room is Mrs. Charles McDonald of New York City in? Mrs. McDonald? Stop stalling. What's her room number? We have a Mr. McDonald, but there is no Mrs. McDonald. His wife is in New York. How do you know that? I... I sent a wire to her for him last night. There's no Mrs. McDonald out here. And now let me go before I call the house officer. I remembered then... Mr. Moore had hesitated when I pegged that tall, dark girl as Mrs. McDonald. That girl was an imposter. My head was still doing the Virginia reel with variations on the turns, but I couldn't slow up now. In spite of the racket inside my skull, I was thinking straight and clearly. I ran to my office. It was only a block. And I got that glass that Mrs. McDonald had been twirling in her fingers as Urban questioned her. I took it down to police headquarters and asked the sergeant of the fingerprint bureau to dust it for prints and tell a photo of the prints to the FBI in Washington. I told him he could find me in my office. I went back to my office and sank into my swivel chair and let sleep take over. Honey, you look so awful. Oh, oh, hmm. oh Betty. Oh. Oh. Hello, baby. What are you doing here? It's 7 o'clock, Richard. You told me to meet you here at 7 o'clock. 7? Mm-hmm. Oh, 7 it is? Oh, hey. What about those fingerprints? Fingerprints? Oh, excuse me a minute, baby. I've got to call the identification bureau. You should be in a hospital. Oh, Richard, you can't take me to dinner looking like that. Oh, honey, I think how I feel. Mm. Identification Bureau, Sergeant James. Uh, Sergeant, this is Richard Rogue. Did you get an answer from the FBI on those prints I gave you? Yeah, it just came in, Rogue. They belong to a girl named Alice Ryan. Three years ago, when they took them at the aircraft company where she worked, she lived at 4435 Ethel Avenue in North Hollywood. Any criminal record? Arrested once in a competence rap, four years ago. Dismissed for lack of evidence. Thanks, Sarge. I owe you a cigar. Come on, Betty, we're going to go to North Hollywood. I'll explain why in a cab. Come on. No, Alice does not live here anymore. She moved into Los Angeles about uh, seven months ago when she quit her job at the airplane factory. Uh, Did she leave a forwarding address? Oh, yes, I'll get it for you. Just a minute. You think she has the diamond, don't you, Richard? Sure. She lifted it off McDonald's body when she fainted over him. Oh, how awful. Here it is. It is a long drive from here in Los Angeles. Thanks. Alice Ryan? No, she doesn't live here anymore. She came into money or something. She lives in Hollywood now. Do you know uh, her dress there? A uh, big guy around here after an hour ago. It's uh, North uh, Serrano. Oh, wait a minute, I'll get it for you. A big man? That's the man? Yeah, who... yeah that's the man. He has an hour's head start. Uh, here, here it is. I wrote it down for you. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, now, Betty. Now, ring the bell and then stand back. Clear back against the wall and stay away from the windows. All right, Richard. You take care of yourself now. I always do. Stand where you are, and I'll go knock on the door. All right. You stay right there, Betty. I'm going to try the door. Now, stay where you are. I will. Come in. 
come in. Come in, Mr. Rogue, and don't attempt to be clever because you present a beautiful target there in the doorway. Where's Alice Ryan? She's here. Drop your gun, please, Mr. Rogue. I can see you, you know. I have a bit of advantage. Drop your gun, Mr. Rogue. Close the door, Mr. Rogue. Now that I've turned the light on, you can see that you have found Alice Ryan. Oh, brother. Yes, I'm sorry. I was forced to eliminate her, Mr. Rogue. She was most unreasonable about giving me the Star of Savoy. She chose to pit her ordinary brain against my genius in this race to see who would be the possessor of the stone after Charles MacDonald was eliminated. And now, Mr. Rogue, you find yourself in much the same position. Yeah, I guess I'm not very smart. You, uh, you have the diamond? Indeed, I have. And I think perhaps you deserve a glimpse of it. There. Is that not the most inspiring sight you've ever seen, Mr. Rogue? Look at it. Glistening there. A hundred people have died, I would imagine, Mr. Rogue, in the history of this stone. Yes, at least a hundred. I have spent the last ten years scheming, contriving, bribing, stealing to get this lovely thing. And now, Mr. Rogue, it's mine. Yeah? You got it. What are you going to do with it? Just sit there and look at it? I can get a million dollars for it. A million in cold cash and no questions asked. A million dollars. I'm not at all sure that that is enough, Mr. Rogue. And now... I'm afraid I'm going to be forced, regretfully, to remove you. There was cold murder in the ice-blue eyes that were looking into mine. Moore was enjoying every breath of my last few minutes on Earth. He was waiting for me to break. And all the time, he was talking in that cultured iceberg voice. Then I saw Betty. She was hugging the wall in the next room, creeping silently toward the killer. I wanted to shout at her. To shout at her, to tell her to go away. And then... Richard! Richard, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I knocked his gun up the air when you scared him silly. Oh, Betty, Betty, bless your little pointed head, but why did you do it? Oh, Richard. Betty, well, of all the times to faint, isn't that just like a woman? Well, the police took it from there, and the story was pretty plain. Moore was the head of a gang of international jewel thieves, consisting of the man I found dead on Squirrel Hill, Alice with the dark black hair, and himself. They uh, had offered Charles McDonald a fortune to steal the Star of Savoy from the Park Avenue establishment where he was employed and where it was on exhibition. They planned to kill him when he delivered the stone. But the trio triple-crossed themselves, and finally only Moore remained alive, which was a temporary thing, because Moore soon paid the final score for the murders he committed. And, uh, well, I got a $5,000 reward for breaking the case. $5,000 for just getting batted around a little. That, uh, isn't bad, is it, huh? I, uh, I split the reward with Betty Callahan, who certainly saved my life. And she went right out and spent her half on a fur cape. You know, women should never have money. They don't know how to handle it. Of course, the first time she wore the cape, she looked so lovely that I took her to the races and lost my half on a horse named Investigator. Oh, well, money isn't as important as true love, but there's a lot more of it. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. It's awfully nice to meet you on a new network. I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a triangle, a rendezvous, and a plan that failed. We call it Lady with a Gun. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue... In Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style. You stitch shampoo. Don't despair, you use your head. Save your hair, you stitch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look.
The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Clap a while, let a song be your style. Use Fitch Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair. Use Fitch Shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. There is something about being happy that I like. And I couldn't have been any happier than I was that night if somebody had been tickling me with a feather. I had a date with Betty Callahan, and the way I feel about Betty hasn't been covered by a word yet. But it's a very dandy way to feel, and I was reveling in it as we sat there in the Club Cuba, drinking our after-dinner coffee and grinning at each other. I was quite annoyed when a gentleman with outraged dignity lurched over, drew up a chair, and made himself unwelcome at our table. Told that you are Richard Rowe, the investigator. Oh, that's right. Why don't you go back to your own table? I uh, just want to tell you, Rowe, that I consider your way of making a living despicable. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. Now, Richard, don't start a scene. Look, uh, mister, why don't you go away? You wouldn't like to have me call the captain and have you dragged away, would you? Oh, no, no. I have a few things to say before I leave, Rogue. I understand that my wife has retained your services to spy on me and sneak around after me. Uh, sit down, Richard. He's been drinking. Yeah, uh, okay, honey. Look, mister, will you please go away? We don't like you. Go away, Scott. Now, go away, go away. Oh, look. You know me, and I know what you're doing here. I just want to tell you, Rogue, that my wife means a great deal to me. I don't even know your wife. I don't care anything about your private life as long as you leave it someplace away from this table. <laughs> Going to lie about it, huh? Haven't even got nerve enough to admit that you're sneaking around watching me. Okay, okay. <laughs> Manuel. Oh, Manuel. Yes, Mr. Rogue. Will you take this creep away before I see whether those vitamin pills I've been taking really work? Take him away, will you? Of course. Yelling for help, huh, Rogue? Yellow, huh? Well, I'll oh. show you. Here, Mr. Oh. Webb. Mr. Webb. Let go of me. I'll kill him to come sneaking on. Come right on, up. come on, Betty. Let's get out of here before I lose my temper and nail that guy. I'd never seen him before. He looked like a nice little man, but he didn't look like he could poke his way out of a mosquito net. As we got a cab, I looked at Betty. She was blushing like a June groom, and her little lower lip was pushed out in that cute way, which indicated that she was going to tell me just what she thought of me and my profession as soon as she could control herself. Well, she did. It was early, but Betty wanted to go home, so I took her there. Then I went to my apartment. In the hall, I met a woman waiting for me, a beautifully turned out woman, well kept 35, with a baby face. And the full mouth drooped at the corners. Mr. Rogue? Yes. Uh, yes. Are you waiting for me? Yes. Mm, well, how nice. Uh, just a moment. Won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, have a chair. Have, uh, have we met before? No, I don't believe we have, Mr. Rogue. I've always admired you, though. I've always admired your work. Well, well thank you. And now, just what is it you wanted to see me about? About my husband. Oh. He's... Uh, oh, he's uh, found a new interest. Yes. Well, uh, well, I suppose you tell me. What's your name, by the way? I'm Mrs. Webb. Mrs. Matt Webb. Webb. Oh, Webb. Oh, well, I'm beginning to see the light. Tell me, uh, has your husband a bad disposition and delusions of grandeur? My husband? Well, he... I, uh, I just met him. He said that you'd retained me for some reason which you didn't explain. Why did you tell him that? I want to retain you, Mr. Rogue. Look at this. Huh? Oh, come on over here under the light. Hmm. Bill for a fur coat, $5,000. I want to know who my husband bought that coat for, Mr. Rogue. I'll pay you well for finding out. Oh, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Webb, but I don't get mixed up in domestic difficulties. There are plenty of detectives, though, who will take your case. You won't take it? No, I really won't. I'm much too busy. 
But, Good night, uh, Mrs. Webb. Mr. Rogan. I'm sorry, Mrs. Webb. I'm tired. I, I don't take domestic cases. Uh, thanks for dropping in, but now good night. I have to get some sleep. Good night, Mr. Rogue. Oh, what's the idea of calling it's me? It's I, Richard. Betty. And it's ten o'clock. Oh. 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 Well, hello, Angel. I, I wasn't quite awake, you know. Oh, never mind. I have news for you. Yeah? Your friend, Matt Webb. Remember him at the club last night? Sure. What about him? Well, he was found dead in his car this morning, parked in the Hollywood Hills. Shot. No kidding, huh? I just left Lieutenant Urban. He's in charge of the case for homicide. He knows about your argument with Matt Webb last night. Well, he doesn't think I did it, does he? Well, no, but... Oh, there's somebody at the door. How about lunch? Oh, all right. Noon at the Derby? Suits me. So long, honey. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh. Oh, hello, Urban. Come in. Thanks, Rogi. I don't know anything about it. Don't even know the guy. You're talking about Matt Webb, I suppose. Sure. Who else? Don't tell me to disrupt in here for a cup of coffee. How did you know Webb was dead? Did I say he was dead? Pull up a chair. Cigarette? No. What do you know about Webb, Rogue? Oh, nothing. I, I met him at the Club Cuba last night. He wanted to beat my brains out because I was an investigator. Seems he had a strange idea that his wife had retained me to follow him. Or... Okay, Rogue, talk your brains out. But you can't talk away the fact that Webb is dead and you had a beef with him. Sure, but I don't know anything about this case, Urban. And it's early in the morning and while you... You have know... a genius for getting all mixed up in things you don't know anything about, haven't you, Rogie? Now, don't get sore. Okay. I'm not sore. Just because I meet a guy who doesn't like investigators and his wife tries to hire me to find out who he bought a fur coat for and he turns up dead. That oh. uh, wife angle is interesting, Rogie. Get dressed. Why? Mrs. Webb didn't mention any fur coat when I went out to see her this morning. She didn't. Maybe she's got some more little secrets. Come on, Rogie. We're going to call on her. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, when you want to drive a nail, you can use the heel of your shoe or some other object, but you get better results with a hammer. So when you want to remove dandruff, you get the best results by using a product made especially for that purpose. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Fitch is the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. It removes dandruff effectively and quickly because its special solvent action dissolves the dandruff, both the loose dandruff and the dandruff clinging to the scalp. To get the full benefit of this solvent action, you should always apply Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo to the hair and scalp before adding water. Then apply water only after the shampoo has been massaged thoroughly into the hair and scalp. When you do add water... A fluffy lather forms to cleanse the hair of the dissolved dandruff. Try this method of attaining shining clean dandruff-free hair. Use Fitch, F-I-T-C-H, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo regularly. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> It isn't very often that I get tangled up in a case with no more money in it than a busted piggy bank. I operate on the theory that a boy's best friend is a dollar. I didn't know the recently dead Matt Webb from Gunga Den, but there I was in Urban's homicide sedan on my way out to play quiz with Mrs. Webb. During the ride, Urban gave me a quick rundown on the events surrounding Matt Webb's murder. Webb was a very wealthy man, you know, Rogie. Big manufacturer, farm machinery. Well, he couldn't have been very smart or else he wouldn't have been parked up in the Hollywood Hills. That's volunteering for a stick-up. Yeah. What's the widow look like? His daughter? No, I guess she's not quite that young, but, uh, oh, what the beauty parlor and the foundation can do to keep her young has been done. Very pretty woman. She looks about 30, probably 35. Mm. By the time we get back down to headquarters, we'll know more about her and everything else in the case. Oh, I'd like to get it over with. I want to go on my vacation. I'm sick of murders. Hey, 
see. So this is the way the other half lives, huh? Hmm. Must have taken a lot of fire machinery to plop enough dough for this monstrosity. Well, Webb had a million or two. I mean, hey. Now, uh, I'll do the questioning, Rogue. I'm in charge of the case, you know. Well, sure, 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 sure. I'm just a silent partner. Ring the bell. Thank you. I will. Yes? Police. I want to see Mrs. Webb. Oh, uh, come in. Thank you. Well, go ahead, Irvin. Go ahead. She's in here. My name is Fred Gale. I was sales manager for Matt, uh, Mr. Webb. Lieutenant Urban, homicide. This is uh, Richard Rogue. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Gale. Would you mind telling me why... Shut uh... up, Rogue. Huh? Well, I... Shut up! Oh, all right. All right. Uh, right in here, please. Well, Mrs. Webb, these gentlemen from homicide want to talk with you. Why must you talk to me right now? I have nothing more to say. Uh, Mrs. Webb... Richard Rogue here tells me that you called on him last night, uh, attempted to hire him to check on the disposition, the disposition which your husband made of a fur coat. Yes, I did. I didn't tell you about it this morning because I didn't consider it important. Well, uh, Miss Webb... Rogue! Hmm? Now, Mrs. Uh, Webb, every detail is important in the investigation of a homicide. Whom do you suspect of receiving the coat? Uh, look, Lieutenant, I hate to get into this. Mr. Gale, if you please, this is my affair. Matt Webb was my best friend. With you, Mrs. Webb, had been a little more understanding. There's no little... time to fight with me. Maybe we could organize this conversation a little bit. You huh? stay out of it, Rogue. This is a murder investigation. Now listen, all of you. Oh, just a minute, just a minute, Irvin. Look, Mrs. Webb, how about telling us a little more about the home life of you and your husband? Rogue, if you don't shut up, I'm going to throw you out of this investigation. Oh, just a minute. Gail, uh, weren't, you at Matt, weren't you with Matt Webb at the Club Cuba last night? Yes, I had dinner with him there. Then you must have known uh, who he was with and what he did later. I have no idea what he did later in the evening. I left him a little after eight. At that time, his plans were to go home. At least that was my understanding. Well, maybe you'll feel more like talking a little later, Gail. You can go now. Well, you can get me at the office any time you want me. Okay. Uh, better fix that cold. Now, uh, Mrs. Webb... You seem to think that your husband was involved with some woman. Of course he was. That's how he got killed. To whom do you think he gave the fur coat? To his secretary, Helen Damon. He's been in love with her for the last year. She's been making a perfect fool of him. Mm, Helen Damon. We'll have a talk with her. <laughs> Lieutenant Irvin dropped me by my office, and I took pen and racing form in hand and managed to forget all about killings not made at Hollywood Park until noon when I left and met Betty Callahan at the Brown Derby. She was as full of information as a Chamber of Commerce brochure. Richard, I want you to come with me to the jail. I want you to talk with Helen Damon. Web secretary, why? I feel so sorry for her. Those homicide detectives have been grilling her all morning, and she's so tired and discouraged. Well, wait a while, Helen. Hmm. Does it look like Helen did the job? Well, yes. A man showed up at the police station this morning and he said he saw a girl in a tweed coat with a tuxedo collar run down out of the hills last night and drive away in a Chrysler coupe, a blue one, just about the time of Webb's murder, and in the same locality. And Helen Damon has a coat like that and drives a blue Chrysler coupe, right? Yes, but Richard, I don't think she did it. Oh, just because she has big brown eyes, I suppose. Look, baby, cops don't make many mistakes. What did they find out about the gun? Well, it was a thirty-eight revolver that Mr. Webb kept in his desk at the office. There were no fingerprints on it. It was, uh, it was found in the weeds a little way from where the car was parked. Look, Betty, Betty, honey, you're a newspaper reporter, not an investigator. So why don't you let the police take care of finding the killers? If Helen Damon did it, she'll get the book. If she didn't, she'll be okay. Hasn't she got any alibi for the time of the crime? No, she hasn't. Oh, you have to go down there and talk to her. I promised her you would. Oh, now, what business have you promising anybody that I'll take their case? Looks to me like this Helen Damon is as guilty as Engelbach. I don't want to get mixed up in a case like that. I should have known that's the way you'd look at it. Just because she doesn't have much money to pay you. But, baby, that's got nothing to do with it. I have a couple of hundred dollars. I can pay you. I want to see that Helen Damon gets a fair deal. Now, look, Betty. I'm not going to get mixed up in this case. That's final. You understand? Rogue, you see Helen Damon. I'll give you ten minutes, Rogie. Thanks, Olson. 
Hello there, Miss Damon. Betty Callahan, the reporter, told me you were expecting me. I don't see how you can do me any good, Mr. Oak. They've already decided that I did it. There's nothing I can do to convince them. Well, I, uh, I know about the partial identification. Now, suppose you tell me where you were at the time the crime was committed. All right. Last night at 9 o'clock, within a few minutes of 9 anyway, I, I got a call from Mr. Webb. I don't think it was Mr. Webb now, but I thought it was then. He asked me to meet him at his office. Said he had some important letters he had to get out at once. Was he in the habit of having you work at night? No, but it didn't seem unreasonable to me. Mm -hmm. So I put on my coat and went down to get in my car, which was parked in the parking lot next to my apartment building. Mm -hmm. Just as I got into the car, somebody grabbed me from behind and held a cloth over my face. It was chloroform. When I came to, about three hours later, I was in my car... My coat was thrown over me, the car was back in the parking lot, and it had been driven about 15 miles. I know because I had it serviced yesterday, and the service record is on the dash. You live at Hollywood? Yes. Oh, oh well, that's just about right for a drive to the Hollywood Hills. You're going to have trouble convincing a jury with a story like that. Now, look, Helen, I, uh, I'm your friend. Is that story the truth? Yes, yes, it is, Mr. Rogue. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. You haven't the slightest idea what happened between 9 o'clock last night and midnight, right? Yes, that's right. There's no way in the world I can prove I'm telling the truth. I couldn't figure out why anybody would do anything like that to me. I got up this morning and went to work. I, I didn't say anything to anybody because I... You uh, live alone? Yes. Now, uh, Helen, I, I want you to be frank with me. Uh, were you... Uh, oh, Overly friendly with Matt Webb? I liked him and admired him, that's all. Mrs. Webb seems to think it went a little further than that. Oh, it? no, no. I hardly knew him at all socially. He's taken me to dinner a few times, that's all. Oh, Mr. Rogue, do you think you can do anything to help me? I'm not a murderess. Uh, yeah. Uh, tell me, do you know anything about a fur coat? A coat that Matt, Matt Webb bought for somebody, not his wife? No, I don't know anything about it. I haven't done anything wrong. Can you get me out of here, Mr. Rope? I don't know. I don't know. You haven't got much of a case. I'll pay you. I have a little money oh, saved. Skip I... that. Skip that. I'm doing this as a favor to a friend. Are you you sure you're on the level with me? I've told you everything I know. I didn't kill him. He was a fine man. <laughs> left Helen Damon, I had a great inquisitiveness about a fur coat. I got in my car and fought all the other crazy California drivers to a standstill trying to park in front of Helen's apartment house. I got her apartment number off the register in the foyer and walked up one flight. The lock was easy pickings. I walked in, closed the door, and... Oh! Oh, I caught it right at the base of the skull, like a turkey on the first Thanksgiving. My astral body left this world and floated up through eternity like a wisp of smoke, only paler. I was so glad to see Cloud A, my home away from home. I'm gladder to see Yugor, my alter ego. Yugor was sitting there on a used thunderbolt, his raisin-looking eyes sparkling with glee. <laughs> Hello, Rokey. Welcome home. You forgot to duck again, huh? Oh, let me sleep. I'm tired. Oh, you better snap out of it, Chiefy. You've got plenty of work to do. Yeah, yeah I know it, but uh, I'll take care of it later. Go away. No, can't, Rokey. You need a talking to. You can't lay down on a job now. Come on, snap out of it. Oh, oh, my head. Betty Callahan got me into this. Uh, her and her hunches. You've got the same hunch, and you know it, Rogie. Oh, now you're reading my mind. Look, Midget. <laughs> reading your mind? Look, Chiefy, I am your mind. Hmm. And I'm telling you to get downstairs. You've got work to do. Oh, later. Now, over you go, Rogie. Oh, stop pushing, Hugo. I'm not well. Over you go. Back to work. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Rogie. Hmm. Rogie. 
Rogie. Rogie. Rogie. Snap out of it, Rogie. Oh, oh, hello, 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 Irvin. What happened to you? I, um, I, um, I got hit on the head. I, can't you see what kind of a detective are you? Anyway? Now take it easy. What were you doing here in Helen Damon's apartment? I wasn't doing anything. I, uh, I just opened the door and somebody let me have it. What were you looking for up here? Oh, I got a little bit inquisitive. Oh, why? Well, I, uh, I had a talk with Helen Damon and she didn't know anything about a fur coat. <laughs> That's funny. What's funny about it? We just got a murder indictment against Helen Damon. Oh, well, that's a long way from conviction. Mm-hmm. And when I was up here this morning, there was no fur coat in that closet. Yeah? There's a fur coat in that closet now, Rogie. Peculiar, isn't it? We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, every woman can have beautiful hair. So it's a shame for any woman to put up with dull, dandruff-flecked hair when she could bring it back to its glorious natural beauty with regular use of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. There are several reasons why Fitch makes an ideal beauty treatment for all colors and textures of hair. For this clear amber liquid shampoo foams into mountains of rich, cleansing lather. And while it's cleansing, Fitch Shampoo is also reconditioning your hair, giving the hair strands more vigor and elasticity, and leaving them with a lovely, silky sheen. Then, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is completely soluble in water and rinses out easily, leaving no dull film to mar the luster and dancing highlights of your hair. Next time, ask for an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter. Or have a professional application at your barber or beauty shop. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Assorted and unrelated facts were whirling around in my massive intellect like neutrons around an atom. And they were, they were just as as much explosive in them as I could get if I could get them properly under control. Holy Christ! I got away from Urban and decided to drive out for a visit with Mrs. Matt Webb. As I pulled up in the same block with the Webb house, I saw Mrs. Webb get into her car and drive away. I followed her over Coldwater Canyon and out into the valley. When she pulled into the driveway of an early suburban white ranch house, I parked up the street. She went in. I took a look at the mailbox in front of the house. The name on that mailbox was F.R. Gale. I got that old familiar chill in the region of my solar plexus. I'd lucked into something and I knew it. I worked my way around to the rear of the house as quiet as fallen snow. The back door was unlocked. I pushed a foot it in, flowed up to the doors between the dining room where I was and the living room where Fred Gale stood talking with Mrs. Well, Marsha, may I be the first to congratulate you on that performance you gave for Lieutenant Urban and Rogue tonight? You did very well yourself, Fred. Now, suppose you tell me what you're doing out here. Why, I had to see you. I needed a little moral support from you, Fred. Yeah, I know. But this is the craziest thing you could have done, Marsha. Well, you don't act as though you're very glad to see me. Now, look, Marsha, we've gone to a lot of trouble to cover up the fact that we're friends, haven't we? Friends? Is that what we are? Oh. Friends? You know I love you, Marsha. It's only that so much depends on us being smart just a little while longer. How do you know you weren't followed? You'll have us both in jail for murder. We've been smart so far. Why ruin it? They don't suspect us. They have a murder indictment against Helen Damon. Aren't you going to kiss me, Fred? Come here, sweetheart. They kissed and then held it. I reached my gun out of my shoulder holster and and readied myself for the pinch, but something held me back. You can call it second sight or luck or anything you like, but I couldn't move my feet, and while I was debating, they broke it up and started talking again. It was a very interesting conversation. Oh, darling. Everything's going to be wonderful for us now, isn't it? Sure. You'll just stay away from me a little while until the case is settled. Everybody's forgotten the murder. Darling... We'll always be sure of each other, won't we? Of course. Oh, Fred, I know I'm silly, but I worry. 
I don't know what I'd do if I ever lost you. I want you to do something for me. Promise me that you will. Okay. I'll do anything for you, Marcia. If you'll only promise you'll be a good girl and get out of here and stay away from me until everything's all right again. You've got to be smart, baby. I'll stay away. If you'll just help me. I want you to write a note like this one I've written. Read it. Confession. I alone, unassisted, killed Matt Webb. Signed, Marsha Webb. Marsha, this is utter nonsense. If we can't trust each other now, no. we... I want you to write a note like that in your own handwriting and give it to me. And I'll give you my confession and you give me yours. Then we know that nothing can ever separate us. You and I. Oh, it's a stupid thing to do. Tear that note up. What if it got into the wrong it hands? Won't. Sit down here and write me one like it. Then I'll know that everything's all right. <laughs> She kissed him then and walked with him over to the desk, talking love all the way. She got a pen and some paper. She stood behind him with her arms around his neck as he started to write. I saw her free hand come up with a gun in it. As he finished the note, she placed the gun an inch from his temple, and I moved. Gail, duck! You... you shot me! You shot me. Rogue, yeah. You should be awfully glad to see me, Gail. In about another minute, you'd, you'd have been a suicide, and your girlfriend here would have been a wealthy widow. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. It's a lie. Oh, skip it, Mrs. Webb. Look, Gail, you see that gun your lovely co collaborator dropped? Uh, Marcia. If I hadn't put that slug through her shoulder, she was going to put one through your head, sucker. She was slipping you the kiss of death. He's lying, Fred. He's lying. Why, you were... You were going to kill me. Sit down, Gail. You... Sit down. I'm running the show from here on out, and the little lady has a reserved seat in the gas chamber. Well, it didn't take much to convince Gail that Marsha's plan to kill him and leave the gun in his hand as he slumped over the desk. The note she asked him to write would have sensed his death as remorseful suicide, and Mrs. Webb would have had all of Matt Webb's money and a dead accomplice. She would have been as safe as an odds-on bet that Dick Tracy catch his shoulders. Gail admitted his part in the plot to murder Webb and frame the innocent Helen Damon for the crime. And Gail got away with life. Marcia paid the full charge in the gas chamber. Oh, well, I, I've always said that there should be a little editing done on that old saying. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> The last word should be deleted. Present company accepted, of course, ladies, but uh, you men, uh, you know what I mean. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music in D. Engelbach, produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a summer resort, a lovely girl, and some newspaper clippings about a murder. We call it Cabin on the Lake. Must be a floating cabin. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. By the way, Dick will next be seen in his newest Columbia picture, Johnny O'Clark. between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Your head, save your hair, use pitch shampoo. 
The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. This Saturday night, I'm going spellbind you, Vogue. Caught me while spending a week and the fee for my last case in zestful living at a summer hotel, which was so swanky that the help hardly spoke to the guests. For $25 a day, I had one of the 50 bungalows on the hotel grounds. For 30 I could have had one with a window. Well, anyway, there was a girl up there. Isn't there always? She was named Janice Cole, a sort of a social secretary to the hotel. She was about 28... Her eyes were so big and blue, they made you think of mountain lakes, and her hair was as black as a jealous rage. She had a figure that made you think you'd seen her before in a swimsuit. Oh, she was real quality. Much to my high blood pressure, she was engaged to a society playboy with a dollar for every suntan in Florida, and his name was Clint Hayes. There was dancing going on in the ballroom of the hotel, and Janice was dancing with Clint, but she was watching me. I thought I saw fear in her eyes. They finished their dance right in front of me. Well, I certainly enjoyed that exhibition, Clint. Glad you liked it, Rogue. Dancing with Janice is a wonderful way to spend an evening. I believe that. Well, how about the next one, Janice? Oh, uh, I I can't, Richard. I I don't feel very well. Oh, really, darling? (laughs) Yes, I I think I'll go to my cabin, Clint. I have a terrible headache. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, dear. Is there anything I can get for you? I've got some aspirin. Oh, no. I, I think I'll just lie down for a while. I'll be back as soon as I feel a little more like enjoying the party. After Janice Cole left, I ducked Clint and mingled with the crowd, fencing in and out of polite conversation and keeping up a gay front to cover the worry which was stampeding around in my mind. I couldn't forget the lost look in the eyes of Janice Cole. A look that was so full of fear and hopelessness that it haunted me. I decided, after sweating out 30 minutes of wondering why she was so frightened, to drop by her bungalow and have a fatherly chat with her. I casually worked my way along a chain of conversations to the open door and faded unobtrusively out into the night. There was a light in Janice's bungalow. I walked rapidly toward it. The door was ajar. When I knocked on it, it swung open. And I saw Janice lying there, a red pool expanding on the Navajo rug under her head. I took a few steps into the room. Oh! I was on the inside of a giant bell, clinging to the clapper with a strength of desperation. It swung through eternity like a giant pendulum. And at the end of every arc, the universe was shattered by the sound of the tolling. I couldn't stand the noise. I let go on the tremendous upsweep and was catapulted through space at a terrifying, breathless speed. The ringing of the bell grew fainter and fainter. And then, there was quiet. I drifted peacefully for a while and landed as gently as a snowflake on a sparrow's wing. And I rested on cloud eight in the blackness of complete oblivion. (laughs) Hey, Chiefy! Chiefy! You better come out of it! Oh, go away, you gore. No, I'm sorry, Rogie, but you've got to get back on the ball or you're going to find yourself behind it. Come on now, come on! Oh, you gore, go away. I'm not well. I've been hurt. There are things going on that you ought to know about, Rogie. I don't care. I'm on my vacation. You're in trouble, Rogie. Bad trouble. Remember that dead girl? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let him get away with it? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Let me alone. Well, well, I guess you've been hit on the head once too often, Rogie. Lost your nerve, huh? What do you mean, midget? No fight left in you. I've got plenty of fight left in me. What's going on down there? Well, you better go down and see, Rogie. Come on. I'll help you over the side. Okay. Come on. Give me a push, Ugor. 
Oh, you're a fine alter ego, and I'm proud of you. I try to take care of you, Chiefie. Over you go, Rogie. Over you go. <laughs> I dreaded opening my eyes because I remembered that dead girl lying there. But I opened them at last. And what I didn't see made me think I'd lost my mind. Where the body had lain, staining the Navajo rug, there was a Navajo rug, but no stain and no body. I wobbled to my feet. My knees were made of soup. I grabbed the bed for support and threw my massive intellect into high... There were strange things happening here, and they were happening to me. I decided to stay mum and get back to the dance to see what I could discover from the behavior of the inmates. I took out my pocket comb, dressed my hair around the bump on my head so I wouldn't look like I had two, wiped the bed and the doorknob clean of my fingerprints, and looking much better than I felt, rejoined the party. Clint was talking with Nancy Bowman, another luscious lady on the hotel social stand. Hello, Rog. We've been looking for you. Oh, hi, Clint. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Richard. Where have you been? We're getting a little fresh air. How about this dance, Nancy? Can't. I promise Clint. Oh, go ahead. I'll be noble. Janice should be coming back soon anyhow. Well, all right, then. You're on, Mr. Rogue. Oh, for you, my dear, both of them. See you later, Clint. Bye. <laughs> You know, Nancy, that Clint's a lucky man getting a girl like Janice. She's what the boys in the back room call a dish. Ah, I suppose Janice isn't lucky getting a man with a million. <laughs> Not my type. Now, I don't have the million, but no, I Oh, then a... let's just dance. Oh. Now that Janice has her millionaire, I'm out to get mine. You girl's old friend? No, I've worked up here with her summers for a couple of years. She's a grand girl. Everybody loves her. She's engaged to this, uh, this creep with the millions? Yes, they're going to be married in two weeks. Don't you ever read the newspapers? Oh, I guess it wasn't on the sport page. Probably not. Though the way Janice stopped him, it could have been. Kitty, 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 kitty. May I cut in? Hi, Frank. That's up to you, Richard. Well, I never give up beautiful ladies to strangers. You don't know Frank, the ladies' home companion? That can be taken care of. Introduce me, Nancy. Mr. Rogue, this is Frank Pitts, friend of Janice. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Rogue. Where is Janice, anyway? She promised me some rumbas tonight. Well, uh, she wasn't uh, wasn't feeling very well. She went to her bungalow to get a little rest. You insist on cutting in? Unless you have some very fine arguments against it. Well, I, I guess I haven't. Nancy, I hope I'll see you later. Uh, you will. This is a temporary thing, Richard. <laughs> oh, what happened to your dance, Rogue? A man cut in on me. Oh, that's Frank Pitts. He doesn't belong here, Rogue. He's all shoulders and no money. Mm -hmm. I understand that he and Janice are old friends. That's right. Frank Pitts has been in love with Janice for years. They're from the same town back east. No kidding. Oh, yeah. well, he was in love with her too, huh? Desperately. But I don't feel sorry for him. He's not good enough for a girl like Janice. No, no, Clint. A girl's entitled to old friends. <laughs> you seem to be the jealous type. Oh, I used to be a little like that about Betty Callahan. I'm not I... jealous, Rogue. You just hate to see a girl like Janice making a fool of herself over a no good like that Pitts. And since he arrived today, she's been moody and dejected. Oh, that's and... the way it is. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? You and Janice had a spat over the old flame. We and... did not. You're being most impolite, Mr. Rogue. Janice and I are happen to be Mr. in love. Rogue. Yes? There's a man outside who would like to talk with you for a minute. Why? It's most important, Mr. Rogue. Please come with me. Okay, excuse me, Clem. Oh, you look a little upset. What's the matter? Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. May, may I ask what you're talking about? No, I, I can't tell you, Mr. Rogue. But in all my years in hotel management, this is the most terrible thing that's ever happened to me. Here he is, Mr. Mills. Mr. Mills is our district attorney, Mr. Rogue. Oh, oh well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Mills. What can I do for you? You're Richard Rogue, the private investigator from Los Angeles? That's right. Why? Well, I'd like to talk with you, Mr. Rogue, about a murder. Oh, yes. Why, sure, sure, Mr. Mills. Always glad to lend my talents to law enforcement. That's nice of you, Mr. Rogue, because you can help a lot on this case. Why did you murder Janice Cole? We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, dandruff on the shoulders and coat collar of a well-groomed person is as out of place as snow in July. 
That's why so many persons who want to have a smart, well-groomed appearance use Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo regularly. For Fitch Shampoo has a special solvent action that dissolves unsightly dandruff. When you apply Fitch's to your hair and scalp before adding water, this solvent action goes to work. So it's important to remember not to wet your hair before the shampoo is applied. After massaging your scalp briskly for a few minutes, then apply water. An abundance of cleansing lather will form to carry away the dissolved dandruff. Then the lather rinses out easily and completely, leaves the hair immaculately clean without a trace of dandruff. Yes, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is a real aid to good grooming. Use it regularly. You can buy an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, or have a professional application at your beauty or barber shop. Now, back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> My guilty conscience was calling me names and giving me bad advice as I stole out of the ballroom with the D.A. He had accused me of murder. And I knew who was murdered. I'd seen her in her bungalow, dead. Janice Cole. The D.A. was as quiet as a grave during that walk and not a bit more cheerful. I made a couple of abortive attempts at conversation, but I might as well have been talking to a totem pole. I couldn't understand why he was heading for my bungalow until he opened the door... And I saw Janice lying there on that blood-stained Navajo rug, just as I'd seen her a half hour before in her own bungalow. I tried to say something, but the words couldn't get by the lump in my throat. I just stood there, my mouth hanging open, and my stomach frozen in a hangman's knot. I could feel the DA's eyes boring into the back of my head. Well, Rogue, why'd you do it? Well, I didn't. I didn't kill her. How do you explain the fact that she was killed here in your cabin? She wasn't. Now, look, Rogue, you better organize yourself, huh? You're supposed to be a smart investigator. Give me a gun. I haven't got it on me. It's in that drawer there. Yeah, we found that one. This girl was shot to death with a twenty-five automatic. Any prints on it? <laughs> We're going to take yours for comparison. Am I under suspicion for this murder? At the moment, that's all you're under. I fondly hope you'll be under arrest for it the next half hour. Oh, you know, Mills, in a homicide, you usually have to have a motive. Be- hey, what's that? Why are you waving those newspaper clippings in my face? What are they? Uh, the motive. You were blackmailing Miss Cole, Rogue. We found these clippings in your briefcase. What do you mean I was blackmailing her? I didn't even know her. Now, look, Rogue, you're smarter than that. Here's a whole envelope full of clippings covering Miss Cole's trial for the murder of her first husband back in Passaic, New Jersey. Her name was Jane Sherman then, and she was released for lack of evidence. Remember the trial? Of course I do. Poisoning. But what's that... So you found out that this Jane Sherman, now known as Janice Cole, was all set to marry a million dollars. And you've been blackmailing Oh, I don't know anything about it, I tell you. I don't know how those clippings got into my briefcase. It must have been planted there when I was knocked out in Janice's bungalow. It's a switch, Rogue. You were knocked out in her bungalow, eh? When? Uh, look, Mills, I, uh... I know this whole thing's gonna sound fantastic, but I want to tell you the whole story. I came up here on my vacation. I never saw Janice Cole or whatever her name was before tonight. Disbelief walked across the DA's face as I unspun the web of circumstances which tied me into this murder. As I listened to my own story, I knew I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been there. I showed him the bump on my noggin. He just nodded. I talked on, and as I talked, I realized that I was acting like every murderer I'd ever questioned. I know my face was red, my eyes were shifting as I browbeat my brain and trying to think of some circumstance which would at least give me the benefit of a reasonable doubt. Finally, I, I stopped talking. He took my fingerprints and we went to Janice Cole's bungalow. There I got my first break. All right, Rogue. Now, where was the body lying when you first saw it? Right here, right here. Come here. Look, look, look here, look under this rug. Uh-huh. And blood on the floor where it seeped through the rug that's now in my bungalow. Do you see it? Yeah. Blood all right. Well, Rogue, that's the first thing that's made sense since we got together. I suppose there is an outside chance that somebody's trying to frame you. Enough of a chance so a conviction would be hard to get, Mr. D.A. Look, you know me. I've got a little standing in my profession, a little substance. Give me 24 hours to get this thing hung around the right man's neck. All right. 
If I don't have you locked up tonight, will you try and have the right man for me in the morning? I'll have him. Now, tell me, who knows about the murder? Well, the maid who went into your cottage to turn your bed down for the night. And the manager. Well, I've told them both to keep quiet until I give them the go-ahead to talk. Then none of the guests know about it yet, except the killer. That's right. As far as I know. Oh, okay, Mel. Okay, now. You keep it that way until morning, and I'll come up with a guilty man for you. Big talk. I had been framed with loving care, like a sweetheart's picture. The DA shoved off to take care of the grisly details of moving the body from its temporary resting place on my bungalow floor. And I started shaking Janice Cole's bungalow down. There were particles of curved glass on the floor near where the body had been lying. I picked them up carefully and fitted the larger pieces together. They could only have been the crystal of a small, square wristwatch. It might be the clue to the killer. I went back to the main hotel building. The Saturday night party was still going strong. I rejoined the merry throng and looked for Frank. He seemed to me to be the logical suspect. He was from Janice Cole's hometown. He would have known about her trial for murder. I found him talking with Nancy in a corner, and he had on a large, round wristwatch. Nancy's watch was a dainty diamond and ruby affair, small and oblong. Hello, Rogue. Nancy's been beating the bushes looking for you. I have not. I just was mildly curious about where you disappeared to. I wanted to get rid of Frank and finish that dance with you. Well, this is as good a time as any. May I have the next one? You may have all the rest of them if you like. What's the matter, Richard? You have a pensive look. Well, I was uh, just trying to figure something out. Oh? I was supposed to have a dance with you at 9 o'clock. Where were you? I was here. I got here just at 9. Didn't I, Frank? Don't try to prove anything by me, baby. I don't know. At 9 o'clock, I was having a drink with Clint Hayes in my bungalow. Hmm. Well, <laughs> there goes your alibi, Nancy. You weren't here. Alibi? Why would I need an alibi? I was here. You weren't. I looked all over for you. Oh, now, let's not argue about it. Let's have the next one, huh? I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> no tricks now. <laughs> Hi, Clint. What? Oh, how come you're sitting this one out? Oh, I am. Uh... Hello, Rug. Well, I'm sorry I startled you. I was just in a deep fog. Hmm? Nancy come back yet? No. Nancy, uh, I just changed her name there, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about her. Well, she's subject to headaches like this, poor kid. Maybe you'd better run over and have a talk with her, huh? Oh, I hate to bother her when she's feeling bad. Look, uh, Clint, just to settle a little argument, yeah. are you and Frank Pitts having a drink in his bungalow at 9 o'clock? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, we were. How'd you know that? He just told me. Just a silly little argument. I wish Janice would hurry back in time for the last dance, at least. Clint Hayes had on a large, square wristwatch. And he and Frank had unbreakable alibis. Nancy had none. They were my three prime suspects, and it looked to me like Nancy was about to be elected. I was sitting there, looking for Nancy, and carrying on a pointless discussion on headaches, their cause and cure, with Clint, when Nancy came running over. <laughs> Come on, Clint. You too, Richard. We're all going down to the pool for a moonlight dip. No, I, I don't think I want to, Nancy. Oh, come on. Just because Janice is feeling rocky tonight, there's no reason for you to be grumpy. Come on, Richard. Get your swim trunks and give the girls a treat. Huh? All right, all right. I'm in. Come on, Clint. A little dip do you got. No, I, I don't oh, think I... Oh, come on, Clint. Oh, might as well, Clint. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, Nancy, we got it all organized. Yes, Richard and Clint are crazy about the idea, aren't you? Oh, okay. I'll join you for a while. Mm, nice man, Clint. Hurry up now. See you at the pool. We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. Are you planning to have a new permanent to help you achieve that cool, crisp look this summer? If you are, here's a good point to remember. Shampooing with Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo will put your hair into grand condition for that cold wave or permanent. That's because Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is such a thorough cleansing agent. It gets the hair immaculately clean and dandruff-free. Then, since it's completely soluble in water, it rinses out easily, leaving no dull, soapy film. Your hair is left radiant with no dirt, dandruff, or soapy film clinging to the hair strands to obstruct the work of the waving solution. Yes, permanent wave equipment manufacturers, such as the Realistic Permanent Wave Machine Company, E. Frederick Incorporated, and Duart Manufacturing Company all agree that really clean hair is the first requisite to a successful permanent wave. 
For a soft, natural-looking wave, prepare your hair first with Fitch. F-I-T-C-H. Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo. Then use Fitch's regularly to keep your wave looking lovely. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. My performance in the pool that night made Nero's fiddle solo in the light of a burning room seem like the height of propriety. Here was Richard, the fall guy rogue, swimming and laughing with Frank, Clint, and Nancy, a bunch of murder suspects. A matter of hours before the law put a pair of stylishly plain bracelets on me and claimed me for its own if I hadn't solved the murder of Janice Cole. But there was method in my madness. That swim gave me the information I wanted. In fact... It gave me the murderer. I left before the swimming party broke up and went to one of the guest bungalows. An open window made the job of getting in as easy as falling in love. I found what I was looking for in a chest of drawers. Then I sat down and waited for my victim to come in and turn on the lights. Rogue, what are you doing here? Waiting to talk with you about a murder, Clint. Shut the door. Come in and sit down, Clint. I want to know all about what happened to Janice. Janice? Something's happened to Janice? Yes, Janice, and don't act so innocent. What do you know about her murder? I didn't kill her. What makes you think I killed her? I didn't say you killed her, but I'm sure you know something about it. You know, you shouldn't get involved in murder, Clint. It's too complicated. (laughs) You're just talking, Rogue. You killed her. You were blackmailing her and you killed her. Ah, no, 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 Clint. You weren't supposed to know anything about that. In fact, you couldn't have known anything about it unless you were the guy who framed me so nicely. I'm a little mad at you for that, you know. And I'm going to get a confession of that murder out of you some way or other. Now, do you feel like talking, or do I have to beat it out of you? What makes you think I did it, Rogue? Take off, uh, take off your wristwatch. Now. Now. Look at your wrist. Why? I... You see that small square of white skin where you used to wear your small square wristwatch? That was the giveaway, Clint. You see this watch here, the one I found hidden under the shirts in that chest of drawers there? The crystal's broken, Clint. That was broken in the struggle with Janice tonight just before you shot her. The broken glass was found on the floor of the cabin right where the body was before you moved it to mine. Now, do you feel any more like talking, Clint? Why did you kill her? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Hmm? I got until morning for you to start talking, and I've got more socks in a ten-story laundry. Now, let me know when you want to start singing. You know what happened in that room, and you're going to tell me. I didn't kill her. I didn't, I swear. I didn't, Rogue. I was there. Sure, I was there, but well, I... you didn't kill her, who did? I can't tell you. Come on, Clint. You're not smart enough to work out that frame on me. Who was in this with you? I wouldn't answer that if I were you, Clint. Drop the gun, Rogue. Oh. Oh, hello, Frank. Well, you're mixed up in this, too, huh? Well, maybe we can arrange a double execution. I didn't tell him anything, Frank. I didn't tell him a thing. I know it. I was listening. Sit down, Rogue. Sure, sure. Glad to, glad to. You were the brains of this deal, weren't you, Frank? It's pretty obvious that that quivering mess over there wasn't, isn't it? It's a good thing I was keeping my eye on him tonight. You see, Rogue, when he opened the door and turned on the lights, I saw you sitting there, and that's why I came in the back way. I was afraid that Clint would talk too much. You think of everything, don't you? I try. What are we going to do now, Frank? This this Rogue, he, he knows I was there when Janice was murdered. Knows you were there? Well... You might just as well know that you shot her then, huh? You did, you know. Well, it was an accident. Was it? I'll decide that. Aren't you forgetting me, fellas? Oh, no. No, we're not forgetting you, Mr. Rogue. It really doesn't make any difference who killed Janice as long as uh, you disappear with all the evidence pointing to the fact that you did it. No, 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 Frank. I don't want any more killing. Well, shut up. I'm handling this affair. What? I'm going to keep you out of the gas chamber, Clint, if you'll just shut up and do as I tell you. Take Rogue's necktie off and tie his hands. We're going to knock him off and throw him over a canyon where he'll never be found. Oh, you are? Well, I might as well take a crack at it. Give me that gun. Grab him, Clint. Grab him. Well, hey, well, well, thanks, Clint. You were very handy with that chair. How come you hit him? I couldn't. I couldn't let him kill you. I just couldn't. Oh, all, right, all right. Take his necktie off and tie his hands with it. We're going to take him for a ride down to see the district attorney. I killed her, Rogue. I killed Janice, but it was an accident. I swear it was an accident. Well, you'll have a dandy chance to explain that to a jury, Clint. Now, come here. I've, uh, I've got something for you. Oh. That's for helping to frame me. 
Oh, brother, is that D.A. going to love me? Well, that was the end of the case. Frank had been blackmailing Nancy, uh, Janice Cole ever since her engagement to wealthy playboy Clint Hayes was announced. And that night, when Frank went to Janice's cabin, Clint followed him. When Clint arrived on the scene, jealousy took over. Frank drew a gun, and Clint jumped him. In the struggle which followed, Janice was shot while the gun was in Clint's hand. Helpful Frank accused scared Clint of the murder and talked me and talked him into framing me. Frank saw lovely visions of many happy years of blackmailing a millionaire. That broken watch crystal was the only thing that kept the frame from working. So I get my brains beat out. I put the arm on a killer and blackmailer. My vacation is broken up like a drop light bulb. And I didn't make a dime. Oh, well. <laughs> Let's face it. If I hadn't been so clever, I'd be doing a life sentence instead of Clinton Frank. I wouldn't like that. No. I've heard... I've heard that stone walls do not a prison make nor iron, iron bars a cage. But it's hard to illustrate the truth of that old saw to a guy who's behind the former looking through the latter. You know what I mean? This is Dick Mushmouth Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a doctor, a dentist, and a miserly old lady who comes up dead. We call it, Where There's a Will, There's a Murder. Thanks for listening, and now here's James with a hair doiled. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. And by the way, Dick will soon be seen in his newest Columbia picture... Johnny O'Clock. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you spit shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you spit shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you Fitch. Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you Fitch. Shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Business was booming like California real estate. And I was lending my magnificent talents to about a half a dozen different investigations on this day I'm going to tell you about. I was as happy as a cat in a canary cage... When on my way back from lunch, I stopped at the cigar stand in the lobby of my building to buy a package of cigarettes. Herb Hyde, the character who owns and operates that cough emporium when he's not playing Jen Rummy with me and cheating, gave me a big wink. Herb's a little guy who is at all times conversant with the score, who is playing, and whether the game is fixed or not. He's slightly bigger than the fox, twice as smart. And that balding gray head of his contains more pertinent knowledge than your nearest library. When he slyly closed his left optic and just as slyly opened it again, I bent my manly torso over the counter and gave him my undivided attention. Hey, Rogue, hey, uh, you got company, Rogue. Big stuff. Yeah, yeah. Somebody waiting in the office? Yeah. A couple of million bucks waiting up there. Angela Mullins. Angela Mullins? <whistles> yeah, that's right. That rates a whistle from anyone. She's got plenty of dough, Rogue. Money. And if she's looking for a private investigator, something's up. But look, after you shake hands with her, be sure to count your fingers. Yeah, I understand she throws a dough around like an armless woman. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she inherited a cool million when her husband kicked the bucket. And she's run it up to double now by shop deals. You know, I understand she killed her husband with her meanness. Wouldn't even give him enough to eat. She's got a niece and a nephew, her only living relative. Niece lives with her, 
nephew is married and lives in San Francisco. She won't give either of them a dime. Meanest woman in the world. She's 67. She's Look, got... Herb, how do you know all these things? What have you been doing, making a study of the old girl just in case she ever dropped in to talk with me? Oh, well, you, you know how, how it is, Logie. Not in a place like this, you get all the gossip. Oh, Herb, you're the poor man's winchel. You store up information like a squirrel stores up nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Well, you see, I'm just a dummy. Oh, I wouldn't be running a little stand like this. I'd have a big one, big. You know, in a better building. Yeah, mm. How about some gin and rummy in my apartment tonight? Huh? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. I'll be over at nine. I'll admit that I was running a high fever in my curiosity department during the elevator ride, which whisked me toward my interview with Angela Mullins. The old lady was a legend in our town. She, she was irascible, mean, miserly, and cruel. She drove the only remaining electric car in the world and drove it wide open right through the heaviest traffic. She had a sea bag full of residence mortgages and took great personal delight in foreclosing them. Grand girl. She was waiting in my outer office, black bonnet tied under her chin, black alpaca dress, shiny with age, low heeled button shoes, and gimlet eyes. You, Richard Rogue, the investigator? Yes. <laughs> You don't look as smart as the newspaper stories about you sound. Well, I'm quite a bit brighter than I look. Well, I hope so. You know who I am? Yes, of course, of course. You're Mrs. Angela Mullins. That's right. I suppose you think I'm a little crazy. Most people do. You think I'm a miserly old hag. You know, I hardly ever think about it. Sit down, please, Mrs. Mullins. Yeah, thanks. I will. I want to talk with you, Rogue. But first, I want to know what your charges are. Well, it depends on the case. You tell me what you want me to do, and I'll name my price. If you want me badly enough, you'll pay it. If you don't, I've, I've lost nothing but time. Now, what do you want me to do? Young man, I've done business with people like you for over half a century. I don't tell my problems until I get a price. I've, uh, I've got great respect for the sanctity of womanhood and for old age. So I'm not going to ask you to leave until you're rested. <laughs> If you're as clever as you think you are, you can accomplish what I want you to do in 24 hours. What are your charges for 24 hours? Depends on the work. If it's as simple as you say it is, it'll cost you, oh, $500 for the first 24 hours. $500? Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Mr. Rogue, I want you to find out who it was who stole my will. Stole your will? Yes. A few weeks ago, I was supposed to die. A half-witted doctor who's been taking care of me for many years told me I was going to die. <laughs> My relatives had a great celebration, I suppose. I fooled them, though. I lived. Yes, I see you did. What were you supposed to die of? My heart. I'm supposed to have a bad heart. Why, it's as strong and steady as yours. I feel fine. But that fool doctor keeps warning me to take care of myself. Trying to make an invalid of me, Mr. Rogue. Look, if you had a heart attack two weeks ago, shouldn't you be home in bed? I came down to see my dentist. He's here in your building. I had a tooth bothering me. That was my excuse for getting out of the house without my spying niece knowing I was coming down to see you. Somebody stole my will, Mr. Rogue. And if I died today, I would die in testate. My money would all go to my only living relatives. A niece whom I loathe and a nephew whom I detest. Now, tomorrow I'm going to see my lawyer and write another one, just like the one which was stolen. I see. Now, what disposition did the will make of your estate? I left 5000 to each of those helpless little fools. And all the rest to a missionary society. You think it was either your niece or your nephew who stole the will? Well, who else would have any interest in it? I kept it in a strong box under my bed. It's gone now, strong box and all. Uh, here's your $500. Whoever stole that will expected me to die. They were disappointed the last time, Mr. Rogue, and now I don't know what they'll do next. All right, all right. Now, now, uh, your nephew lives in San Francisco, doesn't he? Yes. Uh, how did you know that? Well, I'm an investigator. I try to keep informed on everything. Was your nephew in town at the time the will disappeared? He was. He was by my bedside waiting for me to die and arguing with me. Hmm? I beg your pardon, Mr. Rogue. Angela, you should be at home in bed. I told you that when you left my office. And I told you I wasn't going there until I took care of some business, Sam. This is my dentist, Mr. Rogue, Samuel Hall. Oh, yes, we've passed in the lobby several times, shared a few elevators. How are you, Dr. Hall? Fine, thank you. Angela, I want you to go right Sam, home. Sam, if you don't stop ordering me around, I'm I... telling you for your own good. Go home now. I'll see you there tonight. And if that new crown I installed gives you any yes, trouble, yes, I'll... yes, 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 yes. Remember this, Mr. Rogue. Our discussion has been strictly private. <sighs> Now, if you'll help me out of this chair, I'll go home. Of course. Yes. I'll see you both at 8 o'clock this evening at my home. I'll be there. That $500 check in my pocket did its best to pay for the depression I felt that afternoon. And it came in second. 
I didn't like Angela Mullins. I called up some of the old-timers around the banks and the newspapers in town to put the bite on them for some information about the old girl. And the best any of them could say for her was that she had been the best speller in the third grade. Evidently, she'd done nothing decent since. My conscience told me to give back the five bills and bow out of the case. Five hundred dollars is a lot of money. But I have to shave every morning, and when I shave, I have to look at myself. So I decided to turn the case down. When I arrived in front of the dilapidated old mansion where Angela Mullins lived and counted her money, there were two other cars in the driveway. One was an old model coupe with the earmarks of hard use. The other was a shiny sedan with the insignia of a doctor on it. It was just 8 o'clock as I went up the creaky steps across the porch and knocked with the old-fashioned knocker. Hello, Mr. Roke. I'm afraid we're too late. What do you mean we're too late, Dr. Hall? I'm right on time. We're too late, Mr. Roke. Angela had a heart attack at 6 o'clock. She's dead. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, sometimes after we've talked about pitch shampoo, someone will remark, yes, but I still don't see how a shampoo will remove dandruff. Well, there are really two reasons. The first lies in the nature of dandruff itself. Contrary to many ideas, scientists do not consider dandruff to be a disease, but a natural scalp condition. Therefore, dandruff has to be removed, not cured. The second reason is that pitch shampoo removes dandruff for the first application. And this means not only loose dandruff, but the kind that clings to the scalp as well. For Fit Shampoo penetrates the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp, cleansing them thoroughly and dissolving every trace of dandruff. Ask for a big economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, or have a professional application at your barber or beauty shop. Remember, Fitch is the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. Use it regularly each week. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Angela Mullins was dead. Whoever had lifted that strong box containing her will from under her bed had made millionaires of the only two living relatives the old lady left behind. I had accepted a $500 fee for finding out who the strong box lifter was. When I walked into the house, the nephew, Paul Warner, the niece, Claire Mullins, and Dr. Hall, the dentist, were there. Paul and Claire were in the living room when Dr. Hall ushered me in. Claire was as stunning as a blackjack behind the ear and was the lyrics to every love song. She was sitting in a big old-fashioned chair, crying. Paul was standing in front of the fireplace, his rugged face caricatured into a sad scowl. Dr. Hall introduced me. Claire, this is Richard Rogue, private investigator. Claire Mullins, Mr. Rogue. How do you do? Hello. And this is Paul Warner, Mr. Rogue. I'm glad to know you, Warner. Thanks. Dr. Stevens is still upstairs, Mr. Rogue. He'll be here in a moment, I suppose. May I ask what your business is here at this time, Mr. Rogue? Well, your aunt commissioned me this afternoon to do a job for her. She doesn't need any jobs done for her now. She's dead. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. You're sorry? <laughs> I'm not. Paul, don't say that. After all, she was your mother's sister. I'm you sorry, have... Claire, but I can't be hypocritical. The only reason I'm sorry she's dead is I wanted to talk with her tonight. I wanted to try again to borrow some money from her. And don't worry about that, Paul. I can help you out with the amount you want. Mr. Rogue, I think you'd better come back some other time. Your aunt's death doesn't end my job for her, Miss Mullins. What do you mean, Rogue? Well, I still have to find out who stole her will from under her bed when she had her last heart attack. Her will? Yes, she came to see me about that this afternoon. You mean something has happened to that will, the one that left everything to that mission in Tibet or someplace? Has she written another will? No, no, not that I know of. She said she was going to make a new one tomorrow. Do you know anything about the missing will, Mr. Warner? No. Are you accusing me of this theft, Rogue? I'm not accusing anybody at the moment. But there were only two people in the world who stood to win by the disappearance of that will. I don't understand what you mean, Mr. Rogue. If your aunt died without leaving a will, her estate will be divided between her living heirs. That's you and Warner. Ah, that's right, Claire. Ha-ha! <laughs> We're rich! Oh, Paul, I... Mr. Rogue, I don't think this is quite the time to discuss the affair of the missing will. I would like to talk to the doctor on the case. You'll excuse me, please. Why do you want to talk to Dr. Stevens, Rogue? Because I think under the circumstances that he should be very sure that death was caused by unaided heart failure before he signs that death certificate. 
Mrs. Mullins was afraid of an attempt on her life. You think one of us murdered her for money? It's been done before. I'm not saying it was done this time, but I think there should be an autopsy to protect the heirs from suspicion. As long as neither of you had anything to do with your aunt's death, I'm sure you'll agree that such a procedure is for your protection. Did I hear talk of an autopsy in here? Oh, you, Dr. Stevens? Yes. This is Richard Rogue, the private investigator, Dr. Stevens. Oh, yes, Mr. Rogue. Could I help you in any way? I'm working for the late Mrs. Mullins. Uh, uh, doctor, are you uh, are you positive that her death was due to a heart attack? Are you questioning my knowledge of my profession, Mr. Rogue? No, I'm merely asking you a question, Doctor. Under the circumstances surrounding the death of Mrs. Mullins, there is a possibility of murder. I'm sure you wouldn't care to assist a murderer. Murderer? Well, I certainly would not. Hmm. You think Mrs. Mullins was murdered? Oh, I think it's possible. I'm going to tell the facts as I know them to the police. And I also am going to suggest an autopsy. That's a lot of foolishness, Mr. Rogue. And I shall so inform the police. You're willing to say that only heart failure could have caused Mrs. Mullins' death? Mr. Rogue, my diagnosis is heart failure. Good day. I left and called Urban from the nearest drugstore and gave him a quick pitch on the case. He owed and odd a little bit and finally decided he'd talk with the commissioner about an autopsy. I remembered my Jen Rummy date with Herb Hyde, so I told Urban to call me at home later that night. I didn't get the call. When I got home, somebody was waiting for me. I opened the door. Oh! Oh, and the world caved in. I fell into a great void. I fell and fell and fell into a blackness so heavy it felt like velvet against my skin. I fell for centuries before the blast hit and the blackness was shattered with zigzagging red, blue, and yellow lights. And I was picked up in a blast so strong that it shot me up into the heavens at a speed faster than light. I opened my eyes and saw cloud eight, my home away from home. I call you, Gore. You, Gore. You, Gore. <laughs> I'm coming, Rogie. I'm coming. Put down your flaps, Chiefy. You're coming in for a landing. Oh, you, Gore. Somebody hit me. <laughs> You're making an understatement. That's not like you, Chiefy. Somebody beats your brains out. Oh, it's so good to be here on Cloud 8. It's so peaceful. And if you'd shut up, it'd be so quiet. Hey, Rogie, you were a little late tonight. I thought maybe you were going to get by without coming up. Oh, no, no. Who hit me? <laughs> well, somebody did, Chiefy. Now you've got to get to work. you got to get back downstairs. Oh, don't mention it. I'm staying up here a good long time. I'm kind of sick. You won't feel any better until you get downstairs, Rogie. Now, come on. Over the side with you. No. No, you Gore. Stop hanging on, Chiefy. You Gore knows best. You have to go back downstairs. But I've been sick. Oh, no. Over you go. Over the side. There. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Rogie, hey, hey, Rogie. Hey, Rogie. Oh, for the love of Mike, Rogie. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Mm. What do you want? Rogie, it's Herb Hyde. Remember our Gene Rummy date? Oh, oh, it's you. Well, yeah. mm. hi, Herb. Fine, fine. Hey, what's the matter, Rogie? What happened to you? Well, isn't that pretty obvious? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Here, take a drink of this water. No, no, get me a... Get me a brandy. There's some over there in that cabin. Sure, sure. Can you see now? Of course I can see. What have I got to look at? There's a note here. Yeah? Oh, yeah, let me have it. Rogie, somebody wants to get rid of you. Hmm? Huh? Yeah. Oh. Well, it, it just says, get out of town. Oh, it's not even signed. Look at your place. All torn to the devil. Somebody was looking for something. Well, who do you suppose it was, Rogie? Who knows? Who knows? There are plenty of people who would like to see me move out of town. 
Get Urban on the phone, will you? Tell him to come over here. Sure, sure. I'll get him right away. Every nerve in my head was doing the Highland fling to the tune of the anvil course as I lay there and tried to figure out who it was that slipped me that lead pipe sleeping pill. I was working on a half dozen cases, and I didn't know which one of them had enough dynamite in it to cause the mayhem. Herb Hyde called Urban. We sat there and played gin rummy until Urban arrived. The part of my mind which was still working was on my troubles, and Herb's was on the cards. I was 370 behind when the door opened and Urban walked in. Well, what happened to you, Rogie? Oh, oh, what a question. Somebody hit him on the head. Yeah, that's right. Mm, kind of shook the place down a little, too, didn't they, Rogie? Yeah, Urban, you, uh, you know all the cases I'm mixed up in at the moment. Where am I near enough to a pinch to cause somebody to bend the plumbing over my head? Well, we ordered that autopsy on Angela Mullins, as you asked us to. Angela Mullins? She dead? Yeah, what did you find out, Urban? It was a good tip, Rogie. She'd been fed enough poison to kill an elephant. Poison, huh? That's right. Poison with cyanide. <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. A beautiful woman is like a symphony, care and technique and details adding up to a lovely theme. That's why millions of beauty-wise women choose Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo for their hair grooming. Soft, lustrous hair is a beauty detail they've learned to value. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo cleanses the hair gently and efficiently with its mounds of snowy lather. And while it's cleansing, Fitch Shampoo is also reconditioning the hair and scalp. This reconditioning action gives the hair strands greater elasticity, so your hair will take a wave better and hold it longer. And when you use Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo, notice how quickly and easily it rinses out, leaving your hair with a satiny texture, sparkling with natural color highlights. Make Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo your regular aid to lovely, shining hair. Always ask for Fitch. Spelled F-I-T-C-H. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. For some reason or other, I was expecting Urban to crack that news about the death of Angela Mullins being murder. One of my famous hunches had whispered that suspicion to my subconscious as soon as I'd heard of her death. Herb Hyde, who'd come over to play Jen Rummy and remained to put my head back on after some character unknown had knocked it off, was delighted to find himself in the middle of a murder investigation. Urban gave me all the dope in words of one syllable. She was poisoned with cyanide. That's all there is to it. It was fed to her some way, and she died in a matter of minutes of what looked like heart failure. How did you know it wasn't a heart attack, Rogie? What made you so smart? Well, Angela Mullins was up to see me this afternoon. She was expecting an attempt on her life. Well, she wasn't disappointed, was she? No. Well, you lost a client, Rogie. Did you get your dough in advance? Yes, and I'm going to keep her out on the job. Who do you think did it, Urban? There are only two suspects in the case. I've talked to both of them. The niece and the nephew? That's right. One of them did it, huh? They had plenty of motive. Yeah. What do you know about it? Well, I know the old lady's will was missing, and I know they'll divide the estate between them if the will isn't found. A couple of million dollars is a great motive for murder. Yeah, it's a nice price. You managed to break it down yet, Urban? No, they both swear they didn't have anything to do with it. Well, that's a fairly normal reaction. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Think you can get an indictment? The DA's thinking it over. One of them did the job all right. They were the only two people around when the old lady died. And this cyanide takes less than a minute to be effective. We got an open and shut case against one of them. Uh, I think I'll take a run over to the Mullins' house. I'll see you later, Urban. <laughs> Mr. Rogue, I didn't poison her. I want you to know that. You might as well face it, Claire. Cyanide, that's a poison they found your aunt had died of, is one of the fastest-acting poisons known. There was nobody in the house but you and Warner at the time, was there? No, there was just the three of us here. Paul and I were sitting downstairs here, and Auntie had just gone up to lie down for a while. Next thing we knew, she was dying. Well, let me look around a little bit. Where did your aunt keep her important papers? The really important ones she kept in that strong box under her bed. The strong box that the will was in. Mm-hmm. The police have been over the house. It isn't here. Yes, did you have a desk? Yes, it's in her office. The study upstairs. The study's upstairs, but you won't find anything there. Really, Mr. Rogue, I wish you'd go. The police are taking care of everything. I want to take a look through that desk, Claire. 
<laughs> oh, now, look, don't clot up and cry at me. I'm just trying to help you, that's all. I didn't do it. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I, I wish I were dead. There's something about a beautiful girl's tears that turns my iron will to sugar and melts my good intention away like snow in the sunshine. I comforted uh, Claire for a while, all the time wondering whether or not I was giving all that fine philosophy away to a murderess. And then I went to work. I combed that house like a head of hair, and I didn't find the will. But I did find some pay dirt. A letter written on distinctive stationery. That little buzz I get in my solar plexus told me that I'd solved a murder. That letter and that interview with Angela Mullins in my office added up to a pointing finger which I followed right out of the house. I was on the trail of the missing strong box. I called Urban, gave him a hot tip on murder, then went to work. When I arrived at my destination, no one was home, so I let myself in through a basement window. I went to work like I only had five minutes to live. I started in on the top floor and hurricaned my way back into the basement before I found what I was looking for. The missing strong box with the name Angela Mullen stenciled on its lid. I put it under my arm and walked up the stairs with it. As I walked into the kitchen, I saw him standing there with a gun in his hand. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Oh, hello, Dr. Hall. I see you found it. Yes. You were a little bit too sure of yourself, Doctor. Yes. I can see now that I was. Where did I slip up, Rook? I found a letter from you to Mrs. Mullins. A letter about a $50,000 note she was pressing you for. Yes? Well, Doc, you'd carelessly written that letter on the same stationery you had used to write me a note. The one you left in my apartment telling me to leave town. When you batted my brains out, remember? Yes. How unfortunate. You know, Rogue, killing is like lying. One leads to another. Well, what good is he going to do you to kill me? You are the only person who even suspects me of murdering Angela. I tore up the note, and incidentally, I also tore up the will. There's absolutely nothing now to tie me into this murder, Rogue, except you. Look, and I... Doc, Doc, you'll never get away with this. I... No, Rogue, no, you. They'll never get me alive. Well, I, I guess I'll have to. <coughs> well, Rogue, I guess we got here too late. Oh, I'd say you got here just in time. There's your murderer. Yeah, we checked that information you gave us, Rogue. What did you find? Dr. Hall was the killer. Very clever job. He put enough cyanide to kill a horse into a little gelatin capsule. Then he put the capsule in the crown on Mrs. Mullen's tooth. Oh, brother. And when the capsule melted, the cyanide hit the bloodstream. (laughs) Oh, Herbert, what would you do without me? Well, that was the end of that case. When the doorbell rang, Doc got rattled, and I knocked him cold. Urban was very proud of me. Dr. Hall admitted he'd put the capsule full of cyanide in the gold crown he'd made for Angela Mullins. She had been pressing him for payment of a $50,000 note, which he couldn't pay. He was executed. The will was never found, and Claire and Paul got the old lady's money. But they did very handsomely by me for getting them off the hook, and I spent the money in pursuit of Betty Callahan. She was playing hard to get in those days, but, uh, <laughs> I wore down. Case of mouse catching the mouse trap. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next week, will you? We have a story for you, entitled When the Sun Shines Through the Roof, so and so on the skies of Blazabazo. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. And by the way, Dick will soon be seen in his newest Columbia picture, Johnny O'Clock. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. (laughs) 
laugh a while Let a song be your style You spit shampoo Don't despair Use your head, shave your hair You spit shampoo The F.W. Fitch Company presents Barry Sullivan as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, in my business, it's hard to get ahead. There's so many other people trying to get ahead. My head, that is. Sometimes I think it might be better to let them scrape my name off the door before they chisel it into a headstone. Because I'm just a guy who doesn't like to see people get pushed around. Myself in particular. And I often wonder if there's any real future for me in the sneak, snoop, and snitch racket when so many people don't want me to have one. That was the frame of mind I was in one Saturday afternoon when Howard Adrian, a well-known mouthpiece, called to tell me his troubles. Hello. Rogie, this is Howard Adrian. Hey, how are you? Say you're just in time. I'm thinking of selling out. Got a wonderful set of law books here. Let you have them cheap. Never even cut the pages. Never had time. Listen, Rogie. My wife is missing. Well, she's not here. I just took inventory. You don't understand. She's gone. Vanished. I, I'm worried, Rogie. How long has she been gone, Howard? Two weeks. What have you done to locate her? Nothing at all until now. Uh, this has got to be between you and me, Rogie. You see, it's, it's rather delicate. Phyllis... Well, Phyllis is pretty headstrong, and I've got to move cautiously. Okay, Howard, I think I understand. You sit tight, I'll be right over. And relax. Richard Rogue will bring her back alive. Yeah, that's what I said. But the way it turned out, I didn't. I paid a call on Howard Adrian. His outer office was empty, and when I entered his private office without knocking, I found him kissing his secretary. It made a pretty picture, suitable for framing. Well, well, now I get it. You buried your wife in the cellar like Edgar Allan Poe so you could marry your beautiful secretary. You only hired me for a blind like in a detective story. Cut it out, Rogie. Your attempted humor isn't funny. Yeah, I guess you're right. Sorry, no time for me to go popping off. All right. Uh, this is Miss Corbin. Miss Crystal Corbin, Richard Rogue. I'm sorry. Likewise. Now, Howard, how about your wife? Uh, just a minute. Uh, that'll be all, Miss Corbin. Uh, no, wait. Maybe she can help. Well, I don't see I what suppose I... we may as well tell Mr. Rogue. You see, Crystal and I... Are... That's enough. It's an old story. I hope we're not boring you. Not at all. Well, here's some good news. I may have a line on her already. The elevator operator tells me he took her down from here on the day she disappeared. She was with a tall man with brown muscles. Oh, yes. That would be Nicky Barron. Nicky Barron? I know him. He used to be mixed up with Rocky Malatesta when they were running the gambling ships off the coast. Stood file for the murder of Pig Muldoon in Frisco. Gang war. Say, Howard, didn't you handle Barron's defense at that trial? That's right. Well, he must have been clean or you wouldn't have touched him. Thanks, and you're right. That's how I built my reputation, and the reputation helped. Nicky was acquitted, and he stayed clean ever since. Doing what? Doing all right, apparently. Operates a small club in the valley, the Mandalay. Dropped in to see me the other day. Looked sharp. And walked out with your wife, eh? This is ridiculous. There was nothing between Mrs. Adrian Whose and... Whose side are you on, Miss Corbin? She's only trying to help. Sure, sure. Howard, you know, your working conditions are so pleasant, I can't see why you want me to find your wife. Why not leave well enough alone? Because Howard wants her back so he can make a clean break. Get things settled once and for all. That's right. You find her so I could lose her, legally. She'll give you a divorce? She wants one herself. Oh, why? She doesn't like me. Oh, she doesn't like you? No. Does she love you? Cigarette? Thanks. Light. Thanks. Rogi, don't worry about it. Just find Phyllis and forget the rest. Sure, Howard, I'll remember that. But if I don't forget it, you remind me, huh? Phyllis Adrian seemed to have vanished like Judge Crater. She seemed to have rolled her footsteps up behind her, and even her shadow must have been following the wrong blonde. My first move in locating her was refreshingly simple. I merely called another private detective and assigned him to check every hotel in town at half my daily fee. Yeah, I should have been an agent. Then I headed for the Mandalay. The Mandalay was lined with woven grass mats and paneled with bamboo. You could have held hands across the dance floor. And in the middle of it, a girl was trying to shake herself out of a coat of grease paint and a sarong. I got past her all right without being hit by a flying hip and made the door of Nicky Barron's office. It was easy money. Phyllis Adrian was there. Well, 
Well, hello, Mrs. Avian. Goodbye, Mr. Rogues. Why, Nicky, that's not a very warm welcome. I'll make it warmer if you get funny, Snooper. My friends say I'm naturally funny. Maybe we'd make a team. I think you're a wonderful stew. I warned you, gumshoe. Nicky, don't tell him. Yeah? Wouldn't that be a shame? Okay, Rogue, stand up and take it. Oh, relax, will you? You start off like that, what you're going to do for an encore? Why don't you, Snoops, leave me alone? I'm in the clear with this joint. Very interesting. Fall back and regroup, Nicky. I'm not interested in you. Well, then put that sock on your account in case you get that way. Come on, get off the floor. It's a new carpet. It's Mrs. Adrian I care about. Oh, really? Sure enough, baby. Can't think of anybody I care more about at the moment. Why, well, Nicky, the man is utterly quaint. Yeah, the life of the party, that's him. Will you see me when I try on the lampshades? Mrs. Adrian, shall we rumble? I'd be utterly delighted. Uh, just one little thing first. Nicky, would you step over here a minute? No, a little more this way, please. That's good. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A comedy team. Slapstick. Did you get that wonderful fall? Why, Mr. Rose, you have muscles. Nah, I just blow myself up with a bicycle pump. Shall we go? <laughs> And that's the first act of tonight's graphic adventure from Rogue's Gallery. The F.W. Fitch Company is presenting Barry Sullivan as star of this Sunday series, bringing you the adventures of private detective Richard Rogue. In just a moment, we'll continue with our story. America's number one hair problem is dandruff. Yes, according to a current survey made by Cosmopolitan magazine, 61.5% of those interviewed said their number one hair problem is dandruff. You can lick this problem by using Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo regularly. Fitch is the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff with the first application is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. Keep your hair dandruff-free with Fitch Shampoo. And men, for hair with that just-combed look, use Fitch's new Quin Oil Hair Tonic. Quin Oil gives your hair its rightful, healthy-looking luster, even if it's been dried out by hot summer sun and wind. Not sticky or greasy, Quin Oil is blended from five essential oils for perfect hair grooming. Get Fitch's Quin Oil hair tonic at toilet goods counters. Quin Oil is spelled Q-U-I-N-O-I-L. Later in tonight's program, a special offer for the United States only will be made. Everyone in the family will want to listen for details. <laughs> When I walked in on a tender love scene between Howard Adrian and his secretary, I couldn't see why he was so anxious for me to locate his missing wife. But I did locate her, and I was ready to take her home. Though I had to overcome the objections of one Nicky Barron, proprietor of the Mandalay. I guess Nicky was convinced, though, because as he lay there on the carpet, he didn't seem to have another word to say. Well, for a moment, Phyllis Adrian seemed undecided between the horizontal Mr. Barron and the perpendicular Mr. Rogue. Then she began to smile. I must admit, that's an utterly divine Sunday wall of you, Pat. Just part of life at its best. Oh, yes. It's given me an idea. Be a nice boy, will you, and wait for me in the lobby? Well, I don't like to wear out my welcome. Oh, it'll only be a minute. When this wilted snapdragon revives, I'll have something to say to him that isn't for yours, shall I, dear? Dear darling. So I was a darling. What else could I do? In that silk dress, Phyllis Adrian's geography was making history. I waited in the lobby, and I was just telling the hat check girl to look out for men who tell hat check girls to look out for men when someone tugged at my sleeve. I turned around. At first, I didn't recognize her without her lipstick smeared. It was Crystal Corbin. Well, well, Miss Corbin. You're looking a little like a Dresden doll tonight. Thanks. Same to you. Look, Mr. Rogue, you've done your job. You found Mrs. Adrian. It's all Howard's paying you to do. Why not be smart and stop playing with dynamite? Leave Nicky Barron alone. Crystal, kid, you surprise me. What makes you think I'm interested in Nicky Barron? Because I know you had Betty Callahan checking the newspaper files this afternoon on the death of Pig Muldoon. And Nicky won't like that. My, my. It's a crime to waste those gams doing Nicky's legwork. What's your interest, Crystal? Well, you interest me. Enough so I wouldn't like to see that smile without any teeth in it. Why, Chris, I didn't know you cared. Mr. Rogue, forget Nicky Barron and get Mrs. Adrian back to her husband. Maybe I will, Kate. That's just what I'm trying to do, darling. If people will stop shoving Nicky Barron down my throat. Uh oh. Here comes Philip. Forget this for me. Good boy. Right where I left him. Ready to go back to Papa? Oh. Don't be so eager to get rid of me. 
I still have one more stop to make to bring about everything I've been trying to do these two weeks. You're important to my plan. Look, where do I fit in? We've only just met. Well, it's complicated, but you fit in. I'll tell you this much. I'm up to my mascara on a tricky business deal, and you're the lever I need to swing it. Mm-hmm. Play along a few more hands without looking at my cards, and I'll cut you in on the pot. I've already got a deal from your husband, remember? Oh, I'll see you collect on that, too. And I'll double it. Say no more, I'm in. Now, whose grave do I have to rob? <laughs> Well, you're not so far wrong as that, Richard. We're selling a course. But all you have to do is stand in the background and rattle its boom. We got where we were going at 10.25. It was a house on the ocean front, near Malibu. Whose place is this? Ask me no questions. Well, what are you waiting for? An engraved invitation? No, nope, just looking for the light switch. Ah, uh, here it is. The place was a man's idea of what a woman would think a man's place ought to look like. Lots of copper, knotty pine, big brick fireplace, white bearskin rug, you know, the works. One end of the room was sliding glass windows from top to bottom, looking out on a private beach and plenty of Pacific. I'd no sooner case the layout than Phyllis Adrian snapped off the lights. Hey, cut it out. I'm scared of the dark. Oh, now, Mr. Muscles, don't tell me you're frightened of poor little me. Could be, baby, could be. But I just don't like the idea of making mud pies in somebody else's sandbox. Relax. Come here and sit down. Don't you love the moonlight, baby? It's overrated. It shines on the same things the sun does, baby. But on them it looks good. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there's none of us so perfect we couldn't stand a softer focus. In more ways than one. More ways than one. Let's just stick to one. All right. What's up? Whose place is this? He smiled but didn't answer. And it was right then I began to feel that knot in my chest. The uncanny vibrations of something about to happen. And from then until it did happen, my heart was on a pogo stick and my nerves were skipping rope. Phyllis went to the record cabinet and fumbled through a row of platters until she found the one she wanted. Mrs. Adrian listened like someone in a dream. She floated to the chair opposite me and settled herself in it like a cloud coming to rest on a hill. Recognize the artist? Who is it, Evelyn and her magic violin? No, darling. It's Igorsky. This is his house. And this composition he wrote only for me. Pretty. Romantic. Sure. Come on over here and sit on the sofa. No, thank you. I always sit here when he plays. He stands right there. And I sit here. Always. You always close your eyes? Yes. Try it. Really. Well, anything for a thrill. Well, music appreciation's a wonderful thing. But gunshot crescendos are too modern for my taste. I opened my eyes and leapt to my feet, and that knot in my chest pulled tight as a hangman's noose. Phyllis Adrian still sat where she was sitting. There was still a smile on her face. She still looked good. Yeah, good and dead. There was a gushing red hole in her throat. The clock said 11.05. I don't know why. The first thing I did was knock the playing arm off that record. I guess it made me nervous. Then I took a quick study around the house. There was no one in the kitchen, the closets, or under the bed. The shots seemed to have come from close by, maybe from the private beach beyond the big window, so I dived through them. There was nothing out there but sand, 
pounding surf and fog. Fog thick as taffy was rolling in off the sea. Coming in fast like they do at Malibu. Blotting out everything. Everything but one shape at the shoreline that didn't look like driftwood. I yanked out my heater and dropped to the sand. Hey, you! Stop swimming or digging. I'm coming after you. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I'll give you the first one. Don't be silly. I'm not that polite. I ain't got no gun! That proves I have got one. So you'd better start spitting bullets, kids, and make that first one count. <laughs> Started inching toward him, my finger trembling on the trigger, ready for a duel in the fog, but he foxed me. He stood up and started waving his arms over his head. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I give up! Okay, buddy, just hold it like that. Now, start talking. Who are you? Bert Hex. Bert Hex. Hey, the private snoop. Yeah, how'd you know? No, why, I'm the guy who hired you to find Mrs. Adrian. You're Richard Rose? Yeah, you're working for me. Well, I found her. Yeah, but I said find her, not get her dead or alive. Now, wait a minute. You ain't telling me I did it. Who else? You won't get sore? No, I won't get sore. You do? I did. Sure, I seen you. I was watching through the big windows. You were sitting on the couch with your back to me. She was sitting in the chair facing me. She was listening to the music, and all of a sudden you let her have it. What's the matter? Don't you like music? Not the kind you're making. I want to know how you happen to be outside that window. I told you to check hotels for Mrs. Adrian. Tonight I find you peeping through windows that belong to a friend of hers. You get around. You're terrific. Tell me a secret. Oh, well, I found a dame registered at the Wilshire Park Terrace is Adrian Howard. Howard, Adrian, Adrian Howard. You get it? Wonderful. How'd you ever figure it out? Listen, if you can't praise the other guy's work, don't knock it. Okay, keep talking. Well, I checked the telephone calls, and they was all to this beach address. She wasn't in, so I come out looking for her. I looked through the window, and I seen it happen. You saw me kill her, huh? Well, it was kind of dark. Maybe it was two other fellas. And since it's you holding the gun, Rogue, uh, yeah, yeah, guess I must have made a mistake. If you thought I did it, why didn't you go for a cop instead of hiding out here on the beach? Oh, that's your age, Rogue. I didn't want no cops in on the deal. I was going to tell you, when you left, you've been in this racket long enough to know that there's, there's more moolah in not telling who done it. You, you, you know what I mean? Uh, you put the hooks in me for a hush, eh? Well, we all make mistakes, Rogue. Sure, yeah, but you're overdoing it. Okay, Bert, let's go inside the house. I'm calling homicide. You'll be sorry. Somebody's going to be sorry. All right, Rogue, drop that heater and reach. You were right, Bert. I'm sorry. Okay, Baron, this makes you dealer. Smart boy, Rogue. Now hand over those papers. Papers? Oh, I might have known there'd be papers. Well, I hate to say this because I know what will happen, but... What papers? Oh, that's it. It happened. Papers you wanted bad enough to bump Mrs. Adrian for. Oh, now you're telling me I didn't. Who else? I thought you did. Now, wait a minute. I just walked into this. I found her that way. Don't try to hang it on me. Oh, don't mind him. He tries to hang it on anybody who comes along. Yes. Who's this creep? A business associate. You can talk in front of him. Okay. To your benefit, creep, this dame tried to shake me down tonight. I was supposed to meet her at 12 o'clock with 10 grand in hush money. When I walked in, she was... Like that. Go ahead. Tell them where I come in. Oh, sure. I was having trouble raising the dough, so she tells me tonight she's taken Rogue into the deal with her. Says a smart shamus like him would know how to peddle that kind of dope. But Rogue here couldn't wait for the split. So he cut her out with a slug. That wraps it up, a motive. Oh, but one thing. What was he selling? I don't mind telling you now. I got nothing to lose. Besides, you two have a murder rap of your own to settle between you. Okay. I got a little careless once up in Frisco. I was tossing lead around for a bluff, and a gent named Pig Muldoon stepped into one and called me. Oh, I was very sorry, but it couldn't have happened to a worse rat. Yeah, sure, I remember, but I thought you was cleared. Yeah, I was. There was just one little technicality. I was guilty. Howard Adrian didn't know that when he took the case? No, not when he took the case, he didn't. But before the trial was over, he did. See, the jury was already out when a guy called Meathead Maxwell paid him a call. He was the boy who was with me at the time. He wasn't trying to finger me. He just wanted a little powder money to blow town before anyone caught up with him and started asking questions. You mean Adrian made a deal? Withheld state's evidence? Yeah. He probably wouldn't have, but the jury was already out and he built up such a beautiful case. But he still didn't like it. Well, he got me off all right, but he also got a statement from the meathead. And he's been holding it over my head. Making me walk the chalk. That was what was in the papers, huh? You catch on quick, kid. Yeah. But I was doing all right, you see. Until Mrs. Adrian gets her mitts on the safety deposit key. All in the line of her wifely duties going through his pockets one night. 
Next day, she opens the box and pulls out my past. And starts in selling it back to me. I can't see her doing it. She's doing all right, ain't she? Just being Mrs. Adrian. Yeah, but she's not being just Mrs. Adrian. She's being a patron of the arts on the side. Sponsoring concerts here and there. And I'm the angel. Either I angel her boyfriend, Igorsky, or she spades up Muldoon. <laughs> nice dinner. Yeah, I thought she'd like it. All right, now, Rose, how about it, huh? No, no hard feelings. If you're still selling, I'm still buying. As for killing that dame, all I got for you is congratulations. Okay. You put it that way, did you bring the money with you? Sure, sure, I got it right here. Let's see it. Yeah, here it is, right here. Ooh. You see, Bird, he's not so tough. That's the second time tonight he's dropped his guard. <laughs> Neither are you, Bills. Neither are you. You made the very same mistake. Hmm. Folding money. Legal letters. Tons of it. So long, Kitty. Rest easy now. You look real cute there. Cheek to cheek. Folks, here it is. A bullet ballpoint pen. Specially for you from the Fitch Company. Yes, it's made from a genuine U.S. 30 caliber machine gun cartridge. It's sleek, streamlined, all metal, and chrome plated. Filled with non smear ink, it writes for months. It's neat, compact, only four inches long, just right to slip into purse or pocket. Dad will want one for notes, Mother will want one for her purse. And kids, you'll be the envy of the neighborhood if you have one. And here's all you do to get your bullet ballpoint pen. Send your name and address with 25 cents and the box top from any one of these three Fitch products. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo, Quinoil Hair Tonic, or Skin Pep After Shaving Lotion. Mail to Fitch, Des Moines, 6, Iowa. That's Fitch, Des Moines, 6, Iowa. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. And now back to Barry Sullivan as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in... Rogue's Gallery. I woke up with a lump the size of a hat on my head. Both my playmates were gone. Hecht with the ten grand and Baron probably after him with a grudge. And me with nothing but a corpse, I'd have a swell time explaining. I dragged myself to the phone and called Betty Callahan, a newspaper gal who sometimes knows the answers. I told her what happened and asked her to check the alibis of three other people. Crystal Corbin, Howard Adrian, and the violinist, even Igorsky. Then I spent the next 20 minutes trying to figure out one for myself. I still didn't have one when the telephone rang. It was Betty. At the time of the murder, Howard Adrian had been making a speech in front of 70 lawyers in a downtown hotel. Ivan Igorsky was in San Diego giving a concert. He only had 2,000 witnesses. The way the alibis were stacking up, I figured Crystal Corbin would have been taking a bath in the Hollywood Bowl. But no, she'd been with Howard. Betty said she'd notified him and he was on his way out. So I had to have some answers ready fast. And then I saw it. The answer was in front of me all the time. Phyllis Adrian. The bullet had entered her throat at an up angle from somewhere near the floor. From that I traced the possible trajectory of the slug to its point of origin and found myself looking at a wall gas heater with an aluminum grill work. I went over to it, knelt down, twisted some knobs, and removed the drill. There, wired to the pipes inside, was a twenty-two target pistol. A little further back, clamped to another pipe, was a silver tuning fork. Two fine copper wires ran from the tips of the fork to the trigger of the gun. The trip hammer of the gun had been worked on with a file to make it respond to a hair-trigger touch. I didn't have to test it to know that the tuning fork would vibrate to the crescendo in Agorsky's concerto. The Concerto of Death. Rose, we got here as fast as we could. What happened? Oh, Phyllis. How horrible. Oh, don't look up. Oh, it's better you don't. I think she'd want a softer focus. But I don't understand. How could it happen with you right here? There's your killer, Howard. Death by remote control. Commits murder on cue to a musical note. Good Lord, what a devilish thing. But who? Why didn't you tell me your wife was in love with another man? What? But how could I? I never knew. You're sure of that? Of course I'm sure. What are you driving at, Rogue? Well, somebody knew. Whoever planted this gadget knew every detail. That she always sat in that chair, in that exact spot whenever she listened to him play. Who could have known that except the other man? Yeah, that's a natural thought, Crystal. I think it's what we were meant to think. But it isn't the answer. Do you know the answer? I know a lot of answers, baby. Now, did you ever tell Howard you were Nikki Barron's sister? 
How did you ever find that out? The old newspaper file to the trial, baby. You changed your name and the color of your hair, but you were still Nikki's sister and you couldn't hide that. She wasn't trying to hide it. I knew it all the time. You can't persecute the girl because of her I'm brother. I'm not trying to. I'm just saying she made a play for you so she could get her hands on those papers you were holding over her brother's head and destroy them. Right, Crystal? Oh, it may have started like that, but... Now, hold on, Rogue. You're not trying to say that Crystal I'm not killed... saying anything. I'm just clearing the record. No. Crystal didn't kill your wife, Howard. Because you did. Me? Rogan, do you realize what you're saying? What possible motive could I have? Well, I've got my choice of several. But most of them involve blackmail and legal loopholes. And you'd have had a neater way of getting around those, so I choose good old-fashioned jealousy. The one thing you wouldn't have known how to handle. You must be out of your mind. How could I be jealous of something I didn't even know about? But you did know it, Howard. And the very fact that you went to such pains to conceal your knowledge is the tip-off. But that couldn't be. Doesn't make sense. Howard loves me. You know. You saw. Sure, I saw. I was meant to see. The guy's a lawyer, baby. You were Exhibit A. And I was going to be a star witness. You're skating on very thin ice, Rogue. What makes you think I knew? A little guy named Bert Hex. A guy I hired to help me find your wife. Only he found her too fast. And he isn't that good. I figured right then he'd been keeping an eye on her for a long time for somebody else. But why me? You because he said you, Howard. Who but a jealous husband hires a detective to follow his wife? Yeah. Hex reports must have made good reading. All the intimate details about the private concerts and the special... All right, Rogue, that's close enough. I'm sorry. Don't be a fool, Howard. Put on that gun. Yes, yes, I'm really sorry, Rogie, for you. It's you I'm sorry for, Howard. Don't tell me that. Nobody feels sorry for me. Not me, not Howard Adrian. I don't need it. Howard, you're insane. Put on that gun. And you, Crystal, you, you tried to get close enough to hurt me just like all the rest. But you never could. Nobody gets close to me. Nobody knows what makes me tick in here. Save it for the courtroom, pal. You're finished. Yes, yes, I know. But so are you, Rogue. So are you. If it hadn't been for you, I... Well, well, you're just too smart to live. Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. For an instant, I stood expecting to fall dead, but I didn't. Instead, Howard jerked a wreck, spun around like a ballet dancer, and crumpled to the floor at the end of his nice body. And then I got it. The tuning fork was still attached. The gun was an automatic... And Crystal's high-pitched scream had set the thing in motion a second time. Howard hadn't thought of that when he stood in the line of fire, and when he did think of it, it was too late. He was killed, as you might say, by his own ingenious hand. Well, that wrapped it up. It was Bert Hecht's all-too-prompt appearance on the scene of a crime that had started the hunch I played against Howard's alibi. Just a little too coincidental. The police snabbed Hecht crossing the border to Mexico, and they picked up Barron while he was boarding a plane for Las Vegas. Hecht's original thought was to blackmail Howard. That's why he didn't tell me Howard had hired him three months before to spy on his wife. But the ten grand was quicker, so he took that instead. Oh, yes, the papers. We never did find any papers. I kind of like to think that they didn't exist. You know what I mean? You have just heard Barry Sullivan as Private Detective Richard Rogue in this week's graphic adventure from Rogue's Gallery. I'd like to thank our Rogue's Gallery players who were Lorene Tuttle, Gerald Moore, Peter Lee, and Ed Mack. Thanks, too, to Charles Vander, producer and director of your Fitch Van Wagen summer series, Rogue's Gallery. Until next Sunday, then, this is Barry Sullivan saying, don't forget to switch to Fitch. Laugh a while, let us on to your style, you Fitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, shave your hair, you Fitch shampoo. Men, after shaving, be smile happy. For that tingling, frosty, fresh feeling, use Fitch's Skin Pep After Shaving Lotion. It's a smooth antiseptic lotion with a lasting He-Man scent. Get Fitch's Skin Pep After Shaving Lotion. To get your bullet ballpoint pen, send name, address, 25 cents, and the box top from Fitch Shampoo, Quin Oil, Hair Tonic, or After Shaving Lotion to Fitch, Des Moines 6, Iowa. Jim Doyle speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The preceding NBC program was transcribed earlier to be heard at this time. KFC.
I, Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, California distributor of Packard Motor Cars. presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rhodes. In Rhodes Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, I've got a man bites dog title for my story tonight. Blondes prefer gentlemen. Hmm. How do you like that? But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. It's no trick at all to get a smooth, comfortable shave with Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. You just wet your face, apply the cream with your fingers, and you're ready to shave. The instant you apply Fitch's No Brush to your face, the special skin conditioner ingredient goes into action to prepare your skin for the shave. It gets right next to your skin to hold the whiskers up until the razor comes along and mows them down. The lubricating qualities of Fitch's No Brush actually help your razor glide easily without nicking or scraping your face. Then when your shave is finished, your face will feel cool, relaxed, and refreshed. Fitch's No Brush is the easy-to-use shave cream that's fast becoming a favorite with men everywhere. Get it at your drug counter. Or if you prefer a lather cream, get Fitch's Brush Cream. It also contains the special skin conditioner, Leaves your face feeling soft and smooth when the shave is finished. Fitch's No Brush and Fitch's Brush Cream come in 25 and 50 cent sizes. Thank you, Jim. And now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was really as busy as a cat in a kennel when this little old lady walked in. I was on a retainer from a theater chain to find who was tapping their tills. About as exciting as going to the races broke, and I needed more business like a canary needs an arranger. But I've got a weak spot for little old ladies, especially when they look like this one. Apple-cheeked, a little on the pudgy side, with curly snow-white hair showing beneath a black bonnet. Oh, she was a picture She took me back a lot of years, and I like being back there. Barefoot boy with cheeks of tan. Oh, good Lord, could that have been me? Well, anyway, there she stood, just inside the door, with a little scared smile on her lips. Are you Mr. Rogue? That's right. Well, could I see you for a moment? Why, of course. Come in and have a chair. Oh, here, take this one. That's the most comfortable one in the office. It has a back. Oh, thank you. I know you're a busy man, Mr. Rogue, but, well, I've been so worried and... Look, uh, Mrs... Mrs. Echo. Mrs. Echo, you've got trouble? Well, you don't look like the type. It's my granddaughter, Mr. Rogue. Oh. Oh, she's really a lovely girl. You'd just be crazy about her if you knew her. Everybody is. I don't know what's the matter with her. She's worried and distracted and... Well, she's just not herself anymore. Sounds to me like she's in love. Oh, no, Mr. Rogue. It isn't love. Debtor's in some kind of trouble. I know she is. You see, her letters were so distressing that I came up to see her. Oh, you don't live here in town? Oh, my goodness, no. I live in Fairfax. Yes, that's where Debtor went to school. She came up here to take a job singing. Oh, she was so happy at first. What happened uh, when you came up here to see her? Well, she got me a room in the Bellevue Hotel. She has a roommate in the apartment with her. I knew she was in trouble the minute I talked with her. She acted frightened and... Well, I I just can't sleep for worrying about her, Mr. Rowe. Now, now, please don't cry. If I can help you, I will. Well, if it's a matter of money, I... Well, it, uh, it isn't. You know something? When I was a kid, I spent all my Thanksgivings and... Christmas is at my grandma's house. Oh, 
She was the greatest person in the world to me, and, you know, she looked just like you. I talked just like you and worried just like you. You think I'm just a nervous old lady. You think I'm just making all this up in my own mind. But I know better so well. She's so helpless and uh, unworldly. Of course, Graham. Yes. Uh, you just leave everything to me and don't worry. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what's your granddaughter's name and where can I find it? Her name is Betta Eckel, and she lives at the Clybourne Apartments. Apartment uh, 403. Here's a key to it. She doesn't know I have it, but I stole it for you. Okay, yes. okay, Graham. <laughs> now, now, you just give me all the details, and I'll try my best to find out what it is that's bothering that little girl of yours. Well, that's me, the boy volunteer. Never so busy that I can't neglect a steady client to take on a case that wouldn't mean a dime to me. You'd think I hated the sight of money, which is less than truth. Well, I just sat there for a while, thinking about my grandmother in those dear, dead childhood days. Me, the guy who wouldn't bet eight to five that tomorrow's Friday. Well, it uh, suddenly dawned on me that I had work to do, so I pulled the emergency cord on the dream train and made a few calls on theaters. And then about seven o'clock, I remembered my new client, and I dropped in at the Clyburn Apartments. They were nice. A self-operated elevator whizzed me up to the fourth floor, and I knocked at the door of 403. Nobody answered, so I unlocked the door and walked in. And there, across the room from me, was a young girl. She was lying on the floor, and there was a little pool of blood around her head. I just stood there for a split second while that still, small voice within me talked sense. You'd better get out of here, Rogie. That dame's dead. Oh, brother. Right in the back of the head. <sighs> the poor kid. Yeah, the poor kid. What's it to you? This is going to be tough on that little old lady. But that's none of your business. Come on, Rogie. Take distance. Hey! Good Lord, what a spot I was in. Yeah. Better get back in that apartment and get the door closed before somebody sees you out here. Okay, okay. Don't tell me what to do. Oh, this is too bad. Sweet-looking kid. Nice face. Cute figure. Dancer's legs. She was writing something when she got it. There, on the desk. Yeah. To the chief of the police, I have some information. That's as far as she got. Sure. She knew too much. That's why she got bumped. What makes you so inquisitive? You tired of living. Snapshot. Hmm. Huh. Brother. Like the looks of that little blonde in the bathing suit, Rogie? Miss Universe of 1940 anything. Somebody's coming in, Rogie. Better get behind the door where the killer hid when you stuck your skinny neck in here. You better be ready for anything. <laughs> quiet, quiet. You want the cops to come up here? Me. Wait a minute, Dom. Oh, no, Francie, Francie. Is she dead? Yes, I'm afraid she is. You know who killed her? You did, of course. I did. What would I kill her for? I don't even know her. Stop pointing that gun at me. If you're going to shoot me, go ahead. I don't care. I'd rather be dead. I would. I would. Have you any idea who might have killed Miss Eckle? I'm Miss Eckle. That... That... Was Francie McCall. She was my singing partner. You killed her thinking it was me. Look, would you mind straightening me out a little bit? If you were dead at Eckle... I am dead Eckle. Look, here's my driver's license. My initial on my person... There on the mantel is a picture of me. You killed the wrong girl. I'm the one who was supposed to have been killed. You better go back to Mooney and tell him you made a mistake. Look, baby, I'm Richard Rogue, the private dick. I'm not a killer. Now, why is this Mooney guy trying to have you bumped? If he's responsible for killing your friend, we have to get him for it, don't we? Go away from me. Go away. Go away. Don't you touch me. Don't touch me. With a dead 
dam and a hysterical dam in my hand. I liked that dead one best at the time. I couldn't shut this other one up. She was a little blonde from the bathing suit snapshots. She looked like one of those composite pictures Hollywood press agents get out combining the best features of all the stars in one deluxe edition. It was a pleasure to take tender care of her. I put cold claws on her head, I rubbed her hands, I talked to her. Finally, I convinced her I was a friend. And then she cuddled up to me, like a little kid. I called Urban at headquarters and reported the murder. Daddy kept right on bawling. I couldn't stop her. <laughs> oh, look, look, baby. Are you going to tell me what this is all about, or do you want to wait and tell the cops? They'll be here any minute now, and there's I, no use going... I won't tell anyone. I can't. If I do, I'll be killed just like Francie. Don't ever go away and leave me, will you? Well, of course not. Think I'm crazy? You just take it easy now and tell me what this is all about, will you? Take it easy? With my best friend lying there dead... Oh, it's all my fault. Oh, look, doll, nothing's your fault. Stop beating yourself to death. What are you mixed up anyway? Come on, tell me. Let me help you. I will. If you get me a drink of water. All right. Yeah. Now you try to get a hold of yourself, little one. You're going to need all the brains you have when the cops get here. Why, that dirty little double-crossing... Oh, brother, that's all I need for her to run out on me. I tried to beat that elevator down and almost broke my pretty little stuck-out neck doing it. I missed a stair between the third and second floors and flew blind for a while before I caught my balance again. I hit the front door like I had the Notre Dame team behind me and ran across the sidewalk just in time to see Detta pulling away in a cab. She had too much of a start on me for footwork, so I ran for another cab. Follow that cab. Huh? What'd you say? Follow that cab. There's 20 bucks in it for you if you catch it. Okay, for 20 bucks, I'll drive you over that cab. Watch this, mister. Put out, put out. Hey, had an accident, didn't you? No, no, no. Just trying to cure my hiccups. Get out of the way. Just a minute, Rogue. Where are you going? Oh, hello, Urban. I wasn't going anyplace. I was oh, just he was in the cab. He was going someplace, all right. Oh, take that driver down and lock him up, Olson. Maybe we can teach him not to pull out in front of police cars. Look, Lieutenant Urban, I've got to make a call. If you I understand there's a dead girl on the fourth floor of this apartment building. Yeah, and you know how you know... I told you, remember? Then you try to run out. <laughs> You're smarter than that, Rogue. Come on, boys. Push the button there, will you? For... Now, who is this thing that got the business, Rogue? I don't know. You don't know? You just happened to drop in because you heard she was dead, eh? No, I... Well, I was working on a case and I... Okay. You go first, Rogi. This is it. Try the door, Stacy. It's open. Oh, you know everything, don't you? I try to keep in touch. Mm, shot from a distance of over two feet. Right at the base of the brain. Never knew what hit her. That's right. Who did it, Rogi? And why? I don't know. What's her name? Fancy something or other. I, I don't know her last name. Where'd you meet her? I never met her. Alive. First time I saw her, she was lying right there, dead. You're going to be difficult, eh? You bullhead. Stick around. You mean I'm pinched? Did I say so? Now, look. You're not talking to some correspondent school pickpocket, you know, Lieutenant. Either pinch me or let me go and make up your mind which right now. Shut up. I didn't like the way Urban talked to me. I thought of that elevator. It was practically an escape hatch. I edged over toward the door, and while the boys in blue were chortling over the corpse, I made my break. I could hear the cops running down the stairs as I ran out through the door and jumped into a cab and got out of there. Step it, driver. There's a double saw bucket in it for you if you get me out of here without picking up a tail. Okay, mister. Hang on. 
Oh, what's the matter? Can't you get this corn cellar out of low? I'm doing the best I can. The rest of the people won't get off the street. Oh, oh, we're being tailed. There's a cab following us. Lose him. Take a quick turn at the next corner. Well, what goes? He's still with us. Come on, step on it. I had a good driver. He pulled every trick in the book to lose that shadow, but none of them worked. I was being followed. I didn't know who was following me, but I did know it wasn't the police and that it wasn't a friend. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you about the thousands of smart women throughout the United States and Canada, including glamorous Bess Meyerson, Miss America of 1945, who are now using Fitch's saponified shampoo to keep their hair lustrous, soft, and silky. These smart women have discovered that Fitch's saponified shampoo gives a rich, abundant lather even in hard water. And what is more important, they've discovered that this rich, billowy lather carries away all impurities from their hair and scalp, leaving the scalp clean and refreshed, the hair sparkling and lovely. After the fragrant lather has done its work of cleansing the hair and scalp, the patented rinsing agent goes into action. This rinsing agent acts with the rinse water to remove every tiny particle that might remain to hide hair beauty. No special after rinse is required. You'll find Fitch's saponified shampoo is economical for use by the entire family. Buy that big economy 16-ounce size that sells for $1 or the generous 6-ounce size for 50 cents. If you prefer, ask for a professional application at your barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. And now we return to our story. Richard Rogue is in a cab, having just eluded the police who want to question him about the murder of a young girl. He looks out of the back window of his cab and sees that he's being followed. He urges his driver to greater speed, but still the shadowing cab follows him. Rogue is worried. Maybe I'm just the sensitive type, but every time I thought of that little girl lying up there in that apartment, dead, and looked back at the cab that was following me, I got a little more lonesome for a large crowd. I told my driver to speed up and pull around a corner fast. He did. I jumped out and he kept going. The other cab kept right after him. I hopped in another cab and joined the parade. Now I was doing the tailing. I got a good look at my ex-shadow when he got out of the Club Modern and went in. That's all I wanted right at that point, so I told my driver to take me to the Bellevue Hotel. I wanted to talk with Grandma Eccles on a matter of life and death. Oh, hello, Mr. Rogue. Good evening, Mrs. Eccles. I, I have to talk well, to you. Well, come in, won't you? You know, I've been trying to reach you at your office. I'm very anxious to get in touch with your granddaughter, Mrs. Eccles. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was a silly old woman this morning, Mr. Rogue. I've been trying to reach you to tell you to forget my visit. Oh, I see. Have you talked with your granddaughter? Yes, yes, I have. Uh, by phone. Oh? Hmm. She hasn't been up here? No, no, she hasn't. She's been very busy. And, uh, well, uh, will $50 be enough for you? I mean, for my wasting your time? Just a minute. Uh, look, Graham, uh, you've been smoking too much. Hmm? Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh, look at this ashtray. It's full of cigarette butts, fresh ones, covered with lipstick. Oh, yes. <clears throat> you aren't wearing any lipstick, Graham. Where'd they come from? Well, I, I guess they must have been there when I took the room. Oh, no, 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 Graham. Now, here, sit down there. You know, you're not a very good liar. Your granddaughter has been up here, and she hasn't been gone long. She told you to get me off the case, didn't she? No. No, you're wrong. I want you to drop the case because I found that there was nothing the matter with my little girl. And that I had imagined the whole thing. Yeah? Did you imagine a murder? Murder? Mrs. Echo, please take my word for it. I have to find your granddaughter. Now, what did she tell you? Well, uh, she told me that if I didn't get you off the case, she'd be killed. That's just what she told me. 
<laughs> Who does she know by the name of Mooney? Ever hear her mention that name? Yes, yes, let me now see. Now think, Graham, think. Who is Mooney? Mooney. He's the man that debtor has been keeping company with. Well, what do you know about him? Where can I find him? What does he do for a living? He's, uh, he's a gambler. He has the gambling rooms above the club where debtor has been singing. Where's debtor now? She went to meet him. She went someplace to meet Mooney? Yes. She called him from here. She was going to meet him at the club. The Club Modern? Is that the name of the club? Yes, that's it. The Club Modern. Oh, please take care of her, Mr. Rogue. You know, she's all I have in the world. I was a mightily worried little man as I grabbed a cab and took off to the Club Modern. This kid, this dead echo. Oh, she should have never left Fairfax. Poor little dumb dame. I, I just hoped I could, I could get to her before Mooney got another chance at her, that's all. I walked into the Club Modern and stood for a moment in the foyer, looking around for Detta and Mooney. That's a gun in your kidney, Rogue. Just keep moving. Oh, you couldn't get away with knocking me off here. Are you kidding? Well, I'm willing to gamble if you are. Now move. Up those steps over there at the right. Go on. Okay, okay, tough stuff. You're calling this dance. When you get to the head of those stairs, turn right. To the red door over there, you see it? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You have to poke the heart of that gun, Junior. I'm very ticklish. I'm dying laughing. Keep moving. Rogue here just walked in, Mooney. Oh, come in, Rogue. Sure. Were you expecting me? More or less. Thanks, Maxie. Ah, nice little place you have here. You like it better than tailing me around in a cab, Mooney? Mm hmm. Yeah, you know Miss Sackle, I believe. Yes, we've met. Uh, hello, Dada. You left in such a hurry last time I saw you, honey, that I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. What are you doing here? How did you find me? That's a secret. I came in to tell you not to worry about Mooney. You're quite a talker, aren't you, Rogue? Well, sure, yes. Let's talk about murder, Mooney. No, let's talk about money, Rogue. You're a guy that burns up a lot of it, I understand. Uh, would five grand affect your memory? What am I supposed to forget? A little incident at the Clybourne Apartments, remember? Vaguely. You killed a girl up there, didn't you? Me? No. But that's beside the point. You want to play ball? I didn't say no. Where's the dough? Oh, oh, looks very pretty. Count it out, Mooney. Sure. While I'm counting, you make up your mind. Do you want five grand alive or floral wreaths dead? My hero blood was reaching the boiling point, and I could feel a foolish move coming on. I nerved myself up to my desperate Desmond personality, and then while Mooney had both hands busy counting money, I made a dive for him, right across the desk. Bullseye. He went over backward in his chair with me on top of him, and we went from there. Oh, you sneak around. Oh, oh you want to fight that way, huh? Well, okay, mister. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, and here's a kiss for you, hard guy. I'll kill you for this road. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. Okay, Dada, here. Hold this gun on him while I call the cops, will you? Sure. I was feeling pretty proud of myself when I put in that call to the cops. Richard Rogue, the demon detective, good sleuthing, done cheap. As a matter of fact, I think I was whistling when I heard Dada's footsteps behind me. I was just half turned around when I got it. Oh. The Washington Monument fell on me and I took a dive in the midnight. When I opened my eyes, Mooney was still out. I put my fingers up to the side of my head that felt like it wasn't there and they came away sticky. I got up and looked around. The five grand was gone and so was Detta. I threw some water on Mooney and brought him up to date, and then the two of us had a little talk, which was full of surprises for me, and then I ran out of there. The cab starter in front of the club had called a cab for Detta. He'd heard her say, Metropolitan Airport, and step on it. 
I got a cab and said, Metropolitan Airport, and step on it. When I got to the airport, I could hear the loudspeakers announcing a flight leaving for San Francisco. I ran through the building and out onto the field, and there she was, just starting for the plane. Hello, Dada. You leaving again? Oh, Take it easy, baby. I've got my heater pointing at you, and I'd hate to have to shoot any holes in that lovely dress. How did you know I was out here? You know, you're not very smart, baby. The cab started at the club, or did you tell the taxi driver where you wanted to go? <laughs> you should never have taken up murder as a hobby. Murder? Yeah, please don't be coy. Just explain something to me. Where did you get a ticket for the plane so fast? From a Marine. I, I told him I had to get back home. Well, thanks. I I'm glad to know that Mooney and I aren't the only guys in the world that are suckers for blondes with your uh, appeal. I'm not going back. They'll kill me. They'll execute me. I didn't mean to kill anyone. You have to listen to me. It's a little late for that. You'd better be thankful. They can only fry you once, lovely. Come on. You've got a date with the DA. He wants to see you about a couple of murders. <laughs> Well, I turned the luscious dead over to Urban, thereby winning his undying affection for about 20 minutes. Cops are very unconstant personalities. And then I muscled my poor, tired body back to my office. Oh, I was so tired I couldn't have raised my eyebrows with a block and tackle. I opened the door and wished I'd gone straight home. Grandma Echo was sitting there, straight as a Roxy Usher. Well, Mr. Rogue, have you seen Detta? Well, uh, uh, yes, I, I uh... She's in jail? Oh, uh, no, don't, don't take it too hard, Grandma. I was at her apartment. The police were just removing the body of Francie McCall. Well, you, you know that Detta was in... Are you trying to tell me that Detta killed that girl? Yes, she did, you know. Why? Why did she do it? Well, uh, a couple of months ago, Detta ran over a little girl and killed her in a hit-and-run accident. She told Francie about it, and that's what she's been worried about. Oh. Francie was going to tell the police today. That's why Detta shot her. Oh, believe me, I, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I believe I owe you some money, Mr. Rogue. Oh, no, no, please. I insist. I retained you to do a job, and you did it. I mailed you a check in the morning. No, 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 please, no. I'll tell you, if you, uh, if you really want to do something for me, how about inviting me to your house for Thanksgiving dinner? You, you know, Graham, they, they don't make money big enough to buy things like that. Will you come? <laughs> well, just ask me. All right, son. And we'll never mention this again, will we? Never. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, I think I'm going to, to cry a little. <laughs> Well, that's the end of the story, except that they didn't burn Detta. The jury was looking at her when they should have been listening to the evidence. Mooney and I got to be pretty good friends. I learned that he'd been waiting downstairs for Detta while she was busy killing Francie. She told him what happened, and he was trying to catch me to butt my lip with hush money. <laughs> he was in love with the gal. The Marine that got talked out of his plane ticket was suffering from a touch of the same malady. Well, who wasn't? If there's anything in the theory of reincarnation... I want to come back as a blonde with Detta's equipment. Then I can get away with murder. Unless there's a guy around as smart as Richard Rogue, and that doesn't seem possible. Now, does it? This is Dick Powell again. We all hope you like our show tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. The music was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens, and production and direction was by D. Engelbach. Next week, we're going to do a real thriller entitled Murder in Drawing Room A. Lots of excitement. Don't miss it. Good night, all. And now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. 
Fitz's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter Barbara Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Creeps, this is a very tired T4Y on the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight's story will be told by Dick Powell, who plays Richard Rogue now, in another graphic adventure from Rogue's Gallery. When I got on this Rattler for my trip to Central City, I was not exactly a joy boy. I hate riding on trains. But a couple of hours later, I'm a happy chappy. Because who do I run across in the lounge car is a little ambition of mine with the name of Betty Callahan, a newspaper woman who is cheating the movies. She's a pocket-sized brunette with cornflower blue eyes and a complexion which wouldn't come off on the shoulder of my blue gabardine suit. I rescued her from the wolves in Uncle Sam's clothing, who were making life too interesting for her in the club car, and we retired to my compartment for the talk about the uh, old times. Nice little place you have here, Richard. A guy can get pretty lonesome in a place like this, you know, Betty. Get that gleam out of your eye, Richard. I'm perfectly comfortable right where I am. Oh, all right, all right. I just thought maybe you'd like to sit here with me and look out of the window. You're so thoughtful. You haven't even told me where you're going. Did things finally get too hot for you at home? Please. I'm going to Central City, baby, for the same reason you are. The Charlie Miller trial. Don't tell me you've learned to write. <laughs> Very funny. I'm an expert witness, and I've got a briefcase full of research here. That's going to make the D.A. very happy. Uh, come a little closer. Oh, all right. What do you think? Is Charlie going to get the works? Oh, let's not talk about Charlie. Let's talk about me. Don't you ever get tired of that subject? No, it fascinates me. Come on, what are you sitting clear over there for? you like it here. Why? Didn't your mother ever tell you anything? About fellows like you? Plenty. <laughs> Why don't you drop that front page character, Angel? We've known each other for a long time. Stop pulling. Well, I was just trying to... Well, stop trying. How can you be so mean to me? Ever since the first time I, I saw you, Betty, I've, I've been stuck on you. No kidding. Oh, Richard. <laughs> Did anybody ever believe that line? Once in a while. You know, something's going to happen to you in just a minute, baby. Will I like you? Let's find out. Oh, brother. What's the idea, lady? This is a private compartment. Please, I'm sorry to intrude. Who is this girl, Richard? I never saw her before. Who are you? I had to come in here. My life is in danger. Well, offhand, lady, I don't think you improved your situation any breaking in here when you did. Oh, why does everything have to happen to me? Why don't you buy a ticket, Latin type, and then you wouldn't have to play hide-and-seek with the conductor. I had to come in here. I'm hiding. There's a man on this train who has designs on my life. Yes. Yeah. What Bernhardt could have done with that line? You don't believe me? That's right. Now scram. Oh, don't answer it. Please. It's him. The guy with the design? I want to take a gander. Oh, no, no, no. I'll answer it myself. I want to talk to you a minute, Diane. It's impossible, Flip. There's nothing more to say. I think maybe you'd better. I know where you're going, Diane, and I know what you've got. Do you want to come out here? All right. I'll be with you in a minute. I'll be waiting. Want me to take care of that punk for you? You stay out of this, Richard. Please. 
Will you keep this briefcase for me? Don't let anyone touch it. Please. Next time, why don't you get a drawing room with a revolving door, Richard? Oh, shut up. You know, I'm kind of worried about that girl. I'm going to feel pretty silly if she comes up dead. For the next two minutes, I worried about Diane and the man who had designs on her life. But I'm a romanticist at heart. So I spent the next 58 minutes trying to spellbind Betty into seeing things my way. But she wasn't looking. At the end of an hour, my chances were still about on the ratio of Little Rock Junior High against Notre Dame. So I gave up. Well, it's been an hour since I visited checked out. What do you think, Richard? The dame's either as goofy as a cub outfielder or she's really in a jam. You're pulling me, I'll put my ex on the first stanza. Let's take a look in that briefcase she left behind. Hey, wait a minute, honey. That's my briefcase. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't get huffy, Richard. Those two briefcases are practically identical. Yeah, I guess they aren't that. Well, give me mine. I'm going to put it up here on the rack. Hey, what is this? Pipe down, pretty boy. Turn the lights back on, Richard. Shut up, lady. All right, give me that briefcase, pretty boy. Get that flashlight out of my eyes. Keep your hands where they are. Give me that flashlight. Sorry, lady, but you asked for it. <coughs> now, pretty boy, give me that bag. Hey, what's the gimmick? What are you pulling that emergency cord for? I don't want to have to shoot you. Get your hands out of your coat. So long, pretty boy. As he pulled the cord, I could see the gleam of a gun in this character's fist. And I didn't want any samples of his marksmanship. But I could hear Betty groaning on the floor at my feet. And all of a sudden, I felt that I had to get him before he jumped out of that window. He'd knocked out with the butt of his pistol. I made a dive for him, expecting to stop a little lead. When I got where he'd been, he wasn't there. He was behind me. I knew that when I heard the flashlight whizzing through the air. It connected expertly right behind my ear. And there I went again into the land of Nod, which is practically my home away from home. Everything was very quiet for a while, and I slept peacefully. Come on, Rogie. Come on. Get up, Rogue. Get up. Huh? Snap out of it. Betty's been hurt. Betty? The man got away. You've got to get up. Oh, I can't. Oh, my head. Get up. Get up. Wake up. Get up. What's that noise? It's at the door. Someone wants in. Oh, they'll go away. Snap out of it, Roby. Let him in. Betty's been hurt. What happened? I can't remember. Remember the man? Remember the girl? He came back in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cut it out. Stop that pounding. Ooh, my head. You're in a jam, Rogie. Betty's been hurt. Wake up. Get up. I can't. I can't. What's that pounding? Pounding. Pounding. Cut it out. Cut it out. Stop it. Do you hear? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Okay, okay. Betty. Oh, Betty, you poor kid. Hello, man. Hello. I'm coming, I'm coming. Just keep your shirt on. I demand an explanation of what's been going on in here. Come on, come on. Help me bring this girl out of it. The window broken. Do you know what that does to the air conditioning in this car? Well, a man got out of that window while the train was stopped. Who pulled the emergency cord? This guy. He came in here waving a gun around, took a briefcase that some dame had left here, stopped the train, and knocked our brains out. I just came to, and he's gone. So let's face it, Conductor, he must have jumped out the window. Yes, 
And what happened to the young lady who left the briefcase here in your compartment? I don't know. Who was she? I never saw her before. Oh, are you okay, baby? Oh, sure. It takes a bump like that. Clear up my mind. Who was that fellow? I don't know. I'm holding you responsible for the damage that's been done to this compartment. What's your name? The name's Richard Rogue. Now get out of here. I'll give you some more things to hold me responsible for. Personal things. I'm the conductor on this train okay, and I'm... Okay, a... okay. We'll still be on your train when you pull into Central City. Goodbye now. What happened? Now, now, everything's all right, folks. Let's get back to your seat, please. We're going ahead immediately. Please return to your seat. I've heard you were dynamic when you got started, Richard. Yeah, look. That Daffy Dame that came charging in here wasn't kidding. That briefcase for hers is full of dynamite. Was, you mean. It's gone. Out the window. Oh, no, it isn't. That window jumper took mine, remember? I had it in my hand, ready to put it up on the luggage rack when he came in. Uh, give me hers. It's right over there behind you. Oh, sure. It's locked. I want to know what's in it, don't you? I love life. I just wish I'd never seen it. Well, comb the hair over that lump on your head, baby. We're going to find and confer with the young lady who spark plugged this carnival of mayhem. Okay, I'm in. I owe that brunette a little something. Let's go talk to her. My head had that familiar old feeling of having been washed in a washing machine, and I was feeling anything but cute as we wandered down the aisle, asking porters if they'd seen a big brunette wearing a blue pinstripe suit and a hat with cherries on it. That was Diane, you know. Finally, in car 73, the porter recognized the description and told us that the lady was in drawing room A. Naturally, the conductor came along about this time. His glares bounced off that haze of pain that surrounded me like ricocheting bullets. He went with us, under protest, to drawing room A. Oh, no answer. She isn't in. Why don't you look in the club car? I did. Knock again. Why don't you try the door, Richard? Okay. Oh, it's open. Conductor, mind if we go and look around? What right have you to enter the stateroom of a strange woman? She entered his. You sue me if you want to, but I'm going in there and take a look around. Huh. Nobody home, I guess. Well, I hope you're satisfied tearing up the train, walking into other people's drawing rooms. Look, mister, I'm trying to help you. I've been all over this train. This dame has to be someplace. All right, all right. She's not here. And I can't stand around all night. Look, over there. Under the berth. I don't see anything. You don't? Come here, conductor. Hmm? What do you think that is? Red ink? Why? That's blood. Oh, well, I'll pull these blankets back. Oh, I'm getting out of here. Are you convinced now that something's happened to that girl? Yes, I suppose so. Well, she must be in here someplace. Open the door to that wardrobe. <gasps> oh, Richard. Steady, Betty. Here. Help me move her up on the berth. No. Leave her right where she is. The cops won't want to move. Oh, that knife and that throat. She's dead. Yes, she was dead. And all we knew about her was that her name was Diane. And that I had the briefcase which must contain the reason for her murder. A pleasant thought. I took one more look at the dead girl, shuddered, and pulled Betty out of that room. I wondered what was going to happen next. And who is going to be the main attraction? I must have been born under a police star. No matter what I start out to do, I end up in more trouble than a jitterbug at a square dance. Me? I start out to be an expert witness, and I wind up in the sheriff's office in Central City trying to explain a murder. Betty was enjoying every minute of this comedy of terrors, being a news hawk. She was jumping with enthusiasm and theories. The sheriff was jumping with importance, and I was just jumping. I don't like murder unless there's a profit in it for me. Sit down, Rogue. You shouldn't be so nervous. Well, we should be getting a report of that murdered woman, shouldn't we, Sheriff? We're not going to get any place until we find out who she was. Oh, my men are working on it, Rogue. Now, just take it easy. We know our business here in Central City. Uh-huh. Well, it's your business. It isn't mine. So if you don't mind, I think I'll shove off. I've got a little business to take care of myself. Uh, just a moment. I'll, uh... Hey, what have you been fixing? 
But we got a positive identification on that lady who was stabbed on the train, Sheriff. And who do you think she was? Well, who was she? Get to it, Hennessy. She was Diane Miller, wife of Charlie Miller, who's on trial for murdering Big Joe Lamberti. No kidding. Yeah. You can go, Hennessy. Sheriff Mills. Yeah? All over the place, huh? Hmm, great work, Sergeant. Okay. I'll have a pick out on him in ten minutes. Thanks. Well, what's the good news? Have anything to do with the case? Well, Rogue, the man who stabbed Mrs. Charlie Miller was Flip Stone, Miller's best friend and his first lieutenant in the slot machine racket. His fingerprints were all over the knife. <laughs> How do you like that? Mm, I don't like it. Doesn't make sense yet. Richard, I'm going to go call this into my city desk. Will you meet me at the hotel and bring me up to date on what has happened? Sure, I'll take care of it, baby. You run along, keep your readers informed. You might as well go along with her, Rogue. We don't need your help to solve this case. We're perfectly capable of taking care of it ourselves. Well, swell. Lots of luck. I've heard all about you, Rogue. Just keep your hands in your pockets while you're in Central City. We don't like smart private detectives very well. Remember that. I was all set to try and help the guy until he said that. I don't approve of people going around sticking knives through other people, and I'm willing to throw in my nickels worth to see that they're discouraged. Then this politician with muscles running up to the part in his hair gets tough with me. Oh, well, he probably had run across some wrong guys in his time. Anyway, Betty and I lamb back to the Hotel Splendid. We went up to my room because we wanted to talk. She called in her story to her paper... And I sat in the window and talked the deal over with myself. She finished her phone call. I really walked into a scoop this time. The city editor's having hallucinations. He even promised me a raise. Throw the bowl in that door, will you? Why? Oh, don't be so conceited. I want to take a look in this briefcase all the excitement is about. Of course, you know you can get put away in the pokey for a long time for withholding evidence. Hmm. You're the worrying type, aren't you? Why do you suppose Flipstone rubbed out his boss's better hat? Maybe she asked idiotic questions while he was trying to open a briefcase. You know it's locked. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ruin the lock with my knife. Too bad. That's breaking and entering or something, isn't it? Illegal entry. Oh, that'll add 20 years to your sentence. I'll still be a young man I get out. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on, I'm not going to be browbeaten by a lock. Hey, hundred dollar bills. Millions of them. Take a gander at that, Betty. Money! Oh, you catch on quick. No wonder Flip Stone was so anxious to get his hot little pink fist on this leather. You count him, will you? I'd love to. There's some letters in here I want to be impolite about. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one. Richard, there must be fifty thousand dollars here. Maybe this is the works. These letters explain a lot of things. I'm counting. Wait a minute. Eighty-one, eighty-two, eighty-three, eighty-four. Don't bother me. I never saw this much money before. No. Well, I know now why Flip Stone put the kiss of death on the lovely Diane. He had to keep these letters and that money from being delivered. He didn't want Charlie Miller to beat that rap. Four, five, six, seven. I'm through six thousands already, and I haven't even made a hole in the pile. Oh, the guy who wrote these letters was a character. Five, six, seven, eight, seven, uh, give me the sheriff's office, please. One, two, three, four, five, Thank six, you. Seven, eight eight thousand. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine thousand. Mm. Oh, I wonder what a nice yacht would cost me. Chicken, if that door was yours, you'd be Mrs. Richard Brogue tonight. Oh, would I? Six, seven, eight, nine. Hello, nine hello, thousand. sheriff's office. Uh, let me talk to Sheriff Mills. Richard Brogue calling. My Thanks. Gracious. Seven, eight, nine, eleven thousand, one, two, three, four, five, oh, hello, seven, sheriff, eight, nine, thousand. Oh, hello, Sheriff. This is Richard Rogue. Twelve thousand. Yeah. Three, Come five, down to seven thirty at the Hotel three, Splendid five. right away, will you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, well, don't ask four, so many five, questions. Five, I'm going to make you a big man. One, two, three, four, five, I want you to help me plan a surprise party. All right. Now hurry. Hey, that's a lot of letters you got there, Betty, darling. <laughs> Flipstone really grabbed a handful of disappointment when he bailed out with that my satchel by mistake. There wasn't nearly that much money in mine. Who could that be? I don't know. Look, I'll get over behind the door. You open it, and we'll look our company over before we put this artillery away. All right. I don't like guns. Ah, they come in handy sometimes. Okay. Put them up, lady. I'm coming in. You can't come in here. Shut up. Just keep backing up. I want that dough. You switched bags on me. I didn't. I didn't do it. Where's Rogue? Checked every hotel register in town looking for him. Where is he? I want to slap him around a little bit for... Oh, Richard, why did you wait so long? 
I administered that pistol anesthesia with masterful precision. Flip was going to have a long ride on the dream train. Betty and I took a sheet off the bed, tore it into strips, and tied Flip up like traffic at Hollywood and Vine. Then we looked around for some place to hide him. We finally picked out a spot that any old maid would have thought of immediately. We slipped him under one of the twin beds. Then we finished counting the money. $25,000. Oh, it looked beautiful there. But I had things to do. I called the sheriff. He hadn't left the jail yet. So I went down there to talk with him. And while I was there, I had a chat with Charlie Miller. A very satisfactory chat. Then the sheriff and I went back to the hotel. Betty made a phone call. And we waited for company. The sheriff and I squeezed into a closet when a knock came at the door. Who is it? You just called and invited me down. Okay. Come in. Thanks. Now, let's get this over with, Mrs. Miller. I want to get out of here. Don't be in such a hurry. How do I know you're on the level? You have the money with you? Yes. I'll give it to you after you sign this little document. Uh, what is it? I'll read it to you. All right. I, Louis Tobin, a member of the jury in the trial of Charles Miller for the murder of Big Joe Lamberti, do hereby acknowledge the receipt of $25,000 from the hand of Mrs. Charles Miller, for which I agree to hold out against the conviction of Charles Miller and to find him not guilty. I also agree to use my best influence to make the other jurors agree to a not guilty verdict. And that's where you sign, Mr. Tobin. Oh, you, you know I can't sign a thing like that. Now, look, I've got 25 grand in Hudrun's ready for you. You get it when you sign your name. Right there. No, I... If you I keep can't. your word and my husband gets a hung jury or an acquittal, this receipt will be torn up. If you don't, I'll give it to the newspapers. Sign it. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll sign it. Here's a pen, Mr. Tony. I, 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 uh, okay. There, I'll, I'll just hang on to this until you give me the money. Here you are. $250, $100 bill. There we are. You want to count it? Uh, no, no, I just want to get out of here, that's all. Hey, hey. Don't oh. move, Tobin. The sheriff and I have both have you covered. You double-crossed me. I was just get trying to... Get Tobin. I'll shake him down, Sheriff. He's got $25,000 on him that you marked yourself. You haven't got a thing on me. I was just... Take your hands out here. Well, I... I, I Miss Callahan, could I have that confession? Oh, sure, if you'll let me have it back for a photostat later. Okay, it'll be yours, exclusive. And now I'm going to take this man down and lock him up where he belongs. Yeah, that's a good idea. Very practical. Oh, here, Sheriff, you better take this money with you. I just spend everything I get my hands on. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Rogue. You better count it. Later. No, Sheriff, you better count it now. I can't take the time now, Rogue. If there's any money missing, I'll be back. And there had better not be any money missing. I had news for the sheriff, but he was so impressed with his pence that he couldn't see me. Oh, well, I, I knew he'd be back. You see, I'm a practical guy. I had palmed and pocketed $5,000 out of that wad of dough I took off Tobin. I showed it to Betty and she was horrified, but I knew what I was doing. So I just sat there and waited for the door to take a beating. And it did. Who is it? It's the sheriff. Let me in, Rogue. Why, sheriff, you're all red in the face. It's your age. I knew you were a crook the first time I set eyes on you, Rogue. <laughs> you probably studied psychology at Barber College. That's what makes you so smart. There was only $20,000 in that briefcase when I counted the money at the jail. And I had four honest men as witnesses. Well, bless your heart. Where's that other $5,000, Rogue? In my pocket, Sheriff. And that's where it's going to stay. Ah, uh, that's larceny. And you, you're under arrest. Now, is that silly? Look, Sheriff. Oh, please, Richard, tell him. Don't needle him anymore. Well, Sheriff, you remember when I went in the cell to see Charlie Miller? What's that got to do with the missing funds? Well, he posted a $5,000 reward for the killer of his wife with you, didn't he? Oh, uh, yes, I suppose he did. You suppose? You know he did. Well, if you look under the bed there in the bedroom, you'll find Flip Stone, the guy who murdered Diane Miller. It was very simple. I just collected my reward in advance, that's all. My friend the sheriff was a little upset for a while, but he calmed down when Betty brought in a photographer to take his picture for the papers. <laughs> Isn't it funny what some people will do to get their pictures in the papers? I had to practically wrestle him to keep him out-profiling me, the big ham. 
Well, I split the reward with Betty, of course. No, I didn't just exactly split it with her. I gave her 2,000 bucks. But she didn't want to take anything. Isn't that just like a woman, though? Or is it? We're a little late, folks. This is T4Y. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.